Part 1, Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. Part 1, Chapter 1. The fairy Potentilla appears to the young prince, Phantasmion. A young boy hid himself from his nurse in sport, and strayed all alone in the garden of his father, a rich and mighty prince. He followed the bees from flower to flower, and wandered farther than he had ever gone before, till he came to the hollow tree where they hived, and watched them entering their storehouse laden with the treasures they had collected. He lay upon the turf, laughing and talking to himself, and after a while he plucked a long, stiff blade of grass and was about to thrust it in at the entrance of the hive when a voice, just audible above the murmur of the bees, cried, Phantasmion! Now the child thought that his nurse was calling him in strange tones, and he started saying, Ah, Liliba! and looked around. But casting up his eyes, he saw that there stood before him an ancient woman, slenderer in figure than his nurse, yet more firm and upright, and with a countenance which made him afraid. "'What dost thou hear, Phantasmion?' said the stranger to the little boy. And he made no answer. Then she looked sweetly upon the child, for he was most beautiful, and she said to him, whom dost thou take me for? And he replied, At first I took thee for my nurse, but now I see plainly that thou art not like her. And how am I different from thy nurse? said the strange woman. The boy was about to answer, but he stopped short and blushed. Then after a pause he said, One thing is that thou hast wings upon thy shoulders, and she has none. Phantasmion, she replied, I am not like thy nurse. I can do that which is beyond her skill, great as thou thinkest it. At this the boy laughed, and said with a lively countenance, pointing to the hollow tree, Couldst thou make the bees that have gone in there fly out of their hive all in one swarm? The fairy stayed not to answer, but touched the decayed trunk with her wand, and the bees poured out of their receptacle by thousands and thousands, and hung in a huge cluster from the branch of a sycamore. And as the child looked upon the swarm, it seemed to be composed of living diamonds, and glanced so brilliantly in the sunshine that it dazzled the sight. And the beautiful boy laughed aloud, and leaped into the air, and clapped his hands for joy. Then the fairy placed her wand within his little palm, saying, Strike the tree and say, Go in, and they shall all enter the hive again. The cheeks of the young boy blushed brighter than ever, and his eyes sparkled as he struck the hollow trunk with all his might and cried, Go in, go in! No sooner had he done this than the whole multitude quitted the branch of the sycamore and disappeared within the body of the tree. Then the ancient woman said to the little prince, Wilt thou give me that pomegranate? And she pointed to the only ripe one which grew on a tree hard by. One member of the trunk of this pomegranate tree leaned forward and invited the adventurous child to mount. He quickly crept along it, and having plucked the fruit which the fairy had pointed out, he turned round and tried to descend, but finding that he should slip if he attempted to return by the way he came, having measured the height from the ground with his eye, he boldly sprang at once from the bow to the turf below and presented his prize to the stranger. With that she took it from his hand and, looking kindly upon him, she said, My little phantasmion, thou needest no fairy now to work wonders for thee being yet so young that all thou beholdest is new and marvellous in thine eyes. But the day must come when this happiness will fade away, 
when the stream, less clear than at its outset, will no longer return such bright reflections. Then, if thou wilt repair to this pomegranate tree, and call upon the name of Potentila, I will appear before thee, and exert all my power to renew the delights and wonders of thy childhood. After speaking these words, Potentila vanished, and the child opened his eyes wide, and now, feeling afraid to be alone, he ran homeward as fast as possible, and in a little time heard the voice of his mother calling to him in quick tones, for she had outrun his nurse, who was also hastening in search of him. The child bounded up to her, and with breathless eagerness sought to describe the strange things which he had seen. All the bees came out in a cluster, cried he, and they were dressed in diamonds. Thousands and millions of them hung together upon a branch, and I, my own self, made every one of the bees go back again into their hive with a shining stick which the old woman lent me. What old woman? replied Queen Zalia to her little son. Was it one of the gardener's wives? Oh no, said he. An old woman with wings on her shoulders, and she flew up and vanished away, like the bubbles which I blow through my pipe. Thou hast been dreaming, my sweet boy, said his mother. Thou hast fallen asleep in the sunshine, and hast dreamt all this. No, no, my mother, the child replied. Indeed, indeed, it was quite unlike those dreams which I have at night. I wish the bees could speak, that they might tell thee all about it for they saw the winged woman as well as I. End of Part 1, Chapter 1Potentilla fulfills her promise to Phantasmion. Soon afterwards, Phantasmion's fair mother, Zalia, fell sick and died. Her young son was kept from the chamber of death, and, roaming about the palace in search of her, he found a little child sitting on the floor of a lonely chamber, afraid to stir because he was by himself. The people are all gone away cried Phantasmion. Come, I will take thee abroad to see the pretty flowers. Now the sun shines so bright. The child was glad to have fresh air and company, and, holding fast by the older boy's hand, he sped along with short, quick steps further than his tiny feet had ever carried him before, lisping about the bees and hornets, which, in his ignorance, he would fain have caught as they buzzed past him, and laughing merrily when his frolicsome guide led him right through a bed of feathered columbines for the sake of seeing the urchin's rosy cheek brushed by soft blossoms and powdered with flower dust. At last they entered the queen's pleasure ground, where only one gardener remained, and he was sitting on the path, gathering berries in a basket. "'Where is my mother?' cried the prince, leaping suddenly behind him. Hast thou hidden her away, old man? Thy mother is dead, answered he, looking up in the boy's face. And it was the glance of his eye, more than the words he spoke, which made Phantasmion shudder. The menial smoothed his brow, and with humble courtesy offered a branch of crimson fruit to the young prince, who flung it on the ground, crying in a haughty tone, How darest thou say that my mother is dead? Go to her chamber and see, replied the man sternly. And how can I see her if she is dead, rejoined the boy, with a tremulous laugh. Can I see the cloud of yesterday in yon clear sky? Like clouds, the dead vanish away, and we see them no more. Just then he spied the young child lying down, with the fruit branch dropping out of his fingers, and his face buried in a flowery tuft. What, hiding among the heart seas? cried he. Ah, let me hide too. Then, putting his face close to that of his charge, 
How cold the little cheek is, he cried. Come, raise it up to the warm sun. Hearing these words, the gardener turned the child's face upwards, and behold, he was dead, his lips smeared with berry juice, and his pale, swollen cheeks covered with purple spots. Then he held out the body to the startled boy, and showing the slack limbs and glazed eye, while his own shot fire like that of a panther. So look the dead, cried he, ere they vanish away. Just so Queen Zalia is looking. Phantasmion shrieked, and hastening home, he met his mother's funeral procession going forth from the palace. The body was wrapped in a shroud, and black plumes nodded over the face, but he saw the dead hands, and the limbs stiffly stretched upon the bier. From that time forth, he never spoke of Queen Zalia, but he often beheld her in dreams, and often he dreamed of the old man who told him she was dead, and who disappeared on the same day from the royal household. Phantasmion grieved but little when his father died a year afterwards, for he scarcely knew King Dorimont's face, that warlike prince having been wholly engaged, since the birth of his child, in a fruitless search after mines of iron. It was commonly believed that ill success in this matter hastened his end, but the people about the palace well knew that he died of eating poisoned honey. Thus, Phantasmion was yet too young when he inherited the throne of palm land to be a king in reality, and those who governed the land sought to keep him a child as long as possible. They prevented him from learning how to reign, but could not succeed in making him content with mere pomp and luxury, for his pleasures were so closely set that they hindered one another's growth and, by the time that he attained to his full stature, nothing gratified him except the society of a noble youth who came to visit his court from a foreign country, and who interested his mind by curious histories and glowing descriptions. Dariel of Tigridia was well skilled in the management of fruit trees and flowers. He had brought seeds of many fine sorts from different lands, and, at the desire of Phantasmion, he sowed them in the royal garden. One morning he came to the prince, saying, The rare plant has put forth leaves. Come and look at it. Earlier even than we expected, cried the prince, rising joyfully from his seat. I will not only see, but taste and try. The two youths took their way through the flowery labyrinth, talking much of the wondrous plant and the virtues of its leaves. But just as they were drawing nigh to the nook where it grew, several scorpions fastened all at once on Dariel's sandaled foot and stung it with such violence that, quitting his comrade's arm, he sprang into the air and then fell prostrate under the towering lilies. Phantasmion carried him to the palace and placed him tenderly on a couch. After a time, seeing that he continued in a languishing state, he made an infusion of the leaves which his friend had so highly extolled, and silently gave it to Dariel instead of the drink which the physician had ordered. But just as he expected to see the poor youth revived by this kind act, his head sank on the pillow. A blue tinge stole over his cheek, and, when the prince had gazed upon his altered face for a few minutes, he plainly saw that it told no longer of sickness, but of death. Not, however, till decay had wrought a still more ghastly change in Dariel's comely countenance, Phantasmion quitted the side of his couch. Then, overpowered with sorrow, he roamed abroad and sought the forest of lilies which his comrade's hand had reared. The sun was bright, the air fresh, but all that flowery multitude was drooping and ready to perish. Canker worms had gnawed their roots, and the wondrous plant itself had been attacked by such numbers of insects that scarce a trace of it remained. This circumstance deepened the melancholy which had seized on the spirit of Phantasmion, 
he began to think that all persons and things connected with himself were doomed to misfortune. And when this channel of thought was once opened, a hundred rills poured into it at once and filled it to the brim. He reflected on the early deaths of his father and mother, as he had never reflected on them before. The black plumes and solemn tapers of the chamber, where King Dorimant lay in state, rose up before him, while Zalia stretched on her bier, and the strange man holding out his little comrade's body visited him again as in the dreams of his childhood. These and other remembrances, grouped together under one aspect of gloom, all wore the same visionary twilight hue and inspired the same sadness. He turned away from cheerful faces and was constantly expecting to see the ghost of Dariel, a shadowy image of his swollen corpse. Phantasmian had spent many days in this state of dejection, when he wandered forth after a sleepless night one clear morning and, refreshed by the breath of early dawn, began to slumber under the boughs of a pomegranate tree. No sooner had he closed his eyes than the fairy, whom he had formerly seen on that very spot, seemed to stand there again. In his dream she touched him with her wand, and forthwith leafy branches, like those which drooped over him, sprouted from his shoulders. Imperceptibly those branches changed into green wings, and up he soared, feeling as if his whole body were inflated with air. As he floated along in the sky, a group of angel faces shone before him. He surveyed them, and all were lovely, but one was far lovelier than the rest, and while he gazed upon that countenance, it grew more and more exquisite, the others becoming indistinct and fading gradually away. Suddenly, like a balloon exhausted of air, down he dropped to the earth and was snatched away from the vision. Potentila, he cried aloud, starting up in the intensity of feeling and stretching out both his hands. Potentila, help, help! No sooner had he uttered that long-forgotten name than he opened his eyes and saw the little old fairy smiling in his face. Phantasmion, she said, what shall I do for thee? I am queen of the insect realm, and powers like those which insects have are mine to bestow. Give me wings, he cried, for still he had a vague hope that he might once more behold that heavenly face if he could but soar aloft. Potentilla waved her wand, and soon the air was filled with butterflies, those angel insects pouring from every region of the heavens. Here came a long train, arrayed in scarlet, waving up and down all together like a flag of triumph. There floated a band clad in deep azure and flanked on either side by troops in golden panoply. Some were like flights of green leaves, Others twinkled in robes of softest blue besprent with silver, like young princesses at a festival, and in front of the whole multitude, a gorgeous crowd, adorned with peacock eyes, flew round and round in a thousand starry wheels, while here and there one butterfly would flit aloof for a few moments, then sink into the circle and revolve indistinguishably with the rest. Now the entire wheel flew off into splinters, now reconstructed itself at once, as if but a single life informed its several parts. Again Potentilla waved her wand, and the bloomy throng descended on trees and shrubs, attiring every bow in fresh blossoms, which quivered without a breeze. Phantasmian saw that he was to choose from this profusion of specimens the wings that pleased him best, and he fixed on a set like those which he wore in his dream. The moment that Potentilla touched him with her wand, a sensation of lightness ran throughout his body, and instantly afterwards he perceived that wings played on his shoulders, wings of golden green adorned with black embroidery, beneath an emerald coronet his radiant locks clustered in large soft rings, and wreathed themselves around his snowy forehead. Robes of white silk floated over his buoyant limbs, and his full eyes, lately closed in languor, beamed with joyful expectation. 
while more than childlike bloom rose mantling to his cheek. Potentilla had seen an eagle teaching her young ones to fly, gradually widening her airy circles, and mounting in a spiral line that swelled as it rose, while the sun burnished her golden plumes. Just so she flew before the winged youth, who timidly followed where she led the way, trembling in his first career when he saw the earth beneath him. But, gaining confidence, all at once he shot away from his guide, like a spark from a sky rocket. He soared and gyred and darted on high, describing as many different figures as a skater on the ice, while from the groves and flowery meads below, this chorale strain resounded. See the bright stranger on wings of enchantment. See how he soars. Eagles, that high on the crest of the mountain, beyond where the cataracts gush from their fountain, look out o'er the sea and her glistening shores. Cast your sun-gazing eyes on his pinions of light. Behold how he glitters transcendently bright. Whither, ah, whither, to what lofty region his course will he bend? See him, oh, see him, the clouds overtaking, as though the green earth he were blithely forsaking. Ah, now, in swift circles behold him descend. Now again, like a meteor, he shoots through the sky, or a star glancing upward to sparkle on high. End of Part 1, Chapter 2《Part One, Chapter Three of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Three. Phantasmion sees and hears strange things by the seashore. Phantasmion left the shadows of earth behind him, while he soared so high that green fields and blue waters. Gardens and groves all melted into one, and even that heavenly sight which had first made him pray for wings was itself forgotten in the pleasure of flying. He thought it a delightful novelty to rush down upon the heron like the trained hawk, or aim a javelin at some bird of prey as she stooped upon her quarry, to whirl upward with a gleed, drop down like a shot side by side with a gerfalcon, disperse the swallows in the midst of their aerial dances, or sweep the cope of heaven in pursuit of the swift, then hovering aloft in perfect stillness, with green pinions and floating robes, he attracted crowds of gazers who marveled how a bird of paradise could look so large at such a wondrous height. One fine clear day he flew southward to the ocean, and pursued a sea eagle to the highest ether. At first setting off, he was rudely brushed by vultures, hurrying down to feast upon a carcass which lay rocking on the waves. He thrust among them with his drawn sword, and pushed onward, leaving a cloud of his delicate plumelets fluttering in the air. Having arrived at last where the atmosphere was too thin for anything but a bird to breathe, he hastily began to descend. But, faint and weary, scarce saw his way before him, and dropped full on the back of the eagle's mate, jerking out of her clutches a load of fish just caught for her young. Enraged at this loss, she pursued Phantasmion, and with her strong beak shattered one of his pinions, ere he had time to gain a cliff towards which he was steering so that, being no longer able to direct his course aright, he fell with violence and lay stunned upon the rugged shore. While he leaned upon his arm, just recovering from the shock, and surveyed the ocean with dazzled eyes, he perceived a strange woman's form rising out of the waves and gliding toward the beach. A wreath of living, moving flowers, like sea anemones, clung round her head, from which the slimy locks of whitish blue hung down till they met the waters. Her skin was thick and glistering. There was a glaze upon it, which made Phantasmians shiver, and, trailing her sinuous body beside the place where the youth lay, she cast a glance towards him, with her moony eyes of yellow-green, 
at which his blood ran cold. But on she went, and turned round a crag which jutted into the sea beyond the fallen prince. Still scarce recovered, Phantasmion arose, and leaned against the lower end of this rock, which, like a buttress, projected off the main body of the cliff. The shattered pinion drooped to the ground, while the wings on the left side were half expanded, and lay languidly against the white stone, like a green branch amid unseasonable snow. And now other sounds caught his ear beside the roar and hiss of advancing and retiring waves. He stood on tiptoe, and looking down into a recess on the other side of the rock, beheld the shape that had lately passed him, reclining on the shore, and staring up in the face of a lofty dame who talked aloud with passionate tones and gestures. She whose voice Phantasmion heard stood with her back towards him. He saw not her face, but he observed that she wore purple robes and a jeweled crown. Ah, me, she cried, the beautiful Irene. Glandreth has called her the beautiful Irene. Teach me how to countervail the charms of this fair girl and to secure the heart of Glandreth. To this the fishy woman made no reply, save a murmuring sound of laughter, whereat the crowned lady exclaimed in a shrill voice, Remember thy vow to the king, my father, when he caught thee in his toils upon the shore. Then the woman fish replied, Have I not redeemed that vow? Did I not lend thee spells to bewitch the heart of Albinian? And is it not through me that thou art queen of this land of rocks? Without Guerdon I will serve thee no longer. The crowned lady put her hands before her face and groaned deeply. At length she made answer, Be satisfied, Sushelma, the babe shall be thine. Help me to remove Irene from the sight of Glandreth. Help me to destroy the hostile house of Manyart, and thou shalt have thy desire. Then the crowned woman sate down below the rock and listened to the words of her whom she called Sushelma, and the two seemed to be contriving some plot. Phantasmion could not understand all that was said, for Sushelma discoursed in a low gurgling murmur, but he heard her speak of poisonous fish, and of a charmed vessel, and of a damsel named Irene. In the end, she drew from an oyster shell a glittering net, and offered it to her companion, who took it from her flabby hand, then rose and, lifting up her embroidered train, went her way leisurely as if absorbed in thought, but Sushelma returned into the sea, and again rowing past Phantasmion, she looked up in his face with the same hideous leer which had chilled his blood before, then diving into the deeper water, she quickly disappeared. Phantasmion stood for some time gazing on the flood, almost expecting that some new shape would rise out of it. He mused on what had passed, and could not help in some sort connecting it with his heavenly dream. A lady, young and beautiful, was hated and persecuted. Powers of earth and sea were leagued against her. He pictured this fair Irene with the countenance which he had beholden in the vision, and longed to find her and rescue her from peril. The prince now bethought him that he was a long way from his royal palace, having fallen on the borders of Rockland, a country adjoining his own dominions. He therefore hastened from the coast, holding up the disabled wing with his hand, and journeyed homeward on foot. After a night's sleep he repaired to the pomegranate tree, but felt unable to express the imaginations that haunted his mind while Potentilla stood before him. He told the fairy, when she begged to know his pleasure, that he was tired of his butterfly pinions and wished to try new experiments. Make my feet, said he, like those of flies, which climb up the mirrors or walk over the roof of my marble hall. Enable me to follow wherever one of those insects can steal along. He had no sooner spoken thus than Potentilla removed the wings she had given him and fitted to his feet the suckers of flies, 
This gift pleased Phantasmion well, and he spent the remainder of that day in gliding along the walls and over the vaulted ceilings of his palace, or scaling the pillar-like stems of the loftiest palm trees. Those who witnessed his feats were amazed, but it had been commonly believed that the race of the palmland kings was under the protection of some mysterious being, and this tale, which had of late years been forgotten, was now recalled to mind with fresh awe and wonder. End of Part 1, Chapter 3「Phantasmion Ascends the Mount of Eagles」Early the next morning, Phantasmion rode out to the Black Mountains, which divided his territories from Rockland, the realm of a neighboring monarch and having arrived at the bottom of a steep hill, he alighted in order to climb the side of it. This was a precipice of solid rock, many hundred feet deep, which looked like a dark curtain let down from the sky, and till that hour had never been trodden by the foot of man. Strange was it to see him, as he paused in the midst of the ascent, plucking a wild flower from a crevice, not sustained in the manner of a bird, with spread tail and half-expanded pinions, but seemingly upborne by his own lightness, like a vapory phantom. When the prince was a child, his mother had told him that a wreath of precious stones was hidden somewhere betwixt the top of this huge crag and the summit of the hill beyond. She had hung it round the neck of her pet lamb in play, and while she was plucking dainty herbs to regale her favorite, an eagle had carried away the lamb and its costly necklace to her young ones among the highest rocks. Phantasmion remembered this, and in some faint hope of discovering the relic, wandered on, after he had gained the summit of the crag, till he came to a small round lake, which lay buried in shadow below a semicircle of rocks. Taking rest here for a few moments, he spied an eagle with something white in her talons, and soon he saw her fly across the pool and enter a recess amid the crags above. This is one of those Aries, thought he, where the eagles breed from age to age. I will invade their ancient house, and perhaps I may win back the prize which was plundered from mine. While he was beginning to ascend, the mother eagle flew forth again, so that Phantasmion was able to mark well the situation of the nest. With steady foot he climbed the crags above the tarn, till he arrived at the bottom of that loftier cliff, in the center of which the airy was embosomed. Just as he reached this point, unexpected sounds met his ear. The eaglet's cry is strangely like the wailing of a child, thought he, and full of wonder, he glided up the front of the rock, to the hollow where the nest was lodged, and there beheld an infant lying on its back unhurt but screaming piteously, while two half-fledged eaglets were shrinking to the further part of the cavity, frightened by the clamors of their intended victim. Startled by this sight, the prince thought no more about the jewels, but took up the babe, which was clad in the fairest raiment, and now having something beside himself to carry, was bent on returning by the easiest path. Accordingly, after having descended to the tarn again, he tracked the course of a rivulet, which flowed from that darksome receptacle, till it wandered away out of sight amid shaggy rocks. Then, pausing to consider how he should proceed, again he heard a sound of lamentation, but it was softer and deeper, than that which had proceeded from the eagle's nest. He listened, but the dashing of some hidden waterfall overpowered the voice, and for a moment he thought that fancy had deceived him, till once more it rose louder than those watery sounds, and then sank into silence. 
Phantasmian wrapped the infant, now fast asleep, in his upper vest, and laid it on dry moss under a jutting stone. He then followed the streamlet among the crags, and thus found his way to a nook, where it formed a series of cascades. Beside the lowest of these, a damsel sate, weeping. She was so fair and exquisitely formed that, leaning against the black rock, she looked like those white figures that are cut in relief on the dark ground of an onyx. She was a prisoner amid the labyrinth of rocks, unable either to repass the precipitous road whereby she had incautiously ascended, or to climb the wall of rock which rose above her head, and over which the prince was airily advancing. A yew tree grew out of a cleft in the beetling crag, and from its twisted trunk, Phantasmian looked down upon the damsel, and saw her cheeks wet with tears, and her luxuriant tresses curling amid the spray of the torrent. It seemed as if the waterfall mocked her distress, babbling while she wept bitterly, and, crying, Fair one, follow me. See how I leap down the precipice. The rustling of bows overhead made the fair girl look up, and seeing a bright face peering down amid the dark foliage of the tree. Good youth, she exclaimed, hast thou seen a babe upon this mountain? Hast thou seen an eagle carrying a young child to her nest? The infant is safe, replied Phantasmion. I took him myself even now from the airy, and he lies wrapped up in a silken garment under shelter of a rock. Then the youth swung himself down from the yew and approached the damsel who, overjoyed at these tidings, led him to the place where she had climbed up to reach the waterfall, thinking that she might find the eagle's nest within the chasm. Phantasmion offered to carry her to the bottom of the rock, and to prove with what ease it could be done, he darted up and down the steep cliff before her as firmly and fearlessly as if he were skimming over the plain. The lady looked astonished at his wondrous agility, and was somewhat alarmed when he carried her in his arms to the edge of the crag. But in a few moments he placed her in safety on the heather below, and hastened back to the jutting stone where he had left the baby. Phantasmion found the child still asleep, with the tears yet glistening on its placid cheek, and soon returned, holding it carefully to his breast. The damsel sprang forward to meet him. Her countenance was no longer downcast, but beaming with joy and tender affection, and, as she stretched out her arms to receive the rescued babe, Phantasmion saw that her face was the same as that entrancing one which he had beheld in his dream. He suffered her to take the child, and gazed in silent ecstasy while she was pressing it to her bosom. At last, after uttering many thanks, she bade him farewell and was about to depart. Phantasmion would have attended her home, but, with earnest looks and words, she declined his courtesy and began winding her way in all haste towards the further part of the mountain. The prince followed her with his eye as she steadily descended a slope of smooth grass, the babe now awake, showing its rosy face over her shoulder, while a gentle breeze uplifted her long wavy locks, brightened by the sunshine. No sooner was she lost from his view than Phantasmion, awaking from his trance, hastened in the direction which he had seen her take, and at length, came in sight of a spreading veil, with a dusky lake in the center of it. The damsel was nowhere to be seen. She had struck into a wood on the skirt of the hill, but at the further end of the valley, companies of soldiers clad in mail were exercising themselves in a mock battle. They were too distant for the youth to discern their motions, but the sun, being reflected from their polished armor, a steady mass of lightning seemed to dwell upon the plain. Phantasmion's soul kindled at the sight, and he almost longed to rush down and join those shining troops. But from the appearance of the sky, he feared to be belated if he tarried longer, and, in order that he might not miss his way, retraced his steps to the small round lake on the other side of the mountain. 
At the time that he reached the tarn, a beam of light was resting on those waters, which were covered with shadows when he saw them last, and through the clear fluid a gemmy coronal was gleaming. Phantasmion waded into the pool and plucked the splendid ornament from the ooze in which it was half buried. It was of exquisite workmanship and represented a pomegranate branch, the leaves being made of emeralds and the blossoms of burning rubies. The inner part bore this inscription in letters of gold, The Queen of Palmland. Phantasmion placed the wreath in his girdle and hastened to rejoin his attendants at the bottom of the hill. The suckers of his feet had imbibed a quantity of moisture, and being much fatigued, he scarce had strength to drag his clinging soles from that which they trod upon, so that he carried away many loose stones as he went along, and was in danger of being lamed, ere he reached his horse. On his way home, Phantasmion showed the wreath which had once adorned the flaxen locks of Zalia to an ancient noble, formerly his mother's guardian. The old man looked sorrowful at the sight of it and said, May the next queen of Palmland be happier than she who wore those jewels. How sayest thou, Cyridis? the youth replied. Didst thou not bid me visit the glades of my mother's native land, where Zalia was the gayest thing that sported under the green leaves? So it was with Zalia, Cyridis replied, till she exchanged her wild flower chaplets for a royal crown. Alas, thy father saw not how his fair queen was arrayed. He cared only for his kingdom, and grieved day and night that he could not caparison his army in solid brass and steel. The king of Rockland has well-armed soldiers, exclaimed Phantasmion, recollecting what he had seen from the mountain top. He hath, replied Cyridis, and a great-hearted general too, who seeks to enlarge the boundaries of Rockland on either side. These remarks, and a discourse which followed, made the son of Dorimont very thoughtful, and he sought next day to renew his conversation with Cyridis, but was informed that the ancient chief had returned to his own abode in the district of Gemaura, where, in former days, Zalia, the orphan heiress of that territory, dwelt under the same roof with him. The prince pondered on the sudden departure of Cyridis, and began to suspect that the good old man had been forced away by those who wished their youthful sovereign to remain ignorant and careless of all that pertained to the government of the realm. End of Part 1, Chapter 4 Part 1, Chapter 5 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 5 Phantasmion Enters the Land of Rocks The kingdom which Phantasmion had inherited from his ancestors abounded not only in palms, but in all kinds of grain and fruit trees, as well as in flocks and herds. The land flowed with milk and wine, oil and honey, but few metals or valuable stones had yet been discovered in its bosom. On the other hand, the realm of Albinian, who reigned over a country separated from Palmland, partly by an extensive range of hills called the Black Mountains, and partly by the river Mediana, which flowed from them to the sea on the right hand, was craggy and barren, rich only in metals, marbles, and other stones, and in materials for making glass and porcelain. The men of Rockland, so this wild country was called, were ingenious in mechanical devices and operations. The inhabitants of the fertile land of palms were given to agriculture, and had never acquired that skill in arts and manufactures by which the neighboring nation was distinguished. Anciently, the two countries enriched and strengthened one another, but these friendly relations were exchanged for feuds and settled hostility during the reign of Dorimont. 
For that ambitious monarch cherished designs of rendering the land of rocks tributary to his kingdom, and having been secretly informed of certain iron mines in a glen among the Black Mountains, he offered to yield his claim upon the hand of a fair lady whom Albinian had fallen desperately in love with, on condition that this narrow veil should be annexed to his crown. The king of Rockland unguardedly accepted these terms, but afterwards refused to ratify his part of the treaty, having learned, as he declared, that Torremont was covertly preparing to make war on his dominions. It was reported, however, that he had been influenced in this matter by the sorceress queen of Tigridia, who foretold that a mighty conqueror should arise in a craggy vale among the black mountains containing veins of iron. Dorimont inveighed loudly against the bad faith of Albinian, which he secretly hoped he should soon be in a condition to punish, for after deserting the lady to whom he had been betrothed, he espoused the heiress of Gemaura, a district which lay between Palmland and the kingdom of Almatera, fully expecting to find the desired metals in his new territory. But a spell seemed cast upon this region from the hour that it came into his hands, and though he had reason to know that both iron and copper had once been found there, he died without discovering the object of his search. On his decease, however, the discord which he had sedulously fomented between his subjects and their neighbors did not subside. The first were very scantily supplied with instruments of war, and the others were dependent on the fields and pastures of a rich country called Almatera for needful sustenance. But so enduring was the enmity which the measures of Dorimat had excited betwixt the two nations, that no regard to interest could restore their former friendly intercourse. Phantasmion revolved these things in his mind after hearing what fell from Cyrodiil. Dariel had formerly excited his curiosity concerning the land of rocks, and now he resolved to travel through it in disguise for the sake of making observations relative to war and still more from a hope of meeting with the lovely maiden whom he had rescued from her prison among the rocks. When he presented himself before Potentilla, the fairy fixed her eyes on his countenance and saw that there was more speculation in it than formerly. Give me, said he, the power to travel with great speed, yet in such a way that I may not outwardly appear to be thus gifted. Let me skip, like the grasshoppers, and those insects which can go at one bound many hundred times their own length. Potentilla touched his thighs with her wand and bade him try his new faculty. So Phantasmion gave a spring and vaulted above a quarter of a mile, darting over a clump of young palm trees to alight in a verdant lawn. The prince gave out that he was going to travel, and all the court imagined that he meant to visit Cyrodiil in Gemmaura, which he had never entered since the death of his mother. Before daybreak he took horse, and sallied forth alone, habited after the fashion of Rockland, the language and customs of which country he had learnt from his nurse, and also from Dariel. He wore a tight vest of purple silk, embroidered with golden vine leaves, a jeweled girdle encircled his waist, and he exchanged his tiara for a cap adorned with a single arcing feather of many hues. In his hand he carried a hollow reed of thin gold, with a serpent twisted round it. The folds of the snake held gold and jewels, and in the body of the wand a nutritious conserve was deposited. Thus equipped, Phantasmion rode forth to the river Mediana, the banks of which had formerly been fringed with olive trees, even to the skirts of the hills. Now leafless stumps alone were to be seen by the riverside, the vineyards which the prince passed on his way to the boundary stream appeared to have been laid waste, for all the plants were lying on the ground, torn and trampled into the earth, and, in the rich pastures, for miles around, not a sheep or heifer was cropping the tall grass. 
On the rockland side of the stream, at the foot of a hill which ended the range of the Black Mountains, was a fortified town called Lathra. Phantasmian eyed the lofty walls and turrets and deep moat by which it was surrounded, and determined to overleap them all at a bound. He stood upright on the back of his steed and impelled himself forward. In a moment, he was shooting over the housetops, and instantly afterwards, a tremendous crash was in his ears, while fragments, sharp as glass, were entering into his flesh. The leaper had come down upon a stand of sumptuous porcelain exposed for sale. The owners all stood aghast while he endeavored to glide away, but soon recovering from their amazement, the whole crowd bustled after him as a swarm of wasps rushes out indignantly when a stone has been flung by wanton children into their pensile nest, and all their delicate architecture has been crushed in a moment. They hem round the prince. The ring grows smaller and smaller. Still, each man waits for his neighbor to seize the mysterious culprit, and ere the circle has closed upon him, Phantasmion has sprung away, and having cleared many a lofty edifice, he is now alighting in another quarter of the town. To avoid a fresh crowd which began to collect around him, he slipped into a large building, the door of which was standing ajar, and found that he had entered an armory, the walls being covered with weapons fancifully arranged, and the floor with piles of bucklers and breastplates. The attention of the prince was riveted by a magnificent sword which lay beside a suit of armor of extraordinary size. The master of the magazine, seeing his inquisitive countenance, told him that they belonged to Glendreth, who had conquered the country of Tigridia for King Albinian. And that large helmet, surmounted with a white plume, is that to be worn by the same person? the youth inquired. That too is for Glendreth, replied the keeper of the arms. Queen Mandra placed those feathers in it with her own hand. Thou art from court and must know more of courtly affairs than I, but it is plain to the whole country that the conqueror of Tigridia has ruled both the state and the queen's heart ever since the king grew decrepit. Phantasmion went forth, and, leaving the town, advanced toward a field where men, wild beasts, and cattle appeared to be strangely mingled together. Drawing nigh to the scene of action, he perceived that a band of tigers were performing certain movements on signals given them by men with spears in their hands. Obedient to the word of command, they surrounded the sheep and kine, separated them into divisions, and drove them to different parts of the field with as much skill as a shepherd's dog will collect his master's flock on the mountains. A countryman was looking on by the side of Phantasmion. I hear, said he, that there is little booty to be got now in the tract about the river. Doubtless our captains will march up to King Phantasmion's palace next and see what can be made prize of there. Aha! cried Phantasmion, much startled and ready to give one of his enormous leaps. He restrained himself, however, and carelessly observed, I knew not that tigers were bred in this land. The rustic stared as he replied, Sure thou hast heard how Maldoril, the queen's mother, sent them from Tigridia, where they abound in the brakes and forests? The prince made no reply, but directed his steps toward a woody knoll, which he espied at a distance, and having reached the bottom of it, instead of slowly winding his way to the top, he gained it at one bound, and there stretched himself at full length, on dry moss underneath the trees. How have I been living, thought he, like an animal in its winter burrow, wrapped in luxury, without hearing or seeing aught of what went on around me. I will spring back to guard my palace. Nay, I will make war upon Glendreth, and my numerous army shall cover the battle plain. Army, alas! Can men armed with slings and cudgels deserve that name? No, it is best to pursue my original intent. I will survey this injurious, this faithless country, 
as an eagle eyes the flock on which he means to descend. I will take my way through Almaterra. Dariel was wont to say that a little effort would suffice to snap the ties which bind that state to this. Yes, yes, I will seek the king and the chiefs of the adjoining country, and having gained allies there, I will return to my own kingdom and be a monarch indeed. Instantly, after Phantasmion had uttered these last words to himself, the small cunning eye of a serpent met his view. The creature looked in his face as if divining his very thoughts, while it lay coiled up under the fallen leaves of a bay tree. As soon as the prince raised his head, the snake began to move its forked tongue and seemed to emit sparks of fire from its eyes. Whereupon Phantasmion started from his mossy couch, and having leaped from the top of the wooded hill to the plain below, found himself close upon that wide sheet of water which he had formerly seen from the craggy mountain, when he followed the steps of the departing damsel. Toward the banks of this lake he swiftly proceeded, and came opposite to a large island covered with tall trees of gloomy green, over which rose battlements and pinnacles and frowning towers. The waters of the lake seemed to be very deep, so dark was their aspect, and two craggy islets, at nearly equal distances, emerged from its bosom betwixt the large island and the shore. Phantasmion skipped to these isles of crag, one after another, and looked like some gay water bird alighted on a rock with glistening plumage as he stood on the dusky islet with his arched feather waving to and fro. From that station he had a fair view of the large island and saw that within its pebbly margin there rose a fence of interwoven hollies, like a jasper colonnade on a white marble pavement. This firm bank Phantasmion was just able to attain by a leap, and no sooner had he gained it than his attention was arrested by a soft, melancholy voice, liquid and musical as the chime of crystal cups thrilled by a dewy finger. He drew nigh the fence, and though unable to catch a glimpse of the singer through the close hollies, he heard these words of the song. Though I be young, ah, well a day, I cannot love these opening flowers, for they have each a kindly spray to shelter them from the suns and showers. But I may pine, oppressed with grief, robbed of my dear protecting leaf. Since thou art gone, my mother sweet, I weep to see the fledgling doves close nestling in a happy seat, each beside the breast it loves while I, uncared for, sink to rest far, far from my fond mother's breast. Sweet mother, in thy blessed sight, I too might blossom full and free. Heaven then would beam with softer light, but could I rest upon thy knee, my drooping head, what need I care, how sickly pale and wan I were. My face I view in pools and brooks, when garish suns full brightly shine, ah, me, think I, those blooming looks, and that smooth brow can ne'er be mine. Sad heart, I charge thee to express more truly all thy deep distress. Deceitful roses leave my cheek, soft lilies join those happy flowers, which nothing stirs but zephyr meek, which naught oppresses but sweet showers, while she lies dead, I grieve to be more like those living flowers than she. Here there was a pause in the soft strain, and Phantasmion, looking on the lake, descried some fishermen in a vessel just come within sight. He eagerly hailed them, and while they approached the shore, he heard the song thus continued. Oh, what to me are landscapes green? with groves and vineyards sprinkled o'er, and gardens where gay plants are seen, to form a daily changing floor, I dream of waters and of waves, the tide which thy sea-dwelling laves. Dearly I love the hours of night, when bashful stars have leave to shine, for all my visions rise in light, while sunlit spectacles decline, and with those stars they fade away, 
or look as glowworms look by day. End of part one, chapter five. Part one, chapter six of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one, chapter six. Phantasmion pays a second visit to the king's island. Phantasmion leaped into the boat when it approached the shore, requesting the fishermen to convey him to the further end of the lake, and while the vessel was receding he listened, in rapt attention, to the music of that plaintive song which floated over the water, accompanied by the soft symphony of the dipping oars. His conductors eyed him in silent surprise, and, guessing that he was a person of condition, they held their peace and continued to row from the island. When the melody was no longer audible, Phantasmion asked an old man who was sitting at the bottom of the boat, busy with his tackle, if he knew who it was that sang on the large wooded island. Aye, Mary, replied he. The voice was that of Irene, the fair daughter of our king. Irene, exclaimed the prince. And dwells Irene in yonder castle? he inquired, pointing to the towers which were yet visible above the trees in the distance. That is the summer abode of the queen and her aged consort, replied the old man. Is the king aged? rejoined Phantasmion. He looks as if he were, answered the fisherman, but that comes more of sickliness than of years. He is feeble in mind and body, but his wife reigns manfully in his stead, aided by a valiant general, and other helpers belike, which to us are unknown and invisible. These last words were spoken in a low tone, and Phantasmia thought of the crowned lady and her strange companion on the seashore. I am a stranger in this land, observed he after a while. So long have I been absent from it, but, methinks, I recollect that the king had another wife before he espoused the princess of Tigridia. That beauteous dame, said the old man, perished at sea, leaving the sweet Irene to deplore her loss. Has Queen Modra children of her own? the prince inquired. His informant replied, she has two, and one of them is still a babe in his nurse's arms. This same infant was carried away by an eagle to its nest on the highest peak of the Black Mountains, and the fair princess Irene climbed up among the crags and rescued him from the airy. She had been playing with him in a field at the foot of the hill, when the fierce bird descended from the rocks to seize her little charge and in the evening she reappeared with a babe in her arms, just as the king's household began to fear that both were lost forever. The island was now far in the distance, and the fishermen inquired where the princely stranger desired to be put on shore. Phantasmian asked the owner of the boat if he could afford him hospitality for the rest of that day, and a night's lodging and the old man made answer that he was able and willing to do so, even without the payment which the youth offered. His younger comrades now impelled the boat swiftly onward, and, passing a tiny tufted islet, over against which stood the fisherman's cottage on a pleasant green bank, the vessel was brought up to a little stone pier right opposite to the door of that lowly dwelling. Phantasmion entered the rustic abode, and partook of the humble fare which it afforded, then went forth again, having told the fisherman and his dame that he meant to return and rest under their roof that night. He wandered along the banks of the lake, directing his steps toward that part of them whence he could obtain a full view of the king's island. And now the sun went down, and the luster of a summer's day, which had drowned all things in a flood of hazy brightness, gave place to the distinct splendor of moonlight, when the hills looked like masses of ebony, 
and seemed for the first time to exhibit their true forms and bulk while standing out in bold relief against the deep, clear sky. Phantasmion gazed not on them, but kept looking towards the island, for the melancholy strain which he had lately heard there was yet sounding in his ears and connected itself with the fair countenance which was constantly present to his mind. On the side of the wooded isle which he now beheld, Phantasmion espied no verdurous wall of interlacing boughs, but a margin fringed with broad alders and bending willows. While his eye was fixed on that grove, he saw a small narrow boat issue from amid the boughs, which drooped into the water and flit across the lake. It was impelled by a youthful maiden whose braided tresses shone in the moonlight. She entered a little inlet where the water looked black as pitch, the trees leaning over and hiding it from the moonbeams. Phantasmion stood in the shadow of the birchen grove, behind the narrow bay, and watched her motions. The damsel leaned over the edge of the boat and dipped into the dusky basin a net that seemed to be composed of flaming wires. The prince expected to see those flames quenched, but they glowed and flashed in their liquid shrine, like fiery water snakes illuminating the cove and making the moonbeams that rested on the lake beyond appear of a greenish, chrysolite color. Shoals of little fish, with many colored bodies, were attracted by the light. Up they came and crowded into the net, so that the maiden appeared to be catching live jewels instead of fish. When her net was full, the lady poured her draught of glittering fishes into a silver pitcher of water, which stood on the bench of the boat ready to receive them. Phantasmion gazed earnestly upon her, and knew that she was that same fair damsel whom he had met upon the mountain. But now she appeared more brightly beautiful than when he found her weeping beside the rushing cataract. Her face looked placid as marble, and those features on which the ruddy light of the magical net was playing seemed as if they ought never to have been cast in perishable clay. Dazzling in whiteness were the lady's rounded arms extended over the pool, and her graceful neck, on which no jewels shone, was polished and smooth as alabaster, but with a look of soft, downy depth which art cannot imitate. Her bright locks no longer floated to her waist, but were coiled round the back part of her head. Even from her open brow the ringlets were strained away, and only a few tendrils, escaping from confinement, lay upon her cheeks and forehead. Having filled her net once more and loaded her pitcher, the damsel began to push the boat out of the cove by means of a long pole. While thus engaged, she looked up, and espying the figure of Phantasmion as he stood under the birch trees just above the bay, she started and hastened her movements. Then, flinging down the pole, she seized the oars and began to row with all speed toward the island. This was done before Phantasmion had summoned resolution to speak or stir. Now she was in the deep water, yet still within the limits of his vaulting powers, but he restrained himself from leaping into the lake. A little way further on was a vessel which, by some accident, had got loose from its moorings and was drifting about in the water. He leapt into it and thus nearly upset the narrow skiff, which quivered with a sudden shock, but when it steadied again, he caught up the oars and rowed to the wooded isle. Having arrived within a certain distance, he sprang to land among the willows, leaped over an alder grove, and beheld the maiden at the end of a long alley of cypresses, bearing on her head the silver pitcher, the polished surface of which reflected the moonlight. One arm supported the vessel, the other held aside her long white garments and disclosed her twinkling feet, brightened by the harmless flames of the magic net, which was grasped in the same hand that contained the folds of her light robe. Oh, what grace of motion was there! The black firs and cypresses which stood in the moonshine, stern and grand, like stony effigies of trees, the delicate acacias that hung their boughs in graceful attitudes, 
ready to sway to and fro on the slightest impulse, all seemed to recognize her as one of themselves, a being unsullied and perfect in the simplicity of nature. Something of this Phantasmion may have felt, but he thought not of trees or of moonshine, and knew not whether it were day or night. He was busily measuring the distance between himself and the damsel. But, even as a silvery beam from a lamp which some night passenger carries in his hand will travel across the ceiling of an unlighted room, attracting the eye of one who sits idly musing in the darkness, so did the damsel gleam, glide, and vanish through the avenue of black shadows, and Phantasmion stood motionless, while swift thoughts were passing and repassing through his mind. He hesitated to follow the maiden along the walk, which wound circularly about the island, but, espying a light amid the foliage, he darted through the trees into a smooth lawn, across which he beheld a tower separate from the main body of the castle. The lower half of this building was hidden by shrubs, but, just above the screen, projected a balcony, over the rails of which a lady in sumptuous attire was leaning and looking eagerly down upon the path below. A diadem was on her brow, and the rich train of her purple robe swept the marble platform. Beads of gold were twined around her bony arms, while numerous carcanets and chains of sparkling jewels hung from her neck over the balusters. That lady's lineaments were queen-like, though harsh and worn, but hers was the aspect of no kindly dame, and on such a countenance of ungentle emotion the moon's calm ray seldom rests. Irene, she exclaimed, hast thou found them? Quicken thy pace! And now Phantasmion espied the damsel, with the pitcher on her head, mounting the higher steps of the balcony stairs. A moment afterwards she was gone, having entered the tower with the crowned lady. Then, the door being closed, and the light of the inner apartment hidden, Phantasmion was left alone with the trees and the half-shrouded moon. "'That voice, that diadem, that gorgeous train!' exclaimed the youth. "'Full, surely! This is the passionate dame who sate discoursing with that strange woman of the deep. They spake of poisonous fish. Oh, can this maiden, who looks too fair and good to dwell below the sky, can she be the base instrument of wicked wills? Nay, nay, she is herself beguiled, perchance to be the victim of treacherous hatred. He gazed on the dark tower, and had resolved to gain admittance by force or stratagem, when a file of armed men advanced through the trees into the lawn, talking loud and peering about as if in search of someone. From a few words which came to his ear, Phantasmion guessed that he had been descried from the castle, and that the guard were come to lay hands on him. He glided off amid the trees, while the clouds were veiling the moon's light, and found his way by the margin of the isle to that same spot which he had visited in the morning. From the bank of pebbles he bounded to the first of the craggy islets, thence to the second, and from that again to the shore of the mainland. The moon was driving off her veil when Phantasmion thus crossed the water, and when he stood on the shore, having the woody knoll right before him, she had thrown it completely aside. The prince resolved on returning to the fisherman's hut by the side of the lake opposite to that which he had lately traversed, so that he should have gone completely round the whole sheet of water by the time that he reached the cottage, from which its situation he felt sure of recognizing. He skirted the lake closely, being obliged now and then to leap over parts of the shore which it would have been troublesome to pass step by step, and in this way he came to a river, which he concluded was on its way to join the sea upon the right hand. The stream was wide where it issued out of the lake, and looked deep and turbid. Phantasmion prepared to spring across, but checked himself and paused for a few moments, surveying the opposite bank, and endeavoring to ascertain its nature. While standing thus on the river's brim, he felt something cold and slimy touching his foot between the straps of the sandal, and soon a slippery hand glided up his leg where it was bare, 
the tight vest having been rent by thorns during his journey. Phantasmion had no time to consider what this might be, for the touch was as that of a torpedo, and he had received an electrical shock which benumbed his whole body. While he stood stupefied and motionless, again he felt the terrible hand grasping his leg and attempting to drag him into the river. Then, throwing down the serpent wand, he hastily drew his sword and smote that which was pulling at his leg, whereupon a hissing sound, such as a snake might send forth when crushed by a stone, issued from the water, which was tinged for a moment with blood. Phantasmion looked down and beheld the flat white face of the fishy woman, Sishelma, glistening in the moonlight. She leaned backward in the tide as if she were faint with pain, and her great glassy eyes appeared fixed and rigid. But when they stared on him that had inflicted the wound, they seemed to express more of slow malice than of any keen sensation. Soon, however, she gathered strength and turning about began to dive away into the deeper water. Phantasmion seized her blue locks, but they slipped out of his hand, while the air was filled with cries of menace or of mockery, and numberless grotesque visages, staring out of the water, gleamed momently in the twilight. The prince staggered and fell, for he had received another severe shock, from which, having at length recovered, he saw nothing but the image of the moon's face on the stream, and heard no sound but the soft, full murmur of an unimpeded current smoothly sweeping by. End of Part 1, Chapter 6「Part 1, Chapter 7 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 7 After passing the night in a thicket, Phantasmion talks with Telza, the nurse of Irene. For some time after he had grasped the locks of Sishelma, Phantasmion felt as if his limbs were frozen, and, on attempting once more to spring across the river, he found that his leaping powers were suspended. No boat was at hand, or to be seen within hail. He dared not trust himself in the waters of that haunted stream, but, feeling desirous of rest, he resolved to make his bed for the remainder of the night in a grove of oaks and beeches, a little way removed from the borders of the lake and river. On arriving in this thicket, he seemed to have entered a dim chamber, so close and leafy were the boughs that composed it, and the moss on which he reclined, beneath the boughs of an oak, made an easy couch. But no sooner had he lain down than he seemed to hear the hum of a spinning wheel, turned by someone in the dark, and the importunate bird, which produced that sound from her gaping throat, kept flying round his head and striking her wings together sonorously. After preserving in this course for some time, she would perch on a bough just above the prince's head and utter two or three short, sharp notes as though a thorn were piercing her bosom. It was in vain to scare the bird away, for she still returned, and at last, in spite of her noise and restlessness, Phantasmion fell half asleep, and thus reposed till he was completely awakened by a still more impetuous clapping of pinions, and a vehement whistling close to his face. The youth arose, and, by a glimmer of the moon's light, which pierced the branchy covert, he descried a glistering snake, and the speckled nightjar, with her great bill wide open, pouring out her angry murmur over the silent reptile's head. He drew the sword from his girdle and cut the serpent in pieces. Then, stooping down to examine its severed head, he espied a nest in the little hollow betwixt the roots of the oak tree, and thus discovered the cause of that poor bird's uneasiness for she had first been driven from her nest by Phantasmion's approach, and was afterwards in trepidation at the appearance of the reptile. She imagined, indeed, that it came to suck her unprotected eggs, while the prince believed it to be some emissary of Sushelma, who seemed bent on procuring his death or driving him out of Rockland. 
and when he had looked at the several pieces of the dead snake in a fuller light, and saw that it closely resembled that which prepared to attack him in the woody knoll, this opinion was strengthened. The youth advanced a little further in the wood to climb a beech tree, and when the nightjar was settled on her nest, he had stretched himself along one of its wide flat boughs, the upper ones forming a canopy over his head. Here he slept till break of day, and was then roused by the twittering of birds all around him. When he first entered the grove, it seemed to have no other inhabitants than the disturbed mother and himself, but now every tree was alive with chirping voices and moving pinions. Phantasmion was little inclined to join the vocal choir, being ill at ease in his whole frame. He felt so anxious indeed concerning his bodily condition that he must needs climb further up the tree to make trial of his strength, and found it in some degree restored. From the top of the tall beech he cast his eyes over the lake, which wore a uniform coloring of sad blue, while motionless bars of gray clouds shrieked the horizon and all the landscape was revealed under a cold equalizing light. The youth at that hour felt a transitory despondence, and his beautiful visions seemed to have departed with the sublime shadows and spiritual splendor of midnight. From his lofty station, Phantasmion beheld the fisherman in his boat and hailed him with a shout that woke the echoes, at the same time beckoning with his serpent wand. Well pleased was the old man to hear that salutation, having come out thus early in search of his guest, for whose safety he had begun to entertain some fear. The prince descended from the tree, and, repairing to the boat which was soon brought to land, he seated himself at the stern and requested to be conveyed to the cottage. He told his ancient host that he had been seized with cramp, and, feeling still much disordered, should be glad to remain under his roof till he should find himself in a condition to resume his journey. The old man renewed his former hospitable offers, and, rowing faster than he had done for many a day, quickly brought the vessel to the little stone pier. Passing the greensward, now wet with morning dew, Phantasmion entered the cottage and was kindly welcomed by Telza, the fisherman's ancient dame, who had stood on the landing place, straining her eyes to ascertain whether the noble youth were with her husband, and as soon as she discerned him in the boat, had hastened within to prepare for his reception. Phantasmion was refreshed with the food which she set before him, and happening to fix his eye on the porcelain vessel in which it was served, was told they were the gift of the Princess Irene, to whom Telza had been a fond and faithful nurse. No sooner was that subject opened, than the good old woman had more to say than she had time to utter, and the prince felt no desire to stir from her side, while she enlarged on the charms of Irene's babyhood. In very truth, said she, I was the luckiest nurse that ever rocked a cradle, and little need was there to rock the cradle of sweet Irene. Oh, she would sleep so beautifully for hours together, without a start or a murmur, yet looking as lifesome all the while as that clear lake which never seems so bright as when it sleeps in the sunshine. Then, when it was her time to awake, in a moment she was full of smiles, her pretty eyes wide open suddenly, and sparkling like the little merry rivulets which never sleep at all. We thought she could not be meant to pass through this veil of tears, because she wept so little at the beginning of her pilgrimage. But now I fear she weeps enough, and more sadly and stealthily than she need ever have done in my arms. Is it not several years since she lost her mother? inquired the youth. To me, it seems but yesterday, Telza replied. But to one so young as Irene, the time must appear full long, and the loss might ere now have been forgotten, had it been kindly repaired. How did Queen Anthemina meet her death? said Phantasmion. She perished at sea, was the answer. 
in sailing to the Isle of Birds, where a gay entertainment was appointed to be held. I cannot tell thee all the rumors that were afloat at the time, but now I verily believe that evil spirits lent their aid in drowning that lady, for since she sank beneath the waves, they, and they only, have ruled this land. Was the first queen beautiful? asked the prince. Oh, what could be more beautiful? exclaimed Telza. Unless it be her most fair child, Irene. I have her now before me, just as she appeared on the day of that ill-starred expedition. Her gleaming jetty tresses were bound with pearls. Alas, she little thought how soon those pearls would be restored to the deep. And, wreathed around her snow-white vest, was a garland of blue lilies, fresh gathered from the lake. How well I remember the splendid lady raising her eyes to the child in my arms. My pretty one, said she, are they not beautiful? And she pointed to those starry flowers. Beautiful indeed were blue eyes beneath black eyebrows, but soon they swam in tears as if that moment she had a presage of her doom. The sweet child had no presentiment. She laughed and hid her face behind me as I set her on the floor, though charmed to see her mother's festal ornaments. And oh, how mirthfully she laughed again, when, lifting up a loose part of the lady's robe, she spied a silver vessel hanging by a silken cord. Telza would have proceeded much longer in this strain, but the fisherman beckoned her away and she left the cottage, whereupon Phantasmion stepped out of doors and gazed upon the lake absorbed in thought. For many furlongs beyond the stone pier on which he seated himself, the smooth sod came close down to the edge of the water, and now that the sun shone brightly, the greensward and its reflection seemed all one piece. But soon that picture began to be filled with figures which, emerging from a coppice, stole into the verdant foreground, while no steps were heard upon the noiseless turf. Palfreys with courtly riders were occupying the green space, and the mirror showed that one of them carried a silver vessel. Phantasmion looked up and saw that Telza had now joined the distant group, and that she was standing beside a lady who leaned forward on her steed to speak with her. In a few moments the train were winding through the coppice, while the fisherman's dame, smiling cheerfully, crossed the greensward and approached her guest, who was still sitting on the pier. "'Oh, that thou hast seen my fair princess!' she cried. "'The morning air has decked her cheeks with dazzling roses, and now she looks as lightsome as when she was my nursling and had never shed a tear.' The face of the young prince grew deeply red at these words of Telza, and when she added, A sweet lady is going to visit her mother's sister, the wife of Magnart in Almatera. He started from his seat and eagerly inquired what had become of the fisherman. He is going to the king's island, replied the dame, and she pointed to his boat, which was yet within sight. Then the youth sat down upon the pier to watch for his return, and Telza seated herself by his side, hoping in the meantime to have him for a listener. Looking at the island, which was just visible in the distance, she said in a low voice, All the country believes that Albinian was bewitched when he wedded the daughter of Maldoril, whom Glendreth brought a captive from Tigridia. Scarce a month of that marriage had elapsed, when the king fell into decrepitude, and Glandreth became the real sovereign of the land. My husband oft compares Queen Modra to those evil spirits that allure men first and put them in bail afterwards. There is a little boy in the boat with thy helpmate, cried Phantasmion, when at last he beheld a fisherman coming from the island. Yes, replied Telza, that is Albinet, the king's eldest son. Irene grieves to part with the poor child, 
and she prayed my husband to amuse him on the lake this fine morning. See there, he is guiding the rod, which the young prince holds in his hand. Ah, now a fish comes out of the water, and poor Albinet fancies that he has caught it. How quietly the good old man drew his hand away, and left the rod and line, and the prize at the end of it, in the young one's possession. But the boy is lame, cried the prince. What strange motions he makes in trying to leap for joy. Till he was four years old, cried Telza, mournfully. That child throve and grew like mown grass after the rain. One evening he played alone by the lakeside, and from that hour he has been palsied and sickly. Home he came, looking all aghast, like one that had seen a spirit, and verily I believe that he met with something more than the damp air and biting gales of the season. End of Part 1 Chapter 7Part 1, Chapter 8 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 8 Phantasmion is guided by the fisherman to Polyanthida. Phantasmion was glad when he saw young Albinet lifted into a boat which was sent to take him back to the island, and he loudly hailed the kind old man who attended to his summons, and was soon standing beside him on the stone pier. "'My good host,' cried the youth, "'canst thou conduct me to the house of Manyart in Almatera?' "'That I can, right easily,' the fisherman replied. "'I oft go thither to sell fish, "'for we have a delicate sort in our lake, "'which is found nowhere else, "'and the women of these parts "'have a choice method of preserving them with spices.' It is well, replied the youth. I feel myself able to pursue my journey this very hour, and am desirous to reach the place I told thee of by the nearest road. The nearest road, replied the old man, is a rugged one. It lies among the black mountains, but it would bring thee to Almatera some time before they, who are winding through the plain, will reach it. The prince was glad to become acquainted with the passes of the country, and still more he exulted in the hope of being speedily brought to the presence of the island princess. Find me a good mule, cried he, which cares not for rough ways, and as well as he plays his part shall I play mine. Before the sun began to slant down his westerly path, Phantasmion and his ancient guide seated on mules as sure-footed as rock goats, but far more discreet and serious were ascending a zigzag road along a ridge of the Black Mountains. Telza had furnished them with provisions. The beasts knew every step of the journey even better than the guide, and thus the travelers wound their way for several days over the sides of the hills and through bleak valleys, resting at night under the brow of a rock or in the scanty shelter of weather-beaten pine trees. At last they reached a deep gully, where the mountains reared their black fronts on either side, abrupt and steep, as if the double range had formerly been one, and had been split asunder by lightning. The blue sky formed a bright roof to these grim walls, which the sun vainly strove to illumine, and was the only sight that relieved the eye from the sameness of gloom except a rivulet which labored along the bottom of the glen, moaning audibly in the summer silence, its weak voice intercepted by no sound of beast or bird or busy insect. "'Yon falcon comes from Palmland,' observed the guide. "'See where she flies over the crags on the left hand? Doubtless her nest is hid among those airy battlements.' "'A wise bird,' cried the youth. She keeps on the borders of a plentiful land, yet rears her young securely in a barren desert. This glen will be an utter solitude when we have left it. His comrade smiled as he answered, Thinkest thou that we have no living neighbors, but the falcon and her brood? Then come this way. 
curious to know the meaning of the old man's smile, Phantasmion followed him to the edge of a pit, the black mouth of which he had taken for the shadow of rocks, and heard a noise as he approached, like thunder imprisoned beneath his feet. The calm looks of his guide assured him that no earthquake was coming on, and, lying down so as to bring his ear over the darksome gulf, he began to distinguish loud laments in diverse languages, wicked words and piercing outcries, shouts of anger, accents of woe, and, mingled with tyrannical voices, the resonance of blows, the clank of chains, and the crashing of rocks. All these noises reverberated a hundredfold through the windings of the subterranean abode and composed a whirlwind of sounds which smote the listener's ear with horror as it rolled upwards through the black abyss. "'What place of torture is here?' exclaimed the youth, retreating from the chasm. "'This is the famous iron mine,' his guide made answer. "'The same that caused such feuds between our king and his ancient ally. Glandreth discovered what riches these rocks contained, while following his father's stray goats up the glen. Forthwith, he stole across the hills into Palmland, and sold his secret to King Dorimant. This, and naught but this, was the foundation of his grandeur. Now he uses the mine both as a place of punishment and of safe custody. Hither he sends his captives from foreign lands, all public malefactors, and all of every age and sex and rank who trespass against his lawless will. Phantasmion proceeded somewhat thoughtfully, but ere long he had ceased to think of Glandreth, how he began or how he maintained his fortunes, and was musing on the bright Lady Anthemina, whom Dorimund had abandoned for the sake of this bleak veil, and whose wrongs he resented the more from having unconsciously clothed her with the form and countenance of Irene. The travellers continued to follow the stony path, and, on emerging at last from the mountain gorge, surveyed the prospect as little, like the savage wilderness that had brought them to it, as the young monarch's dream of love and joy resembled the warlike projects by which he hoped to realize that soft and radiant vision. Turning round a broad rock, they beheld the veil of Polyanthida, vested in sunny green, luxuriant with orange groves, meadows of golden bloom and sloping gardens, whence the rainbow might have borrowed all its colors. From the high ground where the travelers stood, they looked down upon a bright blue lake, partly girt by hills of soft, wavy outline, clad in freshest verdure, to which an amethystine tinge was imparted by blossoms of the fragrant thyme. The skirts of these grassy hills were bathed by the water, while on the opposite side was a thick wood, stretching beyond the rocky shores, which looked as if they had been carved by a graver's chisel, and formed bays and promontories overhung, here and there with knots of drooping trees. The well-attired valley seemed to smile on the lake which smiled radiantly in return, as a conscious beauty, beaming on her lover, causes his face to brighten with pleasure and hope. The little brook, too, which had murmured so fretfully in the darksome pass, now gushed with a wider stream, arrayed in sparkling white, and bounded to the lake, raising a gladsome cry, as if of thankfulness at having escaped from those torturing rocks and that dreary prison. Where is the mansion of Magnart? inquired Phantasmion, charmed by the view of this delicious region. Beyond that wood it rises, replied the fisherman. Verily, thou wilt find it as rich and noble a tenement as ever a groping miner found his way to. Time was, when Magnart and Glendreth dwelt with their father in a lowlier hut than mine. And how did they reach the height where we now see them? asked Phantasmion. Have I not told thee of the mine? replied the fisherman. Had they no natural gifts then? inquired the youth. Did the mine supply hands as well as materials? Gifts, cried the old man warmly. 
What need they natural gifts, who have supernatural helpmates? Moreover, they never scrupled to blast anything that stood in their way. And now I believe they would blast each other, if the power answered to the will. Discoursing thus, the youthful king and his guide pursued their way down the slanting path into the flowery vestibule of Almatera, and soon struck into the wood which lay between the lake and the dwelling of Magnart. They had not proceeded far in the woodland path, when Phantasmion stopped short, listening to a voice which struck him as having some resemblance to that of Irene. And looking down the wood, he descried a graceful maiden throwing garlands around the neck of a white stag. At this sight, the youth leaped from his mule, turned his glowing face to the old man, and hastily thanked him for his services, at the same time that he put into his girdle a handful of gold. "'Oh, thou hast overpaid me,' cried the fisherman. "'But shall I not guide thee to the goodly mansion?' No, said the prince, only take charge of my mule, and return, when thou wilt, to the black lake, bearing a kind remembrance from me to thy good dame. The prince added a jewel for Telza, to the gold already given to his guide, who, having by this time spied a lady in the wood, and thus gained a twilight glimpse of the youth's mind, bade him farewell, and proceeded to a neighboring village. Phantasmion advanced into the forest and, looking from behind an oak tree, beheld the slender damsel caressing the stag, whose white hide was dappled with minute shadows from a branch of aspen, the sunbeams finding their way through the interstices of its delicate foliage. The lady had intermitted her melody, but now resumed it, addressing thus her happy comrade, who seemed to be conscious that he was the subject of the strain. Sylvan stag, securely play, Tis the sportful month of May, Till her music dies away, Fear no huntsman's hollow. While the cowslip nods her head, While the fragrant blooms are shed, O'er the turf which thou dost tread, None thy traces follow. In the odors wafted round, Those that breathe from thee are drowned, Echo voices not a sound, Fleet one to dismay thee. On the budding beeches brows, None shall come the deer to rouse, Scattered leaves and broken boughs, Shall not now betray thee. Sylvan deer, on branches fed, Mid the countless branches bred, Mimic branches on thy head, With the rest are springing. Smooth them on the russet bark, O'er the stem of cypress dark, From whose top the woodland lark Soars to heaven singing. Here a livelier voice from another quarter of the forest, where the ground dipped into a dell, took up the strain and continued the song thus, as if in a spirit of gay mimicry. Bound along, or else be still, sportive roebuck at thy will, wilding rose and woodbine fill all the grove with sweetness. Safely may thy gentle row o'er the piney hillocks go, every white-robed torrent's flow, rivaling in fleetness. Peaceful breaks for thee the dawn, while thou leadest thy skipping fawn, gentle hind across the lawn, in the forest spreading. Morn appears in sober vest, nor hath eve in roses dressed, by her purple hues expressed, aught of thy blood shedding. The damsel was by this time seated on the projecting roots of a large tree, finishing a long wreath of flowers, while the stag lay beside her and seemed to watch her motions. She continued to murmur in a low key, but in unison with the voice which proceeded from the dell, and which was joined by one of deeper tone in these latter verses. Milk white doe, tis but the breeze, rustling in the alder trees, Slumber thou while honey bees lull thee with their humming. Though the ring dove's plaintive moan seem to tell of pleasure flown, on thy couch with blossoms sown, fear no peril coming. Thou, amid the lilies laid, seemst in lily vest arrayed, fanned by gales which they have made sweet with their perfuming. Primrose tufts, impearled with dew, 
Bells which heaven has steeped in blue, Lend the breeze their odors too, All around thee blooming. None shall come to scare thy dreams, Save perchance the playful gleams, Wake to quaff the cooling streams Of the sunlit river. Thou, across the faithless tide, Needest not for safety glide, Nor thy panting bosom hide Where the grasses shiver. When the joyous months are past, Roses pine in autumn's blast, When the violets breathe their last, All that's sweet is flying. Then the sylvan deer must fly, Mid the scattered blossoms lie, Fall with falling leaves and die, When the flowers are dying. But now the damsel, seated under the tree, arose and began tripping towards the lake. As she went on, she caught a glimpse of Phantasmian's figure among the trees, and sportively flung the stalks of flowers from her basket towards the place where he stood, crying aloud, Come, brother, quit thy melancholy humor. Thou wilt not lean all day against that gnarled oak when fair Irene is seen amongst us. These words, and the countenance of the speaker, dissipated the illusion which had made Phantasmian's heart beat so tumultuously. Fair and sweet was that youthful maiden, but only so far like Irene, as the wild bloom of Eglantine, dancing in every gale, resembles the splendid rose of a hundred petals. She took her way to a break, which was close beside the water, and Phantasmian resolved to follow her, for he surmised that she was one of Magnard's fair daughters, of whom Telza has spoken to him, and that by her he might be pleasantly introduced to the chief's household. Moving toward the break, he beheld the lady stoop down to gather marigolds, which grew far beneath the brambles, and he saw what she could not see, a panther masked by those briars. The beast had now advanced one paw from behind the bush, and was touching the earth with his white bosom, about to spring on the stag which seemed aware of its danger as it stood between the panther and the unconscious fair one. The sight restored Phantasmion to all his former agility. From the place where he stood, he leaped close up to the face of the glaring beast, which bounded back into the forest, and was out of sight ere the prince could draw his sword to dispatch it. After vainly pursuing it to some distance, he returned to the break, and saw the slender maiden lying in a swoon beside the brambles. Her flaxen hair was caught among the thorns, the basket of flowers lay overturned upon the sod, and one crimson blossom rested beside her colorless cheek. The gentle stag was standing beside her, looking down lovingly on her wan countenance, while the gay garlands yet hung from his neck. Phantasmian scooped water from the lake and sprinkled it upon her cheeks and brow, while he knelt beside her, she revived, and blushed on beholding the bright countenance that bent over hers. She withdrew her eyes from his face, and they rested on the blue scarf which was bound across his breast, and peeped from beneath his upper garment as he leaned forward. "'Didst thou know Dariel of Palmland?' she inquired, looking earnestly at the figures embroidered on the scarf. "'He was my dearest friend,' replied Phantasmion. "'And did he give thee that silken band?' asked the damsel fearfully. "'Alas!' cried the youth. "'I took it from my Dariel's corpse, and now am wearing it for his beloved's sake.' The lady closed her eyes and would have fallen to the ground, but Phantasmion's extended arms received her, and on recovering she led the way to that hollow glade whence the two voices that chimed in with her sylvan song had proceeded. The fair damsel advanced before the prince who, on entering the shady dell, espied another beauteous maiden seated on the bank, with her eyes cast down upon a picture that lay in her lap, while a slender youth was twining a chaplet of dewy lilies of the vale amid her raven tresses. Lucoya cried the maid, when she heard the rustle of leaves, but still without raising her eyes from the picture. See what a lovely wreath our Caradan has been making, though not without my aid. He now vouchsafes to try it upon me, but I fear it will have lost its freshness ere Irene comes to wear it. The youth had by this time dropped the chaplet on the ground. 
and was gazing with a bashful air on his sister's companion. And now the dark-haired lady caught sight of Phantasmion, and springing from her seat, came gaily forward, while the picture fell amid a heap of flowers. "'My sister!' she exclaimed. "'What has detained thee?' And so saying, she cast a hasty look with her bright black eyes at the stranger. Zelnith replied the damsel, "'But for this noble youth I might never have returned at all.' And then she related how Phantasmion had driven away the panther. On hearing this tale, the sprightly maiden melted into tears, and Caradan, forgetting his reserve, exclaimed, "'Would that I had been with thee, dear Lucoya! I thought I had slain the last panther which lurked in the forest.' Phantasmion looked somewhat sternly on him, who had been preparing a chaplet for the island maid, and Caradan appeared little delighted when the princely stranger, who called himself Semiro, a friend of their former guest Dariel, declared that he was bound for the house of Magnart. But Zelneth smiled blithely, her eyes glittering with tears, and thus she spoke. The house of Magnart is the house of our father, and Caradan will guide thee to it, kind Semiro. Come, dearest Lucoya, what will our mother say when she hears of thy jeopardy? Thou art as delicate and as dearly prized as the frail bloom of windflowers, which the first eager gale scatters abroad. Then the fair maidens arm in arm proceeded to their stately home, and the stag was left browsing amid a herd of deer. Phantasmion followed them along the varied scenes of a wide pleasure ground, and was conducted by Caradan to a splendid apartment where a man of dignified aspect reclined on a sofa. This comely personage wore a headdress adorned with jewels, and a superb scarf thrown over a pelisse composed of feather down, which gleamed with bright reflections, changing according to the play of light. The chief rose from his couch and courteously received the youth of noble demeanor who was presented by his son. Caradan then hastily departed. A pang of jealous fear shot across the heart of Phantasmion as he quitted the apartment, but the expectant face of Magnart recalled his wandering thoughts, and all his warlike plan was once more brought to mind. With grateful gesture and flowing utterance, he had soon told his story, professing that he was an envoy from Palmland, had travelled in disguise through the land of rocks, and was sent to learn whether his sovereign might hope for aid from the kings and chiefs of Almatera, should his country be invaded by its hostile neighbors. The countenance of Magnart brightened as Phantasmion spoke, and he received the tale exactly as it was told him, being apt to take all things which bore the image and superscription of his reigning desire without a scrutiny. "'Thy master's foes,' cried he, "'should be friends of mine.' Myself and Albinian married two daughters of Clerus, son of Thalimer, and that king's mighty general is mine own brother. Nevertheless, I will not uphold Glandreth in his overweening ambition. If he invades Palmland, he shall have to encounter me, and I will speak on thy master's behalf with the heads of this realm. It was plain that not ambition displeased Magnart, but the success which that of a rival had met with. Glandreth invaded Tigridia, said he, on a mere pretext, and now, forsooth, he is puffed up with his conquest and must give law to all the world. He threatens me doughtily, because I keep fast hold of Polyanthida in my wife's right. Who denies that one half was Anthemina's portion? Ill befall them that put away the mother, and would rob the daughter of her inheritance. Safely will I guard it for that precious child, till I can marry her to my eldest son. Phantasmion was more startled by these last words than if they had proclaimed designs upon the land of palms, and Magnart, seeing the youth's darkened brow, began to protest that this marriage would make no change in his policy and that Caradan would not fail to oppose any injustice which might be carried on in the name of his wife's father. But all his smooth words were as drops of hot lead to the feelings of his hearer, and while the chief swore that he would leave no stone unturned 
to annul the alliance between Almaterra and the land of rocks. Phantasmion thought of nothing but how to prevent that between Irene and Caradan. For this cause he thankfully accepted Magnard's invitation to pass that night under his roof. We have not quite settled the matter yet, said the self-pleasing noble, as he led his guest to another apartment, there to repose till supper time. Now heaven forbid, thought Phantasmion, that it be settled according to thy scheme, could I but see the minds of the other parties. In this hope I tarry here. Having donned fresh robes, he lay upon a sofa near an open door that led into the garden, and, musing on what his host had let fall, watched the shades of evening sadden the landscape, while Nightingale saluted her approach with varied song, till after a time this strain, breathed forth more earnestly than theirs, was borne upon the breeze. One face alone, one face alone these eyes require, but... When that longed foresight is shown, what fatal fire shoots through my veins a keen and liquid flame that melts each fibre of my wasting frame. One voice alone, one voice alone I pine to hear, but when its meek, mellifluous tone usurps mine ear, those slavish chains about my soul are wound, which ne'er till death itself can be unbound. One gentle hand, one gentle hand I fain would hold, but when it seems at my command, my own grows cold, then low to earth I bend in sickly swoon, like lilies drooping mid the blaze of noon. The song ceased, but Phantasmion heard not the nightingales, which still warbled in chorus, the voice of Caradan, thought he, a passionate rival, but sure that was no happy strain. He is gone, perhaps even now by her side. Oh, what vantage ground he has! Impelled by this agitating surmise, he advanced towards the other door, and met one who summoned him to Magnard's board. He followed the messenger, and entering the sumptuous hall, surveyed a spectacle which would have chased all former visions from many a youthful mind. A pyramid of flame suspended from the roof, drew out the deepest glow of crimson hangings, and they, in turn, cast rosy splendor on white marble pillars, images and rich utensils glittering all around, while overhead the lofty ceiling so vividly portrayed heaven's vault that it seemed as if the buoyant forms that floated there, looking translucent amid golden ether and spurning the clouds with their feet, were soon to vanish in the skyey depths. From the hand of one a posy was falling back to earth, and the scattered flowers, which caught the light as they descended, shone like meteors. In the center of the hall stood a table covered with fruits, wines, and viands, contained in vessels of crystal and gold, among which was a taller one of silver. Arzine, the wife of Magnart, was seated at the board, apparelled as beseemed her queenly figure, which time had ripened into a new aspect of comeliness, ere it had lost all the graces of youth. Zelneth sate next, with one full arm resting on the table, while the other held a chaplet of faded lily bells, which she was displaying to her mother when Phantasmion entered the hall. No tresses drooped over her cheek of rich carnation, or veiled the brilliance of her large and liquid eyes, but the raven hair that loosely waved around her head rested on the white expanse below in massy curls, like the volutes of a pillar, and, descending below the gilded cincture's deep recess, wandered along the falls and risings of her soft, luxuriant form. Lucoya's figure, easy and graceful as the sapling ash, was seen bending over her mother's chair. Her quiet eyes, gleaming through a shower of light ringlets, were fixed on the countenance of Zelneth, and one staid smile responded to the quick motions of her sister's face, which was incessantly rippling and sparkling beneath the breeze of mirthful fancy. Caradan stood on the other side of Arzine, with his countenance turned away from the table. He held in his hand a javelin, and pretended to be wholly occupied in examining its sharp point, or trying the strength of the nether end by striking it against the marble floor. But half-smiles and flitting blushes, 
which passed over his dark cheeks and brow and beamed for a moment in his full black eye evinced that the sallies of his blithe sister had not missed their mark at the lower end of the board sate maniart and he too was smiling and showing so goodly an aspect that how he gained polyathida by winning the heart of that noble heiress appeared to be no deep mystery a blooming boy sate on his knee and leaned forward with both his arms on the table to catch the jests of zelneth at which he laughed louder than all the company till on spying phantasmion he sprang from his father's knee and ran up to him exclaiming our cousin is not come unkind queen modra hermilion hold thy peace cried zelneth while her brow assumed that lofty air which naturally belonged to it but which the smiles of youth and gaiety were continually charming away our beloved irene returned home of her own accord when the messenger was sent to tell her of her father's illness all a false pretense i dare be sworn murmured the boy as he quitted the apartment rushing past the prince whom at first he had taken for one of his familiar acquaintances the current of phantasmion's blood seemed for a moment to be arrested by young hermilion's announcement but he made an effort to conceal his feelings and when he looked on the graceful figure of caradan he almost felt glad that irene was not there to behold it too arzine courteously invited him to join the repast and seating himself at the table he entered into discourse with her and her fair daughters zelneth continued her gay smiles though more chary of her words than before the approach of the noble stranger and lucoya's soft brown eyes that swam in silvery lustre gazed on the youth when he spoke to others but when he turned his bright glances on herself were bashfully withdrawn to rest on the blue scarf still worn across his breast phantasmion talked with the damsels and saw their beauty but felt it no more than that of the sculptured nymphs which gleamed in white marble behind them we cannot enjoy our cousin's sweet company said the wife of maniart but let us not forget the delicate conserve which the messenger brought us from her caradan cried zelneth i warn thee not to taste irene's gift thou wilt be sure to find it as bitter as wormwood while the dark stripling allowed arzine to pour some of the rich viand on his plate his elder sister offered a portion of it to phantasmion who accepted her courtesy well pleased to taste what had come from the hands of the island princess after eating a few morsels of the conserve he fixed his eyes on the vessel from which it had been taken no sooner had he marked its resemblance to the silver pitcher into which he had seen irene pour the many-coloured fish than his head swam dizzily the brilliant lights and smiling faces danced before him then vanished into darkness and soon he sank fainting from his seat at the board. Caradan, who sate next him, and had been watching his actions instead of tasting the spicy food, held out his arms and prevented him from falling on the floor. Immediately after, Phantasmion was surrounded by all who had been sitting round the table, and was borne by attendants, at the command of Arzine, to a luxurious chamber of the palace. End of Part 1 Chapter 8Part 1, Chapter 9 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 9 Caradan takes possession of the silver pitcher. Phantasmion remained without sense or motion for nearly an hour, but, opening at length his heavy lids, he beheld faces bright and soft bending over him, and felt as if he had awakened from the sleep of death and beheld angels watching his reanimation arzine when she perceived that he was about to raise his head made a sign to her daughters and they glided out of the room while the youth ere he again relapsed into unconsciousness felt as if he had seen but the figures of a dream the lady now called to mind a sovereign antidote against the effects of poison this she administered and seeing her patient recover more thoroughly she left him to court refreshing slumbers guests which when they need be courted never come 
the torpor that lately possessed the prince was now exchanged for restlessness and burning heat he rose from his couch and sought the fresh air from a balcony which looked out on the smooth turf bounded by a sheet of water in the midst of the lawn stood caradan embracing the silver pitcher which had lately graced the supper table as if in an ecstasy of joy but soon his looks and gestures changed the pitcher fell from his arms he gazed upon it with a countenance of grief he clasped his hands and his dark face upturned to the clear calm sky appeared to quiver with emotion while tears that filled his eyes glittered in the moonshine toward his right hand was a tall cypress on one of the higher boughs of which an owl was standing with his body erect his wings closed and his plumage smooth as ivory looking like a figure carved out of the wood of the tree when caradan took up the fallen vessel and advanced to the water's edge this bird upreared the horn-like tuft upon his head and light as thistle-down he flew from the summit of the cypress to a lower bough only a few feet from the ground meantime the dark youth cast the pitcher's glutinous contents on the grass and kneeling down immersed the vessel in the water not many paces from the cypress tree while he was employed in rinsing it the owl quitted the bough and came hovering around him with such a soft smooth flight that the abstracted youth perceived not the bird till he saw its shadow before him on the gleaming pool then he lifted up his hand to scare it away but after eddying round the lawn with airy motion it returned to the same spot and began to feed on the fishy mass which had been poured from the pitcher a merry hoot mimicking the owl's cry burst from some part of the mansion the bird seemed not to heed it but caradan started and hastened away wrapping the pitcher in his loose garment phantasmion's attention was now arrested by ringing laughter and the name of irene uttered repeatedly in two different voices one low and murmuring as the rustle of a willow grove in the wind the other high and clear as the breeze that plays among the pendulous branches he moved towards the place whence the sounds proceeded and beheld the interior of an apartment on the same floor with that which he had quitted the curtains in front of the chamber had been closed but were now drawn partly aside to admit the air and through this open space phantasmion had glimpses of zelneth and lukoya untwisting their plaited hair beside a lofty mirror their words came distinctly to his ear as he stood under the awning beside the drapery of the apartment but now they had changed the subject of discourse the picture cried zelneth ah i had forgotten it must be lying in the wood trampled beneath the hoofs of deer mayhap rejoined lukoya or perchance the hare has found it smooth enough to couch upon well replied her sister i would that pensalimer had no other perfidy than mine to complain of he scarcely knows my face yet how hast thou dwelt on his rejoined lykoya how hast thou imagined the strain he is breathing forth and heard the very sounds of the harp chords which he seems to be striking none but pensalimer no living breathing lover dear lykoya cried zelneth why remember dreams which even the dreamer has forgotten i have ceased to be a child since this morning rejoined lukoya in a low tone zelneth laughed and with some hesitation she answered the visions of our earliest years soon fade away or serve but to brighten the image of some real object like forms of frost that shine in the chill morning but when the sun is high are changed to dewdrops which sparkle on the firm green leaves lukoya sighed and zelneth said with a glance of kindness shall i ask simiro to give thee that scarf lukoya hast thou such influence the maid replied zelneth looked up and perceived that lukoya strove to prevent a tear from descending upon her cheek dear sister she said thou art still tremulous from thy jeopardy in the morning i had begun to think thou hast forgotten dariel or remembered him only as i do the tears now trickled down lukoya's face 
and Zelnev hung over her in silence, seeming at a loss for words of comfort. Phantasmion was about to retire, but at that moment, Caradan entered the room, and the prince felt constrained to tarry. The youth lingered for a while by Lukoya's side, as if he had something to say or to hear spoken of, but the sisters were silent, and he was about to leave the room, when Zelneth laid her hand upon him, saying, Stay, brother, and tell us, what thou thinkest of Simiro? Hast thou ever seen a youth of more noble aspect? I have seen many comely faces ere now, replied the boy, and some that are better worth studying than his. The comeliness of Simiro's face may be seen without much study, answered the fair damsel with a smile. But dear Caradan, she added, I have been thinking of that fearful beast which still lurks in the woodland. When the stranger is recovered, pray invite him to hunt the panther with thee. Dost thou think I need his aid? cried the youth warmly. "'Twere folly to reject so good a thing when it comes in thy way,' replied the maiden. "'What hindered him from dispatching the beast this morning?' rejoined the dark youth. "'Not want of manliness,' cried Zelneth quickly. "'Caradan, to judge from looks, I should say he would wield sword and lance better than thou.' "'That is as shall hereafter appear,' exclaimed the son of Magnart with flashing eye. At that moment he grasped his javelin and advanced further into the room, so that Phantasmion saw his countenance plainly. The prince began to glow, and forgetful of everything but the menacing looks of Caradan, he laid his hand on the sword in his girdle, but, recollecting that he was unseen, he refrained from drawing it forth. "'Yes, yes,' cried the youth in a low, smothered voice. "'I am neither fit to win a lady's love, it seems, nor to do her manly service.' Here Lukoya turned from the glass, with her fair disheveled tresses in her hand, to look upon Caradan's flushed face, while Zelneth playfully sank on one knee, and catching hold of her brother's robe, besought his pardon with arch humility in her smiling eyes. Dear brother, she cried, I spake but in jest, what I think of thee in very truth. Nay, spare thy assurances, dear Zelneth, said Lukoya. Caradan little cares how he looks in thy glass. If thou couldst assure him that Irene will not prefer Simiro to Caradan, that anxious brow would become as smooth as this mirror. The blood was rapidly overspreading the face of the agitated youth as Lukoya spoke thus, and Zelneth, quickly rising from the floor, exclaimed, Hath Simiro seen Irene then? How knowest thou that? I do but guess it, answered Lukoya. Certainly he seemed to know that we were expecting our cousin, and when he heard that she was not to come, I saw him turn quite pale and look as much distraught as thou and Caradan are looking now. Lukoya's hint had indeed banished all the gay looks and dimples from her sister's countenance, just as a pebble flung into a pool causes a crowd of circling insects and glancing fishes to disappear. But quickly they returned, and as quickly did the face of Zelneth resume its easy brightness, while the eyes of Caradan seemed ready to overflow, and, to hide the tears that would not be repressed, without another word he left the apartment. When Caradan had withdrawn, Phantasmion too retired, and sought the chamber he had quitted, where keen thoughts stimulated his mind till sleep suppressed them with imperceptible hand and presented in their stead her strangely mingled pictures. But at early dawn those thoughts rose up again to awaken the sleeper. He left his couch, descended to the lawn by winding stairs that led from the balcony, and walked beside the shallow lake. Thence he roamed on to a rich garden, where the flowers were still sleeping covered with dew, and the marble statues which gleamed in morning's timid light, now that living company was absent, seemed to share the beauties of their pleasant home with a lonely wanderer. Entering a dim alley, Phantasmion was struck by one still and graceful form which, though not seen in front, appeared more perfect than any he had passed. It was crowned with fresh flowers and stood beside an arbor, the head thrown back, the arms uplifting an amber-colored urn, which glowed in light admitted at the end of the arched walk. Phantasmion admired the easy air with which those polished arms sustained their burden, 
the swan-like throat inclined a little to one side and the full drapery flowing in soft curves from its deep and narrow zone but sure those folds are not of marble they undulate in a passing breeze and glossy tresses gleam between the rose wreath which partly hides them is it clear cry voices from under the trees clear as clearest amber replied the fancied statue turning around and showing the face of zelneth at sight of the prince her eyes brightened smiling and whispering she gave the urn into the hand of lukoya who had come forth from the arbor and now returned to her seat within among heaps of rejected flowers and vessels of new wine a blush slightly tinged the prince's cheek as he greeted the fair daughter of magnart but it rose somewhat higher when young hermilion who sate at lukoya's feet looked up with eyes of wonder and exclaimed well here thou art and neither of us need go far to serve thee dost thou see that yellow wine it was prepared for irene but thou art to drink it to my sorrow not that i am sorry for thy being here and let me tell thee good simiro that i was the chief maker of the delicate beverage indeed now sister did i not gather more than half the flowers and i would have carried it to thy chamber too but zelneth cried peace child thus think i will trust thee with it yet other days i had need be shod with wings here the prattler suddenly paused struck by the altered looks of phantasmion who had relapsed into his former weakness and now reeling forward fell upon the floor of the arbor close by his side o oh, haste lukoya cried zelneth seek for some one to bear simiro to the house Likoya departed, and soon returned with Caradan, who bore Phantasmion to a couch in one of the apartments of the mansion. The youth quickly recovered from his slight renewal of former illness, and looking up, he again beheld Zelneth. He now blushed more deeply than before, and a smile, which he could not suppress, played upon his lips when he saw the beautiful maiden standing a little way off, with her eyes timidly cast towards him alas for zelneth she is deceived by that bright smile and takes for feelings like her own the glow of youthful fancy which loves to feed on images of joy and kindles at the sight of beauty even while the heart lies still as a bird beneath its mother's wing take this juicy citron said the damsel my mother sends it thee in speaking these words she cast a momentary glance at the stranger then threw down her eyes while she offered him the fruit phantasmion took the citron and seemed intent on tearing it apart but all the time he was thinking how he might lead the fair zelneth to speak of irene at last he resolved to break the spell which seemed binding him to silence he took the hand of zelneth like one that is about to plead earnestly and looking in her face with an animated expression fairest maiden he said but at those words he paused, having caught sight of another face reflected in an opposite mirror. It was that of Lukoya, who stood near the door behind the curtains of the couch. Her head was drooping, and tears were about to flow from her pale face into her bosom, while Zelneth stood erect, with brightest bloom upon her cheek, and strove to hide her joy under an air of majesty. So after summer rains we see a stately flower, raising its crimson disc to hail the sunshine, while underneath the snowy bells of some frail plant lean forward on their bending stem and still weep dewdrops. Lukoya stole away, and Zelneth followed her, not casting a glance at the noble youth of whose heart she now felt secure. End of Part 1 Chapter 9「Part 1 Chapter 10 of Phantasmion」by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 Chapter 10 Hermilion Charges Caradan with Poisoning His Owl Phantasmion was musing on the demeanor of Zelneth and Lukoya when their mother approached him with a cup and phial in her hand. At sight of her, the prince leaped lightly from his couch and the lady exclaimed, as he made his courteous obeisance, It glanced me to find that thou hast more need of pleasant food than of bitter infusions. Come with me, I pray thee, and partake of a simple repast. 
Prantasmian attended his gentle hostess to an apartment where Magnard and the household were already assembled, but the first object that struck his eye was young Hermilian. The boy refused the dainty fare which his sisters offered him and stood with his back to the table, looking on the body of a large bird which lay motionless on his outspread palms without a sign of life in its prominent eyes. "'Oh, father, he never blinks in all this light!' cried the sorrowful child, his blooming cheeks flooded with a fresh gush of tears. "'He is stone dead, and I know who it is that has killed him!' Hermilian repaired to his father's side, and continued weeping and whispering in the ear of Magnart, who bent forward to listen, while Caradan kept his eyes fixed on the board in moody silence, and Arzine cast inquiring glances, first at one of her sons, and then at the other. Phantasmion looked at the dead bird, and thought it was the same which fluttered over the head of Caradan the night before. New suspicions crossed his mind as he remembered the picture and its noxious contents. He took no heed of Zelneth, whose beaming eyes were fixed upon his countenance, nor thought for a moment of Lukoya, who watched to see whether that gaze was returned. "'Speak aloud, Hermilian,' cried Magnart. "'I cannot understand this muttering.' The child cast a sidelong glance at Caradan, then, wrapping himself in the loose portion of his father's robe, he began his voluble story. "'Last night,' said he, I made an outcry in my sleep, for I thought that an arrow whizzed through the air and pierced my own poor owl to the heart. Go to sleep again, said my nurse. The owls are hooting, and their noise has put this dream into thy head. But, as I would not be pacified, she took me to the window, that I might look out and see with my own eyes that he was alive and well. How didst thou know it was thy owl? said his father. Oh, I know every feather of him, replied the child eagerly. I first found him in his nest nigh the top of an old tower when he was covered with mere down, and as soon as I looked in, he raised himself on his legs, puffed out his body, and began to hiss at me, just as baby sister does when I offer to take away her playthings. But what was the owl doing last night? said Maniart. Alas, cried Hermilian, resuming his mournful countenance. He was perched on a lower bough of the cypress near the pond, and up went the feathers of his head into a goodly ruff, while he bent forward and peered down on busy Caradan. "'Be silent, foolish boy!' cried his brother sternly. And Arzine, who had been observing her son's troubled looks with surprise, beckoned to Hermilian. But Magnard said, "'Nay, Caradan, let us hear how the owl met his death.' And the boy exclaimed, He met his death by eating the conserve which Caradine threw out of the pitcher. I hooted to him over and over again, but he would not answer me, so eager was he to feast upon that poisonous food. Pray thee, mother, send him away, cried the dark youth. How canst thou suffer him to babble so foolishly? Yes, Caradine, the younger boy rejoined with a glance of defiance, which he cast over his father's shoulder after having climbed to the back of his chair. And thou didst not taste a morsel of the mess thyself, though helped to it abundantly. Arzine commanded her million to be silent, but she looked with a grave countenance at Magnart and said softly, My husband, what thinkest thou of this? Indeed, I think, replied he with lofty smile, that Irene can send no dish wherein Modra may not mingle poison. We must transplant that sweet flower to a happier soil. What sayest thou, Caradan? His son and his guest both reddened at this speech, but on Caradan's cheek the flush subsided into deadly paleness. Where is the pitcher, good wife? cried Magnard, smiling. Has our eldest son stolen it? Thou seest what grievous charges are preferred against thee, Caradan. Nay, replied Arzine, looking with persuasive mildness on the gloomy countenance of her son. He has given me his jeweled cup in exchange for the pitcher, though I shall not be long in finding some excuse to give it him back again. 
"'And I have neither cup nor pitcher,' said Hermilian, appealing to his father. "'And because Caradan is enamored of Irene, my harmless owl is to be sacrificed.' "'The eldest son,' cried Zelneth, "'has his mother's heart in fee, and other children may but hold the soil under him.' "'Yesterday,' said Arzine, "'some of you declared that I favoured my younger children.' Then she took her lute, and thus she sang while Hermilian, who needed no soft music to charm his melancholy away, was sitting on the ground and playing with her train. Deem not that our eldest heir wins too much of love and care. What a parent's heart can spare, who can measure truly? Early crops were never found to exhaust that fertile ground. Still, with riches twill abound, ever springing newly. See, in yonder plot of flowers, how the tallest lily towers, catching beams and kindly showers which the heavens are shedding, while the younger plants below, less of suns and breezes know, till beyond the shade they grow high and richly spreading. She that latest leaves the nest, little fledgling much caressed, is not therefore loved the best, though the most protected, nor the gadding, daring child, oft reproved for antics wild, of our tenderness beguiled, or in thought neglected. Gainst the islet's rocky shore, waves are beating evermore, yet with blooms tis scattered o'er, decked in softest luster. Nature favors it no less than the guarded still recess, where the birds for shelter press, and the harebells cluster. Arzine would have taken up another strain, all the good company being silent, though Manyart alone heeded the words of the song, but suddenly, as a rebounding ball, Hermilian leaped into the air, unheeded by any eye but his. The owl had risen from the floor, and sailing along the roof, silent as a snowflake, disappeared under the arch of a lofty window. Arzine laid down the lute, well pleased to see the happy child bound through the lawn, clapping his hands and hallooing to the owl overhead. Then swiftly pursue him into the grove, where he hastened to seek shelter from the sunny glare. End of Part 1 Chapter 10「Part 1 Chapter 11 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 Chapter 11 Phantasmion is entertained by his host's family in the garden. Toward evening, Phantasmion was seated beside Arzine in the farther part of the pleasure ground. On one hand, light cascades twinkled athwart the foliage of a hanging orchard. On the other, bright-eyed deer, followed by troops of fawns, tripped into the greensward from a darksome wood, then retiring to the sylvan covert, seemed to grow into that arborous landscape as their branched antlers mingled with the boughs. Just in front of the bank where he sat, the children of Manyard danced round beds of blooming plants, which rose like bright embroidery from the shaven turf, or, forming one regular line, resembled a flower spike, on which the lower blossoms are fully blown, the others gradually greener and closer up to the sheathed bud which crowns the summit. Zelneth admired the forbearance of Semiro, who kept his seat beside the matron, believing it to be painfully practiced for her sake but well disposed to tempt him out of this rigor. She approached a tree near the spot he occupied, and, snapping a twig from one of the branches, full half its foliage seemed to fly away. This was a bevy of green doves, which, sweeping rapidly before the prince's eye, proceeded to augment the verdure of an opposite shrub. Phantasmion smiled carelessly as he raised his eyes to the damsel, and that smile was more than returned by Zelneth, who yet lingered under the tree which the doves had deserted. Soon she was springing beside the cascades in the orchard knoll, her loose robe appearing by glimpses betwixt the leaves, white as those foamy streams. Now she bends over them to scoop the water in a shell, and now comes forth again with a dripping vessel in her hand, attended by a train of squirrels. 
Go back, blithe squirrels, to your leafy haunts. It is more than a picture that Zelneth now dreams of, and the maiden has no heart to chase you round the lawns and groves. She laid the shell before Lukoya's stag, but he playfully threw it over with his horn, and wetted the foot of his fair mistress. Zelneth heard not her sister's mild reproach, but now grown weary of this game, where all the lover's part was supplied by fancy, she kneels down over against the bank to place flowers in a jar, and seems to be wholly occupied with the rich hues of amaranths and roses, while her softer cheek, on which Samiro perchance is gazing, surpasses the garden's pride in its deep crimson. But soon, Irene's name has caught her listening ear. Were it not for Irene, sighed the matron, father and son might both sink into the grave. The maiden looked up and saw that the eyes of the prince were eagerly fixed on Arzine. The damask rose, which now fell from her hand, still blushed bright red, but from Zelna's cheek the hue of joy had faded. In haste she finished her task, and rising from the turf displayed before her mother the vase of various flowers. Arzine praised the well-formed group and looked with silent pride on her beauteous daughter. The spirit, like the outward form, Phantasmion murmured. Arzine thought he spoke of Zelneth, but he was far away on the island of the Black Lake and saw neither the flowers nor the fair trembler who held them. Thou wert speaking of Albinet and Albinian, he rejoined. How saidst thou that they are kept from sinking into the grave? Zelneth retired and approaching her sister, poured all that the vase contained upon the garden mould. Lukoya withdrew her vest, which was sprinkled by the water. A second wetting from thy hand in one short hour, said the maiden, and what have the roses done, that they must be turned adrift to wither? Why does our mother keep him listening to such tedious tales? cried Zelneth. Tedious to whom? replied Lukoya. If he finds them so, he will not listen long. Zelna selected a few choice flowers from the heap which lay at her feet, joined graceful buds to half-expanded blossoms, then with flushed cheek and fluttering heart, knelt down betwixt Arzine and the prince to fix the posy in her mother's girdle. Phantasmion was still hanging on the words of his hostess, and still the discourse was concerning Anthemina's peerless child. Magnart believes, pursued the dame, that she silently loves our son, but, by Caradan's report, she thinks more of one who is dead and gone than of those who live but to serve and worship her. Hitherto Zelneth had been studiously disposing the flowers in Arzine's bosom, but now she raised her eyes and saw Phantasmion with rapt countenance gazing upward as if he contemplated some glorious vision in the evening sky. Then she bowed her head, and one of her massy tresses fell upon the prince's hand. He started from his reverie, and beheld the lovely Zelneth looking at him with eyes full of love and sorrow, tears on her cheek, and her wild locks, which had broken from restraint, falling in careless abandonment to the ground where she knelt. Again he blushed and smiled and his was a face on which smiles and blushes appeared to have a tenfold meaning. A sunny weather in a land of flowery meads and crystal waters seems tenfold sunnier than in a barren plain. Quickly as touchwood fires at a spark, while the flint from which it flew is cold as ever, poor Zelneth's heart kindled with sudden joy. Scorning her own distrust, scarce able to endure the tide of pleasure that overflowed her bosom, she rose and glided lightly over the lawn. Meantime, Phantasmion observed Lukoya leaning against the tree, with her eyes turned toward the bank, where he sate beside Arzine. The dainty leaves collected for the stag had fallen to her feet, and he too seemed little to heed them, while his large mild eye was fondly fixed on the absent face of the damsel. But Zelneth wandered on to a pool, which gleamed betwixt the unbranched stems of trees like a mirror in its frame. And now she hears the sound for which her ear listens. 
She cannot be deceived. Semiro is tracing her footsteps. With tremulous limbs, which half refused to carry her forward, she gained the palm trees, and standing between them, eyed the waterfall which flew out of the bordering wood, and caused a transient whirlpool in the glassy lake with sudden plunge, then made it roar and whiten as they rushed hither and thither on whirring wings. Ere the tumult had subsided, Phantasmian stood before Zelneth. His words were drowned in the hubbub of the waters, but he presented a letter cased in ivory, which the spouse of Manyart, to try his dispositions toward the dark-eyed maid, had charged him to lay before her. Zelneth had forgotten all men but one, and dreamed not that what he held in his hand reported of any heart but his own. With feigned reserve, she turned away to caress a graceful bird in mantle of silver grey, which seemed to imitate some stately damsel as it trode the margin of the pool. Pretty crane, said Zelneth, stroking its silky plumage, what hast thou to say of thy fair mistress, Irene? Has she never a thought to bestow upon the living? Wert thou not given to Caradan as an earnest of a better gift hereafter? The letter in its carved case fell from Phantasmian's hand. His heart throbbed fast. He fell on his knees before the lady, and seizing her robe exclaimed, Oh, Zelneth, Zelneth, this is but one of thy jests. Caradan has not indeed won the heart of Irene. Zelneth looked upon his face, where passion was plainly pictured, but now she knew that not for her his cheek glowed, his lip quivered, and when her eye sought the ground, she espied upon the ivory case the letters of an unloved name. Pale and speechless, she turned away, her heart swelling with sorrow. Midway between the pool and the flowery lawn, she joined Lucoya, who, having seen Phantasmion throw himself at her sister's feet, expected to behold the maiden's face beaming with happiness. I am weary, said Zelneth in a languid tone. Let me lean on thee. Oh, sister, he loves Irene. Then Lucoya saw that her first guesses were true, and became on a sudden right eloquent, whispering a thousand consolations, which she herself had a thousand times rejected. Phantasmion followed them to Arzine's bower, paid many abrupt courtesies to the sorrowful maiden, placed a lute in her hand, and, scarce knowing what he said in his confusion, entreated her to sing. Zelneth swept the chords with hurried finger, then accompanied the expressive chime with these words. While the storm her bosom scourges, what can calm a troubled sea? Will the heaving, dashing surges tranquil through persuasion be? Rest, my soul, like frozen ocean, let thy wavy tumult sleep. Rise no more in vexed commotion, heedless where the gale may sweep. Clouds that have the light partaken, round yon radiant planet rolled, lingering in the west forsaken, soon shall glimmer, wan and cold. All our thoughts are gay and golden, while the sun of hope they shroud. Those bright beams no more beholden, turn again to watery cloud. He that scorns the smiling valley, fragrant copse and gentle stream, forth for distant heights to sally, whence deceptive colors gleam. Late shall find that cold and dreary, tis but from afar they glow, shall not, when his feet are weary, when the blossomed veil below. Having stolen a glance at Phantasmion, who was leaning against the arbor with his eyes fixed on the ground, Zelneth gave him back the lute, when all the company looked eagerly towards him. The prince played a soft prelude, then sang thus. Many a fountain, cool and shady, may the traveler's eye invite, one among them all, sweet lady, seems to flow for his delight. In many a tree the wilding bee might safely hide her honeyed store. One hive alone the bee will own, she may not trust her sweets to more. Sayest thou, canst that maid be fairer? Shows her lip a livelier dye? Hath she treasures richer, rarer? 
Can she love better than I? What formed this spell, I ne'er could tell, but subtle must its working be, since from the hour I felt its power, no fairer face I wish to see. Light-winged Zephyr, ere he settles on the loveliest flower that blows, never stays to count thy petals, dear, delicious, fragrant rose. Her features bright elude my sight, I know not how her tresses lie, in fancy's maze my spirit plays, when she with all her charms is nigh. Here is Caradan, coming from the wood, cried Arzine, rising, and Phantasmion, glad to leave the arbor, hastened away with her. Magnart, who had now come forth to see his guest, followed with the children, but Zelneth had fallen fainting among the branches of the bower, and Lukoya remained by her side. Ere the company returned to the spot they had left, the dark-eyed maid was weeping on her sister's bosom, in that apartment where, from childhood, they had nightly reposed together. O oh, Lukoya, she cried, thy channel was once full, though now the stream is dried at the fountain, but mine has ever been despised, unvisited. The current winds another way, and will not flow there. End of Part 1, Chapter 11「Part 1, Chapter 12 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – Part 1, Chapter 12 After meeting with adventures in the wood, Phantasmion goes to seek Pensalimer. "'Thou hast not found the panther yet, my son,' cried Magnart, as he met Caradan coming from the wood with a train of dogs at his heels, and the spoils of a wild beast hanging over his shoulder. "'This is the hide of an ounce,' pursued he. "'I know it by the white ground.' "'The panther shall not escape me to-morrow,' answered the youth, looking as if he would fain have avoided the company that greeted him as he emerged from the outskirts of the forest. "'Semiro will hunt with thee to-morrow,' said his father." Thou wilt not withstand this plea, added he, turning to his guest, whom he had been urging to prolong his stay in Polyanthida. Upon that, Caradan looked sternly at Phantasmion, and, striking his spear on the ground, he said in a low, deep voice, I pray thee, noble stranger, to accept my father's hospitality, but endanger not thy life by pursuing the same game with me. Noble Caradan, rejoined Phantasmion, with a kindling eye and cheek, I will pursue no game, which I am not as free to follow as thou art, but danger to my life will never deter me from any just enterprise. Then, checking himself at sight of Arzine's anxious face and Magnard's uplifted eyebrow, he added in a lighter tone, Surely I have some right to pursue this panther, for it was I who started it first. Thou knowest not who started it before thee, murmured Caradan. But at the urgent request of his mother, he reluctantly appointed an hour to meet Phantasmion in the wood on the following day, and then hastened homeward, outstripping Magnart, who suited his pace to that of the young children, as well as the stranger youth, who remained by the side of Arzine. Next morning, the prince accoutred himself for the chase, and partook of an early repast, at which neither Caradan nor his two elder sisters were present. Arzine looked less cheerily than usual, as she cast her eye round the board, and when Phantasmion set forth, she accompanied him through the lawn, speaking much of Caradan's overhardihood. Hermelian skipped by her side, and drank in more of the morning's balm than even the dewy flowers, which the sun seemed to paint with richer hues, while it stole their tears away. "'When shall I be old enough to hunt?' exclaimed the boy, scattering the posy which he had gathered with rapture. "'Dear mother, before I am as tall as Caradan, I will be more venturous and rash than he.' At parting, Arzine placed in the hand of her guest a phial of the precious liquor which had hastened his cure, bidding him administer the contents to himself or Caradan, 
should either of them receive a wound that day. Phantasmion accepted the phial, as he had listened to the mother's story with a courteous smile, and took his way to the break, where Caradan had agreed to meet him. He looked around and, seeing no living creature in the wood except deer and their fawns, he seated himself behind that screen of briars where he had formerly beheld the panther, and having tightened his sandal, began to examine the weapons with which Manyart had provided him. While thus employed, he heard sounds on the other side of the bushes. It seemed as if steps were approaching. Then, as if someone sat down upon the turf, soon after he saw the head of the white stag, the branches of his horns protruding beyond the shrubs, which came down to the water's edge, and, ere he stooped to drink, Phantasmion caught a glance of his mild, vigilant eye. From the top of an alder tree a thrush was pouring out the gladdest notes to soothe his patient mate as she brooded on her nest in one of the brambles that overhung the water. But soon Lukoya's voice traversed the briary fence and softly warbled these words. The captive bird with ardor sings, where no fond mate rewards the strain, yet sure to chance some solace brings, although he chants in vain. But I my thoughts in bondage keep, lest he should hear who ne'er will heed, and none shall see the tears I weep, with whom to her vain to plead. No glossy breast, no quivering plume, like fan unfurled to tempt the eye, reminds the prisoner of his doom, apart yet all too nigh. Oh, would that in some shrouded place I too were prisoned fancy free, and ne'er had seen that beaming face which ne'er will beam on me. When kindred birds fleet o'er the wave, from yellow woods to green ones fly, the captive hears the wild winds rave beneath a wintry sky. And when my loved one hence shall fleet, bleak, bleak will yonder heaven appear. The flowers will droop no longer sweet, and every leaf be sear. Phantasmion hardly noted the meaning of Lukoya's song, but its melancholy murmur haunted his ear as he loitered along in search of Caradan, and it seemed to him as if he had heard the orphan Irene lamenting that hapless mother, whose image her soul cherished so fondly. By the time that he had advanced some way into the forest, the sun was shining in full fervor. No cloud intercepted its beam. No breeze winnowed the warm air and roused it from sleepy stillness. The lake, which gleamed through an open space between oaks and beeches, was all one fabric with a vaulted sky, and neither end of the lucid pile though the lower was more shiny than the upper, contained a single fret or flaw. One little island was visible opposite the place where Phantasmion stood, and the weeping birches that grew upon its margin seemed to be intently studying their own images in the mirror. Not one of their light leaflets moved upon its pliant stem. No rapid swallow skimmed over the water, now shooting aloft to snatch an insect, now wheeling around and soaring out of sight. But a lonely heron stood beneath those trees, and seemed as if he had fallen asleep over his task, as if the delicate perch might glance past him unobserved. The deer slumbered in the closest culverts, the birds had ceased to sing. All was profoundly silent, except that, from a great distance among the trees, Phantasmion heard the cooing of a dove. But that too died away, and then no sound was audible but the murmur of a solitary bee over a bed of flowers, which loaded the sultry air with fragrance. The only moving object attracted the eye of the prince as he sat beneath a broad-armed oak, wondering at the delay of Caradan. He watched the insect roving up and down among the hyacinths, which grew in countless multitudes far as the eye could reach till a drowsiness began to steal over him, and it seemed, while he inhaled the odor of the blossoms and viewed their soft colors, as if he saw a new flower gradually rising up from among the rest. Rousing himself to look more steadfastly 
At this strange appearance, he perceived that it was no flower, but an exquisite feminine form which stood between his eye and the lake's deep azure. A breath would have separated the yellow tresses that lay upon her neck into a thousand diverging threads, as fine as gossamer. Vivid bloom was on her cheek, her eyes were blue as a turquoise, and her mantle was of the freshest green. A crown of dewdrops glittered on her brow when first she rose, but quickly melted away, and she held by a silken line a leash of butterflies. Phantasmion, she said, in a slender, sighing voice, Phantasmion, thou lovest Irene, the daughter of Antemina. Oh, how fair was Anthemina when she plighted her face to Pensalimer. She was laden with beauty, like the trees of spring, that hide the green of their leaves with amethystine clusters and garlands of yellow gold. Who art thou? cried Phantasmion. And why speakest thou thus to me? The soft phantom replied, I am Fadeline, the spirit of the flowers. I love the house of Thalimer, but Caradan, to gain the charmed vessel, hath put his faith in other powers than mine. He loves Irene. The spirit continued to murmur the names of Caradan, Irene, and Anthemina, but her breath appeared to be stifled. Speak on, said Phantasmion. What hast thou to tell me of Caradan, of Irene, and of Anthemina? Alas, she feebly answered. Olula, the spirit of the blast, go to Pensalimer, to the deserted palace. The fading phantom waved her hand. Even now, she murmured, I feel her touch. It is like the hand of death. While she yet spoke, the delicate color faded from her cheek. Her face began to shrivel. She hung her head. Her whole form shrank. Then, gradually sinking earthward, appeared to re-enter the ground whence it had arisen. While Phantasmion was yet gazing with fixed eyes, the trees, laid so motionless, were bent by a rushing blast, which swept, as if in triumph, across the spot where Fadeline had stood, disturbed the bosom of the glassy lake, then passed away, and soon every nodding hyacinth had ceased to sway upon its flexile stem. Even in the hot sunbeams, the prince felt his blood chilled. He rose from his seat and felt an impulse to hasten out of the wood. But at that moment, the deep silence of the forest was broken by clamorous yells, and the prolonged sound of a hunter's horn caused the sleeping deer to arise and the birds to rush from the boughs they occupied, while the heron upon the island started up and sailed off to a distant shore. Phantasmion passed swiftly on, and soon had sight of Caradan, who stood surrounded by vociferous dogs, with his javelin plunged in the body of a large panther. Indignant at this sight, the prince hurried through the trees, and, coming in front of the young huntsman, he saw that his countenance was full of joyful triumph, as he bent over the grim face of the expiring beast, and that drops of blood were slowly trickling from a wound in his hand into Irene's pitcher, which he held up to receive them. So intent was he on this occupation, and on gazing at the panther, that he had not perceived the approach of his rival, who, stung with jealousy at what he beheld, and with remembrance of what the flower spirit had uttered, stood a little way off, eyeing him with fiery looks, and brandishing his stainless weapon, without knowing exactly in what terms to couch an accusation or how to challenge one who was already wounded in combat. While he yet hesitated, the prince was struck by the sound of Lukoya's voice crying, Caradan! The maiden had heard her brother wind the horn, and knowing by that signal that the beast was slain, she came flitting through the forest to the place of the encounter. Phantasmion gave up all thoughts of seeking a quarrel with Caradan when he saw his sister approach. He withdrew behind the broad trunk of a tree, and soon afterwards beheld Lukoya binding up her brother's wound with strips torn from her own garment, while the dogs leaped around, fawning on the maiden as if rejoiced at the aid 
that she rendered to their master. The lady's milk-white stag, fearless of the hounds, with which he had long been familiar, stood beside the bloody pard, and was the only one of the group who seemed to espy Phantasmion as he lingered among the overarching trees of thickest foliage. Caradon loves Irene, were the words that rang in the prince's ear as he retraced his steps through the forest, and without re-entering Magnard's abode, he forthwith departed to find that of Pensalimer, king of Almatera. End of part one, chapter twelve. Part one, chapter thirteen of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one, chapter thirteen. Pensalimer tells his story to Phantasmion. Phantasmion pursued his journey for several days in that rich land, traveling by leaps whenever he could do so without attracting the gaze of the rustics, and taking refreshment in the humblest dwellings. He found that the peasant folks in general were quite unacquainted with the person of their king, though they had many strange tales to tell respecting him. But all the certain information in these matters, which the prince gained, was that he lived in retirement with Launa, the mother of Arzine and Anthemina, the affairs of his kingdom being managed by Sanyo, a wise and worthy man who had been the friend of his father. The prince pursued his way, according to the directions he had received, till he found that blossomed orchards, gardens, and gay buildings began to be less and less frequent, and it seemed as if, from the land of summer, he had stepped into November's dreary domain. At length he entered a tract which was full of fading flowers and trees, clad in the garb of autumn, and thence proceeded to a bleak and barren moor, where cold swamps, rocks encrusted with ashy pale lichens, or fringed with rustling fern, and twisted, uncouth trunks that looked like mummies of trees as they reclined in sepulchral cavities, were the only features of the stern landscape. One light-colored object appeared in view, just beneath a company of gaunt pine trees that straggled over a stony slope. This was a forlorn mountain ash, with foliage of transparent brightness. The wind came by fits, whistling through the pine grove, and whenever it shook the fragile ash, a shower of yellow leaves fell from its delicate branches on the steely pool below. Those stagnant waters were agitated by the rough gale, and foaming waves for a moment were visible. Then again, relapsing into torpor, they sullenly reflected the sullen sky and the wasting roan tree. Streaks of dull clouds covered great part of the heavens, but just where the sun was sinking on the horizon, they showed a spectral whiteness edged with faintest yellow and sea-green. In the opposite quarter, the moon appeared like a wan face, gradually kindling into life. She looked out from the sky in full splendor, while Phantasmion was yet on his way, and when he saw her beams resting on an ancient castle, surrounded by a moat and a high and thick wall, he knew that he beheld the domain of Pensalimer. Arrived at the edge of the moat, he surveyed the barrier before him, and having taken a good aim, leaped to the top of it, gained a sure footing on the wall, and waved his sword to an ancient domestic who had espied him from a courtyard below. The old man gazed in astonishment at the youthful figure on the horizon, with nodding plume and glancing sword illumined by the moonbeams. Phantasmion proceeded along the top of the wall, looking down upon groves of cypresses and glistering laurels, till he came over against a wide lawn which fronted the castle. Down into this grassy plain he leaped, and beheld straight before him an ancient yew tree, which rose about the center of it, casting a gigantic shadow on the moonlit sward. As the prince passed under this tree on his way to the castle, he perceived that a tall man, habited in a long black stole, was leaning over one of its broad arms, and looking from amid its dusky foliage at the star-bright sky. 
Just then, a thin vapor was flitting across the moon. But soon, Phantasmion beheld the side of the gazer's face in a clear light, and was struck with the majesty of his features, and the placid melancholy of their expression. He stood still, feeling assured that this was Penselimer, and considering how to proceed. When the man in the mourning robe turned round, and having scanned his face, exclaimed reproachfully, Ha! Dorimont, art thou come to render up the silver pitcher? Phantasmion, who had been continually thinking of Irene's silver pitcher ever since he first saw it in the hands of his rival, was too much struck with these words to make a prompt reply. But the lofty personage before him pointed to the moon. Thou art come, said he, from visiting the lady Anthemina. King Penselimer, cried Phantasmion, a little confused, I come from Palmland. It is false, rejoined the monarch, in a tone of solemn indignation. With my own eyes I saw thee descend from the sky, and alight on the hither side of those fair trees. Then again he gazed upwards at the moon. I had been pleading with her all this evening, said he. She was still silent and obdurate. She would not promise to restore the silver pitcher, but now I trust she has sent it by thy hand. Noble Panselimer, cried the youth impetuously, I know not what thou meanest by pointing to the sky and speaking of a silver pitcher. And perchance, rejoined the king, with a disdainful smile, Thou dost not behold the fair Anthemina in heaven, and perchance she too will deny that she is at this moment looking down upon thee and me. King Penzelimer, said Phantasmion, who now began to understand why the sovereign of Almatera lived in retirement. I see that fair dispenser of light as plainly as thou dost, and true it is that she has guided me to thy abode. But the Lady Anthemina I never beheld while she sojourned upon earth. Art thou not mine enemy, Dormont? inquired the king earnestly, perusing the features of his youthful visitant. Dorimont, king of Palmland, sleeps with his ancestors, replied the youth. I know not why thou callest him thine enemy, nor how he can have injured thee concerning a silver pitcher. Ha! <laughs> Indeed, said Penzelimer, then I will tell thee the whole story of my wrongs. But not here, he added in a low voice, casting up his eyes to the moon. Lest she should hear the tale, it is my belief she often listens when shame or pride forbids her to reply. Then he moved away and beckoned to Phantasmion, who followed him as he strode across the lawn, thinking of Irene with a silver pitcher on her head, and Caradan pressing it to his bosom, and how the fishy woman by the seashore and the bright fairy in the wood had both spoken of a charmed vessel. Penzelimer conducted the youth to an apartment in the castle, where a fire upon the hearth cast its light on the walls, hung with dark paintings, and on a harp and other musical instruments which were scattered around. The king of Almatera made Phantasmion take a seat opposite to one which he himself occupied, and began to speak thus. There was a time when the beautiful Anthemina looked graciously upon me and told me every thought of her bosom. Now she veils her face when I gaze upon it, and though I spend my life in assuring her that I seek only to be reconciled, she still persists in chilling silence. Phantasmion looked at the speaker and saw no haggard looks, no traces of anguish on his goodly face. Clear and smooth was his high forehead, and the black locks that shadowed it were scarcely sprinkled with grey. But ever and anon his dark eye gave sudden flashes, like silent lightning on a gloomy summer's night. It seemed as if something were at work within, apart from the soul of Penselimer something dangerous and irregular as lightning itself. Without returning the curious glance of Phantasmion, his eyes appearing fixed on vacancy, he proceeded thus. One day, the lady Anthemina approached me, 
radiant with joy as with beauty, she held in her hand a silver pitcher, and placing it in mine, she said, Penzalimer, while this charmed vessel remains in thy possession, no earthly power can deprive thee of me. At these words I was full of astonishment. I threw myself on my knees before the stately virgin, and receiving the pitcher, was unable to utter a word, but looked up eagerly in her face to seek an explanation, and the Mina smiled. Dost thou believe the tale? said she. Truly thou mayest believe it. Fadeline has answered my prayers, for she loves the house of Thalimer. But Thalo, the king of this land, cried I, whom thy father would have thee wed, is not he a descendant of Thalimer, as well as we too? Fear nothing from him, the maid replied. Fadeline, our guardian spirit, appeared to me as I watered the flowers, and in gazing at the bright phantom, I let the pitcher fall from my hands. Anthemina, she said, take up thy pitcher, and he in whose hands thou shalt place it can alone be thy husband. While he keeps it safe, no other man can deprive him of thee. The fairy vanished, and looking down at my feet, I saw that my earthen pitcher was gone, and that this silver vessel, engraved with curious characters, was lying in its place. From the time that Anthemina spoke thus, I felt like a new creature, and ceased to tremble in the presence of Thalo, or of his young sister Zalia, whom my father would have had me espouse. I cared not who was called the sovereign of this land, the whole world seemed made for me, since I possessed that charmed vessel, the rosy dawn, the noonday radiance, the gorgeous sunset, and the spangled firmament. All were but varied images of my inward bliss. To my exalting fancy, they were but festal shows set forth to celebrate my happiness with Anthemina. Alas, alas, the glory of a sunset gradually gives way to darkness, and by slow degrees the magic spectacle of midnight passes from the heavens. But this radiance which surrounded me and appeared to stream from a thousand sunny fountains was quenched as wholly and as suddenly as a man may extinguish one poor solitary taper. She took back again that precious gift, one that she had proffered with such an overflowing measure of unhoped for tenderness, tricked me out of it by cruel art, and gave it to King Dorimont. I saw her place it in his hand. I saw his look of triumph as he held it aloft. More I could not see, for I fell on the ground senseless. Oh, why did I not pierce him to the heart, that base perfidious man, doubly, nay, trebly, perjured and faithless? When Penzelimer spoke thus, Phantasmion started up and laid his hand on his sword. Forgetting that the true spirit of Penzelimer was not there to render account of his words. My father was an honorable man, the youth exclaimed. He hath a son, at least who will maintain his honor? The king of Almatera looked at him with majestic composure, as the fire threw its tremulous beam on his flushed countenance. For phantoms were realities to him, and external realities moved him less than phantoms. How thy face recalls to me that fatal hour, quoth he, that hour when the aspect of my fate grew suddenly dark, as the glowing face of the deep will blacken in its whole extent when the wind rushes over it. For years I remained in a state of stupor. Thalo died, and I succeeded to my grandsire's throne. Dorimont delivered the pitcher to King Albinian, whom Cleoras forced Anthemina to marry, the king of Palmland, espoused Zalia, and annexed to his realm her inheritance of Gemaura. All these events I learned with indifference. Nothing roused me till tidings were brought that Anthemina had perished at sea. Then I repaired to the shore, entered a boat, and roamed over the waste of waters till at last I beheld my radiant mistress arise out of the waves. From the vessel's prow I stood gazing, and prayed aloud for wings, that I might follow her into the sky. But a jeering voice issued from the deep, and seemed to utter these words, Where she is gone, thou shalt never follow. I looked down upon the waters, and there, 
beheld a round, white, glistering face that seemed to be a hideous mockery of that celestial visage. It rose from the surface of the sea, and there stood before me a strange form, half fish, half woman, which held her arms aloft and her body inclined in the posture of a dancing nymph, while she pointed with one hand at me, with the other at the newly risen Queen of Heaven. Then, with a burst of merriment, she plunged amid the waves, which swallowed in the gurgling sounds of laughter. And before this memorable night, said Phantasmion, when Anthemina took her station in heaven, didst thou never behold that bright orb which is beaming through yonder latticed window? Before that night, replied Penzelimer, I never beheld any heavenly orb which was fairer and brighter than the moon, but she, since then, has been so diminished that I cannot distinguish her from the other stars. And what has become of the pitcher? said the prince. That is the subject of my constant inquiry, replied Penzelimer. Albinian is not long for this world. Could I regain possession of the charmed vessel, Anthemina might yet be mine. When Penzelimer spoke these words, an aged lady entered the apartment. Laona, said the king, hast thou heard any tidings of the silver pitcher? Not yet, replied the ancient dame in a gentle tone. Go now to repose, for Fadeline will never help us to find the pitcher while the flowers are sleeping. Tomorrow we will all renew our search more diligently. When Penzelimer had quitted the apartment, Launa looked earnestly in the face of Phantasmion and said, Art thou the son of Dorimont, king of Palmland? Even so, he answered. Alas, then, rejoined the ancient lady, why comest thou to Penzelimer and the mother of Anthemina? Because I love Anthemina's beautiful daughter, the ardent youth replied, and in all truth and honor I seek to lay my crown at her feet. The spirit of the flowers knows my love, and she has sent me hither. And hath she told thee where to find the charmed vessel? inquired the dame. Fadeline decreed that after Anthemina's time, the fortunes of her child should depend upon it, as hers did before. Phantasmion made no answer, being lost in thought, and Launa added, Doubtless it is now at the bottom of the sea, for my ill-starred child took it with her when she entered that fatal bark, which never came to land again. Sweet Irene knows nothing of this charm. She weeps when she looks on the wild waves of the ocean, but those tears are for her mother alone. Phantasmion felt certain that the pitcher, so earnestly embraced by Caradan, must be this charmed vessel, which rendered him the master of Irene's fate, so far as to prevent her union with any one but himself. How he gained it, and how he might be dispossessed of it, were anxious thoughts which cast their shadow over the young prince's brow. Launa perceived his distress. Come, she cried, rest thou this night under our roof, and tomorrow we will consider if it be possible to find the pitcher. Since the flower spirit favors thy love, she will not suffer thee to seek in vain. Having spoken thus, she led her guest to a chamber of the castle. When Phantasmion obtained sight of Launa the next morning, he inquired if she could direct him to the deserted palace. Look out over the country, she replied. Below that hill which bounds the horizon, thou wilt find the ancient abode of my husband. There we dwelt with Arzine and Anthemina, before Clearas possessed the flowery vale which thou hast lately visited. What a black cloud, exclaimed the youth, is resting on the summit of the boundary eminence. That cloud, rejoined Launa, overhangs the dwelling of the enchantress Melodine. She it is who has blasted this region, while Fadeline vainly endeavors to counterwork her spells. Alas, that outward blasting is but a type of the desolation that she has brought on me and mine. 
Soon after, the spirit of the flowers had blessed Anthemina and Panzelimer with the hope of their happy union. My daughter met a woman whose face was covered with a shining veil as she wandered late in the evening through an orchard that lies between the palace and the mountain. Come to the clear stream, said the witch, and thou shalt see a strange sight. Anthemina looked into the water and fancied that she there beheld the face of Dorimond, her cousin Zalia's suitor, hard by the image of her own. While she was gazing on the shadow in the brook, that wicked enchantress persuaded the maiden to drink out of a cup which she presented to her. No sooner had she tasted its contents than all her affections were transferred from Penzelimer to him whose likeness she seemed to behold. Alas, no spell but that which beaming eyes contain was needed to turn Dorimond's fickle heart from Zalia to Anthemina, and none but that of ambition caused him to break his faith with my faithless child, and again offer his hand to the heiress of Gemaura. Phantasmian looked sorrowful and abashed, but could not feel anger against Launa, for she spoke as one in whom no affections remain, except such as are fit to live for ever. Dorimant is dead, she added, and Zalia and Anthemina are at rest from their troubles. Penzalimar yet lives, and, hark, his lute is sounding from that gloomy cell in which it is his pleasure to immure himself till the moon rises. Phantasmian listened and heard Penzalimar sing thus. The sun may speed or loiter on his way, may veil his face in clouds or brightly glow. Too fast he moved to bring one fatal day. I ask not now if he be swift or slow. I have a regent bathed in joyful beams, where he hath never gilded fruit or flower, hath ne'er lit up the glad perennial streams, nor tinged the foliage of an autumn bower. Then hail the twilight cave, the silent dell, that boasts no beams, no music of their own. Bright pictures of the past around me dwell, where nothing whispers that the past is flown. The eyes of Launa shone in tears for a moment, but no strong emotion disturbed the serene sadness of her brow. Alas, she said, his are but mockeries of woe that dwell in the wild brain and never touch the heart. Yet, hark again. Penzelimer was singing. Grief's heavy hand hath swayed the lute, tis henceforth mute. Though pleasure woo, the strings no more respond to touches light as fond, silenced as if by an enchanter's wand. Do thou brace up each slackened chord, love, gentle lord, then shall the lute pour grateful melodies on every breeze, strains that celestial choristers may please. End of Part 1 Chapter 13Part 1, Chapter 14 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 14 Phantasmion Visits the Deserted Palace. Having received the blessing of Launa, Phantasmion departed, and just as the castle towers were sinking out of sight, remembered that he ought to have inquired for the abode of Sanyo. Eager, however, to explore Anthemina's ancient dwelling place, he hastened forward, now running, now leaping, yet sometimes forgetting even to move in his deep thoughts concerning past and future events. The sky was clear in every part, except right before him, on the horizon. There the dark mass hung so steadily that it looked more like a black sea than a cloud. At last he reached a smiling peninsula in the sullen ocean of the waste. Here at least, thought he, Melodine has not turned the leaves yellow when they ought to be green. Here the flower spirit hath her way. 
Phantasmion passed the mossy stones which, of yore, had formed an outer wall, and now enclosed a neighborhood of snakes and lizards, and proceeded to a wilderness, where commonest weeds upreared their heads among rare flowers, and towered and swelled and blossomed and seeded, casting out their branches on every side in unassailed prosperity and tranquil pomp. There the soft hyacinth and rich carnation were overtopped by thistles, the full peony blushed among tall grass half-hidden, and a solitary arch that had once been a gateway was crested with the prim larkspur and spruce jonquil. Over against the green mound, from which the wild goats bounded at his approach, Phantasmion discerned an imperfect outline of two apartments. The first was tapestried with jessamine, and tenanted by owls, who stared with no hospitable looks upon the stranger as he entered their abode. A shallow pool floored the second, reflecting the ruined wall with its arched windows and carved ornaments, over which the eglantine waved its lithe branches, still perhaps to wave them in the gale, when that phantom edifice should have fallen under its breath. Phantasmion paused not here, but went on to find the brook spoken of by Launa, passing orchards where the unpruned boughs were bending under crowded birds and fruit, till, through the close undergrowth, in parts quite impervious, he perceived a stream which flowed through a vaulted opening at the base of a lofty rock, then wandered away to the right hand. Above that rock was a succession of crags, the highest veiled in darkness, and this was the cloud-capped height which he had seen from the castle. Phantasmion approached the stream close to the archway, and, looking on its waters, discerned his own colorless shadow and nothing more. But, on stooping to bathe his temples in the brook, he perceived beyond the shadow a picture of himself as vivid and seemingly substantial as that which the finest mirror might have presented. It was not looking as his natural face would have done in a glass at that moment, for his countenance was thoughtful and bore traces of tears. But the countenance of the picture appeared to be radiant with joy and love. It did not gaze on him that gazed on it, but on another object in the watery depth, the graceful figure of a damsel, holding up a silver pitcher, so that it concealed her face, which was bowed down upon her bosom. While the youth still examined the picture, it gradually faded, and he saw only the sparkling sands in the bed of the river. But, ere he turned away his eyes, those very sands had formed themselves into characters, making the names of Dorimont and Anthemina, Irene and Phantasmion. Again they were mingled together, and while he sought to decipher them as before, a tinkling melody rang out from the rocks overhead. It seemed as if they were musical stones touched by some invisible hand with a silver hammer, and soon they seemed to speak thus. Life and light, anthemna bright, ere thy knell these rocks shall ring, joy and power, a gladdening dower, thou shalt shower on palmland's king. Floor of coral, roof of beryl, thou shalt find afar from peril, while thy lovely child is dwelling, where the palm and vine are swelling, crystal streams around her welling, all the land her virtue telling. Life and light, anthemna bright, thou to palm land's king art bringing, richest dower, fairest flower, is from thee for palm land springing. That king of Palmland is Phantasmion, exclaimed the youth in ecstasy, and the watery picture is my likeness, only like Dorimont as I resemble my father, and the meanest fair child is mine, but how am I to gain the charmed vessel? Full of joyous agitation, he strayed along the margin of the brook, and after a time stooped down to drink, but ere he had fully slaked his thirst, a cry issued from the opposite bank while sudden brightness fell upon the water. Phantasmion at first imagined that he had heard the voice and saw the shadow of a kingfisher, whose emerald wings and breast of ardent gold were casting that rainbow gleam on the smooth current. But looking up, he espied the green mantle of Phaedeline, floating behind her in a transient breeze 
as she leaned from a grove of rushes over the stream, to which her silken bodice, in hue like the honeyed nectary of a blossom, was imparting its yellow tinge. No sooner had the fairy caught Phantasmion's eye than she pointed up the river to the place where he had beheld the vision, and lo, there was Caradan with his face bent over the waters while the silver pitcher stood on the ground beside him. Now I will wrestle with thee for that pitcher, Phantasmion would have cried, but the words died on his lips. An irresistible drowsiness came over him, and down he sank in slumber beside a shady willow. Soon, however, a gale of sharp fragrance awakened him, and he raised his head. The air had become thick and misty, and Caradan was lifting in both hands a heavy stone, as if for the purpose of crushing the pitcher to atoms. Phantasmion strove to speak, but again sleep surprised him. Thought vanished from his mind as the stream from his eye, and with closed lids he fell back under the canopy of the willow. When he next awoke, the clouds that lately capped the mountain had descended to its base, and all was darkness. Yet in this darkness there were spasms and slower pulses of light which, here and there, unveiled the rocks and the river. And one of these discovered Caradan standing bewildered, his right hand raised before his face as if to repel the mist, and the pitcher hanging from his left. Thereupon with a shout, Phantasmion rushed forward to attack his rival, but even as he advanced, the light was swallowed up, and all the force and fury of his onset were bestowed on the stem of a birch tree, while Caradan's misguided weapon was striking a volley of sparks out of the flinty rock in a cleft of which the tree grew. But soon Phantasmion started back, struck by a plaintive scream close to his ear. Then came the flickering light and revealed the birch tree which he had so fiercely assaulted, its long pendant boughs laden with moisture and blood drops trickling down its silver skin. And next, eyes of steady flame were glaring upon him from a hole in the rock, and, while the darkness came on again, he heard a rustle overhead, then perceived the wings as of white fire sweeping onward. While these sights were presenting themselves, the youth imagined that he had wounded some living female frame, and thereby exasperated a demon who kept watch over the imprisoned object of his love. But a second cry from the goblin as he sailed away, and the sense of a slight wound about the bosom, soon made it clear that he had but startled an owl from its hiding place, and stained a senseless trunk with his own blood. After this interruption, he raged about in search of Caradan, on whom at last he fell with an impetuosity which made the pitcher fly out of his hand and flung the youth himself with stunning force upon the ground, while his own sword was shivered in the encounter. He was bending forward and groping for his rival when something plucked him back. At the same time, the cloud was rent and admitted a bright beam just over the spot where the pitcher lay. Again, he sprang to seize the vessel, but it was snatched away into the darkness. Doubly baffled at having lost both the prize and his enemy, Phantasmion stood motionless, till he perceived straight before him a dim figure glimmering gigantically through a thinner part of the mist. Then, as a great serpent gathers all his might to crush a buffalo of unusual size and strength, letting fall his broken sword and rushing onward, Phantasmion coiled himself with vast force around his foe. But a loud and bitter cry, followed by earnest words of supplication, induced him to relax his grasp, and on the outskirts of the mist, he now beheld a woman's form writhing on the ground and twisting the ends of a silvery veil which covered her face. On one side all was yet dark, on the other the archway was visible, and beneath it an ivory boat to which a team of swans was fastened. The pitcher had rolled to the margin of the brook. Phantasmion caught it up, dipped it in the stream, and, urged by thirst, drank deeply. No sooner had he done so than sleep once more seized him, occupying his senses as fast as vapors in a storm envelop a mountain. He was about to examine a scroll, which he had taken out of the vessel. 
It fell from his hand while the pitcher slipped from his bosom. He sank down in deep slumber with his face towards the stream and heard neither the voice of Caradan in the cloud nor the mournful dirge of the swans which bewailed their lady's anguish with strains that might have preluded their own death and were given back from under the archway with more and more distant echoes. On awaking, he saw that a gray-haired man had hold of his arm. He started up. Boat, swans, and veiled lady were out of sight. The scroll lay upon the ground before him, but the pitcher was gone. "'Who has robbed me of the silver pitcher?' exclaimed Phantasmion, looking wildly upon the old man. "'One who seemed half inclined to take thy life also,' he replied. "'When I came hither, he was standing over thee, dagger in hand, yet appeared irresolute. "'Which way went he?' cried the youth. "'Nay, it were vain to follow him,' the ancient man replied. "'He set out many an hour ago.' "'And took the pitcher with him,' ejaculated the prince." On his spying me, resumed the stranger, he thrust his dagger into his belt, caught up a silver vessel, and went his way. Since that time I have been vainly striving to awaken thee. I guess thou hast been drinking these waters, which flow from the enchanted domain of Melodine, and are well known to produce unnatural sleep. Had I left thee alone in this neighborhood of spells and sorceries, Thou mightest have suffered worse in the loss of a pitcher. I owe thee many thanks, replied Phantasmion. Perchance thou canst tell me where I may find Sanyo, the king's minister. Thou hast found Sanyo already, rejoined the gray-haired man, for I am he. Phantasmion now observed that the air was clear, the cloud confined to the mountain top and that all around looked as when he first came thither, save that the sun was in a different quarter of the sky. Placing the scroll in his bosom, he led the discourse to Penzelimer. Ay, there flows the stream, quoth Sanyo, which ruined him and this poor kingdom. Yet it is my belief that Anthemina would never have seen Dorima's face in these waters, had it not first been pictured in her own fickle heart. They say that Anthemina's child is fair and faithful too, interposed Phantasmion. Sanya smiled. You that are young, he said, search the past only to illustrate the present, while for us that are old, the present has little interest, except as it reflects the past. Alas, how dully! Yes, Anthemina had a daughter by Albinian whom she married, after rendering Penselimer unfit to govern either wife or kingdom. He has no heir, said Phantasmion. Will the son of Arzine succeed him in his throne? I would fain have it otherwise, the old man replied. I have loved Penselimer from a boy, as I loved his father before him. It is for this cause that I repair hither, to call on Melodine, and entreat her to bestow some charmed cup or potent herb that may restore him to his senses. Melodine, exclaimed the prince with emotion, can the hot blast of the desert be persuaded to bear health upon its wing? Sanyo hung his head. Strong desire, he said, has deceived me also. Lest I should be further deceived, I will go hence. Phantasmion accompanied the ancient noble through the tangled grove, cutting a way for him amid the bushes, and, when those impediments were passed, he spoke of his mission and of the succors promised by Magnart. Hope little from him, Sanyo made answer, and trust him with little. Such as he will smile and take in all and give out nothing but what is noxious, glittering bogs. The warmer the sun shines on them, the colder is the air which they exhale. This lord of Polyanthida is the counterpart of this ambitious brother, then, Phantasmion observed. A true copy, replied the minister, in all his fine points and shining qualities. 
Manyard's train hath no eyes in it, yet he loves to unfurl it as widely as if it portrayed the starry heavens, and rears his crest and sweeps the ground with even more pride and consequence than his brother Peacock. I have heard, said the prince, that Glandreth is plotting with Modra to ascend the throne of Albinian at his decease, and moreover to unite Palmland with his dominions. And art thou ignorant, said the old man, that his ships are even now hovering about the coasts of thy country? We know it well, for they carry off sheep and kine from the land of palms, and convey them to the plains of Tigridia, which borders on this realm, as well as on Rockland. Then, cried the young monarch, it is the interest of Almaterra to unite with us against our warlike neighbors, for they will soon be independent of all that her luxuriant fields produce. To second you, the old man replied, but not to begin the war. If I were as young as Panzalimer, and he as sane as I am, we might move faster in this enterprise. Palmland has a youthful monarch. Let him lead the way. End of Part 1 Chapter 14Part 1, Chapter 15 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 15 Phantasmion Returns to Palmland. Sanyo guided his youthful companion to a solitary mansion where he had left his attendants, and the fellow wanderers rested there that night. But before the aged man had left his chamber, Phantasmion was far upon his road, leaping from field to field, and only stopping to inquire his way and procure food. He slept that night in the shelter of an orange grove, having left the desolate region far behind him, and thus he fared till the blooming vale of Polyanthida came in view. He did not take the road which led to Manyard's mansion but passed through a valley betwixt the green hills on the further side of the lake and those rugged mountains which overbrowed them. Here he entered a cottage and exchanged a fine jewel for a bow and a quiver. On hearing the huntsman to whom they belonged describe the sport which might be had by an expert climber in shooting rock goats on the black mountains. Over those wild hills, Phantasmion resolved to take his homeward way. He left Polyanthida and leaped up the crags, passing far above the Valley of Mines and crossing the whole of that mountain district, through which he had already traveled at a much quicker rate than when he wound his way along the lower ridges and stony dells with the fishermen. The contents of a light case, which he had replenished in the huntsman's cottage, satisfied his hunger and, when that failed, he had recourse to the conserve enclosed in his serpent wand. As he vaulted from rock to rock, many an ibex gazed at him with terrified eyes, and one, leaping down a precipice to get beyond his reach, was dashed to pieces. At last he gained the lofty Mount of Eagles, where Irene had been imprisoned among the crags. As he was climbing more than halfway toward the top, and had turned away from gazing on the black lake in the vale below, he beheld a herd of rock goats in a hollow just above him, and soon one of the number, quitting his companions, placed himself at the edge of a jutting crag. How like a child's toy that creature looks, thought the prince, while he thus stands out against the wide background of the sky. A moment afterward his arrow whizzed through the air, but the ibex had leaped from the crag, and there stood in his place a man with a plumed crest, who had been ascending from the vale of the Black Lake, and had hitherto been hidden from view by projecting rocks. The shaft would have hit his forehead as he climbed the crag, had the air remained as tranquil as before. But a strong gust arose and made it slant over the precipice, whence the ibex had leaped. The plumed man made no pause, but waved his hand aloft, as if communing with someone in the air, and continued swiftly to ascend the hill. Phantasmion, hasting forward, 
reached the topmost peak of the mountain by the time that the sun had descended, and while he sought to obtain a view of his own royal domain, beheld on a peak over against him the man from whom his shaft had glanced aside. He was of great size and stature, and wore a plume of glossy white feathers which fluttered in the gale, and now shone, now glimmered, as the moon was visible by snatches betwixt the hurrying clouds. Beside him stood a woman's form, with streaming dusky locks, which the wind raised above her head, and she was pointing to the sea, where it gleamed beyond the dark inland waters like a cloudless part of the sky, and to some vessels off the coast of Palmland. Suddenly she unfurled her wide, transparent wings, which had been lying motionless over her shoulders, and floated away on the wind, which blew toward the land of rocks. This is Glendreth, cried Phantasmion. I know that plumed crest, and he hath for his counsellor Olula, the spirit of the blast. Gradually the wind died away, the moon shone brightly, Phantasmion saw the figure of Olula, like a white-winged bird in the distance, and Glendreth intently surveying that fair country which he hoped to make his own. The youth knelt down, he set his arrow in the bow, and fixed his eye on Glendreth, who stood quite motionless, absorbed in contemplation. Now, thought he, at this moment could I lay him level with the earth, and his schemes should fall with him. Then he cried aloud, Nay, nay, hereafter I will meet him face to face. He was about to rise when a violent blast tore the bow and arrow out of his hand, and, eddying round and round, lifted him on high, then suffered him to fall upon the stony soil as gently as a nurse can lay her infant charge upon a carpeted floor. Phantasmion looked up and beheld a speck in the heavens right over his head. It vanished at the moment when Glendreth disappeared, descending the peak on the side toward the vale of the Black Lake. The prince went on to find a sheltered nook which he had remembered seeing beside the shadowy tarn. There he slept peaceably, forgetting Glendreth and Olula, and seeing only the angelic face of Irene, as it looked when she beheld in his arms the lost infant. At dawn he descended the hill toward the land of palms, and saw the sun light up the white sails of those pirate vessels, of which Glendreth had communed with Olula. He entered a herdsman's hut below the mountain to obtain refreshment. Here a damsel was sitting in company with a youth from the palace, and Phantasmion heard them talk about a council which was to be holden that day concerning the king's absence. So he induced this page, who had never seen his face before, to lend him his horse, and, traveling at full speed, he reached the palace soon after the ancient men were assembled. Not tarrying to change his way-worn garments, he entered the hall of state in the midst of a vehement harangue, on catching the tenor of which he paused, and held up his hand to those who had recognized him to forbid their announcing his name. At this moment, said the speaker, Phantasmion is exploring the central regions, or reveling in the sequestered caves of ocean, or visiting the stars with some arch spirit, and there, no doubt, he takes sage counsel, and learns things of deep concernment to hills realm upon earth. Scarce had these words fallen from his lips, than he perceived the young monarch looking at him with a keen composed countenance, while the other chiefs were full of perturbation, as he stood betwixt himself and the throne. Then all the assembly rose. The brother of Cyrodiil exclaimed, Our king appears, and his gainsayers are put to silence. The presumptuous chief did homage with the rest of the elders, and Phantasmion ascended the vacant throne. Thence he addressed the council, relating all he had learned during his absence, which concerned the welfare of his country, and appearing no more like him who till then had been called the sovereign of palmland, than a tree full robed in leaf and blossom resembles the same tree ere a bud is unfolded. For he was clothed with majesty, and spoke like one who desired and deserved to be a king. End of Part 1, Chapter 15
Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 1 Phantasmion Rescues the Infant Brother of Irene. On the evening of the day on which Phantasmion returned to his palace, he conferred with Potentilla beside the pomegranate tree, and showing her the scroll that fell from the silver pitcher, what is this? he asked. The fairy smiled disdainfully as she read aloud. A record of the agreement betwixt Seshelma and Caradan, the son of Magnart. Seshelma, exclaimed the youth, wherefore does she hate me and serve mine enemies? She hates thee, replied Potentilla, because an ancestor of thine poisoned the waters of a certain spring, and for the same cause she will hate thy remotest descendants. But how is she in league with Caradan? inquired the prince. Is she not Modra's servant? Potentilla made answer. Caradan may have offered some higher bribe, or perhaps she only serves him out of wayward malice. Be that as it may, Modra is but the press that toils to crush the fruit and keeps the empty skins alone while the juice flows down below. I will bring poisonous fish into the lake, says Shelma said to her. Let Irene send them to the house of Magnart in Anthemina's pitcher, which I brought thee from the ocean, so thine enemies will perish, and the charmed vessel will fall into the hand of the steward. But Glandreth will scorn Irene, believing that she has poisoned her own kindred for the sake of that low-born favorite. This plot she framed in order that Caradan might get possession of the charmed vessel, and how Modra has been cheated, concerning the fish thou thyself well knowest. They caused sickness indeed, cried the prince, but not death. Then it was the water witch, he continued, who brought Anthemina's pitcher from the bottom of the sea. Potentilla made no reply to this question, and when Phantasmion spoke of Ulula, she trembled and was silent. At length, however, she said, Be thou guided by me, and I will serve thee against all thy foes without guerdon. Dorimon scorned my words, and I left him to his fate. So saying, the fairy flew away in the form of a chafer, and the prince fancied that he could distinguish her deep droning sounds when her form was hidden among the foliage. It was now very dark, and Phantasmion returned to the palace through groves and alleys where the stars, shining athwart the leafy boughs, appeared like funeral tapers. How did my father perish? thought the youth, musing on the last words of Potentilla. Was it not surmised that he ate poisoned honey? Phantasmion shuddered. Shall I seek aid, he said, from beings like these, freakish and sudden as children, yet steadfast in revenge as the sternest of mankind. But when the young monarch arose with the sun, other thoughts possessed his soul. He remembered the pirate vessels which were plundering the fair plains of Palmland. He conceived a project of driving them from the coast without delay, and seeking the pomegranate tree, exclaimed to Potentilla, at the moment she made herself visible, Once more, give me wings, Make me able to fly over the sea and dive deep into its bosom. The fairy touched him with her wand, and, in exchange for his leaping powers, Phantasmion received those of a water beetle. His body was cased in black mail, and he was furnished with ample means of flight. No sooner was this work performed, and his head surmounted with the crests and fiery eyes of a sea dragon carved on the helmet than having expanded his hard black upper wings with sudden snap and unfurled the soft silvery pinions that lay beneath till they stretched far beyond their dark wing cases, he flew off to the ocean, filling the air with a loud humming and droning, which, when it mingled with the dash of waves below, produced a noise like that of a great water wheel. But when the wind sank and the sea was at perfect rest, he descended and played upon its surface as one that slides on ice runs a few steps, 
and is then borne along the crystal floor without exertion, so did Phantasmion, in his new method of swimming, give a few strokes to the water, then dart on smoothly over the waveless flood, while his jetty corslet now twinkled in the sun like mother of pearl, now blackened suddenly as if a shadow had fallen upon it. Then down he dived, and walked at the bottom of the sea, as long as he could remain there without taking breath. Having enjoyed enough of this pastime, he went in search of the ships that were plundering his subject's cattle. Espying one at a little distance, he flew towards it, plunged under the water, and came up close beside the vessel, the deck of which was crowded with sheep and goats. Great was the perplexity of the crew as they watched the winged swimmer emerge from the deep. The dragon's head rose first, then came to view the curly locks, white brow and animated eyes of a fair youth, then those vast insect pinions and that strange coat of mail. A large net was straight away, brought by one of the sailors, but Phantasmion rushed up into the air amid the roar of waters, uttering loud threats and denunciations. He hovered aloft and made as if he would enter the ship, but the crew, taking him for a demon, sent to carry some of them away into a place of torment, with one accord set up a yell of terror. The captain, who had climbed the mast, thence to survey the monster in the deep, brandished his sword. The sheep and goats huddled together, one over the back of the other, and all the spears and pitchforks which the men had used in their marauding expeditions were turned upward, so that the deck bristled with iron points. Phantasmion wheeled suddenly around, and snatched away the sword of the captain who, endeavoring to make a rapid retreat, tumbled into the sea. The youth plunged after him, as an osprey plunges after a fish, and would have landed him on the deck of the vessel, but the sailors, stupefied with fright, remained in the same attitude as before, and the serried spears were still head aloft to oppose his entrance. Phantasmion, therefore, relaxed his grasp and let the captain fall back again into the water, then violently shaking his wings, though not a particle of moisture adhered to them, he soared away, having first proclaimed aloud that he should speedily return with his armed legions to punish the plunderers. They did not await the execution of the threat, but hastily the whole pirate fleet cleared the coast of Palmland, and, proceeding along that of the adjacent realm, conveyed their booty to the plains of Tigridia. Meanwhile, Phantasmion resolved to steer his course towards the Black Lake and to return home over the Mount of Eagles. He held such a lofty course that his form was not discernible from below, but, having reached the rockland shore, he desired to rest, and softly alighted not far from the spot where he had first seen Sashelma in the concert of Albinian. A remembrance of that strange incident prompted him to approach the low projecting cliff and, leaning against it, to look down into the cave. Having done this, he started, for there, on the same rock which she had formerly occupied, sate the queen with an infant asleep upon her lap. The tide had reached the train of her long robe and was dashing it to and fro, but Modra, heedless of her sumptuous garment, gazed with looks of anguish on the little child, which slumbered peacefully on her knee. The sea was calm and glittered, but if a fish leaped up or a seabird dipped into the water, a shuddering came over her frame, and she looked upon the tranquil ocean with a countenance of despair. A few tears trickled from her eyes on the face of the infant, which started, roused by their heat, then, breathing a soft sigh, resigned itself again to sleep, while the breeze just lifted up and down the delicate rings of flaxen hair that lay in clusters on its innocent head, and tinged with the faint pink of may blossoms, the upturned cheek which, till then, had been colorless, but round and lovely as a gleaming pearl. Modra took the diadem from her burning brow and would have dashed it against the rock, but checked herself through fear of awakening the sleeper and let it fall on the soft bed of sand. Then in a low, lulling tone, she sang these words. O sleep, my babe, hear not the rippling wave, 
nor feel the breeze that round thee lingering strays, to drink thy balmy breath and sigh one long farewell. Soon shall it mourn above thy watery bed and whisper to me on the wave-beat shore, deep murmuring in reproach thy sad, untimely fate. Ere those dear eyes had opened on the light, in vain to plead, thy coming life was sold, oh, wakened but to sleep, whence it can wake no more. A thousand and a thousand silken leaves, the tufted beech unfolds in early spring, all clad in tenderest green, all of the self same shape. A thousand infant faces, soft and sweet, each year sends forth, yet every mother views her last, not least beloved, like its dear self alone. No musing mind hath ever yet foreshaped the face tomorrow's sun shall first reveal. No heart hath e'er conceived what love that face will bring. No sleep, my babe, nor heed how mourns the gale to part with thy soft locks and fragrant breath as when it deeply sighs o'er autumn's latest bloom. But now Phantasmian's heart begins to swell, and he feels impatient of his strange disguise, for Irene enters the recess and fondly bends over the sleeping infant. No sooner had Maudra looked upon that angel face than her own assumed an expression of malignity, all her worst passions being roused by the soft splendor of the maiden's beauty. She bade Irene take the infant boy and walk with him close to the water, that he might be refreshed by the mild sea breezes. Soon I will join thee, she said, and Glendreth will come to conduct us to the boat, and across the lake to the castle. Irene took the babe in her arms, but, in spite of all her care, he opened his blue eyes, and smiling on his mother, encircled her finger, which she had holding up to enjoin silence in playful pertinacity with his fairy hand. Irene unclasped it and, casting a look of wonder on the agitated countenance of the queen, she hastily withdrew. Till the damsel and her charge were out of sight, Maudra stood fixed and rigid, leaning against the rock. When they were no longer visible from the cavern, her form collapsed, and she sank upon the ground with closed eyes. Phantasmion sprang into the air, and the sound of his large pinions was like the whirring of an albatross. He flew over the seashore and hovered above the spot where the damsel was pacing the sands. Irene took him for some large eagle and held the child aloft to show him the great bird which was wheeling about high overhead. Then, with the rapidity of lightning, he slanted downward and dived into the sea, his form being rendered indistinguishable by the swiftness of his flight. Irene was astonished and stood waiting to behold the strange bird reappear, while the baby pointed to the place where it had rushed into the sea and lay back in the arms of his fair nurse, laughing merrily and believing that what he saw was a game of hide-and-seek, carried on for his amusement. But Phantasmion has caught sight of Sishelma lurking in the water, and now he sees her dart onward, now emerge and approach the maiden. At that moment, he rose from the waves, and, before the extended arms of Sishelma had grasped their prey, he snatched it from the hands of Irene, and violently spurning the face of the woman fish with his mail-clad foot, he soared aloft, and became as a speck in the vault of heaven. Before he winged his way homeward, Phantasmion descended once more, to take a last look at the distressed Irene. Poised on his outspread wings, he beheld her with her heavenly face thrown upward and her white arms outstretched, as if she had forgotten all fear and were imploring him that had seized the infant to restore it. Someone approaches her on the sandy shore. By his stately port and plume of waving feathers, Phantasmia knows him to be Glandreth. Irene still gazes on the sky and points to the hovering youth. And now he beholds Maudra rushing across the sands. She utters a loud shriek as she looks at the sky. She tears her hair and flings herself upon the ground. Then arising, she hastens to the side of Glandreth, points at Irene, and seems to be accusing her to him. 
The innocent maiden clasps her hands and still keeps her eye on the infant. Phantasmion dared tarry no longer. He used his wings vigorously and scarcely paused till he had arrived at a pomegranate tree where he was divested by Potentilla of his wings and other strange accoutrements. He then carried the infant to his nurse Liliba and bade her bring him up with as much secrecy as possible. For the remainder of that day, the child drooped like a bird newly placed in a cage and looked strangely on his nurse when he awoke the next morning. But, ere many hours were over, he was smiling in the arms of the youth who had twice preserved him from death and seemed ready to spring away and catch the wild colt which the attendants brought to Gambol for his amusement. End of Part 2 Chapter 1「Phantasmion meets with Irene and Albinet on the banks of the Black Lake. Phantasmion again sought an interview with a fairy, and told her that he desired above all things to win the heart of Irene and to confound his enemy, Glandreth. Potentilla replied, Go then to the Black Lake, offer thyself as cupbearer to Queen Modra, and with my aid thou shalt accomplish both these projects. Having spoken thus, she turned to the bough of a plane tree, where a cicada was pertinaciously chirping, as if it would bear a part in the discourse. She touched the insect, and it gradually expanded, to a vast magnitude, while the sound of its drum grew rapidly louder and louder, till at last it seemed about to split, with its vibrations, the broad trunk and stout arms of the tree on which it stood. Phantasmion exclaimed, With such an instrument as this, I might roam at night through the forests and make the wild beasts fly on all sides. I replied Potentilla, and with an instrument like this, Thou shalt terrify the soul of Glandreth, for I will whisper such a warning in his ear that when he hears that sound, he shall believe his last hour to be at hand. Phantasmion embraced the fairy's scheme with ardor, feeling confident that he should not fail in executing his part of it. Potentilla placed the drum in the forepart of his body and showed him by what slight imperceptible motions he might draw forth the full powers of the instrument. Then, removing her wand to his shoulders, she endued them with wings that might be closely folded down lengthwise and concealed beneath his loose upper vest. Having entrusted the affairs of his kingdom to the brother of Cyrodiil and the royal scion to that of his ancient nurse, he attired himself in garments denoting the office he meant to assume. They were embroidered at the edge with green vine leaves and clusters of purple grapes. Thus equipped, he set forth flying many a league, till he reached the valley of the Black Lake, and stayed to rest on a large tree where he was hidden by the abundant foliage. When he arrived at this station, the king's island, and the whole sheet of water in which it stood, was wrapped in a thick fog, only the edge of the lake being visible beyond the vapory curtain like a rim of lurid steel. Phantasmion looked out from amid the boughs, and after a time began to perceive a small, ghost-like vessel advancing through the mist. It contained two figures, faint and shadowy, a young boy moving the oars and, standing beside him, a damsel clad in white robes and wearing a crown of star-shaped azure lilies, which gleamed within the misty veil. Slowly the boat made way, gradually the figures grew in distinctness, and as the lake looked clearer, and the radiant face of Irene came closer. It seemed to the prince that she, and not the dull red orb on high, was pouring brightness through the sullen mist. Young Albinet, now weary of his task, resigned the oars. Skillfully the maiden drew the boat to land. Then, leaping on the shore, she held up both her arms of gleaming whiteness and lifted the lame child out of the boat. Sister, said the boy, thou wast kind to come with me, when nobody else would venture out. 
The finest summer days often begin thus. Let us sit down here and see the white curtain draw up from the lake. Irene seated herself beside young Albinet on a bank below the tree where Phantasmion was concealed, and soon the child began to amuse himself with plucking purple flags and sticking the blossoms all about her dress, and here and there amid the labyrinth of her locks. Now he would lift up those tresses and spread them abroad in the faint sunshine, till they glittered like a tissue of golden threads. Now heap them together in full masses, which looked as deep and mellow as rich wine in the cask. Sister, said the child, why wilt thou always wear those cold blue water lilies? Red and yellow flowers are livelier than blue ones. I love them because my mother loved them, said Irene. Dost thou think she wears such a crown as this now? said Albinet softly, looking up at the sky. The flowers she wears, replied the maiden, are such as will never fade. Heaven must be very full of flowers, cried he, if new ones come, and yet the old ones never go away. I hope it is not like that picture of a sunny garden which never changes. I hope there are half-open buds in heaven, Irene, and merry milk-white lamps. Heaven is happiness, the maid replied. All that can make us happy, we shall meet with there. I wish, said Albinet with a sigh, that we could get thither without going down into the dark grave. Is there no lightsome road to heaven, up in the open air? My mother never went into the grave, said Irene. She was buried in the waves of the sea. Oh, from the sea, said Albinet. It must be easy enough to climb up into the sky, for I myself have marked the very place where it meets the water. When this fog clears away, if I could get to the top of that tree and look intently, perchance I might descry some very minute trace of the beginning of heaven. Dear Irene, these are no heavenly flowers, for they are drooping already. I will throw them into the lake to send away the fog. So saying, he pulled the chaplet from his sister's brow and flung it into the water, when a large, dark bird suddenly rose from one of the craggy islets and rushed onward, appearing vast and indistinct as it loomed through the mist. Albinet shrieked aloud and fell upon the ground writhing. Irene hung over him tenderly, and when he recovered, she pointed to the dark bird, which now stood on the shore in full view. There is the goblin, she said. No goblins but such as that will ever come near thee and me. The pale boy smiled, and hiding his face in his sister's lap, entreated her to soothe him for a while with one of her soft melodies, and while the fog was rapidly dispersing, she sang words like these. How gladsome is a child, and how perfect is his mirth! How brilliant to his eye! are the daylight shows of earth. But oh, how black and strange are the shadows in his sight! What phantoms hover round him in the darkness of the night! Away, ye gloomy visions, I charge ye hence away, nor scare the simple heart that without ye were so gay. Alas, when you are gone with all your ghastly crew, what sights of glowing splendor will fade away with you? He'll see the gloomy sky, and know tis here decreed that sunshine follow every storm and light to shade succeed. No more he'll dread the tempest, nor tremble in the dark, nor soar on wings of fancy far beyond the soaring lark. I love thee, little brother, when smiles are on thy face. I love thy eager merriment, thy never-failing grace. But when the shadow darkens thee and chills thy timid breast, I'd watch from eve till daybreak that thou mightst be at rest. I dreamt that we were in the grave, said Albinet, roused by his sister from sobbing sleep, and I began to cry, but, behold, it was only a passage, and there was light at the other end. What have we to do with the grave, said Irene, in a sprightly tone. We can never be laid underground, only our worn garments. The earth is nature's wardrobe, for out of it every living thing and every tree and plant receive apparel. 
Ere we go hence, we must replace our garments in the great receptacle, that the old materials may serve to make new clothes for other creatures. Albinet looked at his pining limb. I will have finer clothes than these in heaven, he said, and such as fit me better. Think of our garden favorite, said the maid again. When the streaked petals and shining leaves and upright stem all disappeared, was the dear lily dead? No, no, she might have cried from underground. Though all you ever saw of me is gone to dust, yet I am still alive, and soon shall have fresh raiment fit to appear in, unless the spring proves faithless. Albinet clasped his sister's hand joyfully. We too shall be fresh clothed, he cried, and better clothed, because our spring will be in a far finer soil and climate. Ha <laughs> ha, who knows, but these bodies of ours may be the bulbs out of which our heavenly bodies are to spring, as that caterpillar is the bulb of a butterfly and the poor dry acorn of a branching oak. Then, full of smiles, he ran away to gather blossoms that grew in the lake, the vapors having all cleared off, but soon returning. Sister, he cried, I cannot reach the queen of the whole company. Pray come and lend a hand. Irene had begun to read a letter with deep attention, yet now she rose, and placing stones in the water, erected a little bridge to the floating colony of flowers. But just as she was about to gather one, Albinet screamed aloud, for he had heard the sound of the magical drum, which the prince struck against the branch of a tree in bending forward to look at Irene. The maid was startled, her foot slipped from the stone, and looking up, she beheld Phantasmion, with light wings unfurled, gazing at her from the middle of a broad leafy bough. She knew his face, and remembering how strangely it had appeared to her twice before, she believed the youth was some wizard or guileful spirit, and springing to the bank and catching hold of her little brother, she hastened away as fast as his feeble limbs would allow him to keep pace with her. Phantasmion lightly fluttered down from the tree and, fanning the air with his delicate pinions, quickly overtook Irene and the terrified child. At that instant he lowered his wings, folding them down over his shoulder, and, kneeling before the princess, held out a cup to show what office he sought, and entreated her to favor his suit with the queen. Albinet clasped his sister round the waist and hid his face, that he might not see the object which excited his terror. But the fears of Irene almost melted away, while Phantasmion spoke, and looking at his noble countenance, she could not but yield to the faith which it inspired. I cannot speak for Queen Modra, she replied, but thou shalt be conducted to her presence, and mayest have an answer from herself. She then returned with young Albinet to the boat, which she had overpassed in her sudden alarm, and was soon on her way to the island. Phantasmion went to gather up the flower which had fallen from her hand into the lake, and at the same time espied the letter floating by its side. The name of Semiro and that of Caradan caught his eye as it lay open before him, and guessing that it came from Zelneth, he read what follows while he waited for the boat from the island. Beware of him, dearest Irene, for it is reported that he deals in magic, yes, powerful magic, and I believe the charge. Our house has never seemed like itself since he entered it. Caradan is more despairing than ever, and Lucoya grieves twice as much for her lost love as she did before the enchanter came among us. She seems to have sat too long in the sun. Her cheeks are like a bleached primrose born near midsummer. And oh, what a sun-bright visage beamed on us lately. My cousin, beware of him, if he comes into thy presence. Be not deceived by his heavenly brow, nor his noble countenance, nor his deep sweet voice, nor his gallant bearing. Above all, be not deluded by his smile. That smile I know to be his most pernicious spell. It banishes all natural smiles from the place where it has once appeared. It is a light that puts out other lights, and vanishing, leaves darkness behind it. Our father avers that Semiro was no envoy from Palmland, 
but a spy sent by Glandreth. Ah, oh, folly! Samiro never came from any dominions but his own, whether they be of earth or of some other sphere. Our zine is wroth with him, for the sake of her dear son. That he sought Caradan's blood I believe not, but if he seeks to rob him of that which he values more, thy love, he does far worse. I beseech thee, let him not succeed in this, Irene, let him not work spells on thee, as thou valuest thy good name. I grieve that any suspicion should rest on that, but strange rumours will fly abroad unless thou hearkenest to the suit of Caradan. Pity, indeed, should incline thee to this. Better have nipped his passion in the bud, than suffer the flower to blow in vain, wasting the precious juices of the tree. I could not act thus cruelly, even toward a wicked sorcerer, if I were loved by him as thou art by Caradan. Alas, no one, whose love I care for, will ever love me thus. Yet, loved or unloved, I remain thy loving cousin, Zelneth. End of Part 2, Chapter 2「2, Chapter 3 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 3. Phantasmion makes use of his magical drum. Phantasmion thanks Zelneth in his heart for that warning letter, which seemed so well fitted to defeat its own purpose and by the time that a boat had arrived to transport him whither his heart was bound, he had concealed his wings under a cloak, and every aspiring thought under a countenance of humility and reserve. The queen, when she beheld him, was pleased with the opportunity of engaging so handsome a cup-bearer, and, being engrossed with the image of Glandreth, observed no beauty in him which might not belong to men of lowly station." He looks sedate, yet quick, thought she. I may find him the more useful. At all events, he will be a goodly piece of furniture, becoming a palace. That day, a high feast was holden at the castle, and Phantasmion attended in his place amid the crowd of domestic servants. He placed himself right opposite to Glandreth, and read his face more keenly than any one at the board. He saw the courtier bend forward to address the queen with soft volubility, prolonged smile, and gently suspended eyelid, then, absolving himself from the mimic task, on a sudden resume his lofty port and natural countenance, every smile gone, every muscle braced up, and none but stern thoughts legible on his brow. At one end of the table sate poor Albinian, the mock effigy of a king, his white locks incessantly shaken by the palsied motions of his head. Now and then he muttered a few words, which no one tried to understand but Irene. She, brightest and loveliest, sat beside him, devoting all her looks and words to the afflicted man, but from her heavenly face he turned away, by a miserable fascination, to watch his gaudy queen and the proud injurious noble. Phantasmion could see his eye flash and his teeth chatter with impotent rage, when others perceived none but the twitchings of disease in that distorted face. And now, Glendreth has fixed his ardent eye upon the beautiful princess, but silent reproaches, deeper than any but an angel face could have expressed, were all her answer, and looking back to Modra, he spied suspicion on her lowering brow. He refrained from casting another glance upon Irene, and renewed his discourse to the queen, leaning forward and addressing her with all the tender confidence of a favorite. "'Last night I had a strangest dream,' said he. "'Tis well I have few fears.' Then dropping his voice, and looking expressively at Modra, he added, "'There is but one being on earth who holds me in awe.' "'Tell me thy dream,' answered the queen with a smile. "'I did not think thou hast been a dreamer, "'but the dreams of some are worth more than the waking thoughts of others.' "'I dreamed,' said he, "'that I heard a thundering sound, "'which gradually grew louder and louder, 
till I thought it would shatter myself and all around me with its violence. I started from my couch, expecting, forsooth, to be swallowed up by an earthquake, but all was still and silent. I lay down to sleep, and had no sooner pressed the pillow than these words were breathed into my ear. Glandreth, when thou hearest that sound again, prepare to die. Madra listened to this story with a face full of smiles, believing that it was a feigned tale, intended to elicit from her some mark of favor. She poured out a cup of sparkling wine and bade Phantasmion present it to Glandreth. Long mayest thou live, she cried, and never cease to prosper till dreams like these become true prophecies. When that service was performed, the graceful cupbearer took his station behind the noble guest, and, just as he was raising the wine cup to his lips, having answered the queen's pledge, Phantasmion produced a long, loud, swelling peal from his gong, which vibrated across the back of Glendreth's stately chair through every fiber of his frame, and caused him to spill the contents of the goblet into his bosom. The queen started from her seat with clasped hands, and the whole company were full of amazement. Is that an idiot smile which distends Albinian's face, while he stares upon Glandreth? To Phantasmion it seemed the expression of gratified hatred. Meantime, the proud chief sate trembling, and vainly strove to recover the careless air with which he had related his dream. But Phantasmion perceived that the soft eyes of Irene were bent on him with a regretful look that seemed to say, Zelneth speaks truly, that beaming face and princely aspect are the disguise of a sorcerer. No one else appeared to guess whence the sounds had proceeded. Most of the company had listened to the story of the dream. They cast unpiteous glances on the haughty warrior, and all agreed with one consent that the noise they heard could never have been produced by any instrument which the hand of man had fashioned. Landreth frowned, and it seemed doubtful whether alarm or anger spoke loudest in his heart. Phantasmion retired among the domestics, and wandering while day declined through the woods, on the island he espied, between the foliage, a twinkling light upon the lake. He uncovered his wings, flew up to a tree, and, looking down upon the gleaming pebbles of the shore in the clear moonlight, espied the dark face of Caradan, who at that moment was leaning on a pole in the act of bringing his boat to land. In a few moments he took up the silver pitcher, leaped upon the shore, and looked and listened, as if expecting someone from the castle, then seated himself on a turfy bank just below the prince, and while he embraced the charmed vessel softly murmured these words. I tremble when with look benign thou takest my offered hand in thine, lest passion-breathing words of mine the charm should break, and friendly smiles be forced to fly like soft reflections of the sky which, when rude gales are sweeping by, desert the lake. Of late I saw thee in a dream, the day star poured his hottest beam, and thou, a cool refreshing stream, didst brightly run. The trees where thou wert pleased to flow swelled out their flowers, a glorious show, while I, too distant doomed to grow, pined in the sun. By no life-giving moisture fed, a wasted tree, I bowed my head, my sallow leaves and blossoms shed on earth's green breast, and silent prayed the slumbering wind, the lake, thy tarrying place might find, and waft my leaves with readings kind, there, there to rest. Phantasmion had now taken his resolution. He was about to spring from his place of concealment and contend with Caradan for the pitcher, but his motions were suddenly arrested when he beheld Irene, clad in flowing garments as she sate at the feast, advance through the trees to meet the son of Magnart, and he then became all eagerness to hear what discourse would follow between them. His heart began to sink, and he felt more alarmed for the success of his hopes than he had ever done since he first beheld Irene. The dark youth threw himself on his knees before the princess, and laid hold of her robe, as if to secure her stay till he had gained courage to speak. Caradan, said the maiden, 
I received thy message. Say quickly what thou hast to tell me, for I have little time to tarry here. Irene, said the youth, I have a relic in my possession which once belonged to thy mother. Dear cousin, replied she, hast thou come thus far to gratify that fond wish of my heart? Give me the relic, and I will bless thee for ever. Thou canst indeed bless me for ever, exclaimed the youth fervently, but not with words alone, dear as thy words have ever been to me. Oh, let deeds follow, or thy gentlest words will come in vain, as the dew falls on plants that waste inwardly, having a worm at the core. Nay, Caradan, speak not thus, answered the maiden. Thou hast no worm at the core, but a sound heart, a gallant heart, which will carry thee through a thousand noble enterprises. O oh, lady, sweet cousin, cried the youth, my grief is a jest to thee, if thou couldst understand but half the intensity of my anguish. I know that, out of tenderness and compassion, thou wouldst learn to love me. Not as thou desirest, Caradan, replied the maid. Why wouldst thou force me to promise what I never can perform? If thou hast promised to love me, answered Caradan eagerly, even that thou couldst perform, virtue and kindliness are thy very being, thy every thought and feeling is informed by them. Promise that thou wilt try to love me, and I will go hence the happiest man that ever loved and hoped. That sky, which lately looked so bare and void, now shines with multitudes of stars, and barren plains, which seem to have no germs of life within them, how soon are they covered with flourishing herbs and groves where the birds nestle. Only try to love me, and thy heart, sweet lady, will prove as great a change as this. Dear cousin, answered the maid, we have duties enough which nature imposes. For a heart like mine, I am sure they are sufficient. Never let us make a duty of love. A change came over Caradan's face, and his eyes shot fire as he exclaimed, Thou art more than usually resolute. Perchance thou hast seen a youth from Palmland. Irene was silent. Yes, yes, pursued Caradan with vehemence. A youth like the sun, as my sister blazons him, to thee, no doubt, he seems not less radiant. Oh, he is the rising sun, and I the gloomy night that must retire when he approaches. Give me the relic, good cousin, replied the maid, and I will show favor to no youth from Palmland. Caradan seized the pitcher, and holding it up, he exclaimed, Tell him that I have the charmed vessel on which thy fate depends. Tell him that thou thyself has made it mine. Tell him that I will hide it where it shall never more be found, and then let him fight with me till one or both of us perish. Caradan pressed the pitcher close to his bosom, while his countenance this moment seemed glowing with passion, the next darkening in despair. Phantasmion again prepared to spring forward and challenge him for the pitcher, but restrained himself once more when he beheld Glandreth emerge from the shady wood into the clear moonlight which gleamed upon the lake and pebbly shore. On espying the youth and the maid, he suddenly stopped, holding up his hand as if in astonishment. Irene, exclaimed he, the princess Irene, fair lady, let me lead thee to the castle thou art looked for by the queen. She would wonder indeed to see thee in such company at such an hour. At these words Caradan, whose face Glandreth had not yet seen, rushed forward. Proud man, cried he, my kinswoman owes thee no explanation. My father is her natural guardian, and not thou. What, Caradan, exclaimed Glandreth, hast thou ventured hither? Hence, and bear my defiance to Manyart. I will bear no message from thee, replied the youth. I have a sword here and can stand in my father's place. Hast thou a life to spare, mad youth? replied Glendreth contemptuously. Away, when I am in second childhood, I will fight with thee. I have a life to spare, vociferated Caradan. Do I not know thy wickedness against the mother of Irene? Art thou not in my power? Glendreth approached Caradan, 
who was trembling with passion and bending down his hand which held the sword with a mighty grasp he pointed to the sky while in deep low tones he murmured rash caradan look yonder hast thou forgotten that form phantasmion and the son of magnart both raised their eyes to the sky and beheld the dim outline of a winged figure with the hand outstretched and pointing to caradan while from that outstretched hand lightnings appeared to radiate in quivering lines along the starry vault at the same time a shuddering passed across the lake and over all the woods in which it was embosomed like a stranded vessel that after tossing in violent agitation runs aground upon rocks caradan sank silently to the earth irene covered her face with her hands and even phantasmion's heart was chilled with fear he still gazed upward and observed the form grow fainter and fainter till it finally vanished caradan too raised his drooping head and saw glandreth seize both hands of the fair princess and smile triumphantly in her face then forgetting everything but vengeance he sprang to his feet and dashed the silver pitcher against the forehead of the insulting chieftain at that same moment the isle resounded and all the distant hills re-echoed the tremendous roar of the magical drum during the reverberations of which phantasmion leaped forward full of life hope and energy feeling ready to encounter a world in arms glandreth stunned by the blow but far more overpowered by the terrific sounds which he believed to be the heralds of his death lay motionless on the shore his face streaming with blood the dark youth gazed in perturbation upon the young king of palmland sorcerer at length he exclaimed wilt thou come betwixt me and my foe with spells and witcheries i am no sorcerer cried phantasmion glowing with indignation but it is the most fiendish of all that practice sorcery in whom thy puttest thy trust how speaks the record betwixt seshelma and caradan son of magnart how came that record into thy hands thou robber caradan retorted didst thou not attempt to steal this vessel which i purchased with my own gold thou shalt purchase it with steel as well as with gold cried phantasmion drawing his sword come on there is light enough here to fight by caradan flung the pitcher into the boat and beckoned his antagonist to a firm space of smooth turf clear from trees there they fought in the moonlight guiding their weapons with deadly resolution phantasmion inspired by hope as well as love and courage caradan with no ally to second those feelings but despair the calm lake reflected their bright blades hard by the image of the waning moon which lay motionless on its bosom irene fled to the castle and soon the combatants heard earnest voices and hurrying footsteps of persons who came to separate them both paused at once let us meet again cried phantasmion here is my pledge and throwing his mantle which lay upon the ground on the arm of caradan he plunged into the depths of the wood while his adversary leaped into the boat made it skim round the island and was out of sight from that part of the shore when the armed men reached it the soldiers sought about and found no one but glandreth who was just roused from his swoon and sate upright gazing around him with blood-stained face and looks of bewildered fury End of Part 2, Chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 4 Glandreth is more than ever amazed and discomfited by the noise of the magic drum. Phantasmion stole away through the woods till he came right into the midst of a jovial company who were carousing in the open air. These were the pages and other servants of the royal household. They had heard the awful noise of the gong, and were making haste to drown their fears in wine. The mighty general, they cried, who dreams only of war and conquest. How sober he looked at that spirit-quelling sound. 
Did ye mark, said one, how Queen Maudra started from her chair? There was little sobriety in her demeanor, I trow. Now I warrant, cried a saucy page, after having renewed his courage with a deep draught, while she is planting arbors, entwined with passion flowers in jessamine, wherein to enjoy the converse of Glandreth, when Albinian lies low, he has been looking out for a stronghold on the frontiers, where he may keep her under garrison as far from his palace of pleasure as possible. One good thing will come to pass in those days, cried another. Irene will be queen instead of Modra. Hurrah! Hurrah! shouted the revelers. The moon shall be queen in heaven, and bright Irene upon earth. Hush! Hush! ejaculated an old wine-bibber, who was lying under the rose-bushes. Let the moon hear nothing about it yet, nor Modra either, but mark my words. Here a burst of merriment drowned his sage discourse, but when the uproar had subsided, he raised his flushed face among the pure cool roses and stammered out, Depend on it, that young Irene would rather drink the waters of the sea than marry that wicked miner and underminer who caused Anthemina to drink them. When Albinian dies, cried a sprightly page, the heads of the land shall all be young and handsome, none but a fit spouse, for Irene shall be our king. The revelers cast their eyes on Phantasmion. Come, said one, take this fine fellow, pour some royal blood into his veins, and he shall be the man. Thereupon they crowded round the prince, placed a chaplet on his brow, and made him drink out of many a sparkling bowl, till he caught their spirit and joined them in a blithe chorus after this sort. Ne'er ask where knaves are mining, while the nectar plants are twining, to pull up the vine they never incline, with all their deep designing. Oh, ne'er for the dead sit weeping, their graves the dews are steeping, and founts of mirth spring up from the earth where they are at peace and sleeping. Away with studious learning, when heaven's bright lamps are burning, in the glorious art that gladdens the heart, we cannot be more discerning. Forget the blood that gushes where the fiery war horse rushes. The blood that glows as it brightly flows is making us chant like thrushes. When burdened troops advancing, in cumbrous mail are glancing, with garlands crowned, we reel around, while the earth and sky are dancing. Phantasmion escaped from this boon company, and having entered the castle, espied Glandreth and the queen communing together in a vaulted passage. The chieftain bent his head, and slowly retired to his chamber, but Modra beckoned to Phantasmion and bade him keep watch in the balcony adjoining Glandreth's apartment, that he might render assistance to the wounded warrior in the night if it were needed. The prince obeyed this order with alacrity. He crept to the appointed station, displaced a party of bats, and looked down on his late comrades, most of whom had now fallen asleep among their cups. Glandreth was neither drinking nor sleeping, but drawing a chart of palmland. With his face bent over the table, he had lifted up his pen to mark the very spot where his invading host was to enter the country, at the same point of time when the young monarch, pressing his drum close to the wall, produced an indescribable and intolerable din, which not only made the apartment of Glandreth rock and resound like a belfry, but circulated around the castle, till every dome and tower and vault rang again, and the whole edifice appeared to be a sounding cymbal in the hand of some mighty musician. Phantasmion crouched down, and, peeping through the rails of the balcony, was amused to see that the whole party of sleepers lately scattered up and down among the bushes had started to their feet and were all standing in one attitude, every head thrown back, every right arm appraised, while rooks, bats, owls and swallows, daybirds and nightbirds were flying about in confusion, and the howling of dogs from various quarters of the island sounded as if an enemy had entered the precincts. After having observed the effects produced without the castle for a little time, the prince resolved to enter Glandreth's chamber, under pretense of obeying Modra's command. 
Accordingly, stealing in from the balcony, he found all as still as death. He advanced farther into the apartment and beheld the strong man lying upon the floor, his eyes fixed, his cheeks livid, and the wound upon his forehead sending forth a fresh stream of blood. Modra knelt beside him with a pale, horror-stricken face. A lamp which had fallen from her hand lay burning on the floor and cast a lurid gleam on the blotted map just beside it and on those two ghastly visages while the moon's milder light admitted through the window illumined the rose-crowned head of the royal youth and his light half-raised wings from which his upper vest had slipped aside Modra was too much absorbed to observe phantasmion he glided away and passing into another part of the castle where a lamp shone from the roof he beheld albinian standing outside his chamber door with a wild exultation in his bleary eyes on seeing phantasmion he began eagerly to mutter and gesticulate pointing along the passage as if to inquire what had become of modra the youth was too wary to throw light upon this subject but making a low obeisance hastened on and entered a gloomy passage into which a feeble light was shining from a window at one end and now he heard soft irregular steps approaching some one little and light ran against him by an involuntary motion he erected his gauzy wings which caught the faint rays from the high window while the rest of his figure was shadowy and obscure a shrill scream pierced those darksome recesses then a door opened at a little distance and swift as a coney hides to his hole in the rock young albinet with his bare feet and loose vest hurried into irene's unlighted chamber phantasmion stood at the door and between the pauses of the boy's eager story uttered amidst loud sobs he heard her soothing tones in mild remonstrances let me stay here said the child at length i am happy even in the dark when close to thee but oh sister would that we lived where there is no night for almost half the year in those lands when the sun does set a throng of purple meteors play his part in the sky the very ground too is luminous and reflects the moonbeams from its snowy surface those lands have more light than heat said irene thou dost not love the cold in heaven there will be neither cold nor darkness he answered after a pause but alas now i think on it up in the sky we shall be close to the dreadful thunder and there it will sound as loud as that horrible din which is bellowing in my ears even yet thunder comes from the clouds the maid replied our dwelling will be far beyond the clouds that frown upon this earth there will be no vexing noises no dull silence no shade but the shadows of bright blossomed trees with sunshine all round about them but sleep now oh sleep is scared away for ever sighed albinet never never to come nigh these walls again a few moments afterwards phantasmion heard the soft regular breathing which told that his fearful spirit had ceased to strive with itself then having laid himself down beside that chamber door he too fell asleep and dreamed right pleasantly End of Part 2, Chapter 4。Part 2, Chapter 5 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Part 2, Chapter 5 Glendreth quits the island, and Phantasmion obtains an interview with Irene. When Phantasmion awoke in the dim passage, he heard the inmates of the chamber greeting the dawn with this song. How high yon lark is heavenward born! Yet, ere again she hails the morn, beyond where birds can wing their way, our souls may soar to endless day, may hear the heavenly choirs rejoice, while earth still echoes to her voice. A waveless flood, supremely bright, has drowned the myriad isles of light but ere that ocean ebbed away the shadowy gulf their forms betray above the stars our course may run 
mid beams unborrowed from the sun. In this day's light, what flowers will bloom, what insects quit the self-made womb, but ere the bud its leaves unfold, the gorgeous fly his plumes of gold, on fairer wings we too may glide, where youth and joy no ills betide. Then come, while yet we linger here, fit thoughts for that celestial sphere, a heart which, under keenest light, may bear the gaze of spirits bright, who all things know and not endure, that is not holy, just, and pure. Now for fresh thoughts and fresh deeds, cried the youth, starting up, when the strain ceased, and doffing his withered chaplet, but ere these glowing resolves had taken any fixed shape, forth came Irene, hand in hand with Albinet, throwing light from the chamber full on his face. Then starting at the sight of him, she hurried away, and soon had entered Modra's apartment. Phantasmion stood in a recess, and in a little time, the young boy, going out on some errand, left the door ajar, so that he now beheld the interior of the apartment, where Irene was dressing the queen's hair, and beheld her lovely form as she bent over the task, and her face reflected in the mirror above that of Modra. The stepdame surveyed her own too faithful portrait, and the more she gazed, the more she was dissatisfied with those bleak remains of pristine splendor. A deeper shade seemed to fall over her sunken eyes and the hollows that lay beneath them, so that their reflection and that which was reflected mutually increased each other's gloom, while the soft image of Irene's unconscious face beamed on in pensive beauty. Modra pulled away her disheveled locks from the lily hand that held them, and scowling upon the maiden said, Thy tresses are too thick, Irene. No wonder my work stands still when thou hast such a multitude of gadding tendrils to cultivate. If thou wert a child of mine, I should have them pruned much closer. The damsel understood this hint, and, while her tears fell fast, cut one after another, of her sunny ringlets, and let them fall upon the ground, while Modra looked sternly on, and never seemed to think that she had done enough. Phantasmion's blood was rising. Albinet, at this moment, ran back into his mother's room, and seeing what Irene was about, stopped short in his career. Then, looking greatly astonished, he held her hand, and plaintively inquired, What? Art thou shearing away all thy locks, which our poor father loves to play with? Irene whispered, Hush, it is by the queen's command. Upon which, Albinet looked full in Modra's face and exclaimed, O oh, mother, what harm can Irene's ringlets do to thee? The haughty woman turned away from her child's inquiring gaze and muttered in a low tone to the damsel, have a care that no one else plays with them, no one but thy doting father, or this poor fool. Albinet began to gather up the scattered tresses, while Irene hastened to close the door, having caught a glimpse of Phantasmion's eager face in the mirror. Afterwards, the prince went forth, and saw Glandreth at a little distance, hurrying to the lake, with pale disordered looks, and still the chart of the realm he meant to conquer was in his hand. Terrified, yet unsubdued, exclaimed the youth, and when his enemy's boat was midway between the island and the opposite bank, he knelt upon the ground and drew forth from his body a hollow noise, which was conveyed over the water with great force to the chieftain's ear. Then he saw Glandreth drop the oar and let the vessel drift at random, but Phantasmion arose. I will not break the calm of this sunshiny hour, he cried, with more loud peals. Oh, that these gently trilling birds and that soft breeze could plead for me with my coy mistress. Possessed by such thoughts, he wandered about the flower beds and through many a pleasant copse in hopes that he might find her, but still disappointed, he sadly cried, O oh, harsh stepdame! to keep Irene out of the sunshine on such a day as this. 
At length he approached that ancient tower, detached from the main building, whither he had seen the maiden ascend the night she caught the poisonous fish. Now it cast a black shadow in the midst of the sunny garden. A thousand bees were busy there, but not one murmured over the flowers which lay in that shade. No butterfly flitted across to reach the golden blossoms that basked in the warm rays beyond. The entrance to the tower was open. He went in, and, going up the dark winding stairs, he heard the voice of Albinet. I dare not play in the garden, the boy was saying, for fear of the stranger youth. A soft reply which followed was not audible, and Phantasmion mounted a little higher. Indeed now, sister, I did see his wings, rejoined Albinet. He hides them by day under his cloak. Oh, sister, sister, perhaps it was he that flew away with our baby brother. Dear child, I cannot let thee in, replied the soft voice of Irene. The door is locked and thy mother has the key. Alas, alas, cried the child, it is so dark here. If I had wings, I would fly in at the window which opens upon the lawn. Phantasmion descended the stairs and soon discovered the window spoken of by Albinet. Then, loosing his wings, he flew up to it and, looking into the apartment, beheld the maiden at work on a superb vest which lay floating in ample folds over her lap, while Albinet was crying from without, Sing, sing, Irene, keep singing, that I may hear thy voice. As soon as the damsel espied Phantasmion entering at the window, she turned her face to the door, bent over her task with renewed assiduity, and began singing aloud. The prince attempted to describe the ardor of his passion, to explain his conduct, and entreat the beautiful princess to exchange that gloomy tower for the throne of Palmland. But he wasted his eloquence on deaf ears. Irene kept singing, over and over again, in concert with Albinet, a few verses which her mother had taught her, and nothing would she reply but this. Newts and blindworms do no wrong, spotted snakes from guilt are clear, smiles and sighs a dangerous wrong, gentle spirit these I fear, guard me from those looks of light, which only shine to blast the sight. Do I blast thy sight, cruel Irene? exclaimed the youth, and renewed his passionate prayers, which were interrupted with words like these. Serpents' tongues have ne'er been known, simple made from peace to sever, but the voice whose thrilling tone tells of love that lasts forever, gentle spirit. O oh, gentle spirit, plead my cause, exclaimed the youth, and dissipate this strange illusion. Look up, fairest Irene, I only borrowed wings that I might fly to thee, but take this sword and cut them in pieces if thou wilt. The maid still kept her eyes on a wreath of corn poppies, which she was embroidering, nor stole one look at the kingly brow, with its black arches that inclined towards her in persuasive humility, nor at the radiant eyes of the enamored youth, cast down beseechingly under their full lids and shadowy eyelashes, but still she sang on with Albinet. Beetles black will never charm me, spiders weave no snares for me, Thorny hedgehogs cannot harm me, but the brow where heaven I see, catching beams from sunny eyes, guard me from that bright disguise. As the prince drew nearer to the damsel, she pressed closer to the door, trembling all over, and singing more and more earnestly, and at last she knelt down, wrapping the silken garment round her head and face, and her whole figure, till she was completely enveloped. Thus baffled and utterly disappointed, Phantasmion stood still, and clasping his hands exclaimed, O oh, fatal disguise! O oh, fatal magic arts that have undone me! Thrown off her guard by the earnest tone in which this was uttered, Irene let the robe fall from her head, and looked up, somewhat fearfully, in the face of the youth who stood at a little distance. His eyes met hers. He uttered not a word, but again the maid felt irresistibly persuaded that truth as well as beauty beamed from his countenance. A spell seemed to hold them both silent and motionless, but
but the spell is broken, for a feeble knocking is heard at the partition wall, and Irene starts up to obey that summons, letting Madra's unfinished robe fall upon the ground. She opened the door and discovered Albinian with his head resting on a harp of which some strings were broken. Irene braced them up, and the gray-haired man began feebly to move the chords, murmuring an old melody, the burden of which was scarce intelligible to the prince. But when the damsel joined in the strain, he distinguished words like these. The winds were whispering, the waters glistering, a bay tree shaded a sunlit stream. Blasts came blighting, the bay tree smiting, when leaf and flower, like a morning dream, vanished full suddenly. The winds yet whisper, the waters glister, and softly below the bay tree glide, vain is their cherishing, for, slowly perishing, it doth but cumber the riverside, leafless in summer time. End of Part 2, Chapter 5「Phantasmion」by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 6 Phantasmion joins Irene on the lake. Phantasmion continued to gaze on Irene, unperceived by her father, whose face was turned in an opposite direction, till he heard a key turn in the lock and the voice of Mondra speaking to Albinet. Then he quitted the tower as he had entered it, and roamed about the island, pondering how he might obtain another interview with the princess. That day he poured out wine for a noble company, but Glendreth was absent, and Modra's glances fell upon his empty chair, while Irene seemed afraid to raise her downcast eyes, lest they should meet those of a present lover. The banquet being ended, Phantasmion repaired to the lakeside, and, looking out for Glandreth or Caradan, beheld only the light skiffs of the castle guests lying at anchor in the bay, their gay streamers rustling in a gentle breeze. Albinet sate and looked at them with tearful eyes. It seemed as if he loved to hear the varied intonations of his childish grief. So long drawn out was his sobbing and sighing. I wish that breeze would rise to a tempest ere tomorrow's dawn, he murmured. My sister is to be upon the lake when the sun rises, and woe is me, I am not to be with her. Phantasmion's heart beat high with the thought of a scheme which these words suggested. He dreamed of it, sleeping and waking through the night, and by daybreak the next morning he was hovering over the lake. There all was solitary and silent. Irene was not come. He flew back again to listen at her chamber window, and at last was so far carried away that he softly entered and hung over her like a guardian spirit while she yet slept. Then he tasked himself to examine the separate charms which made up that sum of beauty, the graceful flowing line in which the whole was contained, the full eye gently slanting at the outer side like a dove's, the soft gradation of color from locks of golden brown to the dark thread-like eyebrow and still blacker lashes which, parting from fair white lids, appeared like foliage of a yew branch laden with a pile of snow. It seemed as if the hand that streaks the tulip and the iris and traces the jetty lines down many a milk-white petal had just finished painting that exquisite picture and left it with every tint, bright and fresh, as new-blown flowers. But hush, those eyes will quickly open, and the prince dares not wait to see them unclosed. He repassed the window, and, soaring upward, went and placed himself beside the pinnacles of the castle. From the top of the highest tower, he watched Irene as she went leisurely across the lawn, till she disappeared in a grove between the castle and the lake, and, full of impatience, he still waited with outspread wings, till the prow of her light shallop darted forth from the dark green alders that clustered on the shore. Then, plying his ready sails, he launched into the air, swept over the lawn and grove, and, wheeling round the boat, alighted just in front of the beautiful damsel, who, 
dropped the oars and sat motionless when she saw him arriving. Ah, leave me, she cried. I must needs be alone. The queen bade me go unaccompanied to meet a messenger and receive some token or message for her. And wilt thou be the blind servant of her wicked will rather than reign in my fair land? replied Phantasmion. My sweet princess, thou shalt go with me and never return to give an account of thy embassy. Then he seized the oars and, turning the boat, made it fly over the waters like a swallow traversing the sky. Irene sought in vain to arrest his movements. Gaily the youth smiled when her hand was laid on his strong arm, as if the snow should seek to impede the course of the torrent on which it falls. My father, she cried, alas, my father, thou hast taken his infant child, and wilt thou rob him of me also? I took that child to place him in safety, answered the young monarch, and I will place thee in more than safety. Thou shalt be a queen, and reign over all my subjects, as now thou dost over my heart. Caradan has promised to aid my father against Glendreth, said Irene. What is his aid compared to mine? exclaimed the youth. And what his love compared to that I bear thee? He, he is my mother's kinsman, replied the maid. My father loves him, as he never will love thee, and for his sake... I must shun thee and seek to love him. Would it be less difficult to love me than him? cried the prince. Must thou shun me ere thou canst love him? Oh, if this be true, a thousand enemies and rivals shall never prevail against me. Abandoning the oar, he seized Irene's hand, but with the one still left at liberty, she pointed to the sky. See what clouds, she said have gathered on the mountain top, how threatening they are, how rapidly they are overspreading the heavens. She had scarce finished speaking when the hills, the shores, and the island were shrouded in vapor, while the lurid waters glimmered in a flickering twilight. Lightning rent the clouds on the mountain head and disclosed the black rocks beneath them. Instantly they closed again, but at that signal flash, thunder and a boisterous wind raised their loud voices together, one like sullen threats rising louder and louder into fury, the other like the prolonged scream of maniac rage. A skiff which tossed at a distance, its white sails fluttering as the wings of a tempest-beaten dove, was the last object visible on the dusky horizon. Phantasmion surveyed the sky, in the center of which he seemed to discern one cloud blacker than all the rest, and round it a faint edge of lighter hue. On that dark mass, the youth could not help gazing. It seemed so like the shroud of a winged form. Here and here might be the outstretched pinions, and above these, the head and floating hair. While his face was upturned, a sheet of lightning overspread the cope of heaven. Dizzy and half-blinded, he cast down his eyes upon the lake, and there, beheld the glistering face of Sishelma, upraised by the side of the boat, while her hands were extended to catch Irene. Phantasmion seized the oar, and, driving it betwixt the water witch and the vessel, he thrust her away, then uplifted it again to strike her with all his force. But, like an otter, she darted under the waves, and soon her bubbling laugh was heard at a little distance, amid the voices of the storm. Still the boat goes onward, riding up and down the waves, at each descent seeming about to enter the deep, yet again mounting to the summit of the billow. It drives toward the foot of the lake, and soon approaches the skiff which has been seen on the horizon. Caradan is standing at the prow. Vainly does he stretch out his arms and call upon Sishelma. She cannot bring about that meeting which her arts contrived for a mightier power than hers presides over the storm. The dark youth beholds Irene and Phantasmion together. He may not look upon them long. The skiff is going down. It sinks. Oh, save him, exclaims the maid, and Phantasmion leaps into the tumbling element. It is a desperate enterprise. Those wings, not made for the water, now only encumber him, and Caradan, 
clings round his body with the clasp of a drowning man. Long did he struggle, but in vain. He and his rival were nigh sinking together, when a vessel, conducted by the old fisherman from the lower end of the lake, arrived in time to save them from death. In a little while they were rescued from the waves, and laid at the bottom of the wide bark, where the crew surrounded them, intent on their restoration, and none, save the aged husband of Telza, bestowed a thought on the damsel in the narrow boat. But the storm now abated, and Irene, waving her hand to the fisherman, in token that she needed no help, slowly pursued her way homewards. On the horizon of the plain, beyond the foot of the lake, a border of pale brightness was visible. It seemed to show that there was a silver firmament behind those tumultuous volumes of clouds which had remained unmoved throughout the chaos of the storm. The maid was alone, but for herself she felt no fear. She thought not of Caradan, or of Glandreth, or of the water witch, or of an angry stepdame. She was thinking only of Phantasmion. Her love had hitherto been as a distant strain of music, scarce noted by one that is busily occupied, but now the harmony sounds fuller and more distinct. It will be heard, and the hum of many voices falls into an undersong. With reluctance, she recedes from the vessel where she lately saw him taken in, dripping and senseless. That bark was filled with servants of Manyart, who had been dispatched from Polyanthida in search of their master's son. Learning from the old fisherman that he had gone upon the lake, they ventured through the storm, guided by the old man in the direction of the island, whither they supposed he might have taken his course. Phantasmion recovered wholly while Caradan was just beginning to revive, and while the men in the boat were still bending around the dark youth, he took flight from the stern and hastened to rejoin Irene. Black clouds were yet rolled around the body of the hills, while the head of the lake and one side of the island were still thickly veiled with mist, but the sun began to gild the peaks of the mountains, and a vivid rainbow spanned the waters, which now lay motionless and inky black, as if a trance had succeeded to violent agitation. Again, Phantasmion stood by the side of Irene. With moist wings, he hovered over the boat, while the maid looked up and continued to ply the oars without speaking. But there was a smile on her face, and the youth entered the narrow vessel. Ere that splendid phantom which bent around them had faded away, Irene and Phantasmion were bound to each other by the strongest ties which words can form. Clouds or sunshine might reign without, but their faith was to remain like the dial which stands fixed and changeless, while day and night roll on and can but brighten or darken its face as they are passing over it. Now the youth feels that perfect satisfaction in the present hour which lulls in its tranquil ecstasy all hope, all effort, all reflection, all forecast, even the certain knowledge that the dream must dissolve cannot lessen its charm, that joyfulness of feeling which thought has no power to shake. He took from beneath his girdle the chaplet which had been worn by Zalia, and on which was inscribed, The Queen of Palmland. He showed her the ruby flowers with their leaves of emerald, and the lady smiled, but turned away and again pointed to the heavens. How strange it is, she said, that those wreaths of vapor are yet lying on the lake, when every cloud has left the mountain, and almost all have melted from the sky. Phantasmion cast his eyes around and saw that the welkin was clear, except above the vapory mass to which Irene pointed. There he descried the same noticeable cloud which he had gazed upon in the beginning of the tempest. It was in the form of a cross, and the shape was more conspicuous now than it was alone in the sky. Let us fear nothing, cried the youth. These clouds, too, will disperse like the rest, and we shall have perfect sunshine. Scarce had he spoken thus, and placed a chaplet on Irene's brow, when a boat shot forth from the dark mist. Glandreth was standing at the prow, and that vessel was followed by a train of others which, at his command, 
surrounded Phantasmion and Irene. In a few moments, the youth was bound with cords, which fastened his arms and delicate pinions to his body, and, while Glandreth's armed men were dragging him away to the castle, he beheld the chieftain conducting Irene to the shore, then Modra, hidden among the trees, jealously watching his actions, then the drooping Albinian with his lame child on their way to the lakeside. Albinet pulled his father's arm as Phantasmion passed him. Look at his shoulders, he said. Now see his wings by daylight. The cross-formed cloud had disappeared, and the sky seemed an endless depth of sunny blue when Phantasmion was hidden from daylight in a subterranean vault of the castle. End of Part 2, Chapter 6「2 Chapter 7 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 Chapter 7 Phantasmion escapes from prison and presents himself to Irene in disguise. Dark and cold was the place in which Phantasmion was confined, and such as might have chilled a less ardent temper than his, but he paced the stone floor like a leopard in a cage, devising plans of escape and nursing hopes of vengeance. He had now leisure to review the events of the morning, and now he surmised that Modra had sent Irene to meet Caradan at the suggestion of her wily counsellor, because she desired at any cost to remove her from the eyes of Glandreth, that the dark youth had planned to carry her away, and that their schemes and his own had been frustrated by the intervention of Olula. The spirit of the storm cannot conquer the heart of Irene, cried he. Other things may change for the better, and that will never change for the worse. Thus he hoped and triumphed, but no food was given him, and his limbs were painfully pinioned, so that after a certain length of time he sank on the floor, exhausted and spiritless. His eyes were fixed in anguish on the massy door at the top of the stone steps, by which he had descended into the dungeon. When he heard the bolts withdrawn and, in a few moments, Glandreth stood before him, sumptuously attired and with a flaming lamp in his hand. King of Palmland, said he, with a smile, why hast thou chosen to conceal from a brother chief thy rank and dignity? A brother chief? ejaculated the captive in high disdain. I know thee now, pursued Glandreth, and can offer terms suitable to thy rank. Deign to read that scroll. I may not tarry to hear thy reply, for I must visit my fair mistress Irene, who will brook delay on my part worse than thou wilt. Early to-morrow thou shalt see me again, and the light of the sun also, if thou approvest the conditions. So saying, he placed the lamp and the scroll on the ground beside the prisoner, and without loosing his bands, or giving him a morsel of food, quitted the dungeon. Phantasmion began to peruse the writing laid before him by his adversary, and found only such proposals as roused his indignation. No, he exclaimed aloud, rather than yield half my kingdom, and, what I value more than the whole of it, my claim on the hand of Irene, let the floor of this dungeon be my deathbed. Here, let me perish, since Potentilla does not come to my aid." Just as he had spoken thus, Phantasmion beheld a multitude of sawflies with yellow bodies and black heads flitting toward the light of the lamp. Along with them came numbers of wasps, and the youth shrank as he beheld the mingled swarm approaching himself. He had little cause for fear. They alighted on the cords that bound his arms and wings, and setting resolutely to work, the wasps with their jaws, the flies with their rasping instruments, they severed the tough threads, till the prisoner, by single effort, snapped the weakened bands. At that moment, his arms were stretched at full length, and his wings broke forth like the tender leaves of a tree when released from their gummy sheath. Away flew the whole company of wasps and flies, and, while they were disappearing by the narrow space between the bottom of the door and the top of the stairs, Phantasmion perceived a host of bees entering on the opposite side. 
they flew to a corner of the roof, and holding up the lamp, he saw that waxen combs were suspended above his head, and that the bees were there depositing the honey which they had just collected in the gardens of the island. Phantasmion now acknowledged that he had not been neglected by Potentilla, who had been employed in his service ever since he entered the dungeon. He soon gained possession of the luscious store which the bees abandoned at his approach, and having feasted on the honey, found his strength and his hopes returned together, nay, felt as jocund as one that has drunk new wine. In this mood he passed the remainder of the night, and when a few faint rays of the dawn found their way beneath the door into his gloomy abode, he ascended the steps to examine a painted roll which Glandreth had let fall as he left the dungeon. It was all emblazoned with gay devices, in the midst of which Phantasmion read these lines. False love, too long thou hast delayed, too late I make my choice, yet win for me that precious maid, and bid my heart rejoice. Then shall mine eyes shoot youthful fire, my cheek with triumph glow, and other maids that glance desire, which I on one bestow. Make her with smile divinely bland, beam sunshine o'er my face, and time shall touch with gentlest hand what she hath deigned to grace. O'er scanty locks full wreaths I'll wear, no wrinkled brow to shade, for joy will smooth the furrows there which earlier griefs had made. Though sports of youth be tedious toil, when youth has passed away, I'll cast aside the martial spoil with her light locks to play. Yes, turn, sweet maid, from tented field, to rove where dewdrops shine, nor care what hand the scepter wield, so thou wilt grant me thine. Before the lamp expired, Phantasmion fed its flame with this testimony of his rival's passion, then reascended the steps and stationed himself beside the door. Hearing a key thrust into the lock, he hovered above it on balanced wings, face downward, and, while Glandreth was beginning to descend, rushed past him out of the dungeon. The fugitive played his vans faster and faster till he had cleared the island. Then away over the lake he floated through clear fields of air as if borne along by a breeze, without a movement of his outspread pinions. He alighted in the midst of that thicket where he had formerly spent the night and looked about with momentary dread to see that no snake yet lurked there. Scarcely had he finished hiding his wings when the fisherman's ancient dame came in sight and, being startled at his unexpected appearance, let her bundle of sticks fall to the ground. The youth accosted her kindly and began to collect her scattered burden while she seized the opportunity of chatting and asking questions. Thou hast travelled far since we saw thee last, she cried. But there is no city in Almaterra so well worth going to see as the capital of this country, the Amantha. How knowest thou that I have not gone to see it? said the prince with a smile. I think thou wouldst hardly come away, said Telza. Just as the court are going thither. Are they going thither? inquired the prince. Ah, uh, methinks I heard tell of this. And when will they set out? This very day, replied the dame. Come to my cottage, and thou wilt see them pass. By the time that Phantasmion reached a rising ground, just beyond that lowly cot, the royal train might be seen winding along the vale and long after they were out of sight, he stood looking after them wrapped in thought. Telza marked his countenance. The last time thou wert here, said she, our lovely princess passed by. Truly, till thou hast seen her, thou hast not set eyes on the fairest thing in Rockland. Phantasmion partook once more of Telza's hospitality, and learned from the fisherman, her husband, that Glandreth was not travelling with the king and queen, but was still at the island. Forthwith, he resolved to follow Irene, and taking leave of the aged pair, pursued his journey alone. But presently, fearing that he might stray out of the right course, he looked about for someone to guide or direct him. 
So doing, he espied a number of tall peasant girls with baskets on their heads, and saw them sit down by the wayside to eat their provisions. "'Who are these lofty maidens?' inquired the youth. A passing countryman to whom he had spoken made answer, "'They come from a certain glen, and are bound for a neighboring town, where they expect to sell the fruit in their baskets. Some of them will not need to go so far, for this evening they will overtake the royal household, who are already encamped at no great distance.' Phantasmion approached one of the damsels. "'Are all the women of your valley as tall as thou and thy comrades, fair maiden?' he said. "'No women are so tall as those of our glen,' she replied. "'And no fruit is so fine as that, which we gather at the tops of our hills. Prithee, taste and buy.' "'I will buy the whole basket,' answered he, "'if I may purchase thy cloak and headgear too.' And how might I procure the secrecy of thy comrades, were I to go along with them thus disguised? That affair was quickly dispatched by the mountain maiden, who dighted the prince in her upper vest and muffling headdress, placed her basket on his head, and departed to a cottage hard by, with more gold in her hand than the baskets of all the company were like to gain. The prince went on with the rest of the band, and about evening espied a number of tents erected at the entrance of a wood. The women were soon dispersed among them, eager to gain purchasers for their fruit, and Phantasmion, having learnt that the princess was wandering in the forest, hastily went in search of her, followed by some of his new associates. Soon he hears a rustling amid the leaves, a bird falls from its lofty perch, and young Albinet shouts for joy. Sister, he cried. My little bow and arrows will shoot as well as the longest and strongest in the land. I pray thee aim not at me, young archer, cried a voice from amid the trees, nor take me for a white heron or a long-necked crane. Phantasmion hastened on. The voice was at some distance, but believing it to be that of Irene, he wondered at such lively tones. Soon he entered a glade, where three white-robed damsels were standing beside a rivulet, the first, who was looking toward the wood, was Zelneth. Irene and Lukoya were talking together at a little distance. The youth drew his headdress, which he had begun to push aside, close over his face, while his comrades offered their fruit to the lady. "'Here are the tall mountaineers,' cried she, "'with their pleasant cloud berries. Let us sit beside that elder tree and eat the dainty fruit.' Phantasmion was, by this time, kneeling before Irene and vainly endeavoring to catch her eye, unperceived by Lukoya. But Zelneth called him away to place the fruit in his basket on broad leaves which grew near the brook. And while this repast was eaten, the maiden's talk went on. "'I have little doubt,' said Irene, "'that we shall find Caradan at Diamantha, near the northern palace.' Arzine's heart may soon be set at ease. Nay, cried Zelneth, it is more likely that we shall find him about the Black Lake, for it was there that he escaped again from those who were sent to bring him home. Was he imprisoned in the dark vault of the tower or in the castle? asked Lukoya. Caradan imprisoned, said Irene. I meant that other youth of whom thou and Zelneth were speaking, replied her cousin. He was confined in the tower, answered Irene with tears, and perhaps he is a prisoner still. And thou didst nothing to set him free, exclaimed Zelneth. I would have died, here the damsel checked her hasty speech, struck by an eager countenance, which reminded her of Semiro. But Phantasmion turned away, and the startling likeness was forgotten when Irene offered her a key, and in earnest tone, rejoined, Then go thou to the island and open his prison door. I am ready to attend thee, Zelneth, cried Lukoya, quickly rising from her seat. Why didst thou not release the captive thyself? said Zelneth as she took the key. I was prevented by the queen, Irene replied. She met me as I descended the steps of the tower where I had discovered it beneath the tapestry, and, full of misplaced suspicion, 
angrily sent me to my chamber. And thou wilt seek for Caradan, said Zelneth, while we perform this charitable errand? Oh, hasten to perform it this very hour, exclaimed the lovely princess. Yon cloud above the wood is yet full of radiance, and even when the sun declines, it is pleasant travelling by the softer beams of the moon. Which will not rise this night, sweet cousin, Zelneth made reply, for that favouring countenance we may vainly pray, as luckless Caradan does for thine. Then the three slender damsels, and the man-like mountaineers, with their princely companion, quitted the lawn, and pursued their way through the wood. Come, Albinet, we are returning, cried Irene. But the boy, with a laugh, went and hid himself among the underwood. Pantasmion kept by the side of Irene, and when Zelnet and Lukoya stepped forward, he pulled her robe. The princess looked up in surprise, but at that moment the dark-eyed maiden turned back to address her cousin. What will our mother think of this journey? she cried. And after all, what thanks shall I earn? A thousand thanks, said Irene, blushing deeply. From thee, but not from him, murmured Zelneth. I will never repine, Irene answered, whatever guerdon he offers thee. Zelneth smiled and again stepped forward with Lukoya. Phantasmion once more touched Irene's robe and whispered, I am here and subject to no will but thine. Joy now animated her trembling frame, and when Zelneth addressed her once more, she wondered at the glow of happiness that mantled on her cheek. Unhappy Caradan, sighed the maiden. Hush, cried Irene, my father is approaching. Then Lukoya impatiently beckoned to Zelneth. Come, sister, she cried, if thou art resolved on this journey, we must mount our steeds without delay. The daughters of Magnart now departed after taking leave of their kinswoman, who remained within the wood, and beheld the sun's crimson orb half sunk below the distant plain, betwixt bare shafts of trees, which looked like pillars of ebony. Over their rugged roots, Albinian was slowly advancing, his thin white locks just tinged with red by the sunbeams. Glendreth and his armed band were close behind, their casks glittering brightly, while their shadows blackened the ground. The chief strode on before them, passing Zelneth and Lukoya without a glance, for he had discerned Irene in the wood. With firm step and lofty port he came, while the tottering Albinian hurried on when he perceived his approach, and went to lean upon the lady's arm. Give me the hand of the fair princess, thy daughter, said Glendreth, and thou shalt have a firmer support than she alone can give. The old man's face appeared convulsed with inward passion. He strove to speak, but words failing him, shook his head and waved the chief away. Glendreth, incensed by the refusal of Albinian, impetuously took the lady's hand from his, and the feeble man, overthrown by that sudden movement, fell to the earth. Irene turned her indignant eye upon the proud usurper, and would have knelt by the side of Albinian, but the chief detained her hand, till Phantasmion, leaning forward from the group of damsels, forced him to release it, seizing his arm with no friendly grasp. Astonished that a woman could assault him thus, he turned about and was wounded at that moment in the cheek by a small arrow which flew from the underwood. Then, believing himself surrounded by concealed enemies, he shouted to his armed men, who were still in the background. They hastened into the wood, but scarcely had they entered it, when a cloud descended from on high and hung like a canopy over the tops of the tall trees. That canopy was composed of innumerable winged insects. Every moment it grew thicker and thicker, and the soldiers groped about in total darkness, unable to find their chief. He, meantime, was battling with armies of moths, which, as fast as he cut them away with his sword, continued to swarm around him, undiminished, and soon his men-at-arms were engaged in a like manner. They ran against the trees, and strangled in all directions into the wood, trying to escape from their countless antagonists. Phantasmion seized by mistake the robe of Albinian, who was clinging to Irene, and whispered in his ear, My fairest, 
Dost thou still love the stranger from Palmland? A low groan was the only answer to his fond inquiry. The youth let go his hold and rushed away to a little distance. There the cloud of insects dispersed right above his head, and, looking up into the clear space, he beheld Potentilla, cloaked in white moth wings hovering aloft. She beckoned to Phantasmion. He dropped his feminine garb and, soaring upwards, floated by the side of his guardian fairy through the dim grey sky. By the time that both were out of sight, the wood was free from insects, the sun's flaming ball had sunk, and no moon had arisen, but one large star was shooting its diamond rays just over the top of a sable fir tree. End of Part 2 Chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Phantasmion » by Sarah Coleridge « This LibriVox recording is in the public domain » Part 2 Chapter 8 Potentilla weaves a wondrous web for Phantasmion Potentilla guided Phantasmion to the chief palace of Rockland, situated between the sea and Diamantha, after he had procured the dress of a peasant by the way. The travellers rested in an orange grove, and when the prince besought Potentilla to deliver Irene from the power of Glandreth and Modra, she made answer, Tomorrow the courtly company will arrive at this place. I cannot give thee troops of horse and men in armor to meet them, but I will exhibit a strange spectacle, and while the crowd are gazing at it, thou mayest carry off the princess to the seashore. There the son of Manyarth hath a skiff in readiness, for he still hopes to win Irene and carry her to a secret bower in Nemorosa. This vessel, if thou art beforehand with him, may transport thy fair one and thee to Palmland. The heart of Phantasmion bounded with joyful expectation when he heard the fairy speak thus. He donned his rustic disguise, took a pruning hook in his hand, and, when he saw anyone approach, seemed to be busy among the shrubs. He fed on the fruits of the garden, and at night lay down to sleep in a clump of trees close by the principal entrance to the royal domain. Right in front of that gate, at the top of a gentle ascent, over which the road led to the Diamantine Palace, was a triumphal arch of light architecture, erected to commemorate the conquest of Tigridia, but now overgrown with climbing plants and decked with their gay blossoms. Phantasmion had not reposed long when he was awakened by an eager dream. He thought he saw the royal procession enter the great gate and advance toward the archway. One by one the company seemed to be pacing along. Irene passes, but still he is chained to the turf where he lies. The damsel floats on. She gains the arch, but... Just as she is about to disappear, Phantasmion starts up. The dream has vanished, but the scene remains, and by the pale light of the midnight sky, he discerns a strange object under the festive fabric. A spider, as big as a wolf, is wheeling round and round within the circuit of the lofty arch, spinning and weaving as she goes. The framework of her giant web is formed, the warp is laid out, and now she is traveling round and round to fill in the gummy woof. Not long afterwards, Phantasmion beheld the fairy artisan depart in the manner of spiders, shooting long lines into the air and seeming to fly without wings. Upwards she travels, and now she darts across the moon's bow, and now she is a black spot in the midst of a twinkling constellation. Phantasmion slept again and the first object that struck his newly opened eyes was a magic web, looking like a wheel of fire in the rosy light of morning. Anon those flames expired. Every spoke and cross thread appeared to be a shining icicle, and the whole might have been taken for a crystal net, but soon the elastic substance began to undulate beneath a gentle breeze, and all the scarlet blossoms which flaunted over it were softly heaved up and down. Phantasmion feared that the delicate apparition would melt away before the travelers arrived, but the sun, 
as it grew stronger and stronger, had no power to dissolve that fabric, and, while a crowd was advancing from the palace to view it close at hand, the courtly train, being suddenly arrested on entering the great gate by this unexpected sight, and utterly forgetful of every other object, stood gazing in wonder at the magic web. Phantasmion easily recognized Irene amid a bevy of damsels. Though she and all of them were veiled from head to foot, he shaded his brow with his peasant's cap, and, approaching the princess, eagerly whispered, Come with me, and I will explain this wonder. The lady started, threw down her veil, which she had partly drawn aside to survey the spectacle, and after a few moments' hesitation, stole away into the wide plain beyond the precincts of the palace. Phantasmion followed, full of hope and joy, and beheld Irene, fleet as an antelope, speeding across the moor. She had gained some ground at first, and so swiftly did she bound along that the youth came not up with her till she had sunk down among the trees of a shady copse. Great was his surprise when he arrived here to find the princess, her veil thrown off, clad in the habit of a shepherdess, with a crook in her hand. Wherefore is this disguise? he cried, and why hast thou fled hither? On the sea coast we shall find a vessel wherein we may sail to Palmland and thence up the great river to my very palace gates. Irene replied, My heart is thine, and yet I may not go with thee. I am bound by a vow to make a pilgrimage elsewhere. The strongest proof of love which thou canst give will be to let me instantly depart, and ask not whither I am going. Phantasmion felt like one who has dreamt of golden fruit, and waking, sees what he had dreamt of glowing nigh, but finds his arms fettered, his feet fastened to the ground. This device of thine, she said, has enabled me to escape, just as I had begun to despair of what I so anxiously desired. If my enterprise succeeds, I shall owe that happiness to thee. Cheerily the maiden spoke, yet could not choose but weep, while Phantasmion remained speechless and tearful, looking in her face with imploring eyes, as if he hoped by the mute eloquence of his grief to melt away her resolution. Irene cut off one of her long ringlets, tied it round the arm of the sorrowful youth, and smiling playfully yet tenderly, bound him with that silken fetter to the branch of a shrub. Farewell, she said, when next we meet, thou mayest fasten the chain on me, and if it binds me to thyself, believe that I will gladly wear it, even to my life's end. Then she took up her shepherd's crook and hastened away, nor turned her head till her motions were scarce to be discerned by him she left behind through the dimness of distance. Phantasmion sought not to follow her, but, long after she was out of sight, he stood in the same attitude as when she disappeared, clasping the glossy ringlet in unconscious hands. At length he moved away, and, wandering along with uncertain steps, found himself once more beside the archway. It was now past noonday, and all the gazers had dispersed, but still the magic web remained, and, while he was looking at it with sorrowful eyes, he saw a beautiful bird, called a chinquis, fly into it, and become entangled in its meshes. While it fluttered there, he recognized it as one which he had been wont to caress and feed in palmland, and which had gained the name of the moon bird, from the sky-blue moons or mirrors which adorned its wings and train. Poor bird, said the prince, thou hast followed me hither out of love. Thou shalt not perish in these toils, if I can set thee at liberty. He threw off his upper vest, fanned the air lightly with his pinions, and, forgetting the supernatural strength and tenacity of Patentila's work, labored to free the bird till he himself became entangled and struggling to disengage his wings, was only the more firmly glued to the web. Thus he hung, suspended in the center of the arch, with a moon bird by his side, while a set of rustics who beheld him from the open gate believed him to be some deity that presided over the feathered tribes, and gazed at his wings in silent wonder. All his struggles to escape were vain, till a large eagle, rushing upon the moon bird, became likewise entangled in the toils. 
he with his strong pinions shook the net so violently that at last it was rent asunder. Aloft he flew with a great part of the web clinging to his back, and Phantasmion was dashed upon the ground. For some moments he lay under the triumphal arch with his eyes closed and his senses gone, but coming to himself, he beheld the pretty moonbird hovering affectionately over him. Then he arose, drew on his cloak, and hastened out of the royal precincts. Having gained a lonely place, he tried his wings, but, finding they were too much injured to sustain him aloft, except during very short flights, full of sorrow and perplexity, he took his way to the seashore. Caradan had gone thither before him. Caradan stood on the rocky beach, and raising to his lips a trumpet-formed shell, produced a sound in which the tones of the wind, as it whistles through a crevice, were combined with a deep, full, swelling voice of many waters. That blast was borne over the liquid plain, and soon a woman's form arose from the ocean. The setting sun threw its orange glow on the bloodless visage of Seshelma, as onward she came, cleaving the amber flood. A smile widened her flat face and glittered in her yellow eyes, unshaded by lashes, and, thus illumined, her countenance looked like that of a demon, brightened by surrounding flames. "'Where is Irene?' exclaimed Caradan. "'Hath my rival carried her away, and have thy promises come to this?' "'Irene is gone to Nemorosa,' replied the sorceress, "'and he to whom she has given her heart is not far off.' At these words, Sashelma smiled maliciously upon Caradan, and the youth uttered a deep groan. Accursed be the day, he cried, when I entered into a league with thee. Irene loves my rival, and what fruit have I of this wicked bond? Do my bidding as heretofore, said the woman fish, and thou shalt banish thy rival from the maiden's heart. Away, cried Caradan impatiently. Thy promises are but vain lures. What? was the reply. Have I not put into thy hands the silver pitcher? That is true, cried the youth. What hast thou to propose? The king of Palmland, she answered, hath Irene's infant brother secreted in his palace. Place that child in my power, and I will cause the maiden to believe that Phantasmion has delivered him to me. Agree to this, and I will transport thee to his royal domain long before he can return to it. Thou shalt travel swiftly by the sea and up the large river which flows past the palace of Palmland to enter the ocean. Cold drops stood on Caradan's brow while he debated within himself on this proposal. At last he exclaimed, Oh, never will I betray the child that Irene loves to this monster. One sacrifice... I have promised. To gain that heavenly maid, I have made a vow which renders me unworthy to possess her. Surely, I have never loved the right. Seshelma laughed, and that long-drawn jeering laugh blended with the bubble and hiss of the waters, and died into the piping of the wind. But no angry emotion ruffled the glazed surface of her face as she fronted the youth's agitated countenance. Do as thou wilt, she replied. Perchance thou art wise to cease contending in this cause, for who can alter the fixed purposes of fate? There are spirits of the flood that can see into futurity. Did they tell thee of her I love? interrupted Caradan with vehemence. Shall the maid be mine? Never, answered Seshelma, and again she laughed, while it seemed as if her laugh was re-echoed by a lurking train under the waters, till it passed off into the noises of the ocean. Treacherous fiend, Caradan shrieked aloud. Shall Phantasmion possess Irene? Dost thou answer yes? Unsay that word, and I will come and dwell with thee, all hideous as thou art, in dark and breathless caves forever. Furiously he rushed forward and seized her extended arm, whereat, a lightning flash of electricity shot through his frame. His impotent grasp relaxed. 
he stood motionless, cramped in every muscle, and with anguish-stricken eyes, bent in fixed stare upon the deep, beheld the enchantress, holding up her hands in mockery, while she retreated backward through the ocean, leisurely rocking up and down with the waves, as if she resigned herself like a drifting vessel to their guidance. End of Part 2, Chapter 8Part 2, Chapter 9 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 9 Phantasmion Returns to Palmland by Sea. Meantime, Phantasmion approached the seashore by a thickly wooded gorge, the lovely Chinquis flying by his side or before him, then rushing up among the trees to play hide-and-seek with her master, as she had been wont to do in the groves of palmland. From between the last rocks of the valley appeared a small portion of the sea, in the midst of which a little skiff moved on the dark waves with white sails gleaming in the twilight. The moon bird paused not with Phantasmion to note that object, but skimming on, now hither, now thither, with careless waste of motion, flew unawares, against the face of Caradan, as he turned an angle of the winding road. The youth, being suddenly startled in his miserable mood, lifted an angry hand and smote the bird with such force that it fell to the ground, whereupon Phantasmion sprang forward, and the two princely rivals stood face to face. "'Well met,' cried the young king of Palmland. "'I have not come hither in vain, since I have encountered thee.' Let us fight now for that pitcher which hangs to thy girdle. So be it, cried Caradan, hastily and fastening the vessel. I will show thee a good place, smooth and light. He hurried on till, coming within a stone's throw of a chasm amid the rocks, he raised his hand to fling the pitcher down that dark abyss, hoping thus to prevent its falling to the lot of his rival. Let the event of the conflict be what it might. But Phantasmion, springing forward, stayed his arm. The pitcher fell at his feet. Caradan, in desperation, drew his dagger and was rushing on his unguarded adversary when the moonbird, which had risen from the ground unobserved, flew upon him and darted her beak into his eye. A stream of blood gushed down his cheek. He was still feeble from the effects of Sishelma's touch, and overpowered by this second blow, he fell fainting on the ground. Phantasmion resolved to secure the pitcher and fight with Caradan on some future opportunity. He began to draw it from under the body of the youth, who opened his eyes and groaned deeply, but had not strength to stir. The prince saw that his lips moved, but no articulate sounds reached the listener's ear. He desisted for a moment, then renewed his attempt, and, pulling out the pitcher, sought to place it under his cloak, but the handle slipped out of his fingers. He took it up again, but the same thing happened. Then he would have seized the vessel by the lip, but like those insects which elude the grasp with their finely polished cases or pliant hair, it still glided away. He might as well have tried to hold quicksilver, and, after many vain attempts, he began to suspect that he was foiled by some invisible being. Can Sashelma prevail here, he cried, among rocks and trees and flowery banks? Phantasmion cast his eyes around him on all sides. At a little distance from the place where he stood grew a tall branching plant, sheeted with blossoms, which at this evening hour were newly opened, when other plants had closed their dewy cups and bells. At midday, the hue of those flowers would have looked wan and spiritless, but now that the sky was sobered, now that scarlet and crimson began to blacken, while blue, lilac, and green were glowing all alike, the silver-yellow gleam of the broad disk, which gathered in the light like eyes of nightbirds, had a noticeable luster, and they seemed to be the beautiful spectres of blossoms that had perished in the day. Just above that luminous plant appeared another spectre, 
yet more softly resplendent. It was the fairy Fadolin, with warning hand outstretched toward the youth of Palmland. Phantasmion, she whispered, the tears of Arzine have prevailed, and even against thee I must guard her true and son. Go hence, I beseech thee, and trouble him no more. The young monarch obeyed. He proceeded down the glen, and looking back, ere the path turned away, beheld the delicate fairy pouring balm from a chalice on the eyes of Caradan. And now Phantasmion has entered the little skiff, and is about to leave those hostile shores, when on the summit of the cliff, high overhead, he beholds two figures, the indistinct lineaments of which, seen through the dusk, fill his soul with apprehension. That stony outline of an armed form, sharp as a rugged rock, and that soft, quivering plume, belong to none but Glandreth, while, on the other side, vast wings upraised, and moveless bespeak the presence of Olula. She points to an eagle that flies overhead with threads of network hanging from its feathers. It is the one that rents Potentilla's web. Glandreth looks after the bird, then eagerly renews his discourse. What words he uttered were inaudible to Phantasmion, but the gale brought to his ear Olula's resonant reply. Phantasmion has not carried her away. She is gone to seek a spring of healing waters. For the sake of Albinian and of Albinet, she roams afar. The youth listened eagerly. Glandreth's discourse was a dull murmur, but Olula spake again, and her words appeared to have been blown through a trumpet. While Phantasmion goes in search of Irene, Glandreth shall conquer the land of palms. Then Glandreth shouted for joy, till all the rocks re-echoed, and Phantasmion saw that Olula had disappeared from the cliff. He was still watching Glandreth, and listening to the uproar which his voice raised along the shore, when the little vessel in which he stood was suddenly lifted up and whirled about in the air, while the sea dashed and roared and eddied underneath as if a waterspout had fallen on the spot. The moonbird, having no power to resist that blast, eddied round and round without the vessel, but gradually the wind fell, the sea grew smooth, and the fragile bark settled on the water, as a falcon sinks to her nest after wheeling about restlessly in the air. Meantime, Phantasmion heard a voice on high, and it sent these words to his ear. I swore to serve him till Anthemina's dying day. The moon is up, and two large stars, bright spots of light, appear as if they had dropped out of her beaming crescent. Phantasmion admires not the moon, nor fancies an invisible chain by which those pendant gems may be linked to her golden bow. The chinquis rests upon the mast and sleeps in the moonlight, her splendid train, with all its mirrors, reflecting the mild rays of night. But the prince of Palmland gazes not on her. In thought he is following the lovely pilgrim through dangerous woods and wilds, Thus he coasted along, coming to land now and then for provisions, till he reached Palmland and sailed up the principal river to his own abode. Weary and dispirited, he reached his palace gates, and scarce had arrived at the pomegranate tree when the faithful Chinquis, which had never wholly recovered Caradan's blow, fell dead at his feet. Phantasmion sate upon the ground and shed tears over the lifeless bird. But Potentilla came behind him and cheerily exclaimed, Weep no more for the dead, but take thought for the living. The prince looked up. I have gained the heart of Irene, said he, but I cannot make her my wife because of Glandreth and Caradan. Potentilla replied, Surely my aid has availed thee somewhat. Perchance it may enable thee to gain still more. End of Part 2, Chapter 9 Part 3, Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 1 Irene visits the house of Mulderil in company with Penzelimer. 
While Phantasmion sailed homeward, Irene was wandering through the wilds of Tigridia. At every hut, where she obtained food and shelter inquiring as if by chance, concerning the situation of Maldoril's mansion, but telling no one that she was thither bound. Could the sweet feelings and glad thoughts which she excited wherever she went among the pastoral people of the land have sprung up into visible flowers, it would have been seen that she left a blooming track behind her, and, like the sun, drew virtue from the coldest soil. One evening she entered a green dell between woods, where a shepherd was conducting his sheep to the fold. A youth who accompanied her knew this old man and, having commended her to his care, departed, to the great distress of the maiden, who feared lest wild beasts should attack him on his way home, as the shades of night came on. The shepherd tried to lessen her fears by relating how Eulander of Nemorosa had thinned the tiger inhabitants of the land. In these woods, said he, I doubt if a brindled coat remains, for here it was that the huntsman chief and his comrades procured a band of tigerlings for Queen Modra. I wish this country paid no other tribute to the barren land of rocks than that. Here the parents were murdered, and the young preserved to flesh their teeth on the subjects of King Phantasmion. While the old man stood talking to Irene, describing with lively gestures the battle of the tigers, the braying of horns, the crashing of bows, and yelling of wounded beasts, many of his sheep, as if glad to steal away from the oft-told tale, had struggled into the woody glen, which was full of soft herbage, and Irene offered to guard the main body of his flock while he went in search of the truants. So thanking her for that courtesy, taking a weapon of defense from his girdle, and placing his crook in her hand, he hastened away. The lovely princess led the flock slowly onward, till she arrived at a stream which crossed the dell and had been swollen by sudden rains to a torrent. Here she paused, waiting for the shepherd, and, while the sheep eyed the water, thinking perchance of a ford lower down, where they had crossed in the morning, Irene's mind traveled back to her father and Albinet, thence to her baby brother, and all the time was not wholly absent from Phantasmion. At last she began to think that the old man was long away, and looked up with pleasure when she heard footsteps advancing. But he who now stood before her was more like a king than a rustic swain. His attire, though black, was costly, his countenance abstracted and grave. He stopped to look at Irene as she lifted up a dripping lamb which had slipped into the water, and, seeing that she eyed him anxiously as if desirous yet afraid to speak, for indeed she wished to inquire whether he had seen the shepherd, his eye lit up with expectation and in an eager tone he exclaimed, Hast thou ought to tell me of the silver pitcher? Surely thou art akin to Anthemina, for there is something in thy face like hers. Irene was startled at being accosted thus, but in a few minutes felt assured that she must be in company with Penzelimer of Almatera. I know not what has become of the silver pitcher, she said. Would that I could hear tidings of it. But meantime, I feel anxious, lest the shepherd, whose flock I am guarding, may have met some accident in yonder wood. I trust he has not fallen in with a tiger, said the king. Such a fell beast as lately carried off my horse at noonday. Then, taking a javelin from his belt, he hastened in the direction which Irene pointed out, 
and soon the maiden saw him return, followed by the truant sheep, and bearing in his arms the old shepherd, who had fallen down a ravine, formed by a recent flood, and so disabled himself. He directed Irene to a shallower part of the stream, where her fleecy charge were able to pass over. She penned the sheep in the fold, while Penzelimer carried their owner to his cottage. Then, repairing to that rustic abode, she assisted the shepherd's daughter to tend his wounds and prepare the evening meal. Penzelimer sate beside the hearth, seeing forms in the fire which appeared to no one but himself, for, as soon as he had placed the old man in safety, his thoughts had all flown back to the silver pitcher. When Irene's employment was over, and she too sat down, he offered, out of courtesy, to guard her during the rest of her journey, and, hearing in what direction she must proceed, declared that he should lose no time in attending her, as the way she spoke of would bring him to the house of Maldoril, whither he desired to go. There was a damsel in the cottage who had bashfully drawn back when the strangers entered. While Irene was helping the shepherd lass, she took the maiden's wheel into a corner and span, but, hearing Penzelimer speak in a low voice of Maldoril, she stayed both hand and foot and leaned forward to catch the words of his discourse. Irene, then first beholding her countenance by the firelight, felt a sudden glow of alarm, so much did it resemble that of Caradan. The passionate black eye, the brow, the dark skin, all seemed his, and just such a green and crimson roll as he commonly wore concealed her locks. The shy damsel, seeing herself noted, resumed her spinning, and Irene smiled at her own suspicion when she saw her thus quietly employed. Early the next morning, the princess went forth again in company with Penzelimer, who related the story of his unfortunate love for Anthemina. Then at length she understood how her own fate depended on the silver pitcher, and saw that Caradan had told no feigned tale when he showed it her upon the island. Penzelimer did not observe her sorrowful countenance, but continued talking of himself. It is strange, said he, with the smiling face of a child that wears his newest, finest suit, that I, who am the most unhappy among men, should be the envy of beings who dwell on high. The truth is, they hate me on account of Anthemina, for seeing that I shall regain her love if I can but find the picture. Therefore they watch me with their bright eyes incessantly, and even at this hour, though I cannot see them, I well know that they are keenly observing me. Irene cast up her blue eyes to the sky with a look of pity and wonder. Their unheard of persecutions, added he, excited the compassion of the veiled Lady Melodine, who bade me repair to her sister Maldoril, and gave me good hope that, through her, I should regain what I had lost. The maiden rejoiced on hearing Melodine's name, and surmised that Penzalimer was to recover his lost senses by means of the blessed spring of which she herself was in search. The travelers rested at noon beside a stream, and Irene sought to persuade her companion that the notions which he dwelt upon were shadows of no substance, echoes of no sound, like those sights and voices which the disordered eye and ear create within themselves, unmoved by any outward thing. But Penzelimer calmly replied, Sweet lady, for it is plain to me that thou art no shepherdess, if the mirror of my mind did indeed play false, as thy speech infers, how vain it were to lay the truth before me. For I must either be incapable of seeing it at all, or must see it distorted and discolored through the flaws and stains of the glass. That Anthemina dwells in yonder sky 
seems to me as plain as that I view thy beauteous face, and heard thee just now declare that she lies under the wave. But this is one of the tricks of my persecutors. Go where I may, a report has still preceded me that I am mad. Just as Penzelimer spoke thus, a fawn gambolled past Irene. The damsel was tempted to pursue it a little way down the stream, and, running by a leafy covert, she caught a glimpse of the brown girl, who span at the cottage, but passing that way again she saw no one there. The travellers went on their way, and Irene, finding that all the thoughts which a sane mind can suggest to one that is diseased, will take the hue of the receptacle, as colourless waters turn blue or green when poured into certain channels, rather sought, by gentle ingenuity, to make him conceive happy imaginations, than presented them to him, and no longer combated errors, which were as invulnerable as they were easy to hit. Both rested at a goatherd's cottage that night, and in passing through the little orchard attached to it, when she set forth early the next day, Irene beheld the dark maiden, wrapped in a cloak and sleeping under a tree. The swarthy cheek and black eyebrow again fixed her attention, but as she gazed, the girl awoke, and beholding Irene, covered her face with her garment. Panzelimer now joined his fair comrade, and the maiden in some perplexity pursued her way. At noon she beheld the house of Molderil, situated on the lowest ridge of a conical mountain, which towered alone upon the plain, and showed from its rugged brow on one side pastoral plains, interspersed with woods and hollow glades, full of giant reeds and tree-like ferns. On the other, the endless forests of Nemorosa, which Glandreth had never subdued. The mansion itself and the wall around it were hewn out of a rock. "'Whither shall I conduct to thee?' said Penzelimer to his companion when they reached the foot of the hill. "'I must go whither thou art going,' she said, "'even to the house of Motheril, for I to seek the presence of the ancient queen, but was bound not to speak of this till I approached her threshold.' Penzelimer blew a horn which hung at the outer gate of the mansion as soon as he reached it and started at the loud sound which ensued and which all the rocks above and below re-echoed. A raven flew from the beetling crag overhead just as a rugged churl admitted the strangers. Other domestics then appeared and conducted them to the apartment where their mistress sat at the summit of a tower. Mulderil was seated in a carved chair the brown arms and upright back of which resembled her own figure, dried and stiffened, but not enfeebled by age. Her face appeared of bronze, all but the rapid eye, like lambent flame shining and restless. Her heart was dead as the leathern girdle that covered it, her brain ever in motion like the sands of the hourglass that stood before her on the table, she was clad in robes of purple and scarlet, and wore upon her head a crown of golden spikes. Irene felt appalled when Molderil desired that Penzelimer would wait in the anteroom while she conferred with the maiden, but summoning courage, presented an ivory tablet on which her name was inscribed, with curious ciphers underneath. Molderil, after a glance at the writing, told her that she must go alone to the spring and impart the secret to no one. The maiden having agreed to this condition, she placed in her hand a light bucket and chain with a leathern bottle, at the same time giving her certain directions, and Irene took her leave with many thanks, delighted to think how much of the precious water the skin would contain. No sooner was she out of hearing than Maldoril turned her keen eyes on the melancholy king who had entered at one door as Irene disappeared by another. Penzelimer, she said, he who robs thee of thy right is Phantasmion, king of Palmland. The son of Dorimont, he exclaimed with kindling eye. 
On each side of the queen's footstool, a dwarfish figure was crouching. Irene had scarcely observed them, and by Penzelimer they had been taken for appendages to the grotesque imagery of her wooden chair. But when the queen touched one of them with her foot, up he sprang, and fixed upon Penzelimer a pair of toad's eyes ringed with scarlet. At the same instant, the other dwarf raised his pointed face, in which the eye-holes were mere points, laid out his broad flat hands, and put forward the side of his head, as if to hear, rather than see, what was going on. While Penzelimer viewed these objects with surprise, Maldoril began to mutter, and soon both they and the whole apartment were obscured, clouds creeping over the vaulted roof and veiling the wide crystal windows. A fiery light then rose up on the opposite wall, and Penzelimer beheld in many-colored flame a picture of Phantasmion, standing over Caradan and striving to secure the enchanted vessel. When the king beheld that image of Anthemina's pitcher in the silvery light, he rushed forward and would have clutched it from the wall, but lo, it was impalpable as fires that hover over a marsh, and a loud puffing noise arose from below that seemed to be an expression either of pain or mockery. Thereat Penzelimer, looking down, espied the toad-like dwarf whose body he had squeezed against the wall with his great mouth wide open and a slimy liquid oozing from every pore of his wrinkled skin. A hollow laugh echoed from the chair of Mulderil, who was wrapped in darkness, and the crystal windows of the tower tinkled with her mirth. Is it thus thou rewardest those that serve thee, noble monarch, she said? Swartho has shown thee thine enemy by the power of his art, and in return thou art trampling him underfoot. Penzelimer drew back and was incensed when he recognized the face of Phantasmion to find that the youth to whom he had related his story was King Dorimont's son, not doubting that he had visited him solely to obtain an account of the silver pitcher. Transport me to Pomland, exclaimed the king, and furnish me with armor. Nay, answered the crafty witch, if thou goest now to Pomland, thou wilt miss thine enemy, and in case of meeting him on the road wouldst fail to know him for he is disguised by the fairy Potentilla. Show me his likeness, rejoined the king, as he appears at this moment. The sorceress bade Swartho comply with that request, and straightway he brought so strange a phantom before the eyes of Penzelimer, so all unlike any adversary which he had ever dreamt of, that for a moment he stood aghast. But, Ere the grim figure faded away, and light once more succeeded to darkness, his courage returned, and, kneeling before the ancient queen, he besought her to arm him, so that he might fitly encounter such a formidable foe. "'What guerdon shall I have from thee for such service?' inquired Maldaril. "'What wouldst thou have?' the king replied." If thou conquerest Phantasmion, said the queen, thou shalt bestow half of Palmland on my young kinsman, Ulander. The king willingly acceded to this proposal, and also agreed that if he died without issue, Ulander should inherit Almaterra. In a little time afterwards, Mulderil had provided him with a horse and armor and a plumed cask, as like as possible to those of Glandreth, whose stature was scarce loftier than his own, and bade him repair to the mansion of that aspiring chief, on the confines of Rockland, Tigridia and Almaterra. By the time that thou arrivest there, said she, Phantasmion will have reached the same place, under a feigned character, for the sake of encountering the great enemy of his kingdom in single combat. 
thou shalt bear a letter from me to Glendreth. He will easily be persuaded to let thee accept the challenge in his name, when he knows that thou, being furnished with enchanted armor, in addition to thy own great skill and might, art more certain to defeat the king of Palmland, even than his valiant self. Thus forewarned, Penzelimer departed, full of joy and confidence, expecting soon to have the disposal of Phantasmion's life and kingdom, and to obtain the more valuable pitcher for himself. End of Part 3, Chapter 1《パート3》Chapter 2 of《Phantasmion》by Sarah Coleridge。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Part 3、Chapter 2。Irene has a fearful adventure on the mountain。Mulderil was sitting under the outer wall of her abode, looking after the king of Almaterra as he rode down the hill。When the dark damsel kneeled at her feet and placed in her hand a withered branch, thou comest from Melodine, said Mulderil. Who art thou, and what has passed betwixt thee and the veiled lady? I am Zelnith, daughter of Magnart, said the damsel, taking the roll from her head and letting her jetty ringlets fall down to her waist. This is not my natural color, added she, putting up her white hand to her swarthy cheek. I stained my face, that no one might know me as I traveled to thy house. Melodine I met with on the king's island, and she sent me to thee. Wherefore, said Mulderil, feigning ignorance of what she knew full well. To find my sister Lucoya, replied Zelneth, while a bright blush glowed through her tawny mask. Then return to thy home, said Mulderil, for there thou wilt be more likely to learn tidings of Lucoya than here. Zelneth cast her eyes on the ground, as she replied in a whisper, Where can I learn tidings of Phantasmion, son of Dorimont? I do confess that for his sake also I am come to thee. Mulderil's searching glance was now exchanged for a look which encouraged Zelneth to proceed in her disclosure. She told the story of her love for Phantasmion, and how she had set forth to free him from prison. It was midnight, she said, when we reached the island, and straight away repairing to the darksome vault, and putting the key into the lock, I found the bolts already withdrawn. I descended and sought in all the subterranean chambers, but found no trace of him whom I hoped to meet. Just as I emerged from the vault, my lamp threw its light on a lady covered with a veil which gleamed in the darkness. Thus thou seek Phantasmion of Palmland, she said, this morning his prison door was unlocked by the king's daughter. Then I knew that Irene had deceived me, and, recollecting the lofty mountaineer who kept by her side in the wood, I clearly saw for what reason she had sent me away. While I was weeping on my pillow that night, the veiled lady entered my room and offered me a cup one draught from which, as she averred, would make me cease to love and cease to feel such sorrow. But starting up, I promptly answered, Ask me not to drown the remembrance of either of those I love or those I hate. Rather, offer me a charm by which I may gain the heart of Phantasmion and triumph over my false rival. Then she bade me Repair to thee in secret, bearing a token from her, and, placing a withered branch in my hand, she left me to repose. Early the next day I sought Lucoya, but she was nowhere to be found, and I could not doubt that she drank of the forgetful cup 
and followed Maladin. In all haste, I crossed the mountains and traveled on to the house of a shepherd in Tigridia. There I dismissed all my attendants, bidding them repair to Arzine and tell her that I had hoped soon to return home with my brother and sister. I had not long been under the shepherd's roof when King Penzalimer and the Princess Irene arrived at the same cottage. Alas, even here perhaps the daughter of Anthemina has forestalled me, and I cannot weep with sweet Lucoya, for she has been carried away. Tears flowed down the face of Zelneth, streaking the stains that hid her lovely skin. Mulderil smiled. Have no fear, she said. Touching Irene and Lukoya, neither shall cross thy path. But is Lukoya safe and happy? said Zelneth tenderly. Safer than a pearl, five fathom deep, said Mulderil, and happy enough, though not so blessed as thou shalt be ere long. Come with me to my cavern in the forest, and if I do not quickly bring Phantasmion to thy feet, in that secret dwelling I will hide my head there for the remainder of my life. Zelneth trod on air when she heard Mulderil speak thus. She washed herself white in a pure fountain, and joyfully accompanied the sorceress queen to her cave in the woods. Irene, meantime, wound along the mountain, scarce pausing for a moment to survey the sylvan prospect before her, but going steadily on till she found the well in a hollow betwixt two rocky ridges. This dale was clothed with herbage, converted into stone by the overflowings of the spring, and the breeze, when it swept the valley, stirred not a leaf that grew there. Joyfully the maiden smiled when she saw these manifest signs of the water's potency, and imagined that it would brace and strengthen her father's quivering frame, even as it had enabled the tremulous reeds and blades of grass to stand firm against the wind. With a fragment of rock in her hand, she ascended the petrified mound that encased the spring, and, having flung her burden into the well, kneeled down and listened for the noise described by Mulderil, who had told her that the waters were commonly out of reach, that she must throw a heavy stone into the pit, whereupon they would gradually rise higher and higher till at last they might be taken up by the bucket, that when she heard a noise like a stifled thunder, she must listen carefully till it changed to that of bubbling and hissing. Then, regardless of the fumes which would pour from the mouth of the pit, she must let down her bucket and fill quickly, ere the water again sank out of reach. And now Irene has caught the sound, and with a beating heart she applies her ear close to the opening, in spite of the hot vapors with which she begins to be enveloped. Such indeed was the effect upon her frame, that she felt as if she must quickly dissolve and trickle into the well or float away to the sky in subtle steam. Yet still she listened, holding her breath, lest she should fail to hear the sign and miss the right moment. But, just as the hissing noise commenced, just as she was about to raise her head and lower the bucket, a youth leaped forward, caught her suddenly in his arms, and rushed away to a distance from the shining mound, and... Scarce had he placed the maiden on her feet, when the volumes of steam sent forth from the pit were succeeded by a column of boiling water which rose higher than the dark rocks behind it, and, falling in foaming curves, quickly deluged the surrounding vale. The fountain continued to play before Irene, mounting higher and higher, as if it would sweep down the clouds a pile of rainbow splendor, with a crest of a thousand feathers as white as snow. And while she watched it in speechless amazement, the young huntsman gazed upon her face in equal wonder and almost equal agitation. "'What didst thou at the boiling well?' at length he inquired, 
I have been cruelly deceived, the maid replied, and then began to relate how she had been beguiled into undertaking her pilgrimage. One night, she said, I was working for my stepmother in a lonely tower. The evening shades came on. I dropped my needle, being unable to distinguish the colors of the embroidery, and, hearing my silver pheasant tap at the window, I hastened to let her in. But when I rose, the bird was not at the casement, and, looking out, I saw that she had fallen to the ground with an arrow in her breast. Then I hastened down the steps of the tower and bent over my favorite. Oh, surely she revived, replied the youth, fixing his eyes full of tenderest rapture upon Irene, as if to say that looks of pity from her face were enough to heal any wound. Nay, replied the maiden, my bird seemed stone dead, but raising my tearful eyes I saw a lady wrapped in a shining veil, with a vial in her hand. Pure water from this tiny vessel she poured on the face of the bird, when suddenly I saw the glazed eye relume within its scarlet rim, the ruffled feathers expand and show their finest gloss like silken streamers swollen with the wind, and, rising from the ground, my graceful favorite took her highest flight, clearing the tower and sinking down into the grove beyond. I turned to thank the lady in the shining veil, but she was gone, and never again did I behold her till one night when I sallied forth to free a prisoner from the lonely tower. A prisoner, said the youth, and thou wast going to set him free. Irene blushed as she pursued her story. On that night I met the same veiled lady in the grove, betwixt the castle and the tower. Wilt thou serve strangers, she said, and do nothing for those that are near to thee, for poor Albinian and his sickly son? Then I besought her to tell me how I might serve them, and she bade me seek the fountain head of that water with which she had restored the dying bird. How shall I find it? I eagerly replied. Go to Queen Maldril, she answered, bearing this token from me, but tell no one whither thou art bound, or on what errand. Unless thou goest in secret, she will not reveal the salutary spring. Then, placing an ivory tablet in my hand, again she disappeared. And didst thou free the prisoner? The young huntsman anxiously inquired. Irene paused, then answered, I trust he is now at liberty, though not through me. And thou hast taken this long pilgrimage, cried the enamored youth, all for thy father's and thy brother's sake. And the cruel queen gave thee that bucket, and would have sent thee to destruction. Oh, for a swift steed, cried Irene, to travel day and night till I reached the diamantine palace. Come with me, exclaimed the youth, seizing her hand. Even here we are not in safety. The maiden now perceived volumes of smoke far above the watery column. They rose from a high peak and soon were changed to spiral flames, which occupied the vault of heaven, just over the foaming fountain. Irene kept pace with the speed of her conductor. Soon they reached the grove below the hill, where the young huntsman had left his horse to follow a goat among the rocks. He placed the princess hastily on his steed, and, mounting before her, never ceased urging him forward, till he was in the very bosom of the forest. "'We are going farther from Rockland!' exclaimed the maid in sorrow. "'Trust to me,' the youth replied. "'This way will sooner bring thee home than to retrace thy steps.' Irene was bewildered by the ocean of trees into which they were launched, but hoped that she should emerge from it in time and find herself in some territory not far distant from Rockland. 
It was almost dark in the shady track through which the young huntsman threaded his way. He had left his bow near the boiling fountain, so that the quiver at his shoulder would have been of little avail had one of the panthers, whose bright eyes glared from under the dark branches, felt courage for an attack. But at his approach they bounded away, leaping from tree to tree. At last Irene began to catch bright gleams and moving objects through the foliage, and soon her conductor came upon the skirts of a wide pleasure ground, on the slope of a hill crowned by a goodly palace, which, from glittering spires and gay enameled windows, reflected the rays of the sun, just then about to sink on the opposite woody horizon. Below the mansion were hanging gardens of rich flowers, intersected with rivulets which ran among the beds of roses, like tears down a bright, blushing face. On a lawn, at the foot of the hill, a band of youths and maidens were dancing. These had no sooner espied the noble huntsman than they came forward in a body to cast their wreaths at his feet and, by their festive cries and salutations, Irene learned that her companion was Yolander, chief of Nemorosa, the maiden entered his dwelling, still beguiled by hopes that she was on the way to Rockland, but soon discovered that her being restored to the arms of her father depended on a condition which even love for him could never strengthen her to fulfill. As Yolander's bride, she might revisit her native country, but else was doomed to brook the fruitless penance of distasteful courtship in a foreign land. Day after day she complied with every request of her adorer, save that alone to which all his petitions tended. She flew by his side on the light steed, pierced the pard, or lynx, or savage deer, and while the forest rang with praises of the graceful huntress, and Yolander kneeling declared that she excelled in skill and courage even as in loveliness the gentle maiden longed to fly with those she pursued and either escape or perish from her chamber in yolander's palace she looked out over the undulating forest of nemorosa which appeared like a wavy ocean fixed in stillness by an enchanter's wand for gold or silver gleams when the sun shone there was a gilded verdure, and, when the breezes blew, for ocean's purple frown, a ripple of green leaves. But care darkened the shadows of the scene for her, and sickening hope tinted the mellow foliage. Now she thought of Phantasmion, of him she had so resolutely quitted, whose pursuit she had almost feared. Now she repined at that multitude of trees, which seemed to interpose an endless barrier betwixt them, and gazed for hours on the woodland prospect, still faintly hoping, deeply longing, to see him rise with the morning star from the skirts of the forest, or sail from the golden east with brightened wings over the green expanse. On a tufted knoll behind the palace, Yolander was carving Irene's name upon a cypress with a spear's point, when, hearing her soft voice among the trees beyond, he dropped the implement, and, resting his head against the bough, listened with grieved heart to these numbers. He came unlooked for, undesired, a sunrise in the northern sky, more than the brightest dawn admired to shine and then forever fly. His love, conferred without a claim, perchance was like the fitful blaze, which lives to light a steadier flame, and, while that strengthens, fast decays. Glad fawn along the forest springing, gay birds that breeze-like stir the leaves, why hither haste no message bringing to solace one, that deeply grieves. Thou star that dost the skies adorn, so brightly heralding the day, bring one more welcome than the morn, or still in night's dark prison stay. End 
End of Part 3, Chapter 2「Part 3, Chapter 3 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 3 Phantasmion goes to fight Glandreth and encounters Penzelimer. While Phantasmion seeks Irene, Glandreth shall conquer the land of palms. Surely, thought the young monarch, Olula is secretly on my side, and those words which were blown to my ear as with the blast of a trumpet were meant to give me warning. Not only this kingdom, but Irene herself, will never be securely mine while my enemy lives and triumphs. After a conference with Potentilla, he informed his council that, as Glandreth alone endangered the safety of the realm, and to conquer him would be to extinguish the war at once, he had resolved on defying him to single combat, and purposed to announce himself in the challenge as a puissant warrior sent by the king of Palmland to encounter the mighty general of Albinian. He had already given orders for raising an army and guarding the sea coast with a numerous fleet. There were hosts of brave men at his disposal, but the want of metal armor was one which no ingenuity could supply, and rendered his subjects ill-fitted to contend with the men of Rockland who had iron without as well as firm sinews within. This consideration only heightened Phantasmion's desire to encounter Glandreth, and seeking the pomegranate tree, at the first peep of dawn, he besought Potentilla to produce that powerful armor with which she had offered to furnish him. She struck the earth, and brought before the eyes of Phantasmion a pair of warrior ants which fought ferociously till both were exhausted. How sayest thou, said Potentilla, wilt thou be armed like these pugnacious insects? The youth, having readily consented, she laid her wand upon his head, then bade him strike it with his dagger. He did so, and found it perfectly impenetrable. But looking with eager curiosity into a clear pool hard by, he stared at the portentous shadow of his insect helmet. It displayed a movable crest in the shape of jagged, all-shaped jaws, with which, if other weapons failed, a terrible wound might be inflicted, while the face and breast of the wearer appeared to be cased in a substance as tough as horn, yet hard as brass. The youth was still surveying his figure, not without dismay, little thinking that the picture of it was at the same moment before the eyes of Penzelimer in the house of Maldoril, when Potentilla placed in his hand the sting of a scorpion increased to the size of the largest scimitar and taught him how the fearful weapon was to be used. But thou wilt rid me of this disguise as soon as the fight is over, said Phantasmion. Potentilla smiling replied, It might stand thee in good stead whither thou art going. Maldaril has a young kinsman, who pursues fair damsels more earnestly than the bright-eyed antelope and silver-coated hind. The constancy of thy mistress may be strongly assailed in the country of Yolander. How sayest thou? exclaimed Phantasmion. But the fairy disappeared, leaving him wrapped in thought and gazing on vacancy, till the sting of an ant upon his right foot admonished him to set off without delay. Forthwith he concealed his face and the upper part of his body with a mask and a cloak, which, at the fairy's suggestion, he had brought to the interview, mounted his horse, and, through rugged passes among the black mountains, travelled toward the house of Glandreth. 
his adversary meantime, had been pondering over the defiance from Palmland, when Penzelimer arrived bearing the letter of Mulderil. On perusing this crafty epistle, Glendreth was well content that the king of Almaterra should stand in his place and fight his enemy with charmed weapons, resolving in the meanwhile to lead his well-trained forces into the realm he so much desired to invade. He would not even await the event of the conflict, but stole away, after pompously accepting the challenge. And, while Phantasmion was traversing Rockland, Glandreth was on his way to the Land of Palms. The combatants met on a wide plain before Glandreth's castle in the presence of a large assembly. Phantasmion looked at the sky and satisfied himself that it was perfectly clear. Then he cast his eyes on his adversary and thought that Glandreth, though of noble port and stature, was by no means so broad-built a man as he had formerly imagined. The king of Almaterra, meantime, could scarce turn his attention from Phantasmion's woolen cloak, which lay on the ground, for though it was only wrapped about the serpent wand and a silver cup, he imagined that it concealed nothing less than Antimina's pitcher. But now the trumpet sounded, and great was the astonishment both of Phantasmion and an amphitheatre of spectators to see Penzelimer's panoply drip all over, then fall into furrows, and lastly trickle away in many a bubbling stream, as if he were but a waxen warrior and melted at the very breath of his antagonist. Such was the effect of Mulderil's treachery, such the power of her muttered charm, that Penzelimer quickly stood bare in the sight of all men, his helmet with its visor and his uplifted blade alone remaining for a season firm. When drops began to fall from the end of that weapon, also he indignantly rushed upon Phantasmion, but no sooner had he felt the point of the scorpion sword than, uttering a loud cry, he sank senseless on the ground, with the magic weapon sticking fast in his side. At the same moment that he fell, Phantasmion's fairy accoutrements vanished, and when with loud shouts Penzelimer was removed from the field, he procured fresh armor and challenged every warrior present to stand in Glandreth's place, but all declining the combat, he forthwith departed to Rome in search of Irene. And now that deeds of arms no more engaged his thoughts, they centered wholly in that fair and pious maid whose image beamed on all sides of his solitary path, and this was one of many strains with which he addressed her. Yon changeful cloud will soon thy aspect wear, so bright it grows, and now by light winds shaken, O oh, ever seen, yet ne'er to be overtaken. Those waving branches seem thy billowy hair, the cypress glades recall thy pensive air, slow rills that wind like snakes amid the grass, Thine eyes mild sparkle, fling me as they pass, yet murmuring cry, this fruitless quest forbear. Nay, e'en amid the cataract's loud storm, where foamy torrents from the crags are leaping, methinks I catch swift glimpses of thy form, thy robe's light folds in airy tumult sweeping, then silent are the falls, mid colors warm, gleams the bright maze beneath their splendors leaping. End of Part 3, Chapter 3by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 4. Phantasmion is detained in Mulderil's cave. 
Phantasmian pursued the same track which his gentle princess had taken through Tigridia and excited curiosity in all who beheld him by his noble aspect and kingly air. The first discourse of his cottage hosts was ever concerning the fair pilgrim Irene, and this tale was sure to be followed by an animated history of Eulander as its counterpart. Phantasmion glowed and trembled when he heard those names wedded in description, and scarce dared inquire about Nemorosa, lest he should hear some unwelcome eulogy on the graces of its youthful chief. Thus he fared, tracing his lady's footsteps to the house of Maldoril, where he learned that the ancient queen had repaired to the forest with a most beautiful maiden. His heart beat higher than ever at this intelligence. A most beautiful maiden could be no other than Irene, and it seemed plain as the sun at noonday that Maldoril was bent on securing so rich a prize for her young kinsman Yelander. He wound along the bottom of the mountain and left his horse before nightfall at the cottage of a goat herd, thinking that he could best proceed on foot through the tangled forest to find Maldoril's retreat, provided, as he was with good armor and dauntless courage, he feared neither man nor beast, but anxious thoughts and surmises crowded on his mind like swarms of stinging gnats, the pertinacity of which no efforts were sufficient to repel. Just as his mental fever had reached its height and had begun to bring, even before his visual eye, a graceful huntsman kneeling at the feet of Irene, in whose face a smile seemed to dawn, but whether of cold courtesy or nascent love he vainly strove to distinguish. A voice whispered seemingly from underground, Dost thou seek Irene? She dwells with Leulander, and the loveliest of all maidens is in Maldoril's cave. Phantasmion shivered, and an instant afterwards his veins could scarce contain their scalding currents. Irene with Yulander in Mulderil's cave. Surely, thought he, that was not the mere voice of my delirium. Then he began to rave and shout aloud, as if the forest could hear him. Where is the cave? Where is the cave? Oh, these huge trees that stretch their giant arms and point on all sides. How they too madden me. Flinging away his cloak, he rushed on wildly till he was stopped by close underwood, growing over a swamp. Here again a voice rose to his ear, crying, Irene dwells with Yolander. Seek the beauty in Maldoril's cave. Phantasmia now looked down and perceived a strange figure, but could not see either its form or features clearly from the dimness of the place. Do thou show me the way, whoever thou art, cried the youth, frantically waving his sword. At these words, Maldoril's toad-like dwarf leaped from amid the bushes and skipped on before Phantasmion, who followed him till the umbrageous path was faintly illumined by what appeared in the distance like two huge eyes of fire. Those are openings in front of Maldoril's rocky tenement, said the dwarf. Their light will guide thee thither. Phantasmion looked at his good steel blade, then hastened on and entered the cavern by a winding passage. He paused at the threshold and saw no graceful hunter youth, but a wrinkled crone in queenly attire, bending over the flames of a well-heaped hearth and carefully inspecting the contents of a wide vessel which simmered amid the blaze and filled the cave with odorous, inebriating fumes. Beside her stood the glowing and beautiful Zelneth, her glossy raven locks carelessly flung back from her white forehead and her splendid eyes intent upon the work that was going on. She held in both hands a crystal bowl into which Maldoril began to pour some of the rosy liquid scooped from the cauldron, 
when Phantasmion appeared and caused such alarm in the damsel's mind that the vessel would have fallen to the ground if her companion had not taken it from her. King of Palmland, said the aged queen, thou art welcome. Be seated and take off thy cumbrous armor. Muttering within herself, she touched the head of the youth as he bent forward to look after Zelneth, who had retreated to the inner part of the cave when his crested helmet vanished, and soon the hyacinthine locks and goodly countenance of Phantasmion were revealed by the red light of the flames. Then Zelneth uttered a cry of astonishment and exclaimed, O oh, Maldoril, is this a delusion of magic? Or do I look upon the very face of him I love? Dost thou still love Phantasmion, best and loveliest? cried the youth, rushing forward to throw himself on his knees, his whole soul possessed with the image of Irene. But, looking up and beholding Zelneth, her bright face beaming with transport, her fair form almost appearing to expand from the joy of her bosom, he started away with a countenance of deep disappointment. Zelneth, daughter of Magnart, he exclaimed in a sorrowful tone, O oh, tell me, hast thou lately seen thy kinswoman, Irene? The damsel turned away without speaking, and, while tears gushed between the ivory fingers that strove to conceal them, Mulderil, who still bent over the cauldron, answered in her stead. Irene was gaily hunting the deer, said she, by the side of her betrothed, Yolander, when Zelneth came to my house in search of Lucoya. Irene, pretending to serve her parent, deserts him for a lover, while this maiden faces a thousand dangers for her sister's sake and loves with constancy, though hopeless of a return. Zelneth flung her white arms around Maldoril, and, hiding her head, she gently cried with half-suppressed sobs. Oh, speak no more! Phantasmion will win back his beauteous bride, and Zelneth would rather die than trouble his happiness. The youth's brain had been half unsettled by feverish suspicions, together with bodily fatigue, and now the steams of the liquor doubled its confusion. He turned away and would have rushed out into the forest to seek his rival, but the cavern appeared to be full of passages winding in every direction, and he found it impossible to hit upon the one by which he had entered. "'Take thy rest here tonight,' said Maldoril. Thou wilt never find a sylvan palace in the dark, and tomorrow, or a month hence, Irene may still be found at the house of Elander, if thou must indeed go fight for that gathered lily with tarnished leaf and tainted fragrance. At another time, Phantasmion would have flamed at those words like a fire fresh fueled, but now the luscious vapors were stealing over his senses. He was gazing unconsciously upon Zelneth as she stood a little behind Maldoril, with arms pensively crossed and downcast face, shaded on each side by drooping locks. He retired to a recess in the cavern and tried to think again his former thoughts and purposes, but insensibly they floated away. His rage against Yulander seemed to dissolve or turn into its opposite, and he vainly sought to keep firm hold of that or any other feeling. Zelneth approached with the crystal basin in her hands and said to him as he sat in the shadow, Mulderil has been preparing a precious liquor for my beloved parents. It takes away all sense of toil and pain. She stood with her face half turned away, yet holding the vessel within Phantasmion's reach. He put out his hand towards it, gazing all the time on the damsel, but with a sudden effort he drew it back again, 
and turned his face to the rocky wall. Zelneth sipped the liquid, then cried to the aged woman who was busy about the fire, stirring and skimming the cauldron. Mulderil, add nothing more. It cannot be better. I will go fetch the jars in which it must stand this night. She left the crystal basin on a table of rock just opposite to Phantasmion. He saw the liquor lie glowing and creaming in the bowl, like melted rubies, frost with pearl. He inhaled its sweet, bewildering odor, and scarce knowing what he did, the youth raised it to his lips and drank deeply. In a moment, he was electrified with delight, a rapturous tranquility pervading his whole frame. He felt intoxicated with pleasure, which sprang from no cause and tended to no object, yet was ever ready to be reflected and multiplied from all objects around. He seemed incapable of thinking and happier than any thought could make him, Zelneth returned from the further part of the cavern, bringing jars in her hand. In the eyes of the spellbound prince, she now appeared to be glorified by a supernatural light of beauty. Joy streamed from every line of her face and form into the joyful heart of the prince. As light shoots from the surface of smooth water back towards its heavenly source. All thought of Zelneth, all thought of Irene, all remembrance of the past, all anticipation of the future, were completely suspended. He only knew that he was gazing on a sun of loveliness, in which a thousand beauties seemed to converge, while the feelings inspired by his own heavenly maid were mingled with his new sensations, Though the object of them was veiled in his memory by a dazzling mist, Zelneth retired again into the dark recess to fetch more vessels, while Phantasmion, reclining on a smooth, low rock, with his head sunk into a mossy hollow, beheld fantastic petrifactions which hung from the ceiling, illuminated by the firelight. He gazed upon them in ecstasy and felt as if the transport of his bosom, which invested them with splendor, was derived from those unmeaning forms, till Zelneth, again presenting herself, occupied his whole fancy, and seemed once more to be the fountain of all his glad sensations. The damsel now ventured to cast her eyes upon him, and, seeing the bowl by his side, was sure that he had drunk the charmed liquor, Eagerly, she perused his countenance and, reading the deepest fascination of love in every line of it, she let the jar fall upon the floor. He is mine, she whispered, clasping her hands. O oh, Mulderil, is this all thy work? Have I no part in it? But will not the enchantment fade? Will Phantasmion love Zelneth forever? He heard the words and smiled on her who spoke them, but spoke not himself, his eyes being heavy with sleep, as an infant lies in his cradle, watching every motion of her whom he loves fondly, but unconsciously, free from the burden of esteem and obligation of gratitude. So Phantasmion followed with his eyes the beautiful Selneth and saw her prepare a couch for him on the floor of the cavern. She heaped up sweet-scented withered leaves and strewed over them the skins of wolves and flowing fur of lynxes. Phantasmion sank down upon the soft bed and was speedily wrapped in slumber. Zelneth kneeled beside him, gazing on his gentle and noble countenance as the firelight irradiated his fair brow where all the soft blue veins were traceable under a smooth surface, and his bright, youthful cheek reclining amid the spoils of savage animals, and surrounded by the black walls and shadowy hollows of the cavern. Already she fancied herself the flower-crowned bride of Phantasmion, and breathed in a soft, lulling melody this happy strain. 
was a brook in straightest channel pent, forcing mid rocks and stones my toilsome way, a scanty brook in wandering well nigh spent. But now with the rich stream conjoined I stray, through golden meads the river sweeps along, murmuring its deep full joy in gentlest undersong. I crept through desert moor and gloomy glade, my waters ever vexed, yet sad and slow, my waters ever steeped in baleful shade. But whilst with the rich stream conjoined I flow, e'en in swift course the river seems to rest, blue sky, bright bloom, and verdure imagined on its breast, and whilst with thee I roam through regions bright, beneath kind love's serene and gladsome sky, a thousand happy things that seek the light, till now in darkest shadow, forced to lie, up through the illumined waters nimbly run, to show their forms and hues, in the all-revealing sun. Singing thus, she fell asleep, and when her eyes were fast sealed in slumber, Phantasmion heard a shrill voice crying, Awake, young prince of Palmland, awake! He raised his head and saw Maldaril sitting on the floor, unearned by her side, a branch of red berries on her lap, her fingers wet with purple juice. The crown she lately wore was thrown aside. Her eyes shot fire, and Phantasmio knew that the face he now looked upon was the very face of the strange old man who told him of his mother's death. A shadowy form hovers aloft. It is the spirit of the poisoned child. Phantasmia remembers that swollen, spotted cheek, as if he had seen it but yesterday. Beware, young prince of Pomland, the one spectre cries, and, unmoved at Maldoril's awful threats, with sullen eye and obstinate finger, keeps pointing to the purple berries that lie beside the urn. Which, murderous, exclaimed Phantasmion, starting up. But, while he strove to free his feet from the coverings of the couch, Maldoril stirred the cauldron till fumes filled the cave and entered every pore and inlet of the youth's body. He sank down again, and scarce had pressed the furry pillow when Zelneth met his eye. Zelneth, smiling in sleep, her head inclined on one ivory shoulder, and her soft white arm extended over the skin of a black wolf. The charm resumed its power. The murderess and the ghastly spectre vanished from his sight, and, dreaming only of lilied meads, bright streams, and perfect loveliness, he lay in deep repose within the rugged cavern. End of Part 3, Chapter 4、Part、three, Chapter 5 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 5 Phantasmion is Disenchanted by Olula. From the witch's cavern, subterranean passages conducted into a delicious garden, embosomed in the forest and surrounded by a double fence of lofty trees. Here the prince found himself when he awoke in the morning. Bright wreaths of an acacia bower drooped over his head, flowers blushed, and streamlets glittered as far as the eye could reach. A splendid picture was hung out before him, and Zelneth, placed at a coy distance, appeared the very subject of the piece. Phantasmion sprang from his odorous couch, and, approaching the damsel, seemed to tread on air. No trace of the warning vision remained in his memory, and now that the charm had taken into its alliance the refreshment of sleep, he was transported with a still more exquisite delirium than on the preceding evening. He 
he felt it to be his turn to speak, while Zelneth was speechless with happiness, drinking in his fluent love discourse, as if it were a rill which ever gratified, but never removed, the pleasurable thirst it excited, while to him this volubility seemed in itself an enjoyment, and resembled the soft lapse of the brimming rivulet which wandered past his feet to visit a thousand flowery knots and odorous copses, Phantasmin scarce noticed anything steadfastly, or considered whence it arose, or what it betokened, but, sitting by the side of Zelneth, and pouring himself forth in admiration of her charms, he ever and anon caught glimpses of Fadeline's flower-like face, darting smiles from corners of the bower, dim with the shadow of clustered roses, while now and then her fingers came like a twinkling butterfly, and scattered over the head of the delighted maiden a shower of light petals from the frailest and most transitory blossoms. Zelneth saw not Fadeline, nor anything but Phantasmion. She rose from her seat to fetch a well-filled urn, which had been placed in the arbor. It was the vessel which contained the poisoned juice, and the moment so long watched for by Maldoril seemed about to arrive. The sorceress leans forward over a leafy bough. Phantasmion's glance for a moment is diverted from the maid, and that prominent eyeball flashing amid the foliage brings dim recollections to his mind. But Maldoril sinks back to her hiding place, and the youth turns to gaze on Zelneth, who stands smiling before him with a crystal goblet in her left hand. Wilt thou drink once more, she said, and promise to be mine forever? Phantasmion threw himself on his knees, ready to utter vows of eternal love and faithfulness, having forgotten those he had made to Irene, as if they had been characters formed in ice which a hot sun had melted away. At the same moment, his tongue was arrested, and the blood appeared to stagnate in his veins. The air had become piercing cold and filled with white vapor. The brook ceased to murmur and the birds to sing. The waters were congealed, the leaves and flowers wan and drooping, the branches encrusted with a hoary rhyme. But the eyes of Phantasmion were fixed on Zelneth. Motionless she stood, one arm raising aloft the urn from whose lip an icicle depended, the other holding the empty crystal goblet, now no longer grasped but glued to the powerless palm. She was frozen to the ground. The glowing carnation of her cheek had faded to palest lilac. A deathly blueness tinged her brow of pearl and crept over her bosom. Wreaths of frost curled around her stiffened jetty ringlets. Her arms looked brittle and crystalline, while those dark orbs that lately almost eluded the sight by their livesome motion had a dull shine upon them like eyes of glass and seemed fixed in their marble sockets. Phantasmion would have risen and approached the damsel, but strove in vain to move one step nearer to her statue-like form. His heart beat fearfully, but every other part of his frame was beginning to lose power and sensation. His head was fixed on one side, his knee clung to the earth, and no longer perceived its coldness. The fingers of his extended hand were cramped into one, and felt as if they touched each other through velvet. He seemed to be fast changing into a form of ice. On a sudden, the sky grew black. Showers of stony hail came rushing on between him and his fair companion. He was wrapped round about in a sheet of snow, while blasts, which he found it impossible to resist, carried him to the further end of the garden, prostrated the tall fence of trees with interwoven branches, and continued to impel him onwards for many a mile and many a league, till at length, when the wind lulled, he sank upon the open plain far beyond the forest of Nemorosa, his blood moving rapidly and his limbs stiff with exertion. Phantasmion had fallen under the shelter 
of massy walls overgrown with ivy. The wreck of a palace where Tigridius monarchs had dwelt from age to age. Here the husband of Maldaril and her son, Silvalad, had been treacherously murdered when Glandreth invaded the land, and Modra and her daughter, becoming enamored of the blood-stained hero, followed him as a voluntary captive. The two sons of Silvalad had been brought up by the widowed queen. One had perished in a far country, the other, whose name was Yolander, bore sway in the woodland fastnesses where his father had ruled before him, but was too wild and careless to attempt the recovery of his whole inheritance. The wind had relented, the sky was disclosing more and more of its blue dome, snakes and lizards came forth to glitter in the sun, and the solitary bird that hides its nest under grey ruins sought food in the moistened herbage, enjoying, amid the desolation of that ancient abode, the pleasures of a dear though transient home. Still, the breeze lingered round Phantasmion, playing with his wet robe and gently shaking the particles of snow from his redundant locks. Plaintive sounds issued from different parts of the building, as if a penitent lover were uttering meek confessions mingled with regret, and from within the pile, some solemn instrument sent forth a deep, slow melody of former days. While it was yet proceeding, the youth heard a voice that seemed to be just above his head. Phantasmion, it whispered, what dost thou hear while faithful Irene wanders in Nemorosa? Soon afterwards, the same voice appeared to come from a higher point. It was accompanied with a noise of light wings fanning the air, and to the youth's anxious ear, it seemed to say, Phantasmion must seek Irene, while Glandreth conquers the land of palms. After these words were spoken, the solemn music swelled into a fuller tone, then sank into silence. Phantasmion started up, and saw the pinnacles of the edifice gilded here and there by partial beams which struggled forth from amid disorderly heaps of dark vapor. Just beyond the battlements of a black tower, he beholds transparent pinions spread to their vast extent with the sun glittering through them. A moment afterwards they recede. Olula dives among the clouds on which those golden wings shed radiance. On she goes, sweeping the sky, as a shearer sweeps away the fleeces of the new shorn flock, and now she is indistinguishable from the mass that moves along with her, and now both she and the clouds themselves are gone, leaving the cope of heaven pure and resplendent, as if it were cut out of a single sapphire, through which a powerful sun was pouring its diffusive light. End of Part 3, Chapter 5 Part 3, Chapter 6 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 6 Zelneth is carried to the Sylvan Palace, whither Phantasmion goes in search of Irene. The storm which followed that intense frost had beaten on the rigid form of Zelneth, unfelt, unseen. But now the charm was broken, the stony rocks fell loose, all gemmed with dewdrops gleaming in the soft sunlight, and even as thawing streams break forth into sound and motion, so the damsel moved and spoke once more, and sparkled with returning life. She roamed about the garden where Fadeline had revived the drooping flowers and breathed new vigor into their languid stems. The fairy looked at her pitifully from amid the leaves and fondly whispered, Kings shall sue for Zelneth, and Zelneth shall cause the ardent lover to forget his first love. The maiden heard not, heeded not, but continued her weeping or murmured laments like these. By the storm invaded, ere thy arch was wrought, rainbow, 
thou hast faded, like a gladsome thought, and ne'er mayst shine aloft in all earth's colors fraught. Insect tranced forever in thy pendant bed, which the breezes sever from its fragile thread, thou ne'er shall burst thy cell and crumpled pinion spread. Lily born and nourished, mid the waters cold, where thy green leaves flourished on the sunburnt mould, how canst thou rear thy stem and sallow buds unfold? Snowy cloud suspended o'er the orb of light, with its radiance blended, ne'er to glisten bright, it sinks, and thou growest black beneath the wings of night. Mulderil had been stricken to the earth by the rapid tempest, and there she lay muttering and making hideous faces. The green-vested fairy gleamed past her as a lizard glances past a fallen log, then pointing with dewy finger at Zelneth. Mulderil, she said, when wilt thou weep again? Ah, thou art old and sapless, past the luxury of tears. A harsh voice uttering the name of Irene caused Zelneth to raise her head, and looking up she saw the dwarf Herva seated beside the ancient woman, his sharp visage turned towards her, and each flat paddle arm spread out. How long since? cried Mulderil angrily. Yes, Termorn, said he. I was about to climb the high wall that girds Yolander's domain when, lo, the damsel Irene, armed with bow and quiver, appeared on the top of it. She saw not me, as I crouched beneath, but leaped over my head on the soft moss. Then, swift as a roe, she darted through the wood. Zelneth turned away, wringing her hands, for she gathered that Irene had escaped from Yolander, though she could not catch all that the dwarf muttered. "'And where hast thou been loitering?' cried Mulderil fiercely. But the next moment her thoughts were engaged by the other dwarf who came limping in with open mouth to tell his tale. "'Mistress,' he said, "'she is at the goatherd's cottage, and her father is there also.' "'How?' cried Mulderil. The palsied king, Albinian. Even so, replied the dwarf, strong love, or perhaps the approach of death, counteracted his disease so far that he stole away from the palace, followed Irene's footsteps, and this morning came to thy house on the hill, inquiring for his daughter. I guided him to the boiling fount. Right, cried Mulderil. He has cumbered the earth long enough, and how did he escape? He was saved by his daughter, who had got away from the Sylvan Palace, replied Swartho, and took her way across the hill, doubtless because it was the shortest and best known to her. Entering the stony dell, she espied Albinian, lying just under the mound of the well, where he had sunk down exhausted. The maiden rescued him from that dangerous place, dragging him away in her arms. But if the goat herd had not come within call, she would scarce have reached the bottom of the hill by this time. Now both are under his roof, and Albinian seems to be on his deathbed. Didst thou follow them? said the witch. I should have done so, the dwarf answered. But no sooner did the goat herd relieve Irene of Albinian's weight than she took the bow from her shoulder, an arrow from the case, and made this wound in my heel. The body of Swartho puffed up as he spoke, and the flaming circle of his dilated eye appeared to grow wider and redder. Coward! exclaimed Mulderil with a laugh. Thou shalt have a worse wound in thy face presently. Nay, mistress, hear what I did further, replied the dwarf. After a while I repaired to the cottage garden, and there learned from a boy who has lived with the goatherd ever since his wife and child perished together in a burning shower on the mountain, that Irene will be close to the cavern this evening. I know the exact spot, whither she means to repair, a patch of berry-bearing plants just under the hollow sycamore, in which a squirrel has made his nest. 
she has been once there already to gather fruit for her father, and ere it is dark, she will come again for a fresh supply. Mulderil arose. Well, get ye both into the cavern, she said, and be ready when I call. The dwarves retired, and their ancient mistress approached Zelneth, who sate upon the ground with her streaming locks around her, silently watering the turf with tears. Olula brought the frost and raised the storm, said Maldaril. She favors Glandreth and hates his enemies. For his sake she persecutes the son of Torimont, and she will separate him from Irene as well as from thee. Take courage, I will devise a plan. Away, cried the damsel scornfully. Thou hast neither skill nor foresight. Why didst thou bring us into the garden under the open sky? O Lula could have worked us no ill in the cavern. Maldoril's eye lightened at this taunt, but Zelneth saw not its vengeful flash and relapsed into silence. Imperceptibly, however, as a snow shower changes into rain, her sullen mood relented, and Maldoril found an opportunity to propose her plan. Irene, she said, is at the goat herd's cottage. Where Phantasmion will find her, cried Zelneth impetuously. He shall never find her again, replied the witch, if thou wilt consent to a brief disguise and brave a slight peril. Zelneth fixed her brightening eyes on her evil counsellor. Thou hast some skill, she said, while the last tear fell from her cheek. Tell me what peril, what disguise thou art thinking of. Maldoril brought from the cavern a panther's skin. It is but to dress thyself in this gay garb, she said. Then to sit crouching on the bough of a tree hard by here, and when Irene comes under it and is busily engaged in gathering berries, suddenly to show thyself and leap down by her side. When she attempts to fly, thou and the dwarfs shall intercept her return to the cottage, and I, meantime, will beckon her into the cavern, whence she shall not come out, till she consents to marry Yulander. My kinsmen shall meet her here, and thou shalt repair to the Sylvan Palace, where Phantasmion will be sure to go in search of Irene. She sent me to the island, murmured Zelneth, to release one who was standing by her side at that moment. I will take good care that she shall not escape, added Maldoril. Thou shalt see me run out with a chafing dish in my hand, to stupefy her senses by the smoke of burning herbs. But come, either reject the scheme or prepare to do thy part in it, for she will be here presently. Selneth took up the skin without knowing how to put it on, but Maldoril adjusted it so well that the lady's speaking eyes looked through holes which had formerly contained the bestial ones of a panther. Strangely now, indeed, they sparkled under a shaggy brow and upright ears, which the original wearer could move and bend at will. Zelneth in her childish days had been wont to follow the squirrels up many a well-branched tree. She loved to wind her way among the boughs, overcoming a series of delightful dangers, till she could place her fairy foot betwixt the topmost fork proud to find herself at such a dizzy height, and glad to have in prospect the pleasing adventure of descent. But such sports of the vacant mind and lithe limbs had fallen into disuse, and though the sycamore was easy to climb, slowly and timorously she crept up to her lurking place, and still more violently her heart palpitated when she saw Irene approach with her basket, and kneeled down to collect the fruit which grew on tiny bushes under the tree. While the eyes of the gentle princess were busily engaged upon the ground, those of Zelneth, 
anxious and fearful, were gazing at her from above. The boughs shook as with trembling limbs she began to creep forward, after the manner of a wild cat, and all the crisp leaves and branches made a rustling noise. Irene started, and looking up espied the pretended panther peeping down from the bow, whence she had scarce summoned resolution to spring. Unhappy Zelneth, she had not reckoned on her cousin's newly acquired skill in archery, nor on that matchless bow, the amorous chieftain's gift, which now hung at her shoulder. On seeing the damsel prepare to shoot, she uttered a loud cry and strove to turn about, but ere she could escape, the arrow was in her side. Irene, hearing Yolander's voice from a distance, stayed not to examine the false panther, which had fallen to the ground, but glided swiftly through the wood while the dwarfs, who were stationed to prevent her return, panic-stricken at what they had witnessed, and at the approach of the royal huntsman, crouched among the brushwood, and Molderil, her form half-hidden by wreaths of smoke from the censer in her hand, stood laughing at the entrance of the cave, till at last she fell upon the ground, overpowered by the fumes she had heedlessly inhaled. Meantime, Yolander, who had been roaming in search of his fair fugitive, drew nigh the patch of berry-bearing plants, and there found Zelneth prostrate on the ground with the skin of a wild beast covering the lower part of her body, for by this time she had freed her head and neck from the cumbrous disguise. Astonished both by her beauty and the strange state in which he found her, the youth alighted from his horse and asked what savage hand had inflicted that wound in her side whence the blood was flowing. Selneth pointed to the panther's skin still hanging about her feet, then sank into a swoon, her disengaged arm falling powerless on the shaggy spoils. The chieftain forgot Irene while he gazed on her fair countenance. He gently removed the skin, placed the fainting damsel on his horse, and conveyed her with all care and tenderness to his princely home. But though the travelers went at so leisurely a pace, that the night was far gone when they arrived there, the motion of the horse inflamed the lady's wound, which would soon have healed but for this aggravation. Fever seized the hapless maid, and Yolander found with sorrow that his love had proved as injurious to Zelneth as it had been irksome and grievous to Irene. Not long after, the chief of Nemorosa reached his mansion, Phantasmion arrived there also. The influence of the magic draught over his spirit had been destroyed by Olula's counteracting spell. The mist dispersed, and Irene's image again shone forth in sunny splendor, while that of Zelneth, late so radiant, showed like the vanishing moon with her weak, superfluous light. But the last words of Olula had cast him into a reverie. Glandreth had fallen by his hand. How then should Glandreth conquer the land of palms? Had the voice a hidden meaning, or no meaning at all? He had heard that Glandreth formerly sued for the hand of Irene's mother, that Olula loved the bold and beautiful chieftain, and made a solemn vow to be his friend and minister till Anthemina's dying day. And now that they too are dead, thought he, perchance Olula befriends Phantasmion, or it may be that, like the winds of heaven, she follows no settled course to sport with human hopes and purposes her only plan. Raising his eyes from the ground, he saw Maldoril's mansion upon the brow of the conical mountain, just visible in the distance and thither he resolved to go and inquire again for Irene. On reaching the gate, Phantasmion made the rocks resound with his loud summons, and ere the echoes had ceased, the porter with his grisly beard stood before him. "'Hast thou seen any other maiden?' cried the youth. 
beside her who went to the woods with thy mistress. None since she was here, the porter replied. But just before she arrived, there came a shepherdess, in company with a man of high degree. Her face was shaded with a hood, and she went forth alone, having a bucket and a bottle in her hand. Surprised to see the way she took, I watched her while she ascended that steep upward path. And on she went, so wondrous fleet and graceful, that when she gained yon cloudy summit, I thought within myself, is this a shepherdess or an angel going back into the sky? Phantasmion hastened up the steep track to which the servant of Maldoril pointed, and wound along the mountain till he met an old man who was driving on goats before him. He stopped when the youth approached his flock. Thou art a stranger by thy garb, said he. Dost thou know of the boiling fount and the volcanic fires which oft break forth on that part of the mountain to which thou art proceeding? Daily I climb this hill. And this thou lately see a damsel here, the youth inquired, in the habit of a shepherdess? Yes, truly, answered he, and I meant to give her a warning, but she waved me off with her hand and sped along so fast that even my goats could scarce have followed her. She entered the stony dell, which lies beyond the rocks, and there, no doubt, she perished. Phantasmion rushed away, passed the rocks, and entered the dell where the fountain was playing. He stood motionless at the entrance of the hollow till the water subsided, then approached the mound, and an icy chill seized his heart when he beheld a leathern bottle petrified on the edge of the well, with a bucket and chain lying close beside it. Believing that Irene had been overtaken by the force of the waters and had so lost her life, he sought about in desperation, expecting to find her fair body among the other petrifactions, but, seeing no trace of any such thing, he imagined that she had fallen into the well, and lying down on the edge of it, resolved there to remain and await destruction. Many times he was tempted to throw himself into the dark abyss, and, when he called on the name of Irene, he thought that fierce voices answered him. In this condition, he remained till the moon rose and threw her cold beams over the stony dell, when, turning his eye once again toward the bucket, he descried the steel point of a petrified arrow shining a little beyond it. Instantly, it struck him that this shaft had fallen from the quiver of some huntsman, perhaps Eulander himself, and that he might have borne Irene away, either alive or dead. Roused by this thought, he started up, hurried down the hill, and about daybreak knocked at the goat herd's cottage. The host of Albinian and Irene came out with his finger on his lips. There is a dying man in my house, quoth he. I may not ask thee to enter. Thy steed has been taken care of. Thou wilt find him in yonder shed beside the marigolds. The goat herd having re-entered, Phantasmion found his good horse, which recognized him with signs of pleasure. But so greatly exhausted was he that, instead of mounting, he sank down by his side and slept with his feet among the marigolds, and his head on the neck of the gentle beast. Ere he awoke at midday, one of Yolander's train came nigh and stopped his horse in admiration of the young monarch and his goodly steed, whose quick eye seemed to say, Pass on, I pray thee, and disturb him not. The huntsman's cheek was fresh and glowing, while that of the slumberer looked pale amid the sunshine and the gleams of his golden bed. Art thou Yolander? said Phantasmion, starting up. I would I were, the youth replied with a smile. Not for his crown and palace, but for the sake of a most fair damsel, worthy of both, by whose side he is kneeling. Wilt thou guide me to that palace? 
cried the young king of Palmland, his burning cheeks and scintillating eyes turned full on the huntsman. It is my home, the youth answered, and I can show thee the shortest road to it. Phantasman quickly mounted. He and his guide went at full speed, whenever the road permitted, and ere the light began to fade, he entered the abode of Yolander. End of Part 3, Chapter 6「Part 3, Chapter 7 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 7 Phantasmion leaves the Sylvan Palace and Zelneth receives succor from Fadeline. Phantasmion demanded to see the chief of Nemorosa and was conducted to a spacious apartment, the couches and seats of which were covered with brindled or spotted skins, the walls with horns of deer and rock goats fancifully arranged. There, under a high canopy adorned with branching antlers, lay the wounded Zelneth, her limbs motionless, her eyes closed in death-like languor, while the young chieftain was raising her from the couch in his arms and trying, by a thousand assiduities, to elicit signs of life and looks of recognition. So a child, grieved to see his rarest flower, the milk-white foxglove, with its whole spire of bells, newly blown, extended on the earth, sets himself to support the crushed stem which his own heedless foot has beaten down. But all in vain, for, leaning on the prop, it hastens to decay, no longer able to imbibe the dews that fall around it, withered by that sun, which lately nourished its firm stalk and bursting blossoms. Yolander saw not the young king of Palmland till he had entered the apartment and stood midway between the door and the couch, gazing intently on Zelneth. But when he did at last perceive his presence, the chieftain started, uttering an exclamation, roused by which the damsel opened her eyes, and seeing Phantasmion, leaped wildly from the couch, with crimsoning cheek and eyes of delirious brightness, but, her strength soon deserting her, she fell forward, looking still more lifeless than when she lay on the couch. Upreared in the arms of the sylvan chieftain, Yolander looked on with sullen surprise, while Phantasmion carried Zelnes to the couch and laid her on the tiger skins with which it was covered. Who art thou? he said. Art thou the brother of this maiden? I am bound to her by no near ties, replied Phantasmion with haste. She came to greet me as one who had received hospitality at her father's house. Why then hast thou come hither, rejoined the chieftain, breaking in upon my privacy without leave asked? I came in search of another, replied the youth in some confusion. I came to inquire for this fair damsel's kinswoman, the Princess Irene. Irene, exclaimed Yolander, she it was that wounded this lovely maid. I found her bleeding in the midst of the forest, and she accuses Irene of the cruel deed. That name and one other, inarticulately murmured, are the only words she has spoken since she entered here. Irene, accused of a cruel deed, ejaculated Phantasmion. Here is more witchery, more wickedness, and deceit. The chieftain held up his finger, then, pointing to the maid. Look there, he cried, in a low, stifled voice. Vex not her parting spirit by violent words. Phantasmion held his peace, and drawing nigh to look on Zelneth, he felt assured that her soul had abandoned its fair tenement for ever. The crisp and glossy tresses that flowed to her waist seemed yet instinct with life, 
In all their wonted beauty, they curled around the full white arm that lay so dead and motionless by her side. But mournful was the stillness of her long black eyelashes, which seemed now laid to rest forever on that smooth cheek whence every lifelike tint had vanished, as a warm light of morning fades from a snow-clad hill, leaving it as coldly white as pure and polished marble. Yolander wept aloud. Phantasmiel mused in sorrowful silence. Till now he had never looked on Zelneth as on a bright flower, doomed to wither, but had felt as if she were like the glittering stars that shine unaltered, while a thousand roses bloom and perish. At last he recollected what befell him in the house of Magnart. Perchance the damsel is but entranced, he said. I myself once lay thus for many an hour. Yolander raised his head, and starting from his knees, approached Phantasmion. Didst thou lie motionless? he cried. Was thy breath suspended? Were thy cheeks as pale as these? Phantasmion poured balm into the heart of Yolander by the answers he gave to all his eager questions, and soon the chieftain called to mind how his ancient kinswoman Maldaril had cured one of his train who lay insensible after a wound received from a wild boar. The two youths were now standing together by the couch, the hand of Phantasmion locked in that of Yolander, who frankly told all he knew of Irene, how he loved and lost her, and how he was on the way to consult Maldaril in the cavern concerning the fair princess, when his thoughts were suddenly absorbed by the distress and beauty of Selneth. But now, says he, I will go forthwith to fetch the queen of Tigridia. She hath great skill in medicine, and in other arts too. Me she loves well, and, at my entreaty, she will restore this maid, and perchance discover to thee the retreat of Irene. Right glad was Phantasmion to accept Elander's intercession, with one whose evil powers were not to be averted by sword and spear, he zealously offered to keep watch by the body of Selneth, and to defend it, with the danger of his life against a host of her kinsmen, should they come to take it away. Having accepted his courtesy, Yolander kissed the damsel's cold hand as it lay upon the couch, and sighed to see it no longer withdrawn as heretofore. Then, with looks of deep anxiety, he hastened away. After his departure, Phantasmian read these lines, which he found traced on a tablet, but whether addressed to Zelneth or Irene seemed uncertain. I thought by tears thy soul to move, since smiles had proved in vain, but I from thee nor smiles of love nor tears of pity gain. Now, now I could not smile perforce, a sceptred queen to please, yet tears will take the accustomed course, till time their fountain freeze. My life is dedicate to thee, my service wholly thine. But what fair fruit can grace the tree, till suns vouchsafe to shine? Thou art my son, thy looks are light, O oh, cast me not in shade. Beam forth, ere summer takes its flight, and all my honors fade. When, torn by sudden gusty flaw, the fragile harp lies mute, its tenderest tones the wind can draw from many another lute. But when this beating heart lies still, each chord relaxed in death, what other shall so deeply thrill, so tremble at thy breath? But the dark hours came on, no lamp shed light on the silent face of Selneth, when a train of damsels entered from the garden, with lighted tapers and baskets of night-blowing flowers in their hands. They sang a dirge over the maiden, then covered her body with those blossoms of greenish-white or palest yellow, stuck their tapers around the canopy, and slowly departed, leaving the chamber filled with an aromatic fragrance. Phantasmion had retired to the further end of the apartment, 
where the horns of an elk threw their white shadow on the marble floor, and from that station he watched the mourners while they performed their gentle rites, then softly stole away. At last the door was closed, but one of the train yet lingered under the canopy, her flower basket resting on the couch. Phantasmion, as he drew forward, beheld her countenance by the light of the tapers, which threw a tender gleam over the pale flowers, the still features of Zelneth, and the bright aerial visage that shone above them. Phaedeline, cried the prince, can Zelneth be restored? And oh, where is Irene? Leave Zelneth in my care, she answered, and seek thou the domain of Melodine, there to find and rescue her that is lost for thy sake. Phantasmion was about to reply with eagerness, but the nightly exhalations of so many blossoms overpowered his senses, and he sank on the floor, motionless and pale, as the fair damsel who lay stretched upon the couch. No sooner had he become thus entranced than his guardian spirit stood beside him. Phaedeline, she exclaimed, is it not enough to have deprived Phantasmion of the pitcher? Wherefore hast thou dealt with him thus? The soft fairy smiled on Potentilla, and with words and tones like the warm breeze that unbinds the frozen earth, she persuaded her not only to forgive what was past, but to make a compact with herself, whereby all whom they both loved should in the end be gainers. Potentilla called for her light car, drawn by dragonflies, and having increased both to a convenient size by magic power, conveyed away the fainting prince through the murky air, while Fadeline remained alone by the side of Zelnes. As a plant that seems irrecoverably withered revives at the first shower, swells out its flaccid leaves, and stretches them forth to catch the kindly moisture, so was Zelneth restored by the salutary dews and airs which the kind spirit shed around her. Gradually, a tender bloom suffused her cheek, gentle breathing returned, the damsel raised herself from the couch, holding out her hand as if to welcome someone, while her lids were yet fast sealed, then fell back upon her pillow in deep, refreshing slumber. But, when a thousand flowers were opening their soft eyes upon the dawn, those of Zelneth were unclosed, and up she sprang, scattering on the floor the blossoms which had been so plentifully strewed on her seeming corpse, they were now drooping, while she was upraised in health and lifesome beauty. Alas, Phantasmion had disappeared, and all the apartment was silent and solitary, till a fawn ran in from the open door, through which, ere the cock crew, Potentilla had carried him away. She went forth and caught a glimpse of Fadeline, who was just entering a tufted grove with a chalice in her hand. Zelneth followed, and, kneeling on the ground, under the embowered branches, besought her to declare why Phantasmion had left her side and whither he was gone. A slender voice came from amid the myrtles, and it spoke thus, Phantasmion left Zelneth to seek Irene, and shall I never more regain his heart? The maid exclaimed, again the soft voice, breathing gales of perfume, gently but clearly answered in these words. Henceforth, Phantasmion's heart will never swerve from Irene. Zelneth continued to listen, while tears chased one another down her upraised face, but the only voice she now heard was that of a turtle cooing to his mate, with soft notes long dwelt upon in the depth of the wood. Then she strove to turn her heart against the bright youth of Palmland, and grieved to find how much more love than pride had mastery there. While her mind was full of such thoughts, 
she heard a slight rustling. Something had fallen from the branches beside the place where she sat, and straight before her she espied the picture of Penzalimer, with its eyes looking at hers, and seeming to convey in their passionate melancholy an expression of reproach. From the hour that it fell from her lap when she first beheld Phantasmion, Zelneth had scarce bestowed a thought on this idol of her childhood, which Anthemina, when her heart was estranged from Penzalimer, had carelessly hung around her baby neck. Now she took it up by the chain of pearls to which it was fastened, and sighed as she gazed on the well-known lineaments for the free heart and enamored fancy of former times, when she rejected many an unpleasing suitor for the sake, as she loved to imagine, of the noble Penzelimer. Zelneth raised her eyes on being accosted in a shrill voice and shuddered to behold Maldoril approaching her with a cup. Yulander brought me to thy couch, said the ancient queen, where we found plenty of withered flowers, but no entranced maiden, and soon my young kinsman, rushing to the door, beheld thee, bound lightly over the lawn. I could have restored thee to health, had thy malady continued, and even now I would have thee drink this cup, lest it should return with the evening dews. Zelneth suspected that the liquor presented to her was some of that which had been prepared in the cavern, and that Maldoril's design was to make her return the chieftain's passion. Nevertheless, she took the cup and slowly drank, with her eyes fixed on the features of Penzalimer. Scarce had the magic draught pervaded her frame than the portrait assumed a new aspect. It seemed fairer, nobler than Phantasmion himself. Love for the king of Palmland seemed absorbed into a larger emotion, as the last wave is swelled by those which have gone before. Her visions of childhood rose again in all their keen aerial colors. The realities she had since experienced melted into indistinctness. Their forms were gone, but still their glow remained, and filled the atmosphere of memory with warmth and golden light. Yolander advanced from amid the trees, where he had hitherto been shrouded, and seeing her face bright with smiles, when she returned his salutation, he inwardly rejoiced, vowing eternal gratitude to Maldoril, by whose endeavors he fully believed that Zelneth looked upon him thus. Formerly, his enamored looks and words, which the maid lacked strength to repel, seemed to hasten her spirit's flight. Now they fell upon her occupied mind, like raindrops on marble, which glitters amid the shower and remains unsoftened. Both were equally possessed with gladsome fancies, and confident in the success of their hopes when they rode into the forest, ere noonday, followed by a train of huntsmen. Zelneth indulging her steed in all his graceful vagaries, and Yulander fondly hoping that for long years to come she would thus disport herself by his side. Kings shall sue for Zelneth, and for her the ardent lover shall forget his first love. Fadeline breathed this prophecy once more in Zelneth's ear as she passed under the branches. Now it was no longer unheard or unheeded. The damsel applied it to Penzalimer, and joyfully expected that he would soon appear to rescue her from Durance. End of Part 3 Chapter 7Part 3 Chapter 8 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 8 Phantasmion enters the sunless valley. 
A night and a day had elapsed since Phantasmion left the domain of Yolander when, roused from his trance, he found himself descending through the sky. Then he sat upright and saw right before him, fanning the twilight air, the gauzy wings of dragonflies, while those of Potentilla, who stood upright on the seat of the car, were playing above his head. The moon had not yet risen, but, when he came to the ground and leaped upon the turf, he perceived a shining circlet in the sky, and had no sooner looked upon it than it began to descend, widening, swelling, and brightening as it sank. The tract where Phantasmion stood first glimmered, then gleamed, and lastly shone with more than noonday splendor in many-colored light, while gradually the features of the scene stole upon his eye, and soon he recognized the skeleton palace, where owls peeped forth from bowers of ivy, the ruined hall with its watery floor and rose-crowned window, and the wild pleasure ground in all its flush of blossoms. The deserted palace and the space in front of it were encircled by a vast hoop of cold flame, produced by innumerable fireflies. Phantasmion turned to Potentilla, who was leaning back in the car, over which her wings reclined, and smiling at his looks of wonder. "'Wilt thou go with me?' she said, "'to rescue a lost maiden from the sunless valley?' "'Instantly,' cried Phantasmion. "'Wherefore do we tarry?' Recruit thy strength, replied the fairy, with what is provided in the car. Then drink from this vial which Fadeline gave me for thy use. It will ward off the drowsy influences of Melodine's abode. Phantasmion obeyed, and while his eyes were brightening with the effect of the flower fairy's gift, Potentilla from the seat of the car touched his head and shoulders with her wand, then waved him after her, as she soared aloft. The next moment, he was flying through the air, his head surrounded with a halo of intense light, his dragonfly wings and whole body beaming with a keen luster, which varied from chrysolite to vivid green, passing off into the deepest azure and thence into amethystine purple. Potentilla flew on before, with the wings and radiant head of a lantern fly, and the clouds of luminous insects followed. As the whole mass went undulating along, they looked like a fiery river flowing athwart the sky, and so proceeded till, just as the moon rose, they overpassed the wall of rock which bounded Melodine's domain. This region, said Potentilla, by the spells of the enchantress who dwells here, is perpetually hidden from the sun's light. The whole valley is girt on every side by rugged mountains, and during the day it is shrouded by an opaque fog. Phantasmion followed his guide above the black vapors to a point right over the center of the valley, while the fireflies high overhead appeared once more like a circular constellation. Thence he saw the pitchy cloud splitting in the middle and shrinking more and more on every side, till at last it was heaped in huge scrolls on the mountain tops. While the moon and stars in full splendor were thus revealed to waking eyes below, Phantasmion beheld their beams reflected from the enlightened veil, from lily fields and groves of gleaming foliage, pastures whitened with straying flocks, and one wide sheet of water. As he descended he heard no sound but that of the owls, hooting to one another from yew trees and ivy-mantled rocks, the sonorous notes of those at hand receiving clear but slender responses from others at a distance. Coming yet lower, he began to catch the nightingale's upper notes, and next the sound of flowing waters and the gurgling of brooks. Potentilla waved her wand, and the luminous procession, which was now following in the form of a serpent, quenched its radiance and became suddenly as black as ink. Phantasmion underwent the same change, and followed his guide, who alone 
retained her light to the abode of Melodine. The enchantress was busily employed in gathering herbs on which the moonbeams rested, seeking them by the side of a rivulet which wandered through a meadow silvered with white flowers, a damsel, delicately fair and slender, with flaxen locks that floated to her taper waist, was following Melodine and leading by a silver chain a milk-white stag, the hoofs and horns of which appeared to be also of silver. On his back, the deer carried a pannier, filled with flowers and herbs, which the damsel received from the enchantress and deposited there. Thus they proceeded, moving contrary to the course of the brook, till they arrived at a rocky knoll, where the same rivulet formed a little cataract, splitting like a raveled skein into diverse shining threads, here gliding in clear laps over a smooth-faced stone, there skipping from rock to rock enveloped in foam, here narrow as a spindle, there spreading like a garment puffed out by the wind. Melodine was stooping over the united streams, when Potentilla ranged her regions right above the meadow and watery knoll. The head of the enchantress was crowned with white poppies, and a shining veil, thrown back from her face, covered her kneeling form. Surprised at the shade which darkened the rivulet and its flowery banks, she looked straight up to the sky, disclosing a face of goodly features, but black as ebony. Gazing thus, she beheld Phantasmion all irradiated with purple light, descending under the cloud, and in an instant afterwards, the pitchy mass became a flaming pavilion. Then, blinded and amazed, she fell upon the ground, covering her face with her veil and muttering disjointed spells, without power to repeat any at full length. Phantasmion alighted on the hillock, and Potentilla, hovering over his head, called on Melodine to deliver up the damsel, whom she kept a captive in her sunless domain. She, meantime, was hasting away with a white stag, and soon entered a cypress grove, through which the rivulet held its way. Melodine hesitated to promise obedience, but when the air blackened with swarms of stinging insects and the ground with locusts, she consented to yield up the captive maid and to conduct her to the deserted palace through the pass whereby she entered the valley. No sooner was this promise given than the locusts rose into the air. Potentilla secured Melodine by chains which were hidden under her glittering raiment and with which she was wont to bind her victims. This being done, the whole swarm flew away along with the other insects till they disappeared in the distance. Phantasmion had no sooner witnessed the submission of Melodine than he pursued the damsel into the dark wood. As he rushed along, casting phosphoric splendor on the somber foliage around, the nightingales hushed their songs, and the owls shrank away, letting down the curtains of their prominent eyes. At last he obtained sight of the damsel. She, after flitting on before him for some time, being now unable to go any further, stood in the pathway, leaning on the white stag who had suited his pace to that of the lady, and restrained his steps when he saw that her powers of flight were exhausted. The damsel clung to her mild companion, hiding her face against his neck, till the pursuer, having arrived where she stood, took her hand and gently cried, Look up, my fair one, it is Phantasmion. At these words, he withdrew the dazzling radiance which streamed from his whole person, leaving his head only encircled with a diadem of softened rays. Then the lady raised her face, and Phantasmion saw that it was Lukoya, the sister of Zelneth. Ill-fated maid, she had drunk the oblivious draught of Melodine, had not only forgotten her parents and pleasant home, but ceased to pine for the noble stranger, whose image had occupied her soul, a beautiful poison tree that spread abroad its glistering boughs and blighted every other growth. But now Phantasmion's illumined face, radiant with love and beauty, suddenly cast a flood of light on forms and hues of memory which magic power had obscured, but never obliterated. Again she loves, again her stilled bosom is roused to emotion, and, full of tears and blushes, 
she once more hides her face on the stag's neck. Phantasmion himself was overwhelmed with trouble and perplexity. Lukoya's heart he had never cared to fathom, but he now suspected that she and not Irene was the lost maiden whom he had been sent to deliver. Hast thou not found the daughter of Albinian? He cried, turning to Potentilla, as she came through the grove, leading the sullen Melodine by her chain. Oh, tell me whither to go in search of her. Seek not here for the lovely princess, she replied, but free Lukoya from captivity, and Phaedeline will lend her aid to make Irene thine. What power has Phaedeline? cried Phantasmion, and why must I do her behest? Hast thou forgotten the silver pitcher? Potentilla replied. Without Phaedeline's good will, thou canst never obtain the hand of her whom thou lovest. Doubtless Eulander will be sent to rescue my lost maiden, exclaimed the youth. Nay, replied the fairy, Eulander cares for no one now but dark-eyed Zelneth. Lukoya had been weeping silently while the stag looked in her face with eyes full of tenderness. Phantasmion even fancied he saw a tear glisten there, and that he had seen that countenance before, if these were not illusions of his dazzled sight. But, at Zelneth's name, the maid looked up with an inquiring glance. "'Knowest thou aught of my sister?' she said. "'Zelneth went to seek for thee in the forest of Nemorosa. the youth replied. "'There she was wounded by an arrow, and now lies, I fear, in evil plight at the house of the young chief Yolander. When Lukoya heard this, her heart was oppressed by a crowd of sad emotions, and throwing herself on her knees before Phantasmion. Take me hence, I beseech thee, she cried. I will not keep thee long upon the road, but travel night and day to reach my home. Phantasmion declared that he was ready to conduct the damsel whither she desired to go. He raised her from the earth and placed her on the back of the stag. Melodine showed the way to the borders of a lake, and Phantasmion followed, leading Lukoya's gentle steed by the silver chain. End of Part 3, Chapter 8「Three, Chapter Nine of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter Nine. Phantasmion rescues Lukoya from captivity. Having reached the banks of the wide sheet of water which Phantasmion had seen from on high. The company entered a mother-of-pearl boat, which was drawn by a team of swans, a full-grown pair in front of the vessel, then three yokes of younger ones, each couple being smaller than that behind, while a single tiny signet floated on before. Doves fastened to the stern by silken cords, and studs of diamonds fluttered round the gleaming skiff, and hastened its progress while they lulled the air with their downy pinions. The firefly constellation was reflected, together with the moon, on the calm waters, forming now a belt across her disk, now a ring which enclosed and shone beyond it. White peacocks spread their snowy trains over the dark foliage that overhung the lake, white cormorants occupied the rocks, and alabaster images of herons, cast their still reflections on the pool. A tiger emerging from the recesses of the wood came to drink the cool wave. After sleeping in his lair during the close heat of the darksome day, and he too was colorless and gleaming as a ghost. Anon, a white bird of paradise rose from the trees and flew with slow undulating motion over the lake, first crossing the moon's bright image then sinking amid blossoms, downy and drooping as her own light plumage, like a snowflake descending into a wreath of snow. 
The tiger was drinking at the end of a little promontory as the skiff passed by. A reflection on the water made him look up, when beholding the youth's illumined visage, he suddenly rushed back again into the depths of the grove. The company in the vessel were all silent and thoughtful. Lucoya's fair stag lay beside her feet. Potentilla sate at the helm with Melodine's chain in her hand, while the captive crouched beneath her ebon face bowed forward, Phantasmion leaning over the prow, cast such bright gleams upon the waters that the silver-scaled fishes leaped up, attracted by a stronger light than had ever penetrated their liquid haunts before. The pensive eyes of Lukoya were bent upon the youth's averted face. She longed not for green fields and sunshine, but would fain have dwelt with him in that gleaming veil forever. Melodine drew nigh the stag and would have rested her head upon his lily side, but when he shrank away, she leaned against the edge of the boat and began to murmur a soft melody. The tone of her voice was inexpressibly sweet, and such was her power that it seemed to proceed from the woods and waters and all places except from the skiff. For a time her words were inaudible, but at last, Phantasmion ceased to watch the leaping fishes and listened unconsciously to these numbers. Blessed is the tarn, which towering cliffs o'er shade, which, cradled deep within the mountain's breast, nor voices loud, nor dashing oars invade, yet e'en the tarn enjoys no perfect rest, for oft the angry skies her peace molest, with them she frowns, gives back the lightning's glare, then rages wildly in the troubled air. This calmer lake, which potent spells protect, lies dimly slumbering through the fires of day, and when yon skies, with chaste resplendence decked, shine forth in all their stateliest array, oh, then she wakes to glitter bright as they, and view the face of heaven's benignant queen, still looking down on hers with a smile serene. What cruel cares the maiden's heart assail, who loves but fears no deep-felt love to gain, or, having gained it, fears that love will fail. My power can soothe to rest her wakeful pain, till none but calm delicious dreams remain, and, while sweet tears her easy pillow steep, she yields that dream of bliss to ever welcome sleep. While the strain proceeded, a pleasing stupor stole over Phantasmion, in spite of the antidote supplied by Fadeline, he began to dream with his eyes open and beheld the face of Irene in that of Lucoya. He fancied himself on the black lake and the radiance of the moon seemed to his eyes the same soft sunlight which had shone upon his last interview with the island princess. Potentilla had been busily plying her pinions and broke the silence of night with a continuous hum which seemed to tell of open flowers and glancing sunbeams. Now her wings of gauze hung sleepily down, her lamp languished, one hand dropped the helm, the other resigned the chain, and bending forward she nodded over the stern. Then Melodine raised her head, and fixing her eyes upon Phantasmion's face, continued her melodious incantations accompanied by the noise of downy wings and of the gliding vessel. Meanwhile, as she waved her hand, a mist gradually rose all around the skiff, and on its silvery tissue the rays of the moon painted a vivid rainbow, which rested on either side among the darksome groves and shady waters, while, betwixt the arch, an island, and the great towers of an ancient castle appeared to loom through the vapory veil. Then, Phantasmion dreamed that all which had passed, since he plighted his faith to Irene under the sunny rainbow, was but a dream. He took from his bosom her glossy ringlet, which had been twined with rubies, to form a crown for his brow. And placing it on Lukoya's head, while he whispered vows of changeless love, 
he bade her wear it for his sake till she was queen of Palmland. Melodine looked earnestly at Lukoya, with her finger on her lips, and entreated her, in low-breathed strains of melody, to bear at least a silent part in this deception. And, if the maiden loved Phantasmion while his countenance was unimpassioned, how still more lovable did he now appear, when his looks and tones expressed the deepest tenderness. But her spirit was free from magic influence, and, having just recovered from the treacherous spell, she was less subject to its power. Never, she said, shall Phantasmion, for my unworthy sake, be hidden from the sun's light. False Melodine's subtle slights shall all prove vain. The enchantress by this time turned the skiff. The doves fanned the air with redoubled vigor, and the swans rowed swiftly on toward the head of the lake. Lukoya took a loosened peg, which had fastened one of the dove cords into the skiff, and was about to prick the relaxed palm of Potentilla, which lay half open beside her lap, when the vigilant fairy, who had only been feigning slumber, quickly rose, her flames all rekindled, and snatching the peg from Lukoya, plunged it up to the diamond head in the arm of Melodine, which was guiding the rudder. Stung with pain, the enchantress uttered one loud, piercing shriek. Such a sound had never escaped her lips till then. Such a sound had never before been heard in the gleaming valley. The peacocks, which sate in multitudes on the trees around the lake, unfurling their eyeless trains to the moonbeams, echoed that scream, till the mountains rang again, and instantly afterwards the fiery constellation descended from on high to hang over Melodine's head in the guise of a comet that flamed and quivered just aloft with painful splendor. Dazzled and stunned, she sank to the bottom of the skiff, veiling her head and pressing her palms closely over her muffled ears, while Potentilla resumed the rudder and put the vessel back into its former course. Phantasmion, now thoroughly awakened, looked in confusion at the chaplet of Irene's hair, which twined the flaxen locks of Lukoya. The damsel took it from her head and, with a gentle smile and glistening eye, restored it to him. That done, the stag, which had been standing by her side with wild looks ever since Melodine turned the skiff, lay down at her feet and rested peacefully as before. After a while the boat entered a river, by which the waters of the lake partly flowed off. The swans held on their course till they arrived at a steep wall of cliff, against the lower part of which a cloud was resting. Here they stopped, and Potentilla, having pulled Melodine by the chain, she rose, and waving her hand, caused the cloud to soar from the base to the middle of the rock, discovering an archway, through which the stream flowed and disappeared amid the windings of the passage. Lukoya embraced her gentle stag as they entered the gloomy vault. Phantasmion covered himself with redoubled brightness and cast his many-colored radiance on the expanded wings and arched necks of the swans, while on before and around the gliding boat all was black shadow, save where the fireflies made a golden line in the dark wave, or, soaring up, illumined the roof of the vault, enkindling many a sparry rock, which never reflected one bright ray before. At last, the damsel's now unwanted eyes were smitten by a faint sunbeam. The birds moved with renewed vigor, hastening toward the genial light, and soon a picture, delicate and minute from distance, presented itself to the eyes of the voyagers, who once more beheld the varied green of trees opposed to the deep blue of the sky, and all the landscape bathed in golden radiance. Melodine seemed blasted by the sight, and crouched with her face to the stern, closely wrapped in her veil. Meantime, the halo which surrounded Phantasmion faded away, and his wings disappeared, but heedless of the change he sate, gazing into the stream while the swans lowered their expanded sails, and Lukoya leaped ashore with a white stag, 
for once more he beheld his watery image with that of a damsel holding up a pitcher before her face. And now, for the first time, he observed, in the faint background of the picture, a prostrate form with the aspect of one dying or dead. Why renew this vision? said he to the enchantress, pulling her chain. Whom wouldst thou now delude? The prisoner replied that what had deceived Anthemina was no work of hers, but produced by the spirit of the waters, who had the faculty of foreshowing future scenes. While she yet spoke it faded away, all quitted the skiff, and at a signal from Melodine, the swans disappeared under the darksome vault. End of Part 3 Chapter 9Part 3, Chapter 10 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 10. Phantasmion hears the second part of Penzelimer's story. Potentilla bade Phantasmion follow the stream that flowed from Melodine's domain till it entered a large river. There, said she, thou shalt find one who will convey thee and thy company to Adele, not far from Lucoya's home. Offer the gem that clasps thy sleeve to the boatman, and he will receive you all without delay. Then her form changed, and he knew not if she were gone, or still flitted around him among the gilded flies and feathery nets that hummed in the sunshine. As they proceeded, Phantasmion heard the rocks resound from a distance, above the murmur of the brook, the course of which they were following. Sometimes he thought they rang Anthemina's knell with melancholy falls, and then again their merry tinkling chime, seemed fitter to express the happiest espousals. Soon after, those sounds ceased to be audible, having arrived where the waters met and espied an old man in a boat. He plucked the jewel from his sleeve and ran toward him, holding it up to sparkle in the rays of the sun. On a nearer view, he saw that the conductor provided by his guardian fairy was no other than the ancient fisherman of the Black Lake, who clasped his hands for joy as soon as he knew the prince. The messenger might have told thy name, he cried, instead of offering hire. What messenger? inquired the youth. She with bright wings, he answered, who met me in the watery dell and bade me hasten hither with this boat. Was it not on thy account she promised that I should win by the journey more than my fish had ever earned in Polyanthida, or was it all a dream? Phantasmion replied that, if it were, he had dreamed to good purpose, and having placed his companions in the vessel, he took an oar and seated himself beside the fisherman who felt right glad to see him turn the boat and begin rowing down the stream. They made great way with little effort, the full tide bearing them so rapidly forward that the rich meads of Almatera flew by like dreams, while each new scene had carried its colors into the next, ere the eye had time to distinguish it. Now and then they came to land for refreshment, and added the juicy fruits of the riverside to their other provisions. Such delays Phantasmion yielded to courtesy, though but ill-pleased to see the stream run by his idle boat. Nor did Lukoya wish to linger long upon the way, for she had now resolved on following her sister to the chieftain's palace. If her mother's consent could be gained, and the more her heart reproached her with Zelneth's wound and Arzine's anguish, the less she felt the pangs of unrequited love. It was now the end of the third day, and night hung over the voyagers, while moths flitting by reflected feeble gleams of light at intervals, 
and once the eyes of the wild cat glared amid branches that deepened the darkness of the waters by their shade, Lukoya slept with a tear on her cheek, lulled by the chant of nightingales. Melodine lay still and heaved no breath. Phantasmion rode on in silence, while the old man, from whose failing hand he had taken the oar, slumbered heavily at his feet. He was thinking whether Potentilla still watched over him, when a ring of fireflies suddenly encircled the black visage of the enchantress, and revealed the workings of her sullen face. In a few moments they rose with shrouded light, and a well-known voice was heard to sing thus. What means that darkly working brow, Melodina? Whose heart strings art thou resting now, Melodina? The dearest pleasure follows pain, but thou with grief shalt I remain, and for thyself hast forged the chain, Melodina. Those gauzy wings, muttered the fisherman, disturbed but not awakened, by the fairy's shrill pipe. He slept in peace, while she thus proceeded in a softer tone. Ah, dream of sullen skies no more, sad Lukoya. The roughest ocean hath a shore, sweet Lukoya, a steadfast shore, the billows kiss, and oft some fancied joy to miss, prepares the heart for higher bliss, young Lukoya. By daybreak the vessel was gliding near a field, which the river all but surrounded. Bright green was that field, sunbright its liquid fence, and brightly shone its groups of giant lilies, their glossy leaves full fed with moisture, their painted petals vying with the painted insect, which seemed in rivalry to rest its wing beside them. Round this fair semi-isle Phantasmion steered his boat, and saw that just beyond its farthest angle a narrower stream which flowed beneath high woody banks joined company with the river, losing itself in the stronger current, as childhood steals imperceptibly into vigorous youth. Guessing that this newcomer issued from the lake near Manyard's mansion, he concluded that here was the place to which the fairy had directed him, and was preparing to land on the meadow when his ear caught the melody of a harp floating along the hidden course of the tributary stream. The sounds approached quickly from a distance and now were interpreted by the varying tones of a voice which it seemed to him that he had formerly heard with the same accompaniment. He fixed his eye on the spot where the rivers met and soon beheld a skiff with silken streamer glide from among the trees. It made for the meadow, and, when he had ascertained by whom it was occupied, he took up the oars, and having awakened the fishermen, began to look about for a landing place. Lukoya still lay fast asleep, with her head toward the prow. She had been dreaming of Zelneth, and seemed to roam in search of her through tangled wilds, but when the sounds of the harp came thrilling across the waters, they wrought new images into the dream. That kingly portrait, once her sister's idol, appeared to gleam upon her lonesome path, but when she stooped towards it, the picture had become a living shape. While the frame rose into high trees, between the golden shafts of which the monarch sate before her, singing and playing on his harp, this vision was dissolved by the slight shock of the boat coming to shore, and no sooner were her eyes opened than they discerned the very object of her dream, Penzelimer himself, with his hand upon the strings of the harp, which he had just ceased to sound, while on he came betwixt the drooping trees that overhung the river, and Zelneth stands beside him. Zelneth herself, with outstretched arms and eager look, and face not pale and languishing, but full of bloom and triumph, as before the days of her unprosperous love, and who is she that bends towards the long-lost maid with deeper and more melancholy fondness? Is it Arzine? Ah, oh, yes, 
That mild maternal brow is none but hers. Lukoya is soon folded in her mother's arms, and feels that now indeed she has attained a peaceful haven. When the happy tears and embraces of this meeting were over, Arzine retired with her daughters to another part of the dell, where a tent had been pitched among the trees for their reception, and harnessed steeds were in readiness to carry them home by land. Then Penzelimer, finding himself alone with Phantasmion in the island meadow, for the old man was a little way off with his vessel, accosted him in the friendliest manner, smiling and saying with a perfectly rational air, I owe thee many thanks, young king of Pomland, by thy hand, I have been restored to reason. The youth looked astonished at these words. That thou art a changed man, he answered, I see plainly. But how can I have wrought the change, I see not. And were thy looks no less wild than thy speech, I should hold thee as far from reason as ever. Hear the second part of my story, said Penzelimer, as thou hast formerly heard the first, I will soon show what part thou hast played in my adventures unknown to thyself. Phantasmion delivered Melodine to the attendants, and heard the king of Almaterra relate how the ebon-faced enchantress had tempted him to seek the house of Maldoril, what had befallen him there, how he personated his enemy, fought with him in that disguise, and was wounded by the magic weapon, but not mortally as all supposed. And whither went Glendreth? exclaimed Phantasmion, Olula's prophecy rushing into his mind. Did he invade the land of palms? I thought not of him, replied the monarch. For days, indeed, I lay incapable of thought, and, when my senses returned, was racked with grievous pangs, but this bodily suffering proved the cure of my better part which, like the dyer's tincture, underwent the fire till it became clear, glowing, and resplendent. Reason rose, as it were, from the dead, and now in my true being I began to live once more. Again the stars shone forth in their own brightness, again the breezes blew with their own freshness, Self shrinking within its natural limits, no longer sicklied the whole face of outward things, as vapors veil with one same lurid hue, earth, sky, and water, my spirit ceased to multiply itself by a thousand vain reflections, but grew and spread through nourishment from without. While I was in this happy state, feeling as if my soul were a thing apart from its mortal frame, yet, with my head sunken among the pillows from utter weakness, Albinian's queen drew near. Weeping bitterly, and calling me by the name of Glendreth, while, at the same time, methought there was a soft, bright face on the other side of the bed, which peeped from behind the curtains, and seemed to be smiling at her in derision. Wondering if these were but spectres of delirium, I raised myself up a little, when Modra, beholding my face, cried aloud and hurried from the apartment. Then that other bright visitant, growing more distinct, showed herself to be the fairy Fadelin, and bade me hastened to Nemorosa, where a lady of the house of Thalimer was detained against her will. As she gave me the command, the flower spirit imparted the power of obeying it. Such enlivening odors and salutary dews she scattered round me ere she disappeared. I arose, feeling that my wounds were healed, and took my way, sane in body and mind, through the country of Maldoril, 
entering Nemorosa during the heat of the day, I was allured to a shady covert by the sound of falling waters, and there I spied a dark and slender youth holding a silver vessel underneath a scanty rill which spouted over the rocks. At the first glance I felt assured that this vessel was Anthemina's picture, but before I had resolved whether to claim it or no, the dark youth mounted his horse and rode away. Anthemina is dead, thought I, and if any malignant power imagines that by this sight he may lure me back again to my former dreams, he has missed his purpose, but for the sake of Anthemina's lovely child, I will see into what hands the charm has fallen. Phantasmion was now listening with a fixed eye and troubled heart, for he doubted not that Caradan was the youth with the pitcher, and that he had gone in search of Irene to Nemorosa. I followed him, pursued Penselimer, but he had ridden out of sight, and while I was considering which way to take, a strange object arrested my attention. Below the green oaks of the forest grew the stump of a black thorn, which seemed to have been blighted, for not a single leaf remained upon its uncouth boughs. The tree was split into a double trunk, one portion of which reclined upon the ground, while the other stood upright, and toward the top shot forth a solitary pair of branches. Casting my eyes adown the forest, I beheld the branches change into the horns of a stag, the upright stem put on the appearance of a deer's head and towering neck, while that which lay upon the ground swelled out into a body covered with a spotted hide. I rushed forward to examine this marvel when the creature started up on legs newly formed, perhaps from the roots of the thorn bush, and flew before me while I eagerly followed, spurring the sides of my fleet horse to overtake him. Bounding on with huge leaps, he came at last upon a company of hunters, the most noticeable of whom was one that wore a panther skin around his loins and on his yellow hair a crown of golden oak leaves. No sooner had this goodly youth espied the giant stag than off he flew, followed by all his train with whoop and hollow. One fair huntress alone remained gazing bashfully at me, with such looks as might have made me pause on the road to paradise. And this fair huntress, cried Phantasmion, was Zelneth, daughter of Magnart, she whom Phaedeline sent thee to deliver, she who was destined to replace all that thou hast lost in Anthemina. Even so, rejoined Penzalimer, at first I thought, she was Anthemina herself, restored in all her bloom and beauty, and thus we stood silent and motionless till the shouts of the distant huntsmen began to die upon the ear. Then she fled with me, and, on better knowledge of the sweet lady's features, I found they had an expression all their own, and one for its own sake, most worthy to be loved." Fair indeed were the still eyes of Anthemina, gleaming amid cloudy tresses, seen in the light, they showed as many exquisite shades of colour as a mountain pool, but those of Zelneth sparkle so, with life and meaning, that we think less of them than of the eloquent tales they tell. How her love was bestowed on me, I marvel. She was but a laughing babe." Think me no babe now, cried Zelneth, softly approaching and smiling away some little confusion at sight of the younger prince. Sooth to say, I have not yet found thee much older and wiser than myself. I should scarce quarrel with these few grey hairs, she added in a lower tone, if they did not remind me of the years that I have missed thy love. With a brightened countenance, Penzelimer finished his story. 
it was dusk, he cried. When we entered Magnard's garden, Arzine ran from the threshold to welcome us, but Zelneth greeted her with tears. Think not that I bring Lukoya, she cried. I hoped to find her with thee, but the tone of thy voice tells me thou art still bereaved. While the sad mother wept on Zelneth's bosom, Fedelin gleamed upon my sight. Just under those moonshiny blossoms that droop over the porch. Weep no more, she cried in soothing accents, but seek the long-lost maiden in the watery dell. Didst thou see her? asked Zelneth. As plainly as I see thee now, replied the king, fixing his pensive eyes on the sprightly maid, and methought she drew a white violet from her bosom. Ah, my sister's flower, the lady cried. Mine eyes must have been dimmed with tears. I only heard her voice, and said she, not that a spirit of the wood protects Lukoya, and that this same spirit lent her power to raise the sylvan phantom that brought thee to my aid? Methought so, the king replied, but, lady, let me place thee on thy steed, or the sun will reach this journey's end, while we are delaying ours. Then they all rose to depart, and after bidding farewell to the friendly fisherman, Phantasmion rode with Zelneth and Penzelimer toward the mansion of Magnart, relating his adventures in the Sunless Valley by the way. End of Part 3, Chapter 10「three chapter eleven of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three chapter eleven Phantasmion meets a numerous company at the mansion of Magnart. Meanwhile Arzine and her train were hastening homewards with fair Lukoya whose snow-white stag tripped on in front of the company, as if delighted to carry a rider that so befitted his own graceful form. At times, the maid turned to exchange smiles with Arzine and see what watchful eyes were ever bent on her. Then she flew forward again, surveying with new delight the veil of Polyanthida and every object brightened by the beams of day. At last, her father's mansion came in sight, and the damsel bounded on, waving aloft a white mantle and casting up her eyes to a little mount within the walls, where her young brothers and sisters were assembled to watch the advancing company. Thus, as she approached the principal entrance, while the children were skipping down the hill, and beheld, not far from the gateway, an ancient woman seated in a car to which leopards were harnessed. The heads of the beasts were held by a youth who had himself somewhat of a wild and sylvan air, but not unmixed with gentleness and lofty grace. He was listening to the words of a dwarf who stood in front of the car and grasped the reins with his left hand while... With his right, he pointed at Lukoya. But when the damsel's fair stag came nigh the leopards, he started and rushed through the open gate by which the children had passed to meet Arzine. The youth stepped forward, but could not overtake the fugitive till he had reached the top of that woody hillock which overlooked the road. There, holding the reins of her sylvan steed, he told the lady that his name was Yolander, that he had come to Polyanthida under the guidance of his sage kinswoman Mulderil in search of her lovely sister Zelneth, whom he sought in marriage, 
and who had been carried away from his forest realm just when he hoped she would become his bride. Tell me now, cried he, looking out over the road with glowing cheek, is not that my betrothed lady who comes in front of the troop? A betrothed lady comes there, but not thine, I think, replied Lukoya with a pitying smile. Oh no, I cannot be deceived, exclaimed the lover. What damsel rides with such youthful spirit, such queenly grace as my fair Zelneth? Oh yes, and surely that is Phantasmion of Palmland, who comes on before? Yulander cast his sparkling eyes upon Lukoya's face, and marked its pensive air. But who is he that keeps by the side of Zelneth? the chieftain next inquired. That is the king of this country, she answered. And wherefore comes he to Polyanthida? asked the youth. To celebrate his nuptials, as I guess, Lukoya made reply. Yulander smiled when he beheld her blushing cheek and asked in a courteous whisper if she were to be the bride. Oh no, she answered. Panzelimer seeks the hand of Zelneth, who had indeed betrothed herself to him as I can witness before she went to seek for me in thy far country. Struck by these unexpected tidings, Yulander dropped the reins and sank upon the ground, but soon recovering, he saw the gentle eyes of the stag and of Lukoya fixed upon his face. The one was standing near him while the other kneeled by his side. The lady's gentle countenance tempted Eulander to pour forth all his sorrow to her, and, even while he spoke, her looks of pity stole into his heart and softened the bitterness of that grief which he described so eloquently. But now Arzine appeared, climbing the hill with young Hermilian and all her blooming train. The chieftain was still telling his tale with passionate gestures to Lukoya, who leaned upon her stag and felt her own griefs assuaged by the tears that flowed for Yulander. Arzine accosted the youth and made him the same courteous proffer of hospitality which had been already accepted by his ancient kinswoman. He gladly consented to be her guest and accompany the wife and daughter of Magnart to a pleasant bank shaded by trees and spread with wines and fruits and dainty viands by Arzine's command. Yulander kept by the side of Lukoya, continuing his discourse as much for the sake of the listener as the subject, for while he beheld her gentle smiles and soft retreating eyes, new thoughts and wishes began to arise in his bosom. Insensibly he ceased to think of Zelneth but, caressing Lukoya's silver-coated stag, observed how fair he would look among the glades of Nemorosa. "'Wilt thou go to that far land?' quoth the damsel playfully to her favorite. "'Fair mistress,' replied the chieftain, answering for him, "'without thee I should pine and perish. Let us both dwell there together.' At that moment the stag raised his soft, bright eye, and looked at Lukoya as if he adopted what was said in his name. Arzine and the ancient queen were now sitting on a bank. The white deer came to browse beside them, ever and anon looking up in the face of Maldaril, who scowled and shuddered as she met his gentle gaze. Yulander among the trees at a little distance was teaching Lukoya how to shoot when Zelneth, followed by her noble companions, entered the grove. With light steps she approached her sister, but on a sudden beheld the chieftain of Nemorosa bending his bow under a laurel. At that sight she uttered an exclamation of surprise and drew back hastily to the side of Penzelimer. Then she approached the bank to salute young Hermilian, who was twining his mother's hair with honeysuckle and started when the face of Maldaril presented itself to her view. Soon afterwards, 
the whole company assembled in Magnard's princely hall, but while the guests were gaily entertained, their gentle hostess sighed for one that was absent, and wondered whether Caradan had joined his father in Rockland. Yulander had ceased to sigh, and appeared so all intent on winning Lucoya's grace that Zelneth addressed him with one of her archest smiles, and inquired what had become of the panther's skin which he used to wear for her sake. She blushed when the youth whispered that he did but follow her example. Had not she too forgotten for whose sake she once wore it? Afterwards, however, he drew a remnant of the hide from beneath his vest to spread it under Lucoya's feet. Then, cast upon the spotty carpet his crown of golden oak leaves, which Zelneth took up and twined among her sister's ringlets. Amid these and other such pleasantries, the evening shades stole on, when Melodine dismissed her gloom and joined insensibly in the general mirth. Next, Maldoril arose, and with meaning glances besought the Lady of the Sunless Veil for that oblivious charm which her kinsman stood in need of. At the same time she placed a chalice in her hand, and Melodine, taking forth a vial, poured the contents therein, and delivered the cup to Yolander. But he fixed his eyes on Lucoya, as she sate considering the coronal which now she held in her hand, and declaring that he had no flames in his bosom which he desired to extinguish, poured out the liquor on the marble floor. Then Maldoril complimented the bashful maid on having gained a most experienced suitor, one so well seasoned to love's variable climb that he might now endure its worst vicissitudes, and flinging stones that rebounded from one point to another, annoyed all present by hints at Yulander's passion for Zelneth and his worship of Irene. While the youth himself maintained a blushing silence, Melodine pretended to take his part. Methinks I can spy good reasons for his last change, said she. I know of a song which fits this case well. A song, cried Maldoril. Let us hear it. Thy voice may have more persuasion than thy words. Phantasmion was absorbed in thought of Irene, and Lucoya engaged by the silent courtship of her sylvan lover when this wily proposal was made. So, without opposition from them, the veiled lady held up her fettered arms, where she stood in the midst of the hall, and, with expressive gestures, began to sing thus in the person of Yulander. Methought... I wandered dimly on, but few faint stars above me shone. When love drew near, the night, said he, is dark and damp. To guide thy steps receive this lamp of crystal clear. Love lent his torch with ready hand, the splendid lamp by his command. I strove to light, but strove in vain, no flame arose. Unchanged, unfired, as moonlit snows, it sparkled bright. Again, on wings as swift as thought, the boy a glittering crescent brought of sunny gold, full sure twas worth a monarch's gaze, and how I toiled to make it blaze can scarce be told. Deprived of hope, I stood perplexed, and through my tears what offered next obscurely floated. One other lamp love bade me take, mine eye its color, size, or make, but little noted. Till soon, what joys my soul inspire, from far within a steady fire, soft upward steals, and oh, how many a tender hue, what lines to loveliest nature true, that beam reveals. Now what reck I of burnished gold, or crystal cast in statelier mold, this lamp be mine, which makes my path where I go, with warm reflected colors glow and light divine.
Gradually, Melodine's voice, together with the fumes of the liquor which had been spilled upon the floor, infected the hearers with drowsiness, and as the song proceeded, the scenes it pictured stole upon their misted eyes. First dim starlight, then love with torch and lamp and beamy smile emerging from a wood, till at last a crowd of witching faces and bright torches and lamps of a thousand shapes and colors, lit and unlit, waved along before them in endless succession. Even the enamored chief could no longer look upon the very face of Lukoya, but beheld a lucid image of it with closed lids. The maid herself scarce inquired whether she were indeed the lamp that was kindling at Yulander's touch, and though lately proof against Melodine's charm, now nodded under the influence of this doubly potent spell. Phantasmion kept his eyes open longer than the rest, and perceived that Maldoril was loosing the fetters from his captive's feet and hands, but was too fast held in drowsy bands to prevent her liberation, and, ere it was fully effected, he too lay slumbering on the floor. A new sun had just dawned when he started up, and saw its rays brightening the crimson cushions around, and the fair faces which reclined on them. But the enchantresses were gone. With small hope of recovering his prisoner, he rushed into the garden, and passing toward the chief entrance through a shady avenue, beheld the traces of panther's feet on the humid soil, but beyond the trees and the gate in open sunshine not a footmark was to be seen upon the firm dry earth, and when he looked at the contracted shadows of cattle on the verdurous plain and saw the broad blue sky where a caroling bird was the only speck of darkness, he felt as if drowsy charms and sunless veils and sable visages were but dreams of a long dim night. End of Part 3 Chapter 11「3 Chapter 12 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 Chapter 12 Yolander Conducts Lukoya to the Forest There was something in the face of the huntsman chief which brought to Lukoya's mind young Dariel of Tigridia. The maid had loved and suffered silently so that, when she listened to the suit of Yolander, Arzine thought she gave her hand to him who had first touched her heart. The nuptials of Zelneth and Lukoya were celebrated in their native vale and Sanio, Penzelimer's trusty minister being present at the festivities, was the first to inform the king of Palmland that Glandreth had invaded his dominions and was now occupying them with a powerful army. Forthwith, a league was struck betwixt the three sovereigns, who resolved to unite hand and heart against the common enemy, to drive the invaders from Palmland, to free Almatera from dependence on the land of rocks, to protect the right of Albinian's son, and to place Yulander on the throne of his ancestors. Phantasmion resolved on secretly entering Gemaura, that district which had been annexed to Palmland by the union of Zalia with Dorimont, for the sake of raising the spirits of the inhabitants by his presence and stirring them up against the foe. It was settled that Penzelimer, meantime, should divide his forces, that one part in company with the foresters of Nemorosa should fall upon Rockland, while the other, having joined Phantasmion in Gemaura, which was yet free from the foreign troops, should unite with such an army as he could muster to drive the invaders from the land of palms. 
With these allies, Phantasmion would have felt sure to triumph, but for the lack of metal armor, which damped his subjects' martial prowess. Neither could the king of Almaterra supply the deficiency, for all the steel and brass which his people had in use, they derived from Rockland, having neither mines nor skillful smiths among themselves. Magnart could not be called upon to fulfill his big promises, for he had entered Rockland with all the men he had at command, under pretense of securing Albinian's throne against his brother's selfish schemes for the boy Albinette. He desired to have his eldest son with him in this expedition, and to bring about his marriage with Irene, but the youth and the maid were both missing, and no one could inform him where to seek for either. Panzelimer's queen was eager to raise a powerful army in behalf of Phantasmion, not from any lingering remnant of love for him, but that her kingly spouse might appear important in the eyes of all men. Lukoya dreaded warfare, but from gratitude to her deliverer, she felt anxious that he should be enabled to regain his kingdom. While Phantasmion journeyed toward his mother's country, which lay betwixt Almaterra and Palmland, full of grief to think that he must again travel away from Irene, Panzelimer conducted Zelneth to his castle with regal pomp, and Eulander's gentle bride accompanied her spouse to Nemorosa. The wife of Magnart went with Lukoya on her journey, for having heard Panzelimer's tale, she could not doubt that the youth who carried a silver pitcher was her beloved son, and purposed to make inquiry in every house on the borders of the forest till she traced him out. After many disappointments in this quest, she entered the goatherd's cottage, and there heard tidings which made her resolve to shape her course towards the sea. Arzine had left home with no attendants of her own, and now that she was to part company with her son and daughter, Lukoya bade the chieftain guard her through the dangerous forest. Yolander, though somewhat loath, obeyed his bride's behest, and to show his zeal and devotion, attended her mother, leaving Lukoya at the goatherd's cottage. The lady asked many questions of her host concerning his late guests. She had already heard him relate to Arzine how a beautiful young maid and her aged sire abode under his roof, how the old man died, and the damsel departed with a tall dark youth who bore a silver pitcher. Now he spoke more minutely of these matters, and showed the jewels which his guests had given him. Lukoya felt certain that the decrepit man of whom he spake must have been Irene's father, and full of tender thoughts, she wandered forth alone to view the hollow in the rocks where his coffin had been deposited. Passing through a part of the wood she espied the fair white stag browsing among the trees a little way off, and fearing that he might stray too far, she went to lead him back toward the cottage. On she tripped, calling him by his name in silver tones. But, ere she reached his side, two dwarfs rushed out upon her from behind some bushes, and while one pinioned her arms, the other bound them with cords, then both together placed her at the bottom of a car drawn by leopards, wherein the ancient queen of Tigridia was seated. Swar, though, said Maldoril to one of these monsters, putting the reins into his hand. Dost thou see how yon white deer stands terror-stricken? Drive up to him. If he awaits our approach, I will throw this noose around his neck and take him to the gardens of the cavern. Swarthos toad eyes gleamed strangely while his mistress spoke, and as he stared in affright, the scarlet ring flamed out all around, but without answering a word, he shook the reins and drove up to the stag. Lukoya was lying stupefied at Maldoril's feet. The witch stood erect. The object of attack appeared as motionless as if it were a marble effigy 
placed there to decorate the glade. But no sooner had Mulderil cast her loop round his neck than she dropped the cord and shrieked aloud. It was no stag, but a tiger with glaring eyeballs and terrific jaws around which her noose was hanging. With a roar that shook the forest, he sprang upon the leopards, and at that moment, Yolander appeared in sight. Perceiving the jeopardy of his kinswoman, he rushed on with his javelin uplifted, but no sooner had he approached the car than the tiger vanished. Yolander beheld his own Lucoya lying bound at the feet of Mulderil, and the hideous dwarf crouching like a nightmare on her breast. In a moment he had severed the cords that bound her arms and would have spitted the monster with his spear. But a voice that seemed to be made up of many sweet voices, so powerful and mellow it sounded, was heard to speak thus. Take home thy gentle bride, Yolander, and let the dwarf and Mulderil go unhurt. Fear nothing for Lucoya. She may wander securely, by day or night, amid the loneliest recesses of this forest. The spirit of the woods protects her and destined the maid from childhood for thy bride. Go, Mulderil, in vain wouldst thou seek to overthrow my plans. Fly to thy mountain abode, and lurk no longer in the shadow of these boughs, weaving deceits and treacheries. While the voice continued, every bird was silent, every leaf motionless on the spray, but when it ceased, a murmur ran through the forest, as if the whole expanse of foliage were swept by one strong, transient gale, and all the feathered inmates of the wood burst forth at once into a choral melody. Lucoya leaped upon the turf, then Mulderil drove her leopards through an opposite quarter of the forest, and soon was hidden from the view amid leafy oaks and beeches. The lady by Yolander's side pursued a different course. Wherever she passed, the birds crowded to the boughs. Even the trees themselves appeared to be saluting her with lowered branches, and a troop of white fawns like snowdrops, such as had never been seen in that region before, skipped around and preceded her steps. But when the wedded pair arrived at the Sylvan Palace, Yolander saw to his astonishment that its precincts were enlarged, that a fence of tall trees which formerly bounded one end of it was now removed, and a delicious pleasure ground watered by a clear stream laid open to the view. This was Maldril's garden, which the spirit of the wood had thus added to the domain of Yolander, having taken off the spells which had hitherto hedged it round. The witch's cavern was yet standing, but soon afterwards an earthquake laid it in ruins, and the place it had occupied became a rocky channel, where the river, diverted from its ancient bed, flowed roughly, flashing and raving in its broken course, as if indignant at the remembrance of deeds once perpetrated there. End of Part 3, Chapter 12《Part 3, Chapter 13 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3, Chapter 13 After the death of Albinian, Irene leaves the goatherd's cottage. While the daughters of Magnart were surrounded with festal pomp and pleasure, Irene watched her father's dying bed, and so deeply was her heart engaged by his wants and sufferings, that the season of Albinian's mortal sickness, with its slightly varied stages, its melancholy hopes, and transient restorations, remained imprinted on her mind, 
like a vivid chart, which the eye surveys at once, all equally distinct and clear from the beginning to the end. Just before his death, Albinian spoke of Modra and Anthemina, for in this time of natural decay, his speech was wholly restored. It was a fearful retribution, he said, that she, to whom I denied my hand and heart, alas, too hastily promised, should be enabled to bewitch my spirit with an amorous infatuation, and afterwards my body with unnatural weakness. But, oh, the beauty of Anthemina might have done away stronger traces from the heart than Modra ever left on mine. Irene sighed, and still more sadly she felt when Albinian spoke further. Weakly and wrongfully, he said, I accepted the fair hand which a father offered me, and that gift brought after it a train of evils which clung to the receiver even after the gift itself had been taken away. Dorimont was in all her thoughts. Dorimont was in her nightly dreams when, wrapped in slumber, she uttered the name of Dorimont. Sleep deserted my pillow. One fatal image haunted the unloved husband and the regretful wife. But thou, Irene, wast the child of that marriage. Thy beauty brings only blessing and happiness. Thou hast loved me here, and where I go, thy love will follow me. While he spoke thus, the old man's withered face appeared to expand and brighten, his mind being filled with the one only thought on which it could dwell with perfect complacency. He imagined blissful regions where Modra and Anthemina could wreck his peace no more, where Irene with brave Caradan, who from boyhood had shown him reverence, might dwell forever in his sight. But soon that vision faded, while sad remembrances and anticipations cast their deep shadows over his soul. Irene saw that his countenance was disturbed, though no new words had been spoken, as a lake appears ruffled on the surface while not a breath of air is stirring abroad, and the veilsmen imagine a wind under the waters. Albinian was thinking of Albinet, left in Glandreth's power, of his infant boy in the palace of Palmland, and worse than all, of Irene, plighted to the son of Dorimont. Father, said the maid, reading part of his thoughts, thy children have noble and brave defenders. Me they may survive as well as thee, but while I tarry here below, I will watch those children with a mother's care, and rich indeed will be my reward when I receive thy thanks hereafter, and hear thy sons declare that I faithfully discharged my trust. These soothing images found no entrance to the spirit of Albinian. Dorimant and Anthemina, Irene and Phantasmion, linked together in eternal bliss. Alas, alas! Earth had been a scene of sorrow to the dying man, and heaven, he feared, would be no heaven for him. He pressed the hand of his daughter, and even while the dews of death stood on his forehead, his sunken eyes appeared to glow and be projected by the force of passion. Promise to marry Caradan, thy dear mother's kinsman, he cried with struggling utterance, then I shall die in peace. At that moment, the unhappy maiden longed to die too and dwell with both her parents in the realms above. She remained silent, while tears flooded her cheeks, and her whole frame trembled. With a faint groan, Albinian abandoned her gentle hand, and instantly afterwards he ceased to breathe. Irene closed his eyes, 
and kneeled beside the bed with her face bowed down in sorrow. She had remained for some time in this posture, lost to all outward sights and sounds, when a well-known voice roused her from abstraction. Irene lifted up her eyes dim with tears and beheld the silver pitcher of Anthemina gleaming in the light admitted by a narrow casement at one end of the rustic chamber. He who held it now advanced from the door and she saw the dark face and slim figure of Caradan. Is he dead? cried the youth, gazing sorrowfully on the couch. Oh, say not that he is gone forever. I have here a blessed medicine, which the kind spirit has given me at my earnest prayer. I myself have felt its wondrous potency. It comes too late, replied the maid with fresh flowing tears. Charms and witcheries can have no power upon him now, for good or evil. Woe is me, exclaimed the youth. It would have restored him to health and vigor. How long have I been wandering, bewildered in this land of trees? Oh, would that Fadeline had shown me thy abode before. Many thanks to thee, Caradan, exclaimed the damsel fervently. Thou hast ever loved and honored my father. Caradan wept and stood looking with a countenance of grief on the face of Albinian. At last he said in a low voice, Thy father loved me too, and fain would have had me for a son. Were thou and I united in marriage, his spirit would be ever nigh to bless and to protect us. O oh, Caradan, replied Irene, with his dying voice he urged that suit, yet even now could I restore him to life by granting it? The little word might not be spoken. Caradan remained silent for some time after Irene had uttered these words, kneeling by the side of the bed. Then he clasped his hands and looking up with a face of deep anguish. Yes, yes, he exclaimed. It was fated long ago. I see that thou art never to be mine. Thou couldst not consent even to bring back Anthemina from exile. Irene gazed on Caradan as if to read his meaning in his eyes, but soon the youth declared that meaning with solemn words and oaths. Anthemina yet lives, he cried. Blame me not that I have concealed this truth till now. Hereafter thou shalt know that I am blameless. Anthemina did not sink beneath the waves, and I can guide thee to the coast where Fadeline last night shed balm upon her lonely pillow. Irene stood rapt, with face upturned and arms outstretched but motionless. Her heart and brain seemed overborne by a multitude of thoughts and feelings which crowded on them at once. A thousand dreams were suddenly realized and started up from the depths of memory into brilliant light. At last, she clasped her hands and rushing to her father's side. Oh, wake again, she wildly cried, to hear that my mother lives. The eyes of him who lay on the couch were open, and he returned her eager gaze. Albinian was not dead. Sense and breathing had feebly returned, and he had heard that she whom he had never ceased to love was yet among the living. He beckoned to Caradan, who stood with eyes fixed on his in amazement. Caradan approached and kneeled by his side. Albinian looked at the maid, then at the youth, and pointed to the silver pitcher now standing on the floor. His lips moved, and Irene knew as she bent over her father that he was entreating her to be the wife of Caradan, and to seek with him for Anthemina. "'Give me thy hand,' cried the youth, rising. 
Then he whispered in Irene's ear, Satisfy the soul of Albinian, and thou shalt be free from this tie by the time that thou beholdest Anthemina. The maid no longer held back, but placed her hand in the hand of Caradan, and the youth, firmly grasping it, said aloud, Thy daughter has betrothed herself to me, and death only can separate us. Irene marked not the import of these words, her mind being wholly occupied with the change that came over her father's countenance immediately after they were spoken. For his face, though it wore a happy smile, was now again like the face of the dead. Caradan took the pitcher and bedewed his body with the charmed liquor supplied by Fadeline. The effect was marvelous. Every wrinkle was removed. Soft bloom overspread the cheek. And that body, so miserably wasted by sorrow and sickness, showed like the corpse of some fair and youthful person whose thread of life had been snapped by sudden accident. But this adorning was only for the tomb. Albinian's spirit had fled a moment after Irene placed her hand in that of Caradan. The empty tenement looked meet to be inhabited, but the soul returned to it no more. Long did Irene linger over the corpse of Albinian, but when all hope was gone, having placed her father's remains in a coffin, she went with Caradan to lay them in a hollow among the rocks, where the goatherd promised they should remain in safety till they could be removed to a more august receptacle. The service performed, Irene besought Caradan to fulfill his promise of conducting her to the abode of Anthemina, and having mounted a mule, she bade her sorrowful host farewell with many tears, declaring that even when he should cease to be the guardian of her father's body, every link would not be severed which bound her to him. End of Part 3, Chapter 13Part 4, Chapter 1 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 1 Phantasmion vainly attempts the destruction of Glandreth, but, entering the bowels of the earth, he meets with one who assures him of victory and vengeance. Phantasmion had hardly set foot in Gemmaura when his guardian spirit appeared before him. Beware, she cried, how thou proceedest in this district. The foe has been here before thee. Hast thou no remembrance of the country around? Phantasmion replied that it scarcely seemed new to his eyes. Not far from hence, rejoined Potentilla, is the mansion where thy mother used to dwell with Cyrides, her guardian. After marriage, Zalia loved to revisit the spot and see her little son gambol in those green haunts where she herself had sported when a child. And here, in her death sickness, she desired to be buried, feeling like one who longs to lie down in the old accustomed chamber. Her ancient friend survived till an hour ago, but Glandreth and his savage band have murdered him. Then Phantasmion cried aloud, and flinging himself upon the ground, began to tear his bossy ringlets. It was rumored, said the fairy, that he possessed a treasure and was acquainted with rich mines, and so they pierced him with spears on the tomb of his beloved pupil, which he daily visited. Then, digging into the ground, discovered no precious stones or metals, but thy mother's coffin, which they are even now carrying away into palm land. For Glandreth declares that he will hold a solemn feast and burn the relics of Dorimont and Zalia before all the people, 
as a sign that the old race of the palm land kings is utterly abolished. Phantasmia now sprang from the earth, and grasping Potentilla's robe, implored her either to end his life at once, or to give him the means of sudden vengeance. The fairy made answer that she could devise but one way of helping him to that for which his soul thirsted, and this was a plan fraught with toil, hazard, and even abasement. Phantasmion exclaimed that he would do and be and suffer anything if he might but stop his enemies in their outrageous career. Then, listen, she replied, among the innumerable subjects of my insect realm is one which digs a pitfall in the sand. For nature has so constructed its unwieldy form that it walks backward and has no other means of catching the nimble creatures which it preys upon. At the farther end of Jemaura is a wide, sandy plain. This thy enemies have to traverse ere they reach the luxuriant valley of palms, where their armed comrades are to meet them, and the festival is to be celebrated on the morrow. Thither thou shalt go, and, in the guise of that crafty insect, prepare a gulf large enough to swallow up Glandreth and all his murderous band when they arrive there. The youth embraced this offer, and having received wings from Potentilla, rapidly followed her through the air, and alighted on a spot suitable for the undertaking, just before the entrance to the Vale of Palms. At a touch of the fairy's wand, his wings vanished, and in the same point of time, every vestige of his human form disappeared. Led by a natural instinct, he forthwith set to work and traced out circle within circle in the sand, his new body and limbs being his only instruments. Laboring without stop, he at length scooped out a deep cavity of size proportioned to the gigantic form that wrought it. At the bottom of the snare, the metamorphosed prince now took his seat, covering himself with sand, so that the upper part of his head with the points of his horrid fangs, which were like two reaping hooks crossed, alone remained visible. And over the hollow Potentilla wove a gummy web, on which, when finished, she strewed a light covering of dust and common soil. By this time the sun was sinking in the west, and the last clump of spiral trees, which Glandreth's company passed on the margin of the desert, cast their lengthened shadows on the yellow sand. The leader had fallen back to the rear, and was deep in discourse with a chieftain, richly apparelled, to whom he was vaunting his triumphs, and describing how he meant to rule the state of Palmland. Some way in advance were those that bore the remains of Zalia, and the younger men went riding on before. No sooner had these youthful warriors, who were mounted on prancing steeds, arrived at the sandy plain then, for their own sport and that of their horses, they resolved on running a race. Their friends behind warned them to beware of the old quarries which lay to the right, but, confident and careless, off they started, avoiding those excavations only to fall into an equally destructive gulf. Within a few seconds of each other, all arrived at the abyss which gaped to receive them. At the edge of it they rushed upon a loose bank of pebbles and sand, thrown up by the fabricator. Against this the horses stumbled and, losing their balance, fell headlong into the trap. The men behind wondered to see them suddenly disappear in the distance and strained their eyes to look after them. It was quite dark ere the company that brought the coffin reached the pitfall so that, leisurely as they came, all rolled over the shelf and joined their comrades in the hollow. There the mingled crowd were lying, crushed and mangled with broken arms, legs, ribs, and skulls, some over their steeds and some under them, while those horses which still had power to move 
kicked and plunged and trod their masters to atoms. He who had dug the huge pit kept quietly at his post, somewhat oppressed by the weight of one man's body, nigh the centre of the gulf, but eagerly expecting the arrival of Glandreth. Glandreth, however, was destined to escape that snare. The moon is not yet up, he cried to his men, and we shall have a stream to cross in the Valley of Palms. Kindle the torches that we may see our way. The conqueror was obeyed, and by the light which the flaming pine branches cast around them, he and his companions descried the heaped sand and the gaping pitfall. Seized with alarm and astonishment, Glandreth snatched one of the brands and went with the rest to look down into the gulf, where he beheld a crowd of mangled bodies and heard the groans of the dying. Phantasmion plainly discerned his enemy, on whose horror-stricken visage the torchlight cast a fierce glare, gazing into the pit and narrowly eyeing the scythe-formed weapons of his head which stood out from the center of it. Another face gleamed beside his, beneath a jeweled headdress. It was that of treacherous Magnart, whom the indignant youth immediately recognized. After a while, the two brothers and their attendants drew off toward the Vale of Palms. When, with some difficulty, Phantasmian dragged himself out of his den, bringing up his mother's coffin along with him. He had been miserably bruised, and now, feeling all eagerness to be divested of his hideous mask, would have cried aloud for the insect fairy, but found himself unable to utter any articulate sound. He looked about and saw her whom he sought in woman's form, yet surmised that she must still be near him, because a large moth having the figure of a skull depicted on the upper part of its body, kept flitting around his head, ever and anon uttering a shrill, piteous cry, then sinking down beside him. She deserted Dorimont, thought he. Perhaps she will leave me also to my fate. But soon he keenly felt the wretchedness of being disabled either from facing his enemies or escaping from them by fleetness, when a band of soldiers armed with arrows and javelins and lighted by torches came to take the bodies of their companions out of the pit. One of them, looking over the plain, espied the monstrous form under which Phantasmion was disguised, lying stretched upon the sand. He pointed it out to the rest, who feared to approach, but from a distance discharged their missiles, many of which stuck like porcupine quills about the ungainly carcass and caused the youth such anguish that he believed he should expire that night. Miserable man that I am, he exclaimed, or rather, miserable spirit of a man, imprisoned in a frightful crust, to what dire extremity have I been driven by mad rage? I have cast away my human form and faculties, only to perish, unavenged by arrows from my enemy's quiver. Still dragging his mother's coffin, he crawled along in hopes to gain the shelter of some rocks, and there to find at once a deathbed and a sepulchre. The moon had now risen, and cast her light upon those rocks by the time that Phantasmion reached them. But, exhausted with fatigue and pain, he was unable to command the motions of his monstrous body. His eyes grew dim, he came unawares to the verge of a stone quarry, and, moving backwards, lost his balance so that he tumbled to the bottom. Here, when he recovered sense and motion, which his fall at first suspended, he found himself lying under a vault of stone, with large fragments of rock scattered on all sides. The moon cast her beams wherever they could find entrance amid the lumber of the quarry, and all around was an interchange of blackest shade and soft silver reflections. But the attention of the miserable transformed youth 
was drawn toward a darksome hollow, whence he heard low sounds proceed, and after listening a little while, he distinguished two voices, one deep and sepulchral, the other slender and sweet as that of a solitary wren, which pipes a faint strain when the blast is silent, and the sun shines on its cushion of snow. Nevertheless, oh, save my son, exclaimed that softer voice. It seemed as if the tones of the second speaker came from underground, while those of the first descended through the air. What have I to do with the son of Dorimont? was the reply. I have expiated my disobedience, great spirit of the earth, rejoined the voice from above. I perished through that marriage against which thou didst warn me. What is phantasmion to me? Again the earth spirit replied. He hath a helper of his own, and even here in my domain she hath presumed to practice her witcheries. But thou hast triumphed, O Valorga, the second speaker replied. Now, therefore, I beseech thee, suffer Potentilla to restore my son. While Phantasmion listened to this colloquy, his soul was filled with indescribable tumults, and the silence that succeeded to the last words caused him the most agonizing suspense. He felt as if his strong emotions must rend and break to shivers that disproportioned case which lay on the earth, lumpish and uncouth as the half-hewn stones around it. But now the hideous dream had vanished, and once more, Phantasmion stands erect in his own noble form, splendid as the palm trees, with their leaf-crowned heads in gorgeous clusters, graceful and majestic as the darker cypress. The first object that met his eye was Potentilla, whose wand had just wrought the change. Flitting away in the air, her wings growing transparent, her head triagonal, and her whole body more and more minute, till she had changed into a dragonfly, the gay colors of which twinkled for a moment in the moonlight. She is gone, but what pale shadowy form is that which occupies her place and gazes with such melancholy tenderness on the renovated youth? Phantasmion, looking intensely before him, remembers the fair and gentle countenance of his mother. An hour ago, how ill could he have brought to mind the face of Zalia, the face which, ever beaming in his presence with maternal love, had been to his young mind the very symbol of maternity. Now he not only recognized her features, but saw his childish self placed outwardly before him, the time when he lay in sickness on his little couch, and saw that soft, mild countenance still shining in betwixt delirious dreams, now occupied his mind with such intensity that all which had since occurred seemed dim and faint in comparison. As when a distant moonlit building attracts the eye, all the intervening space looks indistinct and shadowy because that has been rendered so conspicuous. Filled with inexpressible yearning, Phantasmion leaned forward to embrace the form of Zalia. But ah, uh, no living mother watches over him now, and she who has done him this maternal service is but an impalpable phantom. Blessings on thee, my son whispered the spirit, restore my bones to their resting place and lay those of my ancient guardian in the same grave. Phantasmion eagerly promised to obey, and then she related that Valorga once made her mistress of those precious mines, the report of which induced Dorimond to marry her, that no sooner had she accepted his hand than the gift was withdrawn. 
While Phantasmion listened, darkness fell upon an opposite rock, which had reflected the full light of the moon from its humid front. He looked and saw what seemed the shadow of a giant leaning forward from a recess hard by. Torimond could never find those mines, Zalia continued. Alas, it was but iron and gold that he sought in seeking me. The earth spirit knew this and frustrated his purpose. I too need metals, exclaimed Phantasmion. Come then, his mother cried, and I will show thee where the veins of iron have lurked for ages undisturbed by the hand of man. Phantasmion rejoiced at these words, but now he bethought him of Irene, and hoping that he might learn where she abode from the kind spirit, he kneeled down and looking earnestly in her face, Mother, he said, Knowest thou her, to whom I have given thy coronal, the daughter of Anthemina? As he uttered that name, a mournful displeasure darkened Zalia's countenance, and her face, which hitherto had shone in the moonlight pure as a fleecy cloud, now appeared to be flecked with purple. What means this fearful change, my mother? exclaimed Phantasmion. And oh, why dost thou look so mournfully? The shade of Zalia was silent. Phantasmion held up his hands in earnest supplication, but now his mother's form gleamed upon him no longer, and the moonbeams enlightened only the solid walls of the quarry. A dawning sun tinged the landscape with its first pale beam. When Phantasmion heard the voice of the earth spirit, calling him from underground. Son of Zalia, follow me, it cried. And thou shalt be avenged on Glandreth. Shall I leave the light of day, thought the youth, and venture below with one who may keep me there forever? While Phantasmion hesitated, he heard a thundering sound, and at the same time the masses of rock and walls of stone began to quiver, as if seized with an egg, the tumult having subsided, he beheld an opening in the earth, and from that passage the voice of the earth spirit issued and spoke thus, If thou wilt be avenged on Glandreth, follow me. Then Phantasmia thought, that if Balhorka willed his destruction, he had but to shake the earth a little more forcibly, and straight away he must lie defaced and mangled among the fragments of the quarry. No sooner had he taken his resolve than hope led him onward, and all the dark images which fear had summoned were dissipated in the brightening atmosphere of his soul, like smoky fumes in the transparent ether. He entered the hollow way and groped along till the last faint glimmering of light had disappeared, and he stumbled in utter darkness. Awful noises now assailed his ears, and as he proceeded, they grew louder and louder, but his courage never deserting him, he went right on till the passage widened and brought him to an open space with a firm but glassy footing. Here he groped a little way, then stopped, overcome by the seeming weight of darkness and the utter vacancy on every side, when, all at once, his eyes were attracted by sparks of light kindling in the blackness above, and soon myriads of fresh stars shone out. In another moment, these fiery points shot upward and swelled into volumes of flame which disclosed the ruby lamps that held them, and a new heaven of gems with numberless constellations glittering over his head. Below that sapphirine dome, the ground was of jasper, embossed with a thousand flower-like jewels, and full in view were lakes of crystal, emerald groves, and towers and spires of diamond, which rose from a golden city built on many hills, and stretched away in the distance, far as the eye could reach. 
over against where he stood at the entrance of this gemmy veil, which, by its overbrightness, caused the eye to ache for milder daylight. Phantasmion beheld a swarthy and gigantic figure leaning on an implement of iron. His limbs were muscular, his cheeks ploughed with furrows, and his eyes deep sunk beneath black, beetling brows. Valhorga, exclaimed the youth, it is not gold and jewels that I seek from thee, but brass and iron. Give me sharp swords to pierce the impious hearts of my enemies, and let all thy brilliant possessions reflect no other light than that of these subterranean fires. Valhorga's stern brow relaxed, and he smiled upon Phantasmion. Thou shalt have iron and brass enough, said he, to make thy armies glitter in the sun like glaciers on the bosom of the mountain. Conduct them to the volcano behind the house of Maldaril, and there they shall be fitted out to encounter the troops of Glandereth. Phantasmion's heart exulted in this promise, but casting his eyes around the sparkling scene, he beheld that stony likeness of a pomegranate tree whence his mother's coronal had been taken. It grew beside a crystal lake which reflected the sapphire vault, and stars of carbuncle and ruby their flames appearing to quiver on its firm, smooth face. Then, Zalia's mournful image came back into his mind, and he besought Valhorga to explain the meaning of her sudden change. The earth spirit made reply, Maldaril persuaded thy mother to taste poisonous berries, averring that they were sent by the flower spirit, and would render her beloved in the eyes of her neglectful spouse. Zalia clings to the error which haunted her dying bed, and believes that Fadeline sought her life for the sake of Anthemina. Then, Falhorka disclosed the ancient feud which had rendered Maldaril and Melodine bitter enemies, both to the house of Thalimer and the race of Palmland, and Phantasmion found that Dariel, whose scarf he still wore across his bosom, was the brother of Eulander, and had been sent by the Tigridian queen to work his ruin. This discourse inspired him with fresh desire to encounter his foes, and fresh hope that he should prevail against them ere long by Valhorga's aid, the spirit of the storm he feared not. And the meanest dying day, thought he, is long since past, and her vow to serve Glandreth must have expired. With a joyful heart he quitted the sapphirine sky, and pursued another dark winding passage, till it led him up into the light of day. When he emerged, the sun was shining in meridian splendor, and he found himself in the midst of Penzelimer's army. With the numerous bands of Gemarians and fugitives from Palmland who had flocked around him, they had assembled on the sandy tract, and were greatly at a loss to know what had become of the young monarch scouts having been sent on all sides to look for him in vain. Great was the astonishment of Penzelimer when he beheld the earth gape a little way from the place where he stood, and Phantasmion came forth in helmet, shield, and breastplate of diamonds, which sparkled like icicles in the sunshine, though not to be melted by the hottest ray. This jeweled armor, cried the king of Palmland, is a pledge from Valhorga, the spirit of the earth. Soon it shall be exchanged for a more serviceable suit. 
and every soldier of our numerous host shall receive the same harness as myself. Let us march to the volcanic mountain of Tigridia, there to be equipped for battle and victory. Acclamations rent the sky. After the silence of amazement, which his first reappearance occasioned, Phantasmion showed himself to the whole army in his brilliant array, so that all were inspired with confidence and eager to start for the mountain of Maldoril. Phantasmion delayed their march while he interred his mother's remains and the body of her faithful guardian in a secret but honored grave. Those rites performed, the united armies set forth on their distant expedition. End of Part 4, Chapter 1part 4 chapter 2 of phantasmion by sarah coleridge this librivox recording is in the public domain part 4 chapter 2 arzine wanders in search of caradan to obey whence he has just set sail with irene The spring returns, and balmy, budding flowers revive in memory all my childish hours, when pleasures were as bright and fresh, though brief, as petals of the may or silken leaf. But now, when king cups open their golden eyes, I see my darlings brighten with surprise, and rival tints that little cheek illume when eglantine displays her richest bloom. Dear boy, thou art thy mother's vernal flower, sweeter than those she loved in childhood's hour, and spring renews my earliest ecstasy by bringing buds and fresh delights for thee. With tearful eyes, Arzine murmured this song, and seemed to see the childish form of Caradan sporting before her, as when she sang it first. No one gave tidings of her son at the hamlet where she had spent the night, but the goatherd had expressed a belief from inquiries which the youth made that he and his fair companion were bound for the Tigridian coast, and thither she directed her steps. At midday, she entered a sunny field, where the reapers were busy at work, and women were binding sheaves. There she sate below the shady fence to rest, and saw a little boy collecting corn poppies, which the sickle had cut down, while his sister was busy in gathering the scattered ears. "'Idle child!' cried the laden girl. "'What hast thou gleaned, I pray? Will those gaudy flowers make bread?' Bread for bees, replied the urchin. If thou art a busy bee, thou canst make bread of flowers. So saying, with a laugh, he flung his posy at the chider's face, and a shower of the profitless blossoms fell down into her armful of corn. Arzine thought of her own playful Hermelian and young Arimel, who loved to forestall womanhood, and step into her mother's place, till the golden crop and the bending groups swam through her tears, and starting from her seat, she resolved forthwith to seek no more for him who scorned her anxious love, but return to her other children. In this mind, she turned her face from the village, whither she had intended to proceed, and, having partaken of the reaper's fare, which they charitably offered, she travelled on in another direction till the day was far spent. Then, sitting down again to rest, she heard the wind sigh dolefully and saw the black shadow of a tree on a smooth green slope wave slowly up and down. Arzine was thinking with deep sorrow of her truant son, and now she seemed to hear his voice and to see his image reproaching her change of purpose. She arose, 
and again resolved to seek along the coast for Caradan. Scarce hoping to reach the sea that night, she journeyed, however, towards it, till she entered a field that was bathed in the clear melancholy sunshine, and contained a clump of dark home oaks, about which a rivulet was wound like a silver chain. Just across that brook, a shepherdess was sitting, while her flocks nibbled the green grass on its margin. Arzine would scarce have seen her among the trees, but the notes of her song, while the words were inaudible, came across the field to her ear, and she went up to the place where the maiden sate, with the intention of begging a shelter for that night. "'Go on with thy sweet song,' said Arzine courteously, when the damsel rose at her approach. "'I will sit beside thee on this fallen log.' The shepherdess renewed her melody, and these were the words of her song. Full oft before some gorgeous fane, the youngling heifer bleeds and dies, her life blood issuing forth amain, while wreaths of incense climb the skies. The mother wanders all around, through shadowy grove and lightsome glade. Her footmarks on the yielding ground will prove what anxious quest she made. The stall where late her darling lay, she visits oft with eager look, in restless movements wastes the day, and fills with cries each neighboring nook. She roams along the willowy copse, where purest waters softly gleam, but ne'er a leaf or blade she crops, nor couches by the gliding stream. No youthful kind, though fresh and fair, her vainly searching eyes engage. No pleasant fields relieve her care, no murmuring streams her grief assuage. The words of this song struck painfully on the sad mother's heart. Her face was bathed in tears, and while she drooped forward, absorbed in bitter thought, the light-hearted shepherdess gathered her flock and went away. After a while, Arzine remembered that she had not where to take her rest that night, and strove to overtake the damsel, but having followed her for some time, she became exhausted, and laid her down to sleep in a waste field. The sun had just risen, and turned the dewdrops around Arzine's bed into diamonds, when Caradan entered the field where his mother slept. From the top of a lofty mullein, a goldfinch piped beside her, and soon his new-fledged offspring, led by their other parent, alighted on tall plants around, buoyantly swaying back and forward as they pecked the winged seeds. Arzine saw not the gleeful group. In dreams she had wandered back to her own deserted little ones, and knew not that he for whose sake she had left them was weeping over her. While the youth still gazed on his mother's face, Irene came beside him. He started and would have drawn her away. Come, he said in a low voice. Our path lies yonder. I bade thee wait till I had explored this field. But Irene had recognized the features of her who slept, and wondering much at the behavior of Caradan. Wilt thou leave thy mother alone in this strange land? she said. Anguish was depicted on his face, but he answered firmly. We must leave our zine, or thou mayest forego all hope of beholding Anthemina. She came in search of thee from her distant home, said the maid. Wilt thou not stay till she wakes? and tell her thy purpose. Then it would never be effected, Caradan replied. Take thy choice, return with Arzine, or seek Anthemina. Irene looked at the youth's countenance of woe, and guessed that if the mother beheld her son, she would never suffer him to pursue his journey. With a sorrowful heart, she quitted the field, accompanied Caradan to the seashore, and there remained in a fisherman's hut while he went in quest of a vessel. 
But Irene knew only that she was to await the youth's return, for so strict a silence had he kept, and enjoined on her, concerning their errand, that she knew not whether her mother's abode were to be approached by sea or land. After some hours he returned, placed her on the mule, and holding the reins, led it by rugged paths over a ridge of rocks, from the top of which Irene beheld a skiff anchored in a little bay. Still carefully guiding the mule, Caradan descended, and soon he had entered the vessel with his companion. Does the wind blow favorably? inquired the maid, as she helped him to unfurl the sails. She heard not the reply, but a gurgling sound of laughter issued from under the waves, circling all round the vessel, and prolonged by a succession of fainter and fainter echoes. As a pebble thrown by a dexterous hand repeatedly touches the water, then sinks out of sight, even so the sounds were many times renewed, till they died into silence. Irene looked aghast, but heard no comment on that ill-boding mirth from her companion whose countenance did not regain its gloomy composure ere the skiff had cleared the bay. Smoothly then it sailed, till land was again in sight, and Irene's countenance glowed, while that of Caradan became livid as a corpse. On a sudden, however, an impetuous gale arose, and drove back the vessel from the point toward which the melancholy helmsman was steering. Having impelled it far into mid-ocean, the wind relented, but rose again as often as the skiff approached the shore. Caradan knew what power was frustrating his efforts, and in a presentiment of this delay, had stored the ship with provisions. The damsel prayed that the elemental strife might cease, but Caradan would have rejoiced could this state of things have lasted for ever. Meantime, Arzine tarried in the creek whence her son had sailed, vainly expecting his return. Scarce had the youth and maiden left the field where she lay, then the deserted mother awoke and saw Fadeline weeping by her side. Why weepest thou, fair one? Arzine cried. Shall I never again behold his face? Thou shalt behold his face again, the mild spirit answered. But still the tears were chuckling from her soft blue eyes upon the flowery sod. Where shall I find him? exclaimed Arzine. Fadeline replied, Not far from hence there is a narrow bay, encircled by rocks where a hermit dwells nigh the seashore. There, after some days, thou shalt behold thy son. When that time comes, I will again be with thee, and will bring my choicest gifts to preserve him from all future harm. The spirit vanished, and Arzine, going to the seashore, learned from an old man who dwelt in a cave of the rock, that a youth and damsel had lately sailed from the narrow bay in a skiff brought from another part of the coast. Confiding in Vedeline's assurance, she took up her abode with the hermit, and from morn till eve continued to watch the restless ocean, oft reverting in thought to this strain, which had been sung in happier days amid the blooming bowers of Polyanthida. See yon blithe child that dances in our sight. Can gloomy shadows fall from one so bright? Fond mother, whence these fears? While buoyantly he rushes o'er the lawn, Dream not of clouds to strain his manhood's dawn, Nor dim that sight with tears. No cloud he spies in brightly glowing hours, But feels as if the newly vested bowers For him could never fade. Too well we know that vernal pleasures fleet, but having him so gladsome, fair and sweet, our loss is overpaid. Amid the balmiest flowers that earth can give, some bitter drops distill, and all that live a mingled portion share. But while he learns these truths which we lament, 
such fortitude as ours will sure be sent such solace to his care. End of part four, chapter two. Part four, chapter three of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 3 The Allied forces are equipped with armor in the heart of the volcanic mountain. While Phantasmion was conducting his forces through Tigridia, Maldaril sate in her ancient tower full of angry thoughts. After the murder of Torimont's queen, as she traversed Gemmaura in her chariot, she had fallen into the power of the earth spirit. But Valhorga, who hated Dorimont, released the witch that she might accomplish her projects against him. At the same time, he gave her two dwarfs, endowed with wondrous powers, intending on a future occasion to fetch both her and them into slavery. Maldaril dispatched an emissary to Palmland, who planted so many sweet but baleful herbs in Dorimont's domain, that the honey of the bees was infected with it, and the king, regaling himself thereon, was poisoned. But Phantasmion was now beyond the reach of her vengeful arm, while Zalneth and Lukoya, whom she once hoped to enslave, had both escaped her snares. Swardo crouched at the queen's feet, grinning maliciously as he viewed her knitted brows, for he knew that Valhorga had espoused the cause of Zalia's son, and that soon he should return to serve his ancient master. That evening, Maldaril went forth to visit the ancient castle where Phantasmion last beheld Olula. Gloomy thoughts possessed her soul as she ascended the tower whence her husband and her son, by Glendreth's command, had been cast upon the flagstones below. There she stood, while the twilight was deepening into darkness, and saw the ghosts of Helmio and Silvalad fluttering about the parapet and beckoning with earnest gesticulations, as if they invited her to throw herself down. She watched them till her head grew dizzy, and she almost felt tempted to obey the summons. Their motions were like those of swallows, teaching their young to fly. One after another, each gleaming ghost would perch on the battlements a little way off, look eagerly towards her, then plunge into the court beneath. As they flitted away in a curving line, both swept by Maldaril, looked in her face reproachfully, and pointed to the horizon, just as the moon emerging from clouds cast a clearer light upon the landscape and enabled her to descry an army encamped upon the plain. Then back she hied to her house upon the hill and commanded Swartho to raise pictures on the wall and show her what was coming. He obeyed, but when she looked to have seen chariots and horses and men in armor, mockery flames quivered around and she stood in the midst of a seeming furnace. Maldaril shrieked and, rushing forth, beheld the mountain crested with fire. Twice did a pyramid of flame burst forth from a lofty eminence above the mansion. Twice it sank back, as if sucked in by a mighty force. The third time it remained a steady blaze, which made the moon and stars appear to shine in vain. As fast as her tottering limbs could carry her, she descended the skirt of the hill and would have made her way through a plantation of firs and pines, but started when suddenly she beheld all the trees before her glowing with fire, the trunks and branches, and every needle leaf appearing red hot. Meantime, with a crash like thunder, the ancient mansion was leveled with the ground. Torrents of fire gushed down the ravines above, and Maldaril saw that she must soon be overtaken by the flames. Again she looked at the plantation of firs, thinking to rush through the midst of it, but in front of that fiery grove stood the towering form of Falhorga, whose wild locks and rugged cheeks looked awful in the glare of the conflagration. 
Fear not the flames, small Daryl, he said with a grim smile. Thou shalt ply thy burning tasks unhurt. So saying, he touched her with his iron mace. When she became fireproof, and seeing that she was now condemned to endless toil in the bowels of the earth, she repented, not having thrown herself down from the tower, that her spirit might wander at large with the ghosts of Helmio and Silvalad. She followed Valhorga through the glowing pine grove, and at the other end of it beheld the army, which she had seen at a distance approaching the volcano, while Phantasmion, radiant with diamonds, led them on. They had described the conflagration, and believing it to be a signal from Valhorga, resumed their march at midnight. And this was not the only host which the light of those flames had attracted. From the woods of Nemorosa came Eulander, conducting his troops of tiger hunters, clad in shaggy skins and armed with bows, arrows, and javelins. Valhorga waved his hand, and the flames, which looked like a billowy sea, now rolled away, curling upwards to the top of the mountain, and there forming a fiery coronal. By the light of that blaze, Phantasmion beheld a vaulted passage, occupying the place where Maldoril's mansion had stood. He beckoned to Phantasmion, and as the youth followed him through the avenue, which received light from within, he heard a chaos of sounds, and soon entered a vast cavern hollowed out in the heart of the mountain. At the farther end was a huge hill of fire, whence smoke and flame rose up through a chimney that formed the crater of the volcano. Innumerable swarthy laborers were ranged in this vast smithy, row within row. One company softened the blocks of metal, then quenched them in the vessels of water, another fashioned them on the anvil. Every process in the formation of armor was going on, and everything used in war was made in this workshop. The roaring of the flames and bellows, the hissing of the metal when plunged in water, the clattering and jingling of hammer and anvil produced a din which almost deafened the ears of Phantasmion. Maldoril took her place among the toiling crew and helped to make the shield which was afterwards worn by the son of Dorimont. As fast as the suits were made ready, the bands of warriors entered to fit them on, and ere the morning dawned, they were all equipped except Yulander, for he had espied Maldoril, and she followed her master into the cavern, and, guessing that her time of punishment was come, felt loath to witness it. The whole throng of artificers had withdrawn to the haunts, whence the earth spirit had summoned them, and Phantasmion was the only warrior that remained in the mighty dome. At one end of the cavern, Valhorga leaned against a rock, resembling the gigantic effigies which some nations carve in the sides of mountains. "'Why does Yulander tarry?' cried the king of Palmland as he looked at the shield of one last suit which Maldoril was polishing. Hi. Why does Yulander tarry? repeated Valhorga with a stern voice. Tell him that his armor is finished, and that he must fetch it ere it be too late. But now the Nemorosan chief appeared entering the cavern, and soon began to doff the tiger's hide which he wore on his shoulders. The ancient queen arose when she saw her kinsman, and laying hold of his garment besought him for his father's sake to procure a mitigation of her doom. Then Phantasmion at Yulander's entreaty besought Valhorga that Maldoril might be permitted to die and join the shades of Helmio and Silvalad. The earth spirit smiled carelessly and answered, Be it as thou wilt. Maldoril, having heard these words, sprang into the midst of the blazing fire when the flames rose up around her and she looked like an image of bronze which they blackened but vainly attempted to destroy. Valhorga touched her with his mace, then down she sank upon her fiery bed 
and was consumed in an instant. While they yet gazed on the flames, the warriors heard a strange, unnatural sound that seemed to express pain or grief, and, looking about, they espied Swartho in a corner of the cavern, his bright eyes gleaming like jewels set in rusty iron. Though sorely oppressed by the heat, he had lingered behind all the other slaves to see what would be done with Maldoril, and was grieved to the heart that she should escape the insults by which he had hoped to repay her former tyranny. Yolander, recollecting his treatment of Lucoya, was about to pierce the livid breast of the dwarf with the spear he had just received. But Phantasmion, laying hold of his arm, bade him beware how he touched a servant of Valhorga, whose mighty form was yet visible in a recess of the cavern. Then the two chiefs issued forth into the daylight, and beheld the united armies ranged upon the plain, their burnished armor shining coldly in the light of the newly risen sun. End of Part 4 Chapter 3Part 4, Chapter 4 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 4 Irene finds her mother in the sequestered peninsula. While Phantasmion and his allies were conducting their armed force to Rockland, driving along with them troops of sheep and kine formerly plundered from the land of palms, and followed at a distance by a train of wolves and tigers, which seemed ready to brave any danger for the sake of obtaining a share in the booty. Caradan still contended with the impetuous gale. At length it sank and was no more renewed. The voyagers gained the coast, and silence reigned on sea and land, while the dark youth placed Irene on the beach. He told her how she was to find the dwelling of Anthemina, and tears streamed from the maiden's eyes when he declared that she must seek it alone. Farewell, cried Caradan passionately, a ray of joy at sight of those tears brightening his sad face. More than betrothed thou canst not be to any one but him who owns this charmed vessel, and thou hast been betrothed to me, alas, that wreath upon thy brow. When next we meet, may it be there no longer, then thou wilt know that I have ventured for thy sake, as he who gave that pledge will never dare to do. Sorrowful indeed was the parting of Irene and Caradan, while each had a heart full of the gloomiest forebodings, but little did either suspect what worse calamity awaited the other. Caradan stood at the vessel's prow and watched the maiden hurrying with tremulous feet along the rocky coast. Again and again she turned to wave her hand, and beheld him still keeping his station. At last she disappeared, and her garment, fluttering behind her, vanished out of sight. Then Caradan fastened the pitcher securely to his body, steered away his skiff into the deep water, and, looking to the sky, beheld, just dawning into view, a winged form which, since he first beheld it, had a thousand times been present to his nightly slumbers. He waited not to see the dreaded shape more fully revealed, but plunged into the waves and perished, the charmed vessel remaining still bound to a heart which fear and love could agitate no longer. Unconscious of his miserable fate, Irene pursued her way to Anthemina's abode. No living creature met her eye as she hastened on amid sickly herbage or blighted bushes, and the sky wore a leaden hue even more melancholy than that of the plain. Once she looked up and beheld 
a flight of swallows which soon descended like a shower of dappled stones and lay dead on the ground before her. The farther she advanced, the more pining and desolate the face of nature appeared. Beyond the cliffs of the shore, she journeyed over a perfectly level plain, and after a time the turrets of a solitary dwelling came within view amid the tops of spiral cypresses. Just such a landscape Irene had beheld in mournful dreams, and she hurried on, hoping by quick motion to escape the sad feelings which the scene reawakened. After passing a collection of low mounds like graves, she gained the cypress wood, and advancing through it, soon found herself in front of that mansion which she had seen at a distance. The door stood open, and Irene entered, but no one greeted her at the threshold. She traversed many empty apartments, all such as would have befitted a palace. They were decorated with black marble and costly hangings, but the colors of the drapery had fled, while the ornaments and utensils around were tarnished and rusty. She visited a small chamber, which contained a bed, hoping to find some tokens of living inhabitants. The bed was occupied, the body of an old man being laid out there, and branches of cypress mixed with yew arranged over the head of the corpse. This solemn sight assured Irene that some one yet survived in the house or its neighborhood. She retraced her steps, quitted the mansion, and having crossed the grove that extended behind it, descried two figures standing beside a boundless sheet of sluggish, lurid water. On she went and beheld a stately lady, all hung over with the blue garlands of star-shaped blossoms, her long black tresses floating wide, and her head and neck adorned with strings of pearl. An aged woman who held a basket seemed to be contending with her, while she persisted in throwing cakes of bread afar into the marsh with an air of sullen fierceness. Her companion, having tried in vain to stop her hand, let fall the empty basket and crossed her arms in all the tranquility of settled despair. On Irene's approach, the woman in humble apparel turned about and looked at her in astonishment, but the majestic lady continued to gaze upon the march. The maiden felt unable to speak, but, perusing her face with deep anxiety, felt assured that she beheld her mother. The outline of her form and features was grandly beautiful, but her cheeks were white as wax, her blue eyes spectrally bright, and her delicate arms and fingers wasted to the bone. There was something wild and ghastly in her countenance, and strangely, it was contrasted with that of her companion, who seemed benumbed by misery but not bewildered. Who art thou? said the feeble creature. And why hast thou come hither to see us perish, and to perish thyself when we are gone? Art thou not Dorna, my mother's nurse? replied the damsel. And is not this Anthemina, the wife of Albinian? Woe is me, thou sayest true, replied the aged woman, and surely thou art the sweet Irene, whom this wretched lady left in the palace of Rockland, when she quitted it never to return. All this time Anthemina remained with her eyes fixed upon the stagnant water, speechless and motionless. The damsel related who she was, and how she had come to that coast, tenderly addressing her mother, but obtaining not a word, nor even a single glance in return, till at last she took her hand and implored her to break this fearful silence. Then she, who was so gaily bedecked, looked up, and beholding the wreath of jeweled flowers, gazed at it with astonished countenance. Zalia, she cried at length, her eyes kindling with frenzy. Art thou come instead of Dorimont? Then, with a wild shriek, she snatched the chaplet from the maiden's brow, 
and trampled it under her feet. Heart-stricken and overpowered, Irene sank upon the ground at the feet of the once gentle and captivating Anthemina. She had found her mother, but alas, in what state? Here was the goodly fabric, to outward view still perfect. All the wondrous materials were yet in being, but the springs within had failed, and the whole was a wreck. We are starving, Dorna cried. No fresh provisions have been sent for us for many months, and our last remnant of food now lies in yonder marsh. Alas, my mistress feels no trouble concerning things like these. Sorrow and the noxious vapors of this pool have turned her brain, and daily she decks herself as when she first came hither, still expecting to be visited by Dorimond, king of Pomland. How came she hither? Irene exclaimed. By the arts of Glandreth, Dorna answered. A storm drove our vessel to this desolate coast. But that storm was raised by Glandreth's power in those days. The wicked chief was enamoured of my mistress, and, I doubt not, beguiled her with feigned tales, saying that Queen Zalia was near her end, and that, when she died, Dorimont would carry her into Palmland. So she trusted herself with him, and never consenting to become his wife has remained his wretched captive. I will tell thee more while we repair to the beach. Let us go in haste, lest thy conductor should sail away. He bade me return to my own country by land, replied the maiden, saying that this peninsula could scarce be a day's journey from the chief palace of Rockland. If he is gone, we must all perish, Dorna replied. There is no passage hence by land. The place is separated from Rockland and Tigridia by this vast marsh. The exhalations whereof are so baleful that any birds which attempt to wing their way high in the air above it are sure to perish. All our household have died, one after another, of lingering maladies. The last survivor expired yesterday, and strength will fail me, I fear, to dig his grave. During this discourse, Anthemina sate upon the ground, weaving a fresh garland, and sometimes raising her head to cast sullen glances at the unhappy maid. Dorna hied away to the seashore, hoping yet to hail Caradan's vessel, while Irene stood beside her mother, absorbed in silent grief. End of Part 4 Chapter 4. Of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 5 Phantasmion and his allies join battle with Glandreth in the valley of the Black Lake. Struck with consternation at sight of the united army, the people of Rockland had offered no resistance but had forthwith dispatched messengers to Glendreth, and while Phantasmion was gazing on the island where Irene used to dwell, it was announced that the conqueror was about to enter the valley of the Black Lake with his victorious forces. Soon afterwards, the foremost bands of the enemy were descried at a distance and were hailed by the men of Palmland with this chant. Their armor is flashing and ringing and clashing. Their looks are wild and savage. 
with deeds of night, they have darkened the light, they are come from reckless ravage. O bountiful earth, with famine and dearth, with plague and fire surround them, thy womb they have torn with impious scorn, let its tremblings now confound them, our cause maintain, for as dew to the plain, or wind to the slumbering sea, or sunny sheen to woodlands green, so dear have we been to thee. To newborn flowers, from thy fairest bowers, their rifling hands have taken, and the tree's last crop, that was ready to drop, from the boughs have rudely shaken, through deep green dells, where the bright stream wells, like a diamond with emerald blending, through sheltered vales, where the light wind sails, high cedars scarcely bending, through lawn and grove, where the wild deer rove, they have rushed like a burning flood, for morning's beam, or the starry gleam, came fire and sword and blood. Then, lend us thy might, great earth for the fight, O oh, help us to quell their pride, make our sinews and bones as firm as the stones and metals that gird thy side. May the smouldering mountains and fiery fountains inflame our vengeful ire, and beasts that lurk in thy forests murk their tameless rage inspire. While from caves of death let a sluggish breath o'er the spoiler's spirits creep, O oh, send to their veins the chill that reigns in thy channels dark and deep. But if those we abhor must triumph in war, let us sink to thy inmost center, where the trump's loud sound, nor the tramp and the bound, nor the conqueror's shout can enter. Let mountainous rocks, by earthquake shocks, high o'er our bones be lifted, and piles of snow, where we sleep below, to the plains above be drifted, if the murderous band must dwell in the land, and the fields we loved to cherish from the land of balm, let cedar and palm with those that reared them perish. Phantasmia knew so well how the land lay in this mountain region that Penzelimer desired him to take the lead in all orders and dispositions of war. He had already shown the herdsmen how they might drive their bleating and lowing troops across the hills into Palmland, and he now joyfully proceeded to marshal the allied armies and conduct them to the most advantageous post. Flanked by the lake and its steep banks on one side, and on the other by a woody brow, they were soon drawn out in order of battle. The long winding files were quickly transformed to squares, clothing every inch of green turf and purple heather with brass and steel as fast as a painter's brush invests a panel with new colors. The ground covered by the front line rose gradually at either end, toward the lake and toward the mountain, so that the troops were ranged in form of a semicircle. The center of the van was occupied by Phantasmion, with his light Gemmarian cavalry, whose helmets were surmounted with carbuncles representing ruddy flames. But the young monarch's own crest was of diamonds, and displayed the figure of a damsel holding a pitcher. The Nemorosan spearmen were placed on either wing, Yolander commanding the division flanked by the hill. His foresters wore casks, crested with the grim visage of a gaping tiger. The king of Almaterra divided his large force into two squadrons, taking charge himself of that which held the middle ground, while Del Morin, son of Sanio, commanded the rear. Some companies of archers wearing stag's horns on their helmets were posted by Phantasmion among fir trees on the slope of the hill where fan-shaped branches, growing close to the ground, kept them in ambush, though now and then their sylvan crests peeped out amid the leaves. Meantime, Glandreth was rapidly advancing and filling the plain opposite to that narrower space which Phantasmion's front line occupied and which looked like the contracted girth of the valley. His force appeared innumerable and had been swollen by accessions from Palmland together with certain well-ordered battalions brought by traitorous Magnart 
whom the mighty promises and mysterious hints of Glendreth had persuaded to strengthen the strong cause and desert that of Albinet. The chief now sate beside his brother in a stately car which preceded the army and listened to his talk with deep attention. Glendreth pointed to the sky, and Manyard seemed more bent on watching the appearances there than on surveying the ground and the enemy's array of battle. The aspect of that well-accoutred host, reflecting a bright sun from burnished armor, was indeed an unwelcome surprise to the mighty general, and though his own was still more numerous, he could not hope to surround and overpower his opponents with multitudes of horse by reason of their having secured so advantageous a position. Nevertheless, Glendreth was free from even a shadow of dread, and beheld the furious onset of his foes, when the battle began without concern, for it was not in sword or buckler nor in stout hands and hearts that he reposed his trust. He had summoned other powers to his aid, and the dark massy cloud which followed his course or paused with him right over his head, while the cope of heaven around was crystal clear, assured him of victory. Phantasmion saw that cloud and his heart was troubled. Seen indeed, it must needs have been by every one present, but he of all the assembled multitude surmised that it was aught more than a collection of vapors. He alone imagined that it contained such an ally of Glandreth as no mortal power might withstand. Perplexing conjectures engrossed his mind. He thought of Olula's doubtful conduct at former junctures. He strove to think that she was no real enemy to his cause. He believed that Antemina's dying day was long since past. Yet why did that black cloud continue to hover above the head of Glandreth, and what did it portend? While the other chiefs, animated with the most confident hopes, were performing feats of valor, Phantasmion's brow was overcast, and for a little while the buoyancy and ardor of his temperament appeared to have forsaken him. Soon, however, the young monarch roused himself from anxious speculation and led on the troops with all his wonted energy. Phantasmion eagerly desired to encounter Glandreth, but lo, the chieftain, conspicuous by his long white plume and lofty stature, resigns the command to Magnard, who leads the vanguard, and retiring from the fight, ascends a bare rock just apart from the conflict, whence he obtains a full view of the hills above and of the plain beneath. Triumphantly, from that eminence he cast his eyes around, having reason to believe that, in a few moments, every object he beheld would be absolutely subjected to his power. Below where he stood, were the contending armies, the flashing of armor, the tramp of horses, the clang of sword and shield. On the green hillside he observed the numerous sheep and herds which now belonged to his adversaries. With scarce perceptible motion, they were stealing onward, while ever and anon their conductors turned about to look upon the field of combat. Part of the flocks had already disappeared, having wound their way into a rocky gorge, while the rest were following. Glandreth's heart swelled with scornful exultation as he looked upon them. Now, thought he, ere those flocks are out of sight, the plunderers shall have felt my power. At one stroke, I will change the scene, and my enemies shall be crushed forever. At this moment, success appeared, inclining toward the less numerous army, Magnard had fallen by the hand of Phantasmion, and his body was trampled underfoot by the throng. Penzelimer, with his heavy armed troops, powerfully supported the Jamarian cavalry, and the archers placed behind the fir trees, like a herd of armed deer, came rushing down to attack the enemy in flank. Glandreth beheld Phantasmion after he had given Magnard his death blow pressing onwards and striving to win his way to the place where he stood. Then he lifted up his glittering blade and shouted, 
Come on, Phantasmion. The rocks were still resounding that cry when a far different echo came from the cloud over his head. Phantasmion, Phantasmion, come on, Phantasmion, was uttered from above in a tone more shrill and piercing than that of the chieftain, more like the sound of the wind than that of any human voice. It prevailed over the din of battle. Every ear heard it, every eye was fixed on the black mass, and every weapon was suspended. But the dense pitchy cloud remained unchanged and motionless, and had a preternatural appearance alone in the pure blue sky. Phantasmion gazed at it, as he listened with awe, but not with terror, to that aerial challenge. An eye of intense light now became visible in the center of the darkness. It grew and spread, till he seemed for a moment to perceive the indistinct lineaments of a dazzling face. And... At the same time, a hand glanced forth and beckoned him. Feelings akin to frenzy possessed the young warrior at that sight. He resolved to know his fate, and not to die without having essayed at least to punish the iniquitous aggressor. He spurred his horse and began to drive right onward through the ranks, which made way before him. Then once more Glandreth raised his sword and pointed to Phantasmion, while he cast up his face to the sky and called upon Olula. The call was heard. A gush of lightning burst from the cloud, quivered adown the uplifted blade, and clothed as with a robe of fire the mailed body of Glandreth. A moment he stood enveloped in flames. The blasted corpse then trembled from the rock, and just as Phantasmion arrived, rolled down at the feet of his courser. No noisy peal followed this vengeful lightning. No cry was uttered at the fall of Glandreth. Silence was in the sky, amid the mountains, and on the motionless lake, and the armed multitudes, lately engaged in the turmoil of conflict, were still as the stones and rocks. Arrow-shaped particles of innocuous flame were diffused around, each combatant beheld them gliding over the polished helm and breastplate of his neighbor, and all fell, terror-stricken, with their faces to the earth. Phantasmion alone was exempted from the blinding glare, silent yet calm. He sate on his unmoving steed, which hung his head, and, like all living things around, seemed stupefied with amazement. Unappalled he sate, his head thrown back, to gaze on the dark cloud, which slowly ascended and gradually brightened, as if some luminous body within were eating away its coal-black shroud. That shroud became thinner and thinner, revealing more and more of a winged form, till at last, when it was perfectly transparent, the floating locks and outspread pinions of Olula, ere she disappeared in the upper sky, were dimly visible. End of Part 4, Chapter 5《Part 4, Chapter 6 of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Part 4, Chapter 6 》Anthemina dies in the presence of Irene and Phantasmion Phantasmion was still gazing upward when he discerned in the sky that angelic vision which first made him long to soar aloft. At the same time, a well-known voice whispered in his ear, Come and find Irene. Then he felt himself enabled to quit the earth and, rising buoyantly into the air, pursued Irene's image over hill and dale. But when at last... The apparition melted away. He saw his guardian fairy flitting on before him. Swiftly, they traversed the land of rocks, past the diamantine palace, and flew above the waves, till they descried an empty vessel drifting about at random. Phantasmion followed Potentilla when she entered the skiff, 
and no sooner had they alighted on the deck than the pinions of both disappeared, and the fairy sitting at the helm appeared like some ancient pilot. In this boat, she said, Caradan conducted Irene to the place of her mother's exile. In this boat, thou shalt bear Irene away, but death alone can release Anthemina. The fairy then disclosed that Olula's power had long forced her to conceal how Albinian's first queen had been tempted by Glandreth, how she came to the lost land which was cut off from the neighbor countries by an impassable marsh, and shunned by seafarers on account of fearful traditions and predictions connected with its name. On that dreary coast she roamed, continued Potentilla, till at length every cloud which hung about the sun's globe and steeped its fleece in splendor seemed growing into the likeness of Dorimant. Every changeful mist that rose from the wave seemed about to take his form. Thus she fared, till not a vestige of her former being remained, but that one miserable dream. Glandreth meant to have sailed with fresh provisions the day after the battle, but Anthemina, in frenzy, had cast a scanty remnant into the water, and by hastening the day of her death released Olula from a vow long repented of. Thus was she enabled to punish the wickedness of Glandreth, and thus hath his cruelty recoiled on his own head. But Caradan, inquired the youth, while the skiff went forward with a favorable breeze, how knew he where to find Irene's mother? Caradan, she replied, was visiting his fair young cousin in the land of rocks when Glandreth laid his plan for carrying off the queen. By way of a childish frolic, he hid himself in the lower part of the ship and remained unseen by the chieftain till he was about to sail away from the peninsula. Then coming forward, he fearfully exclaimed, Where is the queen? Oh, where is all the crew? Thou wilt not leave them on this barren coast? While he spoke thus, Olula made herself manifest in thunder and lightning. His young spirit was filled with terror, and he took solemn oaths never to reveal Anthemina's abode. The day that any one through thee finds this peninsula, said Glandreth, that day will be the last of thy life. Carada knew not that at the very hour when he brought Irene thither, Olula was released from her vow to Glandreth, and free to serve him whom she had ever loved, since first she saw him on the mountain's top. And the silver pitcher, exclaimed Phantasmion. That was stolen from the hapless queen by Sishelma, replied the fairy, and afterwards transferred to Caradan, who knew that Irene's fate depended on it, and was beguiled by the water which to hope that she might in the end be his. But oh, where is it now? the youth eagerly demanded. Potentilla replied not, but pointed to the coast of the peninsula where Dorna was joyfully hailing the vessel. Phantasmion gained the shore, and, guided by the aged woman, crossed the bleak waste to which his betrothed maiden had lately traversed. Then, hurrying through the cypress grove, he came in sight of the marsh, just as the sun was throwing a red gleam over that livid pool in which, on the far horizon, he seemed ready to sink and quench his flaming tiara. When he had passed the wood, Phantasmion stopped and beheld Irene kneeling beside her mother, who lay on the margin of the lake and seemed nigh unto death. Now that life was waning, her senses had fully returned. She had recognized her sweet Irene, and they had wept together. Could such tears have rained upon her blighted cheek before they might have kept away a fatal malady. Dear child, she said, thou wast a glimpse of soft blue sky 
between the clouds of my tempestuous life. Now that it beams forth once again, my day is closed. Just as Anthemina had spoken thus, and had begun to lament over the wretched past to which Irene was brought, she heard approaching footsteps, and casting up her death-stricken eyes, beheld Phantasmion. Dorimont, she faintly exclaimed, and Irene, clasping her hands, cried, Yes, the son of Dorimont, Phantasmion, he is come to save and to protect us. Then, while the youth kneeled by her side and told his tale, Anthemina saw how she had been deceived by the watery vision and whom the figures there portrayed they truly represent. She was glad to depart herself, and thankful to find that her child was destined for happiness, which had ever been a mere vision to her. But the silver pitcher given me by the guardian spirit of our race, that is still wanting. So thought Anthemina when she joined the hands of the youthful pair and blessed their union. The mists of death had now begun to darken her eyes, but ere they were closed forever she caught a glimpse of the charmed vessel, gleaming amid the cypress trees, and just discerned a train of aerial figures which had glided thither from the sea, and were now pausing in silence amid the shadows of the grove. Her head then sank upon its earthy pillow, and, with a smile on her countenance, the mother of Irene expired. The maiden closed her eyes, kissed her wan cheeks, and sank in a swoon upon her bosom. Phantasmion goes to raise her in his arms, but pauses on seeing another mourner come to weep for Antemina. It is Fadeline, the spirit of the flowers. Softly she rises from amid the lilies of the pool, her head wrapped in a hood, white as those lovely blossoms, while the ends of her shiny green mantle float away on either side of her bending form and rest upon the surface of the water. And now she droops in sorrow over Anthemina and the fainting maid. Tears drop from her fair eyes on the faces of both, and her yellow locks, light as gossamer, fall down and mingle with the dark tresses of Anthemina. At length, she raised her head, and, throwing back the snowy hood which had concealed her face, disclosed her bloomy cheeks and golden tendrils to Phantasmion. Fadeline pointed to the silver pitcher, then to Irene, and softly smiling whispered, She is thine. Hues of life were dawning on the maiden's cheek, while Fadeline retired among the white and azure blossoms. She veiled her head and bowed it on the surface of the pool, as a water lily closes her cup and lowers her flexile stem when the sun is on his downward path. In a few moments, none but the heads of the lilies glimmered on the darkening waters of the marsh. As Fadeline disappeared, Irene rose from the earth, supported in the arms of Phantasmion, and then the train of sea nymphs, with feet glancing in the twilight, fair as foam that twinkles on the crest of a billow, poured forward like a soft advancing tide. The foremost of them brought the charmed vessel and placed it in the maiden's hand. They who came last bore the corpse of Caradan. They paused among the cypresses, and Irene held up the silver pitcher to hide the tears which flooded her drooping face. But ere those tears had ceased to flow, Phantasmion received it from the willing hand of his gentle-hearted maid. The nymphs now surrounded Anthemina's body, taking the weedy coronals from their heads to scatter them on that fair corpse. Those who formed the outer circle blew melancholy notes through many a wreathed shell, attuning them to this farewell strain which their sisters chanted. Ah, where lie now those locks that lately streamed, mid gales that fanned in vain the fevered cheek? Lo, let them rest, ye winds, 
the heart now rests in peace. How vainly, while the tortured bosom heaved, restless as waves at last, her sea beat haunt. We strove to cool that cheek, which death too quickly chilled. Like wreaths of mist that some lone rock o'erhang, and seemed intent to melt the crags away, while with soft veil they hide its tempest-driven head. We hovered round thee on the lonesome beach, and sought to calm thy brow with dewy hand. Thy wild and quiet eye with pitying glances met. O oh, fly with us, we whispered, from glad hearts, from mirthful bands that meet on moonlight shores. We came to watch thee pace this melancholy strand. A captive thou, an exile here confined, but fatal passion to more galling chains, to exile more unblessed, thy blinded spirit dooms. Oh, fly with us, no dangerous choice we know, mild heavenly influence guides our gentle lives, obedient as yon tide swayed by the circling moon. Oh, fly with us, free, free as ocean gale, to roam at large, released from sorrow's power, ah no, far happier scenes, more blissful change be thine. Through fields of radiance let thy spirit stray, while these fair relics, shrined in ocean's depth, shall gleam like purest pearl, caressed by winds and waves. End of Part 4 Chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Phantasmion」by Sarah Coleridge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4 Chapter 7 Phantasmion and Irene are wafted to the narrow bay, whence they sail with Zelneth and Lukoya to Rockland. While the procession moved along the wood with Anthemina's body, one of the many garlands that hung about it fell to the ground, which Irene took up and fondly twined amid her own tresses. Phantasmion observed the pomegranate wreath at a little distance glittering on the borders of the marsh. He went to fetch the relic and placed it in his bosom, resolving to keep the memorial for his mother's sake. In the stillness of the air, as he stooped beside the pool, a mournful sound, like the boom of some distant bittern, came to his ear across the waters. It was the voice of Sishelma. Just as Caradan expired, the witch was about to seize on his corpse and the pitcher along with it. But Olula had descended in a whirlwind, and bearing her aloft, had plunged her in that pestiferous bog which bounded the lost land. Thence she dared not return into the sea, but ever after, continued slowly roaming from one part of the fen to the other, while her moans and wailings, heard sometimes on the side of Tigridia, sometimes toward the land of rocks, augmented the horror with which the people of those countries regarded the marsh and the peninsula beyond it. The moon was up, when Phantasmion and his fair princess gained the beach, and espied Dorna sitting in the vessel with the seeming pilot. They entered it, and, when they had put out into the deep, no cloudlet was ever driven along the sky by the keen winds of March more swiftly than that skiff was made to fly over the ocean plain. After a while, Phantasmion discerned before the vessel's prow a shadowy form, which seemed to be guiding it on its way. Irene saw not what he saw, for her eyes, from which the tears had scarcely ceased to flow, were now heavy with sleep, and at last she lay in slumber on Phantasmion's cloak upon the deck. Then the phantom rose up from the waves, and turning about revealed to him that still watched the face of Zalia. While she murmured blessings on his head, he pointed to the sleeping maid. Oh, bless her too, he cried. 
who makes me blessed. The shade of Zalia bent toward Irene, but soon recoiled, gazing with a sad look on the blue lilies which now lay withering on the damsel's stainless brow. But when Phantasmion removed Anthemina's garland and placed the jeweled wreath upon the maiden's head, again the face of Zalia grew softly bright, and bending over Irene's tearful cheek to breathe a benison, she seemed like the moon shedding benign influence on some dewy flower. When the stars faded in heaven, Zalia too disappeared. But first she pointed to a group of figures now in sight upon the margin of the narrow bay, and sighing she said, Awake, Irene, thou hast fellow mourners. Lo, Zelneth and Lucoya, weeping for their mother, and for Caradan. With that voice sounding in her ear, Irene awoke. The shade of Zalia had vanished, but she beheld the daughters of Magnart kneeling on the beach beside two prostrate forms. Nigh them a fair shape was pouring liquid on those lifeless bodies, but when Irene approached the mourners it disappeared, leaving behind a fragrant atmosphere. Fadeline had been performing the last kind office for the mother and the son. Arzine had watched and waited for Caradan in the bay till those same sea nymphs who bore his pale corpse to the peninsula transported it thence to her feet. Then, falling senseless over it, she was drowned by the advancing tide. The same vessel in which the son of Magnart sailed from these shores received his embalmed body with that of his mother. Irene, Zelneth, and Lucoya, closely united in sorrow, entered the skiff with Phantasmion and were driven by steady gales to the Rockland coast, not far from the Diamanthine Palace. Leaving the fellow mourners at the royal abode, Phantasmion rejoined his kingly allies at the capital city of Rockland, and learned that Glandreth's army had submitted to their united forces without striking another blow, so that the whole country was subdued. Albinet, with his mother, Maldra, had disappeared. For no sooner was the fatal end of Glandreth generally known than the principal men of Rockland had revolted against the widowed queen, declaring that they would neither endure her sway nor that of her sickly child. To escape their hands, she had fled with young Albinet. No one knew whither, and the chiefs placed their crown at the disposal of the allied monarchs, signifying a desire that he who should espouse the daughter of Albinian might reign over them. Phantasmion was not eager to embrace this proposal, but caused diligent search to be made for Irene's brother, whose rights he resolved to uphold. At this time it was announced that mines of iron as well as copper had been discovered in Gemmaura and in part of Palmland adjoining that district. While Eulander was restored to his ancestral throne, the blooming Hermilian inherited Polyanthida. Meantime, Penzalimer and the Sylvan chief found their fair consorts at the Diamanthine Palace and heard how, in obedience to the voice of Fadeline, they had followed their mother to the narrow bay, where they found her corpse on the beach beside the body of Caradan. Afterwards, Lucoya made known to Eulander that the witch's cavern was destroyed on the night when the volcanic mountain filled the heavens with smoke, and Selneth told her kingly spouse that the bleak waste around his castle had begun to smile with verdure, while the black cloud no longer rested on the horizon. It is reported, said she, that the dim veil has been freed from its diurnal canopy by the spirit of the blast, and that Melodine has drowned herself in a mountain pool which lies in deep shadow. Phantasmion caused the remains of Albinian to be brought from Nemorosa under the care of the fateful goatherd, and to be interred in Rockland with fitting pomp. Magnart's body could never be certified among the heaps of slain which had been defaced by the trampling throng. 
but the obsequies of Arzine and Caradan were solemnly performed, and splendid monuments were raised to their memory. Anthemina had no share in these funeral honors. Her relics could not be entombed beneath a solid marble pile, but the face of the deep, with its changeful hues and motions, for the mind of Irene was her mother's monument. And strains like these she dedicated to her memory. Poor is the portrait that one look portrays. It mocks the face on which we loved to gaze. A thousand past expressions all combined, the mind itself depictured by the mind. That face contains which in the heart is shrined. Yet, dearest mother, if on lasting brass thy very self to future times might pass, ill could I bear such monument to build, for future times with dearer memories filled. Ah, no, thy fadeless portrait in my breast from earth shall vanish when I sink to rest. But, ere to join thee on glad wings I go, thy sun-like influence beaming here below, in sorrow's hour, when earthly hope betrays me, to heaven above my hope's best aim shall raise me. In hours of bliss when heaven almost seems here, for thy sweet memory claim the tribute tear. So yon bright orb doth tearful incense gain, from glittering lake, swift rill, and humid plain. Yet dries the spray that trembled in the shower, and shines reflected from each dripping flower. End of Part 4, Chapter 7「Four, Chapter Eight of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four, Chapter Eight. Irene finds her brothers in the grove where Phantasmion first saw Potentilla. When the days of mourning had expired, all the children of Magnart with the kings who had espoused Zelneth and Lucoya, accompanied Phantasmion and his betrothed princess to Palmland, that they might be present at their nuptials. The country palace where the young monarch had always resided lay in their way, being at no great distance from the confines of Rockland. And here it was resolved that the company should sojourn, while preparations were made for the wedding in the principal city. There was a strange look on earth and sky when Irene entered that regal domain, a hot sun being veiled by bluish mist. Her cheeks glowed and her breath labored with a stifled heat and with eager anticipation, for she expected shortly to behold her long-lost infant brother. Eurelio was to be lord of Gemaura, so Phantasmion had declared. But how could she rejoice over him without grieving for Albinette? And, alas, where was Albinette to be found? Or how could she discharge toward that beloved boy her promises to his father? With beating bosom she hastened onward and entered the grove where Potentilla first showed herself to Phantasmion. There she espied a child just old enough to run alone, caressing a poor boy in tattered clothes and presenting him with fruits, toys, and fragments of cake from a basket where all were mingled together. Close by was a woman who wore a beggar's garb and seemed in woeful plight. She sat upon the ground, her head inclined against a tree, watching that fair child and his pale comrade who ate the dainties given him by the rosy little one as if he were well nigh famished. Her looks were full of misery, but not a teardrop trickled down her ghastly cheek. Irene knew at once that the younger child was Eurelio, and flew to embrace her darling charge, twice lost and now twice found. While she held him in her arms the sickly boy wept, and catching her robe exclaimed, "'Oh, sister!' Wilt thou not speak to me? 
art thou too turned against me? Startled by the sound of a well-known voice, the lady looked at him steadfastly, and saw that he was her father's heir, the poor, rejected Albinet. Then she gave Eurelio to his nurse, who had come up in breathless haste, and tenderly caressed her weeping brother, shedding tears herself while she wiped the big drops which fell from his eyes. But soon his face beamed with happiness, though wan as frosted roses, and turning to the wretched woman who vainly strove to rise. Mother, he cried, our griefs are ended now. Here is Irene. Sister, didst thou find that healing well? If thou hast any of the water left, I pray thee, give it to my mother. By this time the gentle princess had recognized Madras' altered face and kneeling beside her whispered words of consolation, declaring that she herself would be protected and Albinet restored to his rights by the generous king of Palmland. Tears now gushed in torrents from the eyes of Modra, but still she could make no reply. Her evil counsellor, whom she had met on the seashore after the destruction of Glandreth, and frantically strove to punish, had stricken a deadly chill into her frame and rendered her speechless. And now Phantasmion was seen holding up the charmed vessel among the boughs of the pomegranate tree, which stood a little way back within the grove. Potentilla sat in the shadow, while Fadeline, less hidden by the foliage, was pouring a fragrant liquid from her chalice into the pitcher. And just as Zelneth and Lukoya, with the rest of the company, arrived, he shed the flower spirit's balmy gift on the head of Albinet, whose body gradually changed as the precious drops trickled over it, till, by the time they reached the ground, he stood erect in blooming health and vigor, his limbs, on which the ragged garments had before hung loose, now muscular and shapely, filled them out to their full stretch, his form was upright, and his cheeks, though not so round and soft, were blooming as those of Eurelio. Modra had witnessed the change with flushed cheek and gleaming eye, but could not utter a word of joy or thankfulness. Albinet flung his arms around her neck. Oh, mother, he said, why art thou not healed of this dire malady? But Modra scarcely thought of him or that, for now again her eye was fastened on Eurelio. Irene observed that look and blamed herself that she had so long delayed to place the lost one in his mother's arms. In haste, she brought him to her side and gently whispered, This is thy rescued babe, thy sweet Eurelio. Joy lighted up the face of the dying woman at those words. She strove to clasp the smiling child to her bosom, but ere she reached him, her sight failed, and sinking backwards, she expired in the arms of Albinet. A little while afterwards, Phantasmion looked down into the grove and saw the heir of Rockland leaning against the tree with his weeping eyes fixed upon the ground. The flower spirits gleamed beside him in the hazy light and seemed to smile as she bent forward like a sapling swayed by a gentle breeze to crown his drooping brow with thornless roses. Eurelio was too young to weep the death of Modra. He thought she slumbered when silently and softly she was borne away. With Potentilla's wand, he struck a hollow trunk of sycamore, and sweetly his childish laughter rang through the grove. When myriads of bees came crowding forth, and shone with all the dyes of the opal as they hung from a branch above his head, Phantasmion felt as if he had dreamed of years, not lived them. The fairy looked as old and upright as when she first appeared to him. The trees around all seemed as green and flourishing. The grove was filled with just the same soft insect murmur, and that bright swarm hung dazzling as of yore. But lo, the sun has broken through its hazy veil, and Fadeline's soft cheek, as if it faded in the brilliant light, is seen no more among the blossoms. 
Albinet raises his head, from which the airy chaplet melts away, and with wonder-stricken eyes, Eurelio gazes upward, for Potentilla has risen from his side. A moment yet the wings of her insect's steeds are painted against the background of one lingering cloudlet, but now they disappear, while earth below, suffused with splendor, becomes a softened image of the heavens themselves. Phantasmion looked round in momentary dread, lest Irene should have proved a spirit and vanished like the rest. But there she stood, her face beaming bright as ever in full sunshine. The earnest that all he remembered and all he hoped for was not to fade like a dream. End of Part 4 Chapter 8 End of Phantasmion by Sarah Coleridge Recording by Maricel Cui Thank you for listening.